Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. <laughs> it's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by Kraft, makers of parquet margarine, and a complete line of famous quality food products. Why not, Uncle? Why not? Uh -uh. Why can't I go to the movies? Because, Leroy, school starts tomorrow, and I want you to get to bed early. You need your sleep. Store up a little energy, my boy. You can't learn arithmetic without energy. Arithmetic? I ask you, Uncle, what good is arithmetic going to be to me in later life? Arithmetic is of great practical value. I use it every day. Well, I must have learned just about all the arithmetic there is. I've been studying it all my life. Why can't I quit school and start getting the benefits? Leroy, let's not have any more of this nonsense. You'll go to school tomorrow whether you like it or not. And you'd better decide to like it. Well, we'll see about that. But before we do, here's a special message from Kraft. Whether you're having roast and ears of corn fresh from the glowing embers of a campfire, a stack of golden brown pancakes hot off the griddle, or just a plain slice of bread... It's the spread that makes all these good foods extra fine eating. And here's a spread that millions prefer for its delicious flavor, parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Parquet is a favorite from coast to coast because its fresh, delicate flavor is still unmatched. Try spreading parquet on an ear of roasting corn. Find how delicious it tastes melted into a golden waffle. And remember... Parquet margarine is always delicious and satisfying spread on bread, rolls, and muffins. So buy flavor-fresh, economical Parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. From your food dealer tomorrow. It's made by Kraft. Now let's return to the great Gildersleeve and his nephew, Leroy, whom we find in a silent deadlock over the question of going to the movies tonight. Huh. Huh. Hello. Well, Marjorie, joining the family for a while? I thought I might. Say, Anki. What is it, my dear? Oh, never mind. Bye, George. It's nice to have one of you kids grown up. Huh. Are you glad to be getting back to school tomorrow, Marjorie? Not particularly. Ha. Huh. That will do, Leroy. What's this, my dear? You've always been glad to go back to school? Summerfield High is awfully dead. Well, it's a very good school. Fine educational standards, good teachers, and good equipment. It's dead just the same. Do I have to go there? Marjorie, I don't understand you. What's come over you? Oh, nothing. I know. You do not. Oh, yes, I do. She says it's going to be dead because Marshall Bullard isn't going to be there. Marshall Bullard's going away to school. Oh, shut up. I thought so. Oh, shut up. Now, children... Is Marshall Bullard going away to school, my dear? Mm-hmm. He's going to prep school in the East. What the devil for? So he can go to an Eastern college. It's the only way. Well, if the Bullards want to throw their money away, trying to squeeze their boy into Yale or Princeton through the back door, that's their foolishness. It has nothing to do with you. There are lots of nice girls' schools in the East. Yes, and they can stay there, and you can stay here. Can I go to Culver, Unc? Culver, no. In case there should be another war, I could be an officer. There isn't going to be another war, and you're going to the Summerfield Grammar School. But if I went to... And you're going to the Summerfield High School. Can I go to the you go to bed. Uncle Mort, do you think You I... too. Heaven's sake. My goodness, what's the matter with you children? Ain't either one of you even touched your cereal. Sorry, Bertie. What's the matter? Has the cream seen better days? No, the cream's okay. Well, I can't let you run off to school with nothing inside you. You want some eggs? No, thanks. No, thanks, Bertie. I declare it seems like this family gets crazy every day. Oh, good morning, Miss Gilsley. Well, good morning, Bertie. Good morning, children. Hi. Good morning, Unky. I'm glad to see you properly washed and combed, my boy. That's a treat I haven't had very often during your vacation. Oh, quit picking on me. Haven't I got enough trouble? What trouble have you got that I haven't got? I got old Lady McCann, that's what I got. I'm in her room this year. 
Did you ever have McCann? No. What's the matter with Miss McCann, Leroy? She's the worst teacher in the school, that's all. Talk about hard markers. Oh, now, Leroy. She's not only a hard marker, but she has pets. Leroy, that's just superstition. There's no such thing as a hard marker, and this whole notion of pets is ridiculous. Every teacher tries to be fair. Are you kidding? What about the time old lady Cowley made me stay after school and write, I am a mischief maker 500 times? Wasn't me that put the mouse in her pocketbook. No, but I'll th- bet you thought it was a good idea. <laughs> I think it was a pretty good idea myself, my boy. It worked out pretty good for everybody but me. But if anybody ever pulled anything like that with old lady McCann, what? She's got a piece of rubber hose in her closet. She beats you with it if you do the least little thing. Oh, nonsense. You can ask any kid in the school. Hey, Uncle, what time is it? Huh? Let me see. Uh, you'll have to hurry, my boy. It's quarter of nine right now. Oh, gosh. McCann probably murders you if you're tardy. Hey, where's my report card? I left it right here last night. What does it look like? Like any report card. I have to have it to show I got promoted. It's on the mantelpiece in the parlor. Yeah? Gee, thanks a lot, Marge. Yep, here it is. Well, that was pretty lucky. Hey, Uncle, you got a pencil? Well, yes, I have. I have to have it, Uncle, to write down the stuff we have to get. Thanks. Say, can I have some money? Money? What for? To buy tablets and notebooks and all that. How much? Well, everybody but me has a loose-leaf notebook. The ones with the three holes are best. They cost 25 cents more, but they're the best. Why are they the best? Because that's the kind everybody has. And if you're out of paper, you can borrow some three-hole, but nobody's got any two-holes here dead. Yes. About a buck and a quarter will cover everything, Uncle. Here's a dollar. Now run along. But a dollar isn't oh, any... come on, Leroy. We'll be late. Oh, for corn's sake. Come in. The door's open. Leroy, we don't know who that might be. We know now. Craig Bullard. Get out of here, Craig. I can't play. i got to go to school. I want to go to school with you. Uh, now, Craig, I'm afraid you'll have to stay home and play by yourself. Craig's starting school today. I want Leroy to go to school with me. Get out of here. Uh, wait a minute, Leroy. I promised Mrs. Bullard yesterday that you'd take Craig to kindergarten this morning. What? Why doesn't she take him? Because Craig said he'd rather go with you. I want to go to school with you, Leroy. Uh, well, come on, then. But you'll have to run <laughs> Leroy, my boy, how did it go today? How was school? Oh, everything was fine. Huh? Well... I'm just finishing up my homework, a theme I have to hand in tomorrow. Homework the first day? Isn't that unusual? Well, maybe, but I don't mind. You haven't got a fever, have you, Leroy? Oh, no, I feel fine. Uh, What's the subject of your theme? How I spent my vacation. I'm writing a pip. Five pages already. You don't say. By George. Uh, How do you spell patriotic, Uncle? Never mind. I'll look it up in the dictionary. Yes, that's a much better system. You'll remember it longer that way. P-A-T-R-I-O-T-I-C. Just what I thought. Well, I'm all finished. You want to hear it? Uh, five pages, you say? Well, four and a half. Won't take long to read. I write pretty big. Uh, suppose you start reading it and we'll see. Okay. My Vacation by Leroy Forrester. That's the title. I see. Well, get to the meat, Leroy Forrester. Okay. My vacation in the summer of 1945 was not only enjoyable but useful. During the summer, I tried to relax in order to prepare to return to school in the fall. That is one purpose of a vacation, and I was very anxious to be full of enthusiasm by September. I relaxed by playing baseball, swimming, hikes, and other amusements. My second purpose was to make my vacation useful. Our country needed surplus fats, oils, and waste paper, since we were at war at that time. I collected these objects and gave them to the people in charge, so my vacation was therefore enjoyable, useful, and patriotic. That's all. How do you like it? My boy, I think Miss McCann must be a very remarkable woman. Who? Your teacher. If she's produced this magical effect simply with the length of rubber hose, I'm going out and cut myself a piece of it right now. Oh, you're talking about old lady McCann. We didn't have her. We had a new teacher, Miss Wynn. Oh? What's she like? She's a darn good teacher. She's super. She appointed me head monitor of the class. Well, how did that happen? Well, she didn't know anybody in the room, so she just took a chance. (laughs) She says it means I have to be a model of deportment and a model student besides. You think you can handle all that? I'm sure going to try. Gee, Miss Wynn is nice. Well, well. I'll answer it, Unc. Hello? Oh, yeah, Piggy. No, I don't believe I can play right now, thanks. No, I can't, Piggy. I've got to copy my homework. So long. Leroy. 
Uncle Mort. I certainly never saw Leroy like this before. Uncle Mort! Shh. Uh, yes, my boy. Say, Unc. What is it, Leroy? You all through with your homework? Uh, not quite. I'm trying to finish my science report. Oh? And there's one question. I can't seem to find the answer in the dictionary or any of the kid science books around here. Just ask your uncle, my boy. A year of physics and a year of chemistry in college ought to qualify me to handle your difficulty. Oh, sure. All I want to know is, why is the air thinner at 15,000 feet than it is down here? Uh, why is it thinner? Yeah. Well, my boy, it's account of, on account of the altitude. Is that all you know about it? That's all there is to it. Unless you want me to get into all kinds of complicated theories and details that you wouldn't understand. Okay, Uncle, thanks. I'll look it up in the library tomorrow morning. Well, now, see here. Are you expecting anybody, Uncle? Nobody in particular, but I'll see who it is. <sighs> well, hello, Craig. A little late for you, isn't it? I want Leroy to play with me. <laughs> Leroy's busy now, Craig. He's doing his homework for school. I want him to play with me. Hiya, Craigie, old boy. How did you like school today? I didn't like it at all. You want to play, Leroy? I can't now, Craigie. I've got to get ready for school tomorrow. Aw, uh, what do you want to do that for? School stings. Well, I know how you feel, Craig. I used to feel just the same. But you'll get so you like school after a while. Now, you come by in the morning, and I'll take you to kindergarten again. How's that? You come by about a quarter of nine, okay? Atta boy, Craigie. I'll see you in the morning. Good night. Leroy, I don't understand you. Well, Miss Wynn says it's up to all the bigger fellows to be extra nice to the kids in kindergarten, Unc. It's part of my job, that's all. Uh, I must be dreaming. Great Gildersleeve will be back in just a moment. You know, from coast to coast, women are praising the fine, fresh flavor of parquet margarine. And that's right. And here's a letter that proves the point. It's from Mrs. J.J. J. Keene of Chicago. Shall I read it? Yes, please do. I've tried several different spreads, even the most expensive ones. But for my money, there's none that can match the delicious flavor of parquet margarine. It's just grand. And I know because I spread parquet on hot toast every morning. Sounds great, but uh, does she say anything about the freshness, the delicacy of parquet's flavor? Why, sure. She says, our whole family likes parquet margarine because it always tastes so fresh and sweet. We like it, too, because it's so easy to spread. Thank you, Mrs. Keene, for all those nice things you've told us about parquet margarine. Of course, as you say, the amazing thing about parquet is that you get the fresh, delicate flavor... Smooth texture, easy spreading, and the splendid food values, too, for only about half the price of costly spreads. No wonder millions of homemakers are insisting on delicious, economical parquet margarine. Try it soon. Tomorrow, buy parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by Kraft. <laughs> Now let's return to the great Gildersleeve, who has been entertaining Judge Hooker at dinner. Full of good food and goodwill, our host sits at the head of the table, beaming upon his little family and his old friend, the judge. Judge, how about another helping of peach shortcake there? Yes, Judge, how about it? No, thank you, Bertie. It's simply delicious, but I couldn't. Oh, come on. Yeah, come on, Judge. It'll do you good. Oh, I'm sorry. Peach but... shortcake, Horace. The first since Pearl Harbor. I know, Gil. That's real whipping cream. You're right out of the cow. I'm sorry, but if I... Shortcake won't get you, know. We'll have to throw it away if you don't eat it. It'll just go to waste. That's just what I'm afraid of, Bertie. I'm afraid if I do eat it, it'll go to my waste. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> Marjorie, how about you? More of that peach shortcake? Oh, no, thank you, Uncle Morris. Leroy? Leroy, I guess it's up to you. Uh, none for me. Thank you, Unc. What? Oh, I never heard of a boy who didn't like shortcake. Well, it's not that, but I think I ought to hurry upstairs and get back to my homework. Mm -hmm. So if you'll excuse me. You're excused, my boy. You're excused. Well. Marge, don't come into my room and bother me, please. I'm going to be doing my homework. 
Who's bothering you? Um, tell her to keep out of my room. Who wants to go in your room? It's the last place in the world. Now, I... now, my dear. Run along, my boy. We'll see that you're not disturbed. Well, quite a change seems to have come over Leroy. I don't know how long I can stand him this way. <laughs> now, Marjorie, let's not discourage scholarship. We'll excuse you too, my dear, if you did. Thank you. Cigar, Judge? Don't care if I do. Yes, Horace. I'm actually beginning to believe that Leroy is grown up. That's the funny thing about children. One day they're children, and the next day they're grown up. And the next day they're children. Yeah. Now, Judge, this has been going on for three days. It's a whole new attitude. For the first time, Leroy has begun to show real interest in his work. I'm beginning to think the boy has the makings of a scholar. Well, that's fine. If it's true, I'm delighted to hear it. I'm even thinking of sending him to college. Every boy ought to go to college. After all, I'm a college man myself, graduate of a state university. I still think you ought to send him anyway. <clears throat> Judge, will you kindly be serious? I'm discussing a boy's future. I'm trying to plan his career. Well, you needn't talk as if you were the only college graduate in the room. Tell me, Horace. What do you suppose it costs to put a boy through college these days? You think I could swing it? Well, I'd say it depends. If Leroy's as smart as you say he is... He's smart, all right. Well, most colleges have scholarships, you know. A scholarship? Now, why didn't I think of that? That's what I'll do. I'll get Leroy a scholarship. I'm afraid that's something Leroy will have to get for himself, Gildy. Well, I'll help him. I'll coach him. Yes, I'll study with him. After all, as I say, I'm a college man. I think you'll find that college has changed a good deal since our day, Gildy. The requirements are tougher. All right, I'll get help. I talked with his teacher about it. Or his principal, Eve Goodwin. Yes, she'd be glad to help me outline a course of study for the boy. Well, Miss Goodwin might be able to help. Yes, yes, indeed. I might just run over there tomorrow evening. I haven't seen Eve all summer. <laughs> Besides, I owe it to Leroy. Getting home a little late, I see. On the contrary, P.B., I'm out a little early. We had an early supper tonight. Oh, you're out for a stroll, you think? Not exactly. I'm making a call, but I'm not expected quite yet. Calling on a lady, probably? Well, as it happens, yes. I uh, understand Mrs. Ransom won't be returning to town until next week. I'm calling on Miss Goodwin, if you must know. Oh. It's not what you think it is. I'm going there for a definite purpose. That's what I say. Well, I'll just wrap this parcel. I have to deliver a thermometer to a customer, Mrs. Snyder. She called up about it, said to rush it right over. Well, Peavy, I put down $25 in cash on an encyclopedia today. Did you say $25? $25. Did you say encyclopedia? Encyclopedia. 30 volumes. Special paper and special binding. The man's been after me for months. My goodness. Well, I guess I'd better get this thermometer over to Mrs. Snyder. She'll be... Peavy, wait a minute. Yes? I said I bought an encyclopedia today. Yeah, I know. Thirty volumes. Got everything in it from A to Z. Anything you want to know, it's in there. Handsomely illustrated, too. Over a thousand color plates. You see, here's a sample volume the man left with me. I have to return it. Just heft that. Mm hmm. Heavy. It's not light reading, either. Well, I guess I'd better run over to Mrs. Snyder. Wait a minute, Peavy. Look at the special tooling on that cover. Just feel that. That is tooling. Sure it is. Well, you see, I... this is the first volume. A to Auk. That means it contains everything of any importance beginning with A. You see? You look in here. Has it got about the atomic bomb? About what? The atomic bomb. Well, no, I don't suppose it has. Pretty important. I usually go by the Cornhill Almanac myself. Hasn't got everything, but it's got what you need. And I better get over there with this tomorrow. Wait, PB. This is full of interesting stuff. For instance, did you know that the moon controls the tides? The almanac calls all that. Has the phases of the moon and high and low tide for every day in the year. Names of all the presidents, too. Well. All right. Do you know how ants communicate with each other? Do you know who Archimedes was? Go ahead. Who was Archimedes? Sounds like a Greek. That's not a complete answer. You know which of the highest mountains in the Western Hemisphere? You must begin with A. The Andes. Do you know how long it'll take a railroad train traveling 60 miles an hour to reach the moon? I doubted it would make it. That shows how much you know. 
Hey, tell me, Mr. Gildersleeve, how did you ever fall for it? D- that is, how did you come to buy this reference work? Because every house ought to have an encyclopedia, Peavy, to look up things. As a matter of fact, I bought this for Leroy. Leroy? Well, you needn't seem so surprised. Leroy's begun to show a real interest in his schoolwork this year. He's turned over a new leaf. <laughs> Must have turned over a new Leroy. <laughs> well, I'm for encouraging him, Peavy. That's why I bought this. I figure it'll help him in his work. For instance... Do you know how many tribes of aborigines there are in this country? Hey, Mr. Gillespie, I've got to go. I have a customer waiting for a thermometer. Her husband is having chills. I asked you a question, Peavy. Do you know how many battles Alexander the Great won? Mr. Gillespie, I... Yeah, that's probably her again. Wants to know where the thermometer is. Do you know what country is the na- native habitat of the orc? Mr. Gillespie, I'm trying to run a pharmacy here, not a quiz program. Yeah, I'm coming. All right, go on. The trouble with you is, Peavy, all you're interested in is making money. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. Oh, go on and answer it. I'll go and talk to somebody who's interested in intelligent things. Throckmorton. Come in. Or would you rather sit out here on the porch? Well, it's such a nice evening, but let's go inside. Got something I want to show you. I was so glad when you called last night. I've hardly seen you all summer. Yeah, not since the Jolly Boys picnic. That's right. Well, where shall we On the uh, sofa here would be good. Fine. Tell you why I came, Eve. It's about Leroy. Already? Well, school only started Monday. (laughs) That's not what you think. Something has come over, Leroy. I think it's his new teacher. Miss Wynne? Mm-hmm, that's her. I mean, that's she. Uh, she. Well, she's rather young and inexperienced. I-, I was a little concerned about substituting her for Miss McCann. Listen, she's got those kids eating out of her hand. Oh, well, I'm glad to hear it. Why, she's got Leroy all steamed up. He can't wait to get to school in the morning, and he comes home every afternoon and goes straight to his homework. I think the boy is going to turn out to be a student. Oh, how splendid. You know, it's so inspiring when a boy suddenly takes hold like that. It's what makes teaching worthwhile. By the way things are going, I'm planning now by George to send him to college. Oh, I think he should go, definitely. Well, I want him to have every advantage. So the first thing I did, today, I bought him an encyclopedia. Oh, how wonderful. The Britannica? The what? The Encyclopedia Britannica. Well, no, this is called the New World Encyclopedia. Oh. It's 30 volumes, Eve. Cost me sixty nine fifty. Got everything from A to Z. They're delivering it tomorrow. See, here's a sample volume. Handsomely illustrated, over a thousand color plates. Hand tooling and so forth. Why, is the Britannica better? Oh, I'm sure this one is very good. I, I'm sure if Leroy learns everything in it, he'll do very well. Uh, I just happen to like the Britannica. But let's have a look at this. Uh, do you want to turn on the light there? That's better. Like me to show it to you? Mm-hmm, yes, do. Well, uh, let's shove over a little, huh? Mm-hmm. Then we can spread it out on our laps. Mm-hmm. Kind of big. Now, you see here, they begin with A. They usually do. Huh? Oh. <laughs> uh, now, here it's all about Aaron, fellow in the Bible. Mm-hmm. And from Aaron, they go to... Uh, well, uh, kind of dull in through here. Let's look for some pictures. Oh, there's one. Yeah, now, here. Here's a picture of a... Let's see. It says it's a picture of an ancient Abyssinian vase. Hmm. Busted. Now, over here we have... Uh, say, lean over again like that. Why? I like that perfume you're wearing. It's not perfume. It's cologne. I don't care. I like it. And it has nothing to do with the Abyssinians. Uh, let's see what this other picture here has. Throckmorton. Yeah. Well, are you going to show me the book, or aren't you? I don't want to read any more, Eve. My eyes are tired. Hmm. They tire too easily. You should see an oculist. Um, tell me, Throckmorton, did you come over here to talk about Leroy's college education or for something else? Well, after all, Eve, you won't be going to college for five years. There's no rush, is there? Oh, none at all. Why don't you come back again in five years? (laughs) 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 Well, let's see here. Astronomy, astrophysics... Oh, 
Miss Gilsey, this is Bertie. Bertie, it's Bertie. I'm sorry to call you at the office, Mr. Gilsey, but there's a man here with a truck that wants a dollar and seventy cents. Yes, sir. It's a crate and it weighs a ton. Oh, I won't open it. No, sir, I won't say nothing to Leroy. In psycho what? Well, I don't get it, but I'll just leave it laying here in the hall till you get home. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Miss Gilsey, it ain't anything that'll go off, is it? Guess it must be all right. He said pay the man. Stand back, Bertie. Let me get at this. Why, books. That's what I said. It's an encyclopedia. My goodness, what name? Uh, this way the Leroy sees this. Will he be thrilled? Where is our little scholar? I don't know, Mr. Gilsley. He came in from school and went right upstairs. At his books, I suppose. We mustn't let the boy wreck his health. Ha! No, my dear. Well, I don't see why he has to make such a show of it. The first time in his life he's ever studied. Now, let's not discourage him. Leroy! Oh, uh, Leroy! You want me, Uncle? Come down here, my boy. I've got something for you. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, no, wait. Don't look yet, Leroy. Hand me that first volume, my dear. I want to write something in it. Write in it? On the fly leaf. Just a little inscription. I'll go get my pen. Well, what do you know? Here comes Miss Goodwin. Miss Goodwin? Well, coming around, eh? <laughs> I've got to get back to my homework, Uncle. I'll be in my room. You sure in, Bertie. I'll be right back. That's her. I'm coming. Miss Goodwin, well, well. Good afternoon, Bertie. Is Mr. Gildersleeve in? Yes, ma'am, in his study. You'll be right out. Come in. Thank you. You've been kind of a stranger around here lately, Miss Goodwin. Well, I've been... Oh, hello, Marjorie. Hello. Uncle Mort will be right out. Gee, well, you came just at the right time. Look out for that crate. Oh, I, uh... I came over, Throckmorton, because I wanted to explain to you about the whole thing myself. Well, that's fine. I was just about to surprise Leroy with his present. Leroy! Le... Explain about what, Eve? You want to explain about what? Didn't Leroy tell you? Tell me what? I've hardly seen the boy. I was forced to suspend Leroy from school today. Suspend? For a week. I didn't like to do it. But when a boy openly defies his teacher and calls her name... Leroy! I don't understand it, Eve. I thought he was crazy about Miss Wynn. Oh, this wasn't Miss Wynn. She was just a substitute. This was Miss McCann. Uh Uh-huh. She's back. What did he call her, Eve? (sighs) He called her a goon-faced old tomato. (laughs) Leroy! Don't bother. I'm coming up. Marjorie, what am I going to do with this encyclopedia now? $25 down and 10 months to pay. Well, I guess I'll just have to return it, that's all. How are you going to return it? Well, that's easy. Just tell them to come for it. With this writing on the fly leaf? For a good boy. Oop. To Leroy from his loving uncle. Reading maketh a full man. By George, he'll pay for it. He'll pay for it out of his allowance. If I have to raise his allowance to do it. The Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekin. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. (laughs) Good night, everybody. For hurry-up meals and quick company treats, here's a sure bet. Serve Papstet, the delicious cheese food. Enjoy Pabstet's mellow cheddar cheese goodness in sandwiches and salads. Serve slices of Pabstet with pie and fruit desserts. And see what a swell sauce Pabstet makes for egg and macaroni dishes. Pabstet is nourishing, digestible, comes in two delicious varieties, golden Pabstet and pimento Pabstet. Buy both kinds. Get Pabstet cheddar cheese food from your dealer tomorrow. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. It's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Now let's see what goes on in the home of The Great Gildersleeve. Leroy, it seems, is in the doghouse. He got himself suspended from school, and he's been sent to bed without any supper. It's a big chip. Old lady, my can. Oh, I wish I told her what I really thought of her. All right, so I'm suspended for a week. What am I supposed to do? Bust out crying? Ha! <laughs> <laughs> the other kids are in school. They're slaving away, and I'm outside playing. Not bad. Yeah, I'm going to like this. That's what he thinks the next morning at breakfast. Leroy? Yes, Unc? Out in the garage, Leroy, you will find a mess. I want it cleaned up. I didn't do it, Uncle. I'm a stole it. Nevertheless, you will clean it up. Yes, sir. I want every tool in its proper place. I want those broken flower pots removed, and I want it swept out. I want it spotless. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Somebody spilled some paint in there, too. I almost stepped in it. Not me. You clean it up. <laughs> understand? Yes, sir. Fine sister. Having done that, my boy, you will repair to the cellar. There you will take all the kindling and stack it neatly in the corner near the coal bin. When you finish stacking the kindling, you will proceed to remove all that junk you've scattered around down there. All of it. Understand? Yes, sir. What about the back porch? Why don't you drop dead? <laughs> yes, I meant to speak about that. All those crates that you and Piggy piled up there, I want them put away. That's our machine gun nest. I don't care what it is. Get rid of it. And following that... Uh, say, that's a swell necktie you're wearing, Unc. That's new, isn't it? Where'd you get it? Don't try to change the subject, Leroy. <laughs> After you have cleaned up the back porch, I want you to go up to your room and study your lessons. Oh, oh, gosh, just cleaning out the garage will take me all morning. When do I get to play? You don't get to play, Leroy. This is not a vacation. It's a punishment. You hear that, Bertie? I want you to keep an eye on him and see that he sticks to business. Yes, sir. You'd better expect me home for lunch, too. I intend to check up on him myself. He... Don't hear me. <laughs> I'm not... And don't sit there feeling sorry for yourself. I'm Sitting here. Out to the garage, Leroy. Out to the garage. I'm not going to have any boys getting suspended around here. Bertie, how soon is lunch? Leroy, I declare you've been asking me that every 15 minutes since breakfast. Oh, gosh, that's hard work I'm doing out there. Takes energy. I know, I know. I feel kind of faint. All right, Leroy, you can start in if you want to. Your lunch is on the dining room table. Thanks, Bertie. It ain't nothing but sandwiches. Your uncle said I wasn't giving you nothing but a regular school lunch. That's okay. Boy, this looks super. Your uncle ought to be along any minute if you want to wait. No, I'd better start in. There's a little piece of that lemon meringue pie left over from last night. If you don't tell your uncle, I gave it to you. Bertie, I'm glad I got one friend left. Hey, Roy, you shouldn't talk like that. The best friend you got is your uncle. Are you kidding? He doesn't even like me. Of course he likes you. He thinks the world of you, Leroy. No, nope, nobody likes me. Except Miss Wynn. Ah, that's a lot of nonsense. Who's Miss Wynn? She's my new teacher. That is, she was till old lady McCann came back and got her fired. <laughs> How do you know she got her fired? Because she's always doing things like that. What do you know, Bertie? She's got a piece of rubber hose in her closet, and she beats you with it when you're bad. Is that a fact? You can ask any kid in the school. Did she beat you? Well, no, but I was lucky. I just got suspended. <laughs> I'll tell you how the whole thing happened, Bertie. I was sitting Oh, here at... comes your uncle now. Who? I better get back to work. I'll take the sandwich with me. But, Leroy... You can slip me the pie later, Bertie. Ask me goes. I don't know. Mr. Gilsley? Yes, me, Bertie. Lunch about ready? 
I'm short for time. Got to get out to the reservoir and see about things there. All ready for you, Mr. Gillsleeve. It's on the table. Uh, fine, fine. Uh, I thought some sandwiches would be nice. Sandwiches? That's what Leroy had. Oh, where is Leroy? Oh, he's out in the garage working. He is, eh? Has he really stuck at it, Bertie? Mr. Gillsleeve, I never saw a little boy work so hard in my life. <laughs> yeah, I guess I threw a scare into him, all right. It's a fact. Why, I could hardly get him to come and eat his lunch, hardly. One bite and he's right out there again working. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Let's see. What are these? Oh, cucumber sandwiches. <laughs> well, they won't put on any weight. Uh, Mr. Gillsleeve. Yes, Bertie. Don't you think maybe it's going a little far, making the little boy work all day long like that with no time to play? The boy was guilty of impertinence, Bertie. He was rude to his teacher. He must be taught a lesson. Hand me the salt, please. Yes, sir. Uh, say, Bertie, that lemon meringue pie we had last night, you haven't got a little piece of that left, have you? Uh, no, sir. I'm sorry. I ain't. <laughs> Yes, sir, that Leroy sure worked hard out there this morning, lifting all them heavy things and sweeping out. He sure worked hard. Well, I don't want to be too hard on the boy. After all, I wasn't perfect myself. As a child, I mean. (laughs) I had my little run-ins with the authorities. You can tell Leroy, Bertie, that he only has to work during school hours. After 3 o'clock, he can play. Gee, thanks, Uncle. Thanks a lot. Oh, I thought you were out in the garage, Leroy, working. I was just going... Yeah, I'm only surprised he didn't get the teacher suspended. Hmm. Quiet around here. Anybody home, for goodness sake? Home so early? Is there anything particularly unusual in my being home at 6 o'clock? Uncle Mort Marshall's here. Well, do we have to whisper? I don't see him. Where is he? Uncle Mort, please. He's in the study. In the study? What's he doing in there? He's going away to school. He came over to say goodbye. That why you had the door closed? We closed it to keep Leroy out. Now, come in and say hello. As soon as I hang up my hat. And please be nice to him. Come along. Uncle Mort? You remember Marshal Bullard? Well, I certainly should. Good evening, sir. Good evening, good evening. I understand, Marshal, that you're going away to school. That's fine. Uncle Mort, really? Huh? Oh, I mean, it's fine you're going to school. <laughs> Too bad you're going away. <laughs> <laughs> Just came over to say goodbye to Marjorie. Oh, leaving tonight? Well. Oh, no, sir. Not going till the end of the week, sir. Oh, taking no chances, eh? <laughs> well, good luck when you do go. Thank you, sir. I'll probably be over to say goodbye again before that. Oh, I dare say. (laughs) What the devil was that? It's probably Leroy. He's down in the cellar. I better see what's going on down there. Yes, you'd better do that, Unky. If you'll excuse me. (laughs) Go right ahead, sir. Yes, sir. I never trust a boy who calls me sir. (laughs) Do they have to close the door? By George, if they're smooshing in there. <laughs> After all, I'm her uncle. I got a right to know what goes on. Uncle Mort! I think I'll just leave this door open, my dear, if you don't mind. It gets a little close in there. <laughs> Leroy! What's going on down there? Bertie! Yes, sir? What's all that racket? That's Leroy sitting up the cellar again. Well, I told him he could quit at 3 o'clock. I told him he could go out and play. Yes, sir, he went out for a while, and then he came back in again. But this isn't like Leroy. No, sir. I think he feels bad about something. I think he's got something on his mind. Why? Well, the way he acts. I asked, about, I asked him about it, and he just gave me a look and ran on down the cellar quick and then slammed the door. We'll have to see about this. Leroy! <laughs> Guess he didn't hear me. Well, I'll go down. Leroy, Leroy! 
<laughs> What's the matter, my boy? Nobody likes me. That's not true. I like you. No, you don't. Marjorie likes you. She does not. And Bertie likes you. Well, that's all. <laughs> Now, 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 now. Put on that hammer and come here. <laughs> here, my boy, blow your nose. Now, tell your old uncle. <laughs> tell your old uncle what's the matter. What are you doing down here? Why don't you go out and play? I did. Nobody would play with me. Why not? Their mothers wouldn't let them. Why not? Because I heard I got suspended. That's perfectly ridiculous. I don't care. I don't care that darn old kids play with me. Now, now, Leroy. <laughs> you shouldn't cry, a boy your age. I'm not crying. I just get the darn mad. <laughs> yeah, I know how it is. I get that way sometimes myself. I'll tell you what, my boy. You just come upstairs with me. I'll play with you. Well, we'll see what we can do about it. Come along. Hey, we're just coming up, Bertie. There's somebody at the door for Leroy, that little bullet boy. There. What did I tell you, my boy? There's somebody who wants to play with you. Oh, for corn's sake, Craig Bullard. Well, he's a little young, perhaps. You want me to send him away? Dinner's just about ready. No, no. Let me talk to him, Bertie. Yeah, I guess he's better than nobody. <laughs> did I hear that kid brother of mine? Yeah, he's at the front door, Marshal. Hiya, Craigie, old boy. Hi, Leroy. Glad to see you. Come on in. I can't. I just come over to tell you my father won't let me play with you. Huh? Hey, Craigie, Nick. Yeah, just a minute. Say that again, Sonny. Yeah, let's have that again. My father says I can't play with you. He says you're a bad influence. Craig! He says you're just like your uncle. Oh, <laughs> Young man, you run along home just as fast as your little legs will carry you. And you tell your father for me. You tell your father for me. For me. Mr. Gildersleeve, you'll have to forgive Craig. You too. If my nephew isn't good enough to play with Craig, you're not good enough to hang around my niece. Uncle Mort, you can't talk to Marshall like that. Oh, can I? Get off the property. <laughs> and stay off. He doesn't mean it, Marshall. Don't pay any attention to him. Go on. Get off the property. Marshall. Evidently, I'm not welcome here. Good night. Now, look what you've done. Marge serves you right. Really, Uncle Mort, sometimes I think you're the stupidest man a girl ever had for an uncle. Marjorie, I'm inclined to think you're right. And the stupidest thing I ever did was to become an uncle. Who got me into this? <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve will be back again in a moment. Just now, we'd like to enact a little breakfast scene. The soon-to-be-contented man is played by yours truly, John Lang. There you are, John, dear. Nice golden brown toast, just the way you like it. Hey, you're handing it to me dry. What goes with it? Where's my favorite spread? Oh, I didn't know you had a favorite. Wait a minute, my favorite wife. Don't you listen when I talk about the wonderful flavor of parquet margarine? Why, the many times you've heard me say how good parquet margarine tastes. The many, many oh, times. Oh, I was only teasing, dear. Of course we've got parquet margarine. Here you are. Well, that's more like it. This toast is delicious. Parquet margarine's delicious. You're delicious. What a character. There's a man who really knows what's delicious. <laughs> okay, Leroy, and I'll just step out of character a moment to remind our friends that parquet margarine is not only wonderfully good to eat, but is high in food energy value and fortified with important vitamin A. It's mighty economical, too. Only about half the price of costly spreads. So be sure to buy delicious, economical parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by Kraft. <laughs> Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. Twenty-four hours have passed, and his nephew, Leroy, is still suspended from school. He is also still being shunned by his friends. Gildersleeve is beginning to feel sorry for the boy, as we can see if we drop in at Mr. Peavy's drugstore. 
Mr. Peavy is out and back making up a prescription, but Leroy is consuming a chocolate soda while his uncle watches. Ah, oh, boy. Aren't you going to finish it, Leroy? Oh, sure. <laughs> How about another one? Oh, gosh, thanks, Uncle. Three is plenty. You may be right. Well, I got to get back to my office. You think you can amuse yourself for the rest of the afternoon? I suppose so. What do you think you'll do? I'll bum around, I guess. There must be something more wholesome than that. I'll be okay. I don't like to think of you just wandering around by yourself. Out there was some movie that you were crazy to see. There is, Unc, at the Majestic. Gosh, if I could go to the Majestic. Well, here's a quarter. You go on to the Majestic. But don't tell anybody I sent you. Oh, thanks. The Majestic has a triple horror. That'll carry me right up to supper time. Huh? Sure it won't spoil your appetite? Are you kidding? Those horror pictures make you hungry. (laughs) Gee, thanks. I'll I'll just be able to make it in time. Yeah, so long, my boy. Poor kid. Mr. Gildersleeve, was that somebody going out or somebody coming in? <laughs> no, Peavy, just Leroy leaving. What do I owe you? Yeah, yeah, just figure that out. Three chocolate sodas, is that right? That's right. <laughs> Doesn't seem possible. <laughs> well, that's 45 cents and one cent tax. Here. Thank you. 46, 50, 75, one dollar. Uh, isn't this a little unusual, Mr. Gildersleeve? Unusual? Buying Leroy's sodas in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, birthday, maybe. No, it's not his birthday. He's been suspended from school. You don't say. Well, it seems a funny reason to buy him a chocolate soda. That's not why I'm buying him a chocolate soda. But you said he Let was... me finish, please, Peavy, just once. I'm sorry, Mr. Gildersleeve, but I thought you said that you... Allow me, Peavy! Permit me. Now, Leroy was suspended from school. I suppose you want to know why. I can not say anything. I know you, Peavy. The boy was suspended because he was rude to his teacher. Suspended for a week. A week? Yes, pretty severe punishment. But I don't say it isn't fair. What I object to is that, it's, that none of Leroy's friends will play with him. Their parents seem to think he's some kind of an outcast. Well, that's the way of the world, Mr. Gildersleeve. Would you want Leroy playing with some young criminal? Leroy is not a criminal. <laughs> I think he's being persecuted, unjustly. I'm just trying to make it up to him, that's all. Well, if I were suspended from school and got free chocolate sodas, I might be tempted to make a habit of it. That's ridiculous. And yeah, if I like chocolate soda, it is. Peavy, it's easy to see you never were in a jam when you were young. No, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I tried to sneak onto a streetcar once without paying the five cents. My, my, quite a crime. Were you arrested? No, but the conductor made me give him a nickel. It was a very humiliating experience. You haven't lived, Peavy. Naturally, you can't imagine what Leroy's going through. Why, if you... Good afternoon, Mr. Peavy. Have you got my prescription ready? Indeed, I have, Mrs. Townsend, right here. Uh, how do you do, Mrs. Townsend? <laughs> How's little Arthur? Will you charge it, please, Mr. Peavy? Uh, yes, ma'am, a dollar twelve. Thank you. Good day, Mr. Peavy. <laughs> Why didn't that woman speak to me? I've known her for years. Is uh, Arthur Townsend in Leroy's class? Well, yes, I believe he is, but... That's the way of the world, Mr. Gildersleeve. (laughs) I'm afraid you're tarred with Leroy's brush. But Leroy is just a kid. He's a nice little boy. They all are at the beginning. I guess Dillinger was a nice boy once. (laughs) Dillinger? Uh, if you'll excuse me, Mr. Gildersleeve, I have some work to do out and back. Are you trying to get rid of me, Peavy? Oh, no. Yes, no. you are, Peavy. You're afraid I'll contaminate your other customers. You're afraid you'll lose some trade. Why, Mr. Gildersleeve... All right, you money grubber, you'll be sorry. <laughs> See who that is, will you, Bertie? I'm on. Birdie. Mr. Gilsey, he's writing the parlor, Judge. He's just starting in on evening paper. And I'd a lot rather read it than talk to Hooker. Oh, hello, Horace. <laughs> hello, Gildy. Yeah, sit down. Make yourself at home. No, I can't stay, thank you. I was passing by, and I just thought I'd drop in and ask you about that financial report. Financial report? Yeah, you were supposed to give the financial report at the uh, school board meeting tomorrow night, remember? Oh, that. Sure, I remember. I've got the report already. That is, I will have. It's fine. It's fine. Well? 
Is that all you wanted to know? Uh, not exactly. Well, speak up. What is it? Well, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, Gilda, but it occurred to me you might like me to present your report to the school board. Why should you? I'm chairman of the finance committee. Why shouldn't I give the report? Well, a man in your position... That is to say, if I were in your position... What position? What the devil are you talking about? Stop beating around the bush. I'm afraid I'll have to. You're so thick. Who's thick? <laughs> you are in more ways than one. Hasn't Leroy been suspended from the Summerfield Grammar School? Yes, he has. And what of it? Well, doesn't that place you in a slightly embarrassing position as a member of the school board? How? Well, how will you feel standing up there with the school board when you can't even keep your own nephew in school? Now, see here, Judge. I had nothing to do with Leroy's difficulty. When the suspension period is over, he'll go back. I wonder if there's any way he could get back sooner. Have you uh, tried to arrange it? No. I wonder if his teacher knows I'm on the school board. I think it would be most inadvisable for you to start throwing your weight around. I wasn't thinking of throwing my weight around. <laughs> Just thinking of dropping a hint. I've seen you drop a hint with an awful thud, Gilday. <laughs> Are you trying to suggest I'm undiplomatic, you old goat? I'll show you. I'll find a way out of this thing without any help from you either. Well, what about tomorrow night? I'll be there, don't you worry, and with a report. And I'll be able to look every member of that school board right in the eye. <laughs> Is that you, Leroy? Yeah, it's me. Supper ready? In a minute. How was the picture? Oh, it was okay. It was much fun going to the movies all by yourself. Yeah, I know. Sit down, my boy. There. Now, I think you've been punished enough for your rudeness to Miss McCann. Yeah? Gee, that's what I think. <laughs> Perhaps we can find a way to get you back in school tomorrow morning. How would you like that? Can you really, Unc? We'll see. You're sorry for your behavior, aren't you? Sure. Gosh, never thought I'd be suspended. Well, aside from the punishment... You realize you said a very bad thing to Miss McCann, that you hurt her feelings, that no boy in school should ever speak rudely to a teacher. You realize all that, don't you? Sure, sure. What are you getting at? That's not the attitude. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's the boy. Now, if you'll just say that to Miss McCann. You mean i got to apologize? Certainly. That's the manly thing to do, my boy. I can't, Unc. Let's not be silly about this, Leroy. There's nothing easier than to apologize, and there's nothing that gives you a better feeling afterwards. I can't apologize to her. Nonsense. What makes you think you can? In front of all the other kids? Certainly. You insulted her in front of the other kids, didn't you? I didn't insult her. Okay, I insulted her. <laughs> Look, Leroy, there's nothing to this thing. You walk into the schoolroom tomorrow morning, you walk straight up to Miss McCann, and you say, Miss McCann, I owe you an apology for my thoughtless behavior. I want you to know that I'm very sorry. What do you think she'll do, bite you? She'll hit me with a rubber hose. <laughs> <laughs> Leroy, you're acting like a baby. But if you want to get back in school tomorrow, this is the only way to do it. Apologize? Apologize. The only way? The only way. Well, I guess I'll just have to wait till the week is up. But Leroy, <laughs> Leroy, you haven't got anybody to play with. You're not having any fun. You're miserable, aren't you? Sure I am. Then why not apologize? I hate to apologize. It just happens, young man, that there are other people concerned in this affair. It just happens that I personally find this whole thing very embarrassing. Oh, so that's it. No, that's not it. <laughs> I'm thinking principally of your welfare. The fact that I'm a member of the school board is entirely secondary. What do I care about the school board? Leroy, people are refusing to speak to me in the streets on account of you. I'm being an outcast. I'm becoming an outcast. So am I. But I'd rather be an outcast than apologize to old Lady McCann. You listen here. You'll apologize tomorrow whether you like it or not. to be afraid of. I'm with you. I'll walk right up to the door of your room. I'll listen while you make your apology. If that woman lays a finger on you, I'll be there with you in a jiffy. Okay. Where is your room, Leroy? At the end of the hall. Hmm. Long hall, isn't it? <laughs> All right, my boy. Now be brave. Just say what I told you to say. Just walk straight up to her and say, Miss McCann. Oh, shut up. Why, Leroy. <laughs> uh, good morning, 
Miss McCann. Good morning, Leroy. I'm... I'm sorry I... That's all right. Just take your seat. Perhaps you'd like to lead the opening song, Leroy. Okay. Good morning to you. Good morning to you. I'll be darned. <laughs> Maybe I ought to go in and say a few words to her myself, though, just to make it sure. <laughs> Miss McCann? Yes? I wonder if I could just have a word with you. Certainly. Excuse me a moment, Clark. Yes? I'm Mr. Gildersleeve, Leroy's uncle. Oh. I just thought I'd mention that it was my idea for Leroy to apologize, <laughs> and he was supposed to say a good deal more. That is, he was supposed to make a more elaborate apology. <laughs> yes, but the little devil... Mr. Gildersleeve, if you don't realize it's the spirit of an apology that counts and not the words, you aren't fit to bring up children. Miss McCann... I suspected Leroy's difficulty must be with his home training, and now I'm sure of it. But I don't... In fact, you're the one that should be suspended. <laughs> but I don't want to go to the other home! Oh, <laughs> from the great Gildersleeve again in just a moment. Round about mid-afternoon, boys and girls are apt to get mighty hungry at school. And when they get home and make a beeline to the pantry, here's something that's sure to satisfy hungry young appetites. It's crisp crackers and slices of tender, fresh bread spread with delicious parquet margarine. Children really go for parquet's fresh, delicate flavor because it tastes so good. And there's another important reason why so many mothers serve after-school snacks of crackers and bread spread with delicious parquet. It's that wonderful energy parquet margarine helps provide. And the important vitamin A that's added to every single pound of parquet. Of course, parquet is mighty economical, too. Only about half the price of costly spreads. So mothers, tomorrow be sure to buy delicious, economical parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by Kraft. Uncle Mort. Uncle Mort, here's a special delivery letter that came for you this afternoon. Oh? It's postmarked Savannah. Savannah, Georgia? Well, must be from Leela Ransom. Yeah, I'll just see what it says here. Mm. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> Oop. Why the little minx? Huh? Oh. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> what does she say, Uncle Mort? Uh, she says she's had a very good time and she'll be back Friday. Well, that's what she said. Now you go to bed. <laughs> Good night, folks. The Great Gilder's Slave is played by Harold Perry and is written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meacham. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of The Great Gilder's Slave. <laughs> Do the children in your family like cheese? Then you can just bet they like Pabstet. It's so rich in mellow cheddar cheese flavor, so easy to digest. Pabstet is a cheese food that contains the nourishing food values of milk. And it's simply delicious, spread on bread or on crackers, or melted into a luscious cheese sauce for macaroni. And now the ration points are no longer required, you'll want to buy both delicious varieties, Golden Pabstet and Pimento Pabstet. Ask for Pabstep, the delicious cheddar cheese food, when you shop tomorrow. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> yeah. It's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Now let's join The Great Gildersleeve, who is up early this morning. There's a nip of autumn in the air, but Gildersleeve is taking his morning bath just the same. And we can hear him. Life and I want to live. I love soap. Darn soap. Oh well. I love life and I want. To live. Boy, these hot cakes are really super. Shoot the syrup, will you, Marge? Here. Leroy, you don't have to drown them. Oh, what's it to you? You waste so much syrup. I won't waste any. I'll use it up with some more cakes. Your table manners are disgusting. You'll be sorry if you're ever invited out anywhere. I got swell manners when I go out. Gosh, did you hear Uncle singing up there? He feels swell today. I know. I know why, too. Yeah, why? Mrs. Ransom is coming home today. Gosh, is that any reason for him to go crazy? Singing isn't crazy. <laughs> No, but he shaved twice. <laughs> and he gave me 75 cents to go to the football game next Saturday. Didn't even argue. You'll understand someday, little boy. Ah, you think everything is love. Romance. I love life. Here comes the great lover now. <laughs> hey, Bertie, Unc's coming down. Hi. Well, good morning, Marjorie. Good morning, Unky. I told Bertie you were here, Unc. I heard you, my boy. Is uh, that a new shirt, Anki? It's lovely. PK. I bought it yesterday. It looks so rich. Post-war shirt. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't been able to buy this kind of stuff. Oh, good morning, Bertie, thou priceless jewel. Good morning, Mr. Gilles, please. You want eggs or hot cakes this morning? Take the hot cakes, Unc. That's super. You've uh, tested them thoroughly, have you, Leroy? Yeah, I'll say. He's been eating like a pig. <laughs> well, there's a certain amount of pig in every boy, my dear. <laughs> I'll try the cakes, Bertie. Yes, sir. I got some bad news for you, Mr. Gilsey. Well, bad news, eh? What is it? The refrigerator's on the blink. The milkman says we'll have to have a new motor. Oh, well, had to expect it someday. I'll attend to it this morning. Positively? Positively. Bring on the hot cakes. Yes, sir. If the stove is still working. <laughs> <laughs> well, glorious morning, isn't it, children? Yeah, it's a pip. Say, Unky. Yes, my dear? Oh, never mind. What is it, Marjorie? Nothing. I was going to ask you for something, but I won't. It'd be taking advantage of you. What do you mean? Well, you're happy this morning, and I know why. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear, my smart little niece. Well, if you're too nice to ask for anything, I'll have to be nice, too. You can go down to Hogan Brothers and get anything you want up to $5. Oh, Unky. <laughs> oh, Unky, you're a darling. You think so? Uh-huh. Yeah, that reminds me. <laughs> I've got to make an important phone call. Will you excuse me, children? Surely, Uncle Mort. How do you all like that? Five dollars. All I got was a lousy football ticket. Behind the goal post. <laughs> I didn't ask for anything. Oh, no. Hello, Summerfield Grill. This is Rockmorton P. Gildersleeve. This is Water Commissioner Gildersleeve. Yes. I'd like to reserve a table for two at luncheon today, please. About one o'clock. Uh, Gus, I wonder if you could give me that little booth in the corner. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. For God's sake, I could have a seat on the 50-yard line. Hello, Floyd. Can you take care of me pretty soon? All right, sure. Come on in. Take off your coat. I got a friend of yours under the towel here, but he'll be through in a minute. A friend, eh? Well, let's see. Uh, who do I know with big, flat feet? 
and a little round pot belly. Why, you? Yeah, and the voice sounds familiar. Is that his nose sticking up there like Fujiyama? Now, you see here, Gildersleeve. Well, Judge Hooker, I never thought it was you. Oh, you're not fooling me for a minute. If I were as fat as you, I'd go slow making fun of other people. I'll have you know, Horace, that I've taken three inches off my stomach this summer. You have? Looks like you just moved it around the rear. (laughs) (laughs) It's all right, Judge. (laughs) Uh, uh, hmm. What's the matter, Commissioner? Can't you enjoy a joke? Yeah, where's your sense of humor, Gildy? I'd like a mustache trim, Floyd, if you're through with this comedian. Fly right up there, Commissioner. I'll make you look like Ronald Coleman. Don't strain yourself, Floyd. <laughs> Getting pretted up for a certain party, Gildy? Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. Well, I don't know who you're trying to fool, Doc Morton. It was in the paper she's coming home today. Oh, that widow, Mrs. Ransom. Yeah, I saw that in the paper. Well, who the devil put it in the paper? Leela probably wrote the society editor. She always calls up when she's giving a party. Publicity. Why do people want it? Women, they're the ones that like it. Every time my mother-in-law comes over from Sauk City, my wife calls up the paper. Mr. and Mrs. Floyd Munson are entertaining Mrs. Munson's mother for a brief visit. When she finally goes home, they print that, too. (laughs) The mustache, Floyd. I can't spend the day here. Okay, Commissioner. The old lady keeps a scrapbook. She's got that item pasted in there 20 times. Floyd! Okay. Going to meet Leela Gilder? I thought of it. How'd it be if I'd go along? Give her a little surprise. Hey, I got a better idea. Why don't we all go down and meet her? The Jolly Boys are getting together tonight anyway. Mrs. Ransom is coming in early this afternoon. Oh, that's too bad. We could have a lot of laughs. Why don't I try to round the boys up right now? She'd probably get a big kick out of it. I don't think so, Floyd. It wouldn't be very dignified. Dignified? The girl likes a little fun, don't she? I always thought she did. <laughs> I don't care to hear your thoughts regarding Mrs. Ransom, Floyd. And I'm opposed to the whole idea of the Jolly Boys meeting her. Mr. Gildersleeve is right, Floyd. Thank you, Horace. I think the nicest thing would be if just you and I went down to meet her, Gildy. Oh, why, you nosy old goat. Uh, Gildy, we'll give Leela a nice surprise together. I gotta go to my office for a few minutes, but I can meet you at the station. What train is she coming in on? Uh, what train? Yeah. Uh, the uh, 1215 train, Judge. All right, I'll be there. Here, Floyd. Thanks, Judge. See you at the station, Gildy. <laughs> well, he kind of put one over on you there, didn't he, Commissioner? You think so, Floyd? Uh-huh. <laughs> Finish me up. I got to get out to the airport. <laughs> Trying to make this one-horse airport sound like LaGuardia Field. Well, only one gate must be gate one. Oh, just wait here, please, sir. Only passengers and employees come through. Oh. Uh, Say, aren't you the fellow that was talking through the loudspeaker? Yes, that was me. Huh. Why don't they let the people off? They're coming now, sir. Oh, yes. (laughs) Oh, there she is. Leela! Leela! She's waving. I guess she sees me. Yes, I guess so. I wasn't talking to you. Oh, wasn't it darling of you to come and meet me? Uh, Leela. <laughs> Am I glad to see you? Mm. Oh, Throckmorton, what will people think? <laughs> anybody can kiss anybody in railroad station. But this is an airport. Well, if the airlines outlaw kissing, they'll lose a lot of customers, I can tell you that. Uh, where's your baggage, Leela? Oh, well, this is all I have, this little bit of handbag. I got so many new clothes down home, I had to buy a trunk, and they won't let you take a trunk on a flying machine. Oh, uh, <laughs> let me carry your handbag. Oh, then. thank you, Throckmorton. Come on, Leela, let's get in the car. All right. Oh, I wonder if I could make a phone call first. There must be a booth here. Well, sure, only what's your hurry? Well, it won't take but a second, Throckmorton. Well, the booth's right over there. I'll wait here at the newsstand. Oh, you're a darling. I won't be a minute now. What a girl. Ah, George, it must be great down south. Imagine a whole town full of Leela's. 
Did you want a magazine, sir? Are you running the newsstand, too? Yes, but I'm closing it up now. I've got to go over and open up the ticket office. Well, for... <laughs> Wasn't I quick? Oh, you certainly were, Lena. Come on now, let's drive into town. I'm taking you to lunch at the Summerfield Grill. And I hope that guy isn't the waiter. <laughs> I've reserved a booth, Leela. Oh, Rock Martin, if I'd only known. Well, what's the difference? Surprise. Well, it's simply sweet of you to have thought of it, and I'm heartbroken I can't go. Can't go? Well, I'd counted on it, Leela. A nice lunch, and then maybe a nice drive out by the reservoir. Oh, it sounds... It sounds heavenly. Well, come on. Well, I can't, Throckmorton. I just called my hairdresser, and if I get there in 15 minutes, she can take me. Hairdresser? Leela, are you standing me up for that? Oh, now, darling, I was hoping I might see you tonight after supper. I was hoping to see you this afternoon. <laughs> I'll be lots prettier this evening, and I've got a new dress I think you like. At least I hope so. New dress? Mm -hmm. Leela, you haven't got the dress in this little bitty handbag. Mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'll drop around right after supper. God. <laughs> back with the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. Mr. Lang, didn't you make a slight error at the start of this program? Why, no, not that I know of. Well, I thought I heard you say the Kraft Foods Company presents the great Gildersleeve. That's just what I said, the Kraft Foods Company. But isn't the name Kraft Cheese Company? Not anymore. From now on, it's the Kraft Foods Company. Because, you see, the Kraft Company not only makes a wide variety of fine cheese and cheese foods, but also is known for many other top-quality food products. For example, parquet margarine. Parquet is one of my favorites. Such a delicious spread for bread, hot toast, and rolls. It's a favorite of millions, because parquet margarine has a fresh, delicate flavor that is still unmatched by any other brand. I found it's economical, too. Only about half the price of costly spreads. And don't forget, the maker of this delicious, economical spread is the Kraft Foods Company. I stand corrected, Mr. Lang. I'll remember. Kraft Foods Company. That's right. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet Margarine. Made by the Kraft Foods Company. Try it soon. You'll be glad you did. <laughs> Well, now let's see what's in store for Gildersleeve. That's what the great man himself is wondering as he sits twiddling his thumbs at his desk in the water department. But perhaps we'd get a better idea if we looked in on Peavy's drugstore, where the proprietor is welcoming back an old customer. Sure, nice to see you back, Mrs. Ransom. <laughs> oh, it's nice to be back. Uh, what kind of a summer did you have, Mr. Peavy? Hey, quiet, quiet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And Mrs. Peavy, how's she? No, oh, she can't complain. Or perhaps I shouldn't say that. She, on the whole, she's been pretty well. Oh, that's good. Uh, tell me, Mr. Peavy, how is Mr. Gildersleeve these days? Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, he was in here the other day for a bottle of rhubarb and soda, but I don't believe it was anything serious. Just a temporary upset. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, what's he been up to this summer? Well, I really couldn't say. Mm, nothing new, then. Well, you know Mr. Gildersleeve. He, he's hard to keep track of. One day it's one thing, the next day it's something else. <laughs> Aren't you right? Was there uh, something, Mrs. Ransom? Oh, oh, yes. I, I want to get a lipstick. I'm afraid I lost mine on the plane. Lipstick, yes, indeed. I, I seem to have quite a selection here. Now... Ah. Here's one that's put out by Hubigan's reliable firm. Has good wearing qualities, so they tell me. Mm-hmm. And then uh, here's one that goes by the name of First Blush. That's the name of the car. Oh, I, I'm afraid that would be a little lie. i got another one here that's called Shame. I take it that's a little redder. 
Well, uh, what's this one? Uh, just let me see that. Oh, yes. Yeah. This one is called Savage Dawn. Is that more the kind of thing you had in mind? Well, that's very nice, too. Now, if you were a man, Mr. Peavy, which of these colors would you prefer? Well, I'd say that either of them ought to do the same. <laughs> but, uh, which do you react to yourself, personally? <laughs> I don't know anything about these things, Mrs. Ransom. I, I just sell them. I, ladies come in here asking for them, so I have to stock them. But I guess they're both good serviceable lipsticks. Oh, you're so old-fashioned, Mr. Peavy. You probably think any woman is a hussy if she even uses lipstick. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I guess I'll just have to decide for myself, ma'am. You know, I think I prefer Savage Dawn. <laughs> Is that wicked of me? Mrs. Ransom, the way things are going these days, I don't know how anybody's going to tell what's good and what's bad. <laughs> I just try to break even myself. <laughs> now, it'll be one dollar. Oh, there you are. And, uh... Two cents for the governor. <laughs> oh, yes, I keep forgetting. Grab it up for you? Oh, don't bother. I'll just put it in my handbag. Well, goodbye, Mr. Peavy. Goodbye, Mrs. Ransom, and good luck with your lipstick. <laughs> lipstick. <laughs> Booby trap. <laughs> Wonder who she's after this time. <laughs> Martin, always early. Oh, thank goodness I'm dressed. Rock Martin, is that you down there? Who are you expecting? Uh, silly, the door's open. Go in the parlor and make yourself comfortable, you hear? I'll be right down. Now, do I look all right? Is anything showing? Uh, how's my hair? Well, it'll have to do. My lipstick, my new lipstick, where is it? I had it in my handbag. No, no, I took it out. Now, where did... Leela, darling, what are you hurrying for? Don't you remember what Mama said? Always keep them waiting. Where is she? Where is she? In the name of heaven, what's she doing up there? Forty-five minutes by the clock. Ye gods. I could be doing things. I could be at the Jolly Boys right now. I could be home paying bills. I could be reading a book even, but no. Eight o'clock, she said. <laughs> Just wait till she comes down here. I'll give her a piece of my mind. Yes, by Georgia. Oh, hello, Leela. <laughs> kept you waiting terribly long. Not at all. I just arrived, practically. Oh, I'm so glad. I was afraid I might have kept you waiting. Oh, do sit down. Uh, thanks. Well, aren't you glad to see me? Aren't you glad I'm back? Oh, of course I am. Gosh. Then what are you sitting way over there for? Yeah. Oh, that's better. I hate having to shout across the room, don't you? Hate it. Here yeah, we can talk nice and comfortably. A whisper even, if we had anything to whisper. I know something. What? How about a little kiss? No. Come on. No. I'm very angry with you, Throckmorton. What for? Because you never once wrote to me all summer. Oh, gosh, I've been busy, Leela. You don't know how busy I've been. I've been terribly busy, really. I kept intending to write to you, but... I know. You were busy. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't really matter in the slightest, Rock Martin, because if you had written to me, I should probably just have torn the letter up. Why? Too busy to read it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, George, you've got a great sense of humor, Leela. That's what I always say. As long as a girl's got a sense of humor, I don't care if she's... Well, that's the main thing, a sense of humor. <laughs> She's what, Rock Mom? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> what kind of a summer did you have, Leela? How was Savannah? Did you have fun? Well, yes and no. It was all terribly complicated. I'll tell you about it sometime. What's the matter with it right now? Right now, I'd rather forget. Oh? 
That's what I came back up here for, to forget. Forget who? What? His name is Lightfoot Dupree. <laughs> Lightfoot? Oh, Throckmorton, why don't things ever work out? Why doesn't what work out? Who is this guy? What's this all about? Well, it was just one of those things, I guess. He was engaged to my very best friend, the girl I was visiting all this time. So, naturally, there was nothing I could do about it. Did you try Throckmorton, she was my very best friend. The worst of it was I found out he was in love with me, too. Terribly in love. That's why I cut my visit short. Cut it short? You were down there three months. <laughs> I thought you were coming back the first of August. Well, anyway, that's why I've come back, to try to forget. Well, you've come to the right place, Leela. You want to forget? I'll be glad to help you. Let's start right now. <laughs> As if I could ever forget Lightfoot Dupree. Yes. Oh, well, I guess it was just one of those things that could never be. Sure, forget it. What do you want to feel sad for, Leela? I'm here. Why, I gave up an evening with the Jolly Boys just to be here with you tonight. Oh, did you, Throckmorton? Aren't you sweet? Sure, I could be playing poker right now. <laughs> oh, Throckmorton, you're so understanding. I can be a lot more understanding than this. Mm, you knew I'd be needing you this evening. You will help me forget, won't you? Will I? Yeah. Throckmorton, what was that? Me? Oh, no. No, I thought I heard a sound outside. I didn't hear anything. Sounded like prowlers on the pole. Now, don't you worry, Leela. I'm here. Oh, it's so wonderful to have a man around the house. Leela, now how about it, huh? A little kiss. Do you always have to ask? Yeah. Throckmorton, don't move. Why not? The window. Look, it's opening. Leela, hold me tight. <laughs> Fellas, that's very funny. Now get out of here. Go on and get off the property. Beat it. Listen, you fellas, do you want me to call the police? Police? Who do you think is singing bass? <laughs> Leela, I apologize. I don't know what's gotten into them. I'll go out there and get rid of them. Oh, don't send them away, please. That would be terrible. That's the way they behave. Well, I think it's delightful to be serenaded like this on my first evening home. I think it's very flattering. Uh, let me speak to them. Won't you gentlemen come in? What's she getting? Oh, no offense, old man. Just a little joke on the commissioner. Oh, gracious. I should say not. Come right in. And Mr. Peavy. And this fellow's got me into this, Mrs. Ransom. I was just on my way home. Oh. <laughs> I'm glad you came. Horace. Welcome home, Leela. Oh, Horace, I'm glad to see you. It's good to see you, Leela. I would have met you at the airport if our fat friend here hadn't played me a dirty trick. <laughs> I resent that. I'm not fat. Well, you've got even with him, Judge. Oh, Mrs. Ransom, you know Mr. Munson. Oh, sure. Hiya, Mrs. Ransom. How's it going? Close the door, Floyd. You were the last one in. Yes. Where were you brought up? In a barn? Oh, sorry. Oh, well, I just think it was wonderful of all you boys to come over like this. I'm so flighted. I was telling Throckmorton, it reminds me of Mardi Gras when all the men go around serenading the girls. Now, if Mr. Peavy were just wearing a funny face... What's the matter with the one he's got on? <laughs> <laughs> Only kidding, Pete. Say, that's an idea. Why don't we serenade the lady as long as we're here? Yeah, why not? Oh, do sing. I'd love to hear you. Oh, we do pretty good on Home on the Range, huh, fellas? <laughs> How about it, Commissioner? You take the lead. No. Oh, come on, Commissioner. Oh, do sing, Throckmorton, please. No. Why not? I'll play the piano for you. I don't want to. All right, Floyd, you take the lead. What do we sing? Well, let's see. Uh... There is a tavern in the town. No, no! <laughs> well, what would it be then? Oh, the moonlight's fair tonight along the wall. From the field there comes the No, man. no, no, that's terrible. What's terrible about it? Everything. I don't like the song. I don't like the way you sing it. Well, you know so much. Let's hear you sing something. And while we're about it, I don't like you fellas coming over here and busting in like this. Can't you take a joke? Oh, boys, mm. boys. Yes. Let's remember, there's a lady present. Let's be jolly boys, shall we? After all, this is supposed to be a tribute to the fair sex. That's right, it's a tribute to the fair sex. Say, how about... 
I dream of Jeannie with a light. Oh, I love that one, Horace. That's one of my very favorites. Do sing it. Yes, yeah, Jeannie. I dream yeah, of Just Jeannie a minute, please. Just a one light. minute. Huh? If you're going to sing, for heaven's sake, let somebody <laughs> sing the song who can sing it. Had a boy commission. Had a boy Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'll do this, Leela, and see if we can repair the damage. I dream of Leela. Yeah, yeah. With the light brown hair. Born like a zephyr on the summer. We'll be back again in just a moment. There's a well-known saying that names make news. And a few days ago, this change in a time-honored name made news in the food world. It was an announcement that the Kraft Cheese Company has changed its name to Kraft Foods Company. And here's the reason. Throughout 40 years, Kraft has built a reputation as maker of some of the world's finest cheese and cheese foods. But over the years, Kraft has created other top-quality food products. So the new company name is designed to include all these quality foods. And, of course, one of these important foods is parquet margarine, the delicious spread for bread that's a favorite of millions because of its superior quality and its fresh, delicate flavor. So in the future, look for the new name, Kraft Foods Company, on each package of delicious, economical parquet margarine. <laughs> Sweetheart of six other guys. <laughs> Good night, Leela. Good night, everybody. Yeah. The Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekham. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Do the children in your family like cheese? Then you can just bet they like Pabstet. It's so rich in mellow cheddar cheese flavor, so easy to digest. Pabstet is a cheese food that contains the nourishing food values of milk. And it's simply delicious, spread on bread or on crackers, or melted into a luscious cheese sauce for macaroni. And now that ration points are no longer required, you'll want to buy both delicious varieties, Golden Pabstet and Pimento Pabstet. Ask for Pabstep, the delicious cheddar cheese food, when you shop tomorrow. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. These are busy days for Summerfield's Commissioner of Public Water, and they call for a little relaxation in the evening. On this particular evening, he has permitted himself the pleasure of a few hours' diversion at the movies in the company of his attractive friend and neighbor, Mrs. Ransom. And at this particular moment, we find him at her front door saying good night. You'll have to be a little patient. He's still saying good night to her. Oh, gracious, you do say good night to a girl. Yeah. I'd. I'd ask you in, Throckmorton, only it's pretty late. Oh, that's all right. I don't have to get to the office until 10 tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> but I'll have to be downtown at the dentist at 9. Oh. And uh, I have to get my beauty sleep, you know. Hal Shoe might not like me anymore. <laughs> so uh, I think I'd better say good night. Well, I'll be seeing you then, Leela. Good night. Oh, Throckmorton. Yes? Never mind. What was it, Leela? Well, I was just wondering how I'd get down there tomorrow morning. But uh, as long as you're not going to the office till 10, I guess Horace Hooker wouldn't mind stopping for me. Well, now, wait a minute. You don't have to do that. There must be some way to work this thing out. But how? If you're not going to the office till 10. I know. What? I'll go to the office at 9. Uh. <laughs> oh, Throckmorton, you're so smart. <laughs> I declare you think of everything. <laughs> Yo, uh, you're sure you don't mind now? No. I, I wouldn't be putting you out. No. <laughs> Because I wouldn't want you changing your plans for me. Glad to do it. I'll pick you up tomorrow at a quarter of nine. Oh, thank you, Throckmorton. And thank you for a perfectly gorgeous evening. I don't know when I've enjoyed Abbott and Costello so much. <laughs> Why, George, it certainly doesn't take much to make a girl happy. I guess it's all in knowing how. Wonder if there's any of that fried chicken left. I might just look in the icebox before I... Marjorie. Hello. What's this, my dear? Up so late? You have school tomorrow. I know. What are you doing there? Writing. Writing what? A letter. A letter to who? Or shouldn't I ask? Oh, why can't I ever do anything right? Marjorie. Nothing I ever do is right. Nothing. I'm just a... Just a... I wish I were dead. No, no, my dear. You don't wish anything of the kind. I do, too. Why, that's ridiculous. Why, if you were dead, you wouldn't have any fun. I don't have any fun anyway. <laughs> that's why I wish I were dead. <laughs> oh, Marjorie, honey, don't do that. Come here. You're not mad at me, are you? No. And tell your old uncle what's the matter. I don't know what's the matter. There must be something wrong with me. All the boys I know either join the Navy or go away to school. <laughs> Is that all, my dear? Why, you had me worried there for a minute. Now, listen. You just go up and get a good night's sleep and you'll feel better. I can't. That's nonsense. You run along to bed and tomorrow morning you'll feel better. I guarantee it. Uncle Mort, you don't understand. Now, don't tell me that. I know all about these things. Yes, indeed. Sleep, that's what you need. <laughs> or would you like something to eat first? A little snack before you go to bed, huh? Some of that nice fried chicken, huh? I know what would fix you up. A hamburger. I could make you a hamburger. If Bertie's got any hamburger. How about it, huh? A nice hamburger with a slice of onions and relish, maybe, and 
ketchup all over it. <laughs> what do you say? Uncle Mort, don't you ever think of anything but your stomach? <laughs> Marjorie, I was just trying to suggest something. Oh, I'm but... sorry. I don't know what's wrong with me, Uncle Mort. Pay no attention to me. I guess I'll go to bed. Yes, you do that, my dear. You do that. You'll feel better in the morning. Poor kid. Well, I don't know what she's worrying about. I don't know whether to have the fried chicken or the hamburger. <laughs> Roy, when you finish monopolizing the sugar, you might let somebody else have some. Oh, sorry, I'm just sick. Four is plenty. Do you want to get diabetes? Now, what time is it? Bertie, what time is it out there by the kitchen clock? What time is it? Yeah, my watch has stopped. I'm sorry, Mr. Gilsey. The kitchen clock has stopped, too. Oh, fine. I'm supposed to pick up Mrs. Ransom at a quarter of nine. If anybody would wind any clocks around here... I wound it, Mr. Gillsleeve. I wound it all the further it would go. <laughs> well, maybe that's the trouble. When did the clock stop? July. Yeah, July. <laughs> Bertie, you ought to tell me about these things. Not, not wait till somebody needs to know what time it is. I told you, Mr. Gillsleeve. Never heard about it. Never heard a word about it. Mr. Gillsleeve, I told you about that clock once. I told you 20 times. That's right, Unc. I heard her. You eat your oatmeal. Okay. <laughs> Miss Marjorie, it seems like you ain't eating anything this morning, hardly. I guess I'm not very hungry, Bertie. You're awfully quiet, my dear. Anything wrong? No. I just don't feel very well, that's all. Oh, that's too bad. Maybe we'd better call Dr. Pettibone. Oh, it's not anything to call the doctor about. I think if I just stay home today and... Don't go to school. Well, perhaps that's a good idea. Ah! <laughs> Leroy, why can't you ever be decent for once? Why should I? Nobody ever lets me get away with anything. Gosh, I can be dying practically. Leroy. Leroy, something tells me it's about time you started the school. Yeah, me too. Is my lunch ready, Bertie? Right on the hall table there. Bye, Unc. Goodbye. Goodbye, Marge. Goodbye, Leroy. You mustn't feel badly, my dear. I don't think Leroy meant to hurt you. I don't mind about Leroy. He's probably right anyway. Why, Marjorie? Sure, he's right. I just don't want to go to school, that's all. I don't ever want to go to school. Because all I am is clumsy and unattractive and nobody will ever have anything to do with me. Marjorie! <laughs> Now, now, that's not true, my dear. Why, you're one of the most attractive girls I've ever seen. And graceful, too. No, I'm not. I'm a clumsy ox. The gym teacher said so. Listen, anybody... Anybody who says you're clumsy has got me to fight. When did the teacher say this? Yesterday, in ballet class. Right in front of everybody. My George, I'd like a word with that teacher. <laughs> What's the use of fooling myself? She's right. All the boys I know either leave town or join the Navy. I told you there was something wrong with me. Oh, brother, we're back to that again. Now, listen, my dear, this is all a lot of nonsense. Why, you're as graceful a girl as I ever knew. I was saying to myself only the other day, I said, Marjorie certainly is graceful. I got it. Uh-oh, Mrs. Ransom here quickly, Marjorie. Got a hanky? All right. Uh, be right with you, Leela. Come on in. Yes, and come right in. Oh, thank you. I'm afraid I'm a little early, so I just ran over to save you the truck. Why, Marjorie, honey. Hello. <laughs> it's all right, Leela. It's nothing at all. I was just telling Marjorie I think she's unusually graceful for a girl her age. Don't you think, Leela? Don't you think she's graceful? Oh, yes. Indeed, I do. Yes, indeed. But... Well, what? some fool teacher just made a remark. Woman's got no business teaching ballet or anything else. Yes, probably doesn't know a thing about it. She's probably got knock knees herself. <laughs> huh, Marjorie? <laughs> well, if you ask me, she's probably an old maid. That's right. Now, you just have to expect that, Marjorie. If there's one thing an old maid can't bear, it's the sight of a young girl who's prettier and more graceful and more attractive than she is. I've had that trouble all my life with old maids. <laughs> 
There, you hear that, my dear? This teacher just happens to be married. Oh, the married ones are worse, believe me. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think Marjorie could be a marvelous ballet dancer if she put her mind to it, don't you, Leela? Oh, I do, I truly do. Some of them are quite tall, you know. I don't care anything about ballet. I only took it to get out of gym. I just don't want people thinking that oh, I... Oh, but you should, Marjorie. Well, I don't know anything more wonderful than being a ballerina. They lead such glamorous lives, don't they, Frank Martin? Huh? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, that's right. Why, why, just think of having the whole world at your feet. It's not bad, eh? Oh. <laughs> think what fun it would be, Marjorie. Flowers at every performance and people kissing your hand and suitors, loads of them always hanging around your dressing room. I'd send them away. All I do is study and work till I was really good. Of course. But when you finally arrived, think of it. Diamond necklaces. Uh-huh. And, and college boys pulling your carriage through the streets. Uh-huh. <laughs> and gentlemen drinking champagne from your slipper. Yeah. <laughs> and husbands. Why, some of these girls have as many as four and five of them. All rich. Oh, Uncle Mort, do you really think I could? Have five husbands? <laughs> no, be a dancer. A really good one, I mean. My dear, it's my firm conviction that anybody can do anything he wants if you just put his mind to it. Anything at all. Is that how you got to be a water commissioner? <laughs> no, that's an example of what can happen if you don't put your mind to it. <laughs> Oh, well, just the same your uncle's right, Marjorie. You could show that old gym teacher if you really wanted to. Think it over. That's right. You think it over, my dear. Come along, Lily. You'll be late to the dentist. Oh, gracious, what time is it? Uncle Mort. Uncle Mort, wait. Uh, what is it, my dear? Could you... Could you drop me at school on the way? Certainly, certainly. Only too happy to do so. Feeling better, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me I don't know how to handle girls. Why, I ought to be running a school. <laughs> Well, how did school go today, my dear? School? Oh, school was all right. I talked to Francie today, Uncle Mort, and guess what? She's going to be a dancer, too. Well, that's quite a coincidence. We decided we don't care what the old gym teacher says. We decided she doesn't know anything anyway. We're going to practice every afternoon, Francie and I, so we're really good. Well, that's fine. That's fine. I guess so, Leela. Just throw it. Thanks. Pick it up when you get through reading it. I always do. How can you say that? Do you have to read it on the floor, Leroy? Where else? Well, it just happens that I'd like to show Uncle Mort something. Go ahead, my dear. But I have to have room. It's what Francie and I were practicing this afternoon. Pick up the paper, Leroy. Oh, for corn's sake. I can't even read in peace around here. Now, Marjorie, what were you going to show me? Well, these are the positions you have to learn for ballet. You really ought to have music for this. But anyway, this is the first position. Well, very graceful. Ah! No, Leroy. (laughs) And this is what they call the second position. Well, like a regular ballet dancer. You call that dancing? Perhaps you could do better. Sure. Chase me. I'm a butterfly. Leroy. I'm the south wind. Woo-hoo. Make him stop. Kiss me. I'm a piece of thistle now. Leroy, watch that lamp. Whoop. <laughs> I was watching it. Yeah. <laughs> Very funny, thistle down. But you want to know something? A little instruction in dancing wouldn't hurt you one bit. What? I mean it. I have a good mind to have you take dancing lessons. Oh, no. Dancing lesson. It might teach you a little grace, wouldn't it, Marjorie? I doubt it. Well, it might at least <laughs> might at least teach you to walk through a room without falling over those feet. Besides, every boy ought to learn to dance. It's an important social accomplishment. But when would I take lessons? I haven't any time. I have to practice my piano every afternoon. You don't want me to neglect that, do you? My piano? I haven't heard you practice in days. <laughs> Well, I've been intending to. I've been intending to right along. I didn't want to get stale, that's all. I'm going to start again tomorrow. I know, Uncle Mort. Leroy could play the piano for me to practice to. Great idea. Hey, nothing 
do it. Leroy, you'll play the piano for your sister. Oh, um. You love the piano so much, let me see you sit down there and play. Now. Now. Gosh. Ready, Marjorie? One, two, three. <laughs> Oh, very pretty, my dear. And very nice, Leroy. I ask you, was there ever so much talent in one family? <laughs> By George, I've got a good mind to retire. <laughs> Great Gildersleeve will be back in just a moment. You know, I've always been a bit curious about what makes people buy one kind of food in preference to another. So I asked my wife the other day why she preferred parquet margarine. Well, as I recall it, John, some of us were talking about spreads for bread. Well, one of the girls mentioned what a wonderful flavor parquet margarine has. So you went right out and bought some, eh? Well, no. It was a few days later that I noticed parquet in the store. And I thought it was a real money saver. Only about half the price of costly spreads. Then that's why you bought parquet. Well, partly. Then I saw the name Kraft on the package. And when I put it on the table, you and the children kept calling for more. Yes, sir. Day in and day out, it's the best spread I ever tasted. And parquet margarine is a favorite with millions of families. Because parquet's flavor is still unmatched. And just to remind you, don't forget that the Kraft Cheese Company is now the Kraft Foods Company. So when you buy delicious, economical parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine, remember it's a quality product of the Kraft Foods Company. Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve, whom we find relaxing in his parlor before supper with the evening paper. At least he's trying to relax with his niece, Marjorie, diligently trying to master the ballet with the aid of a portable phonograph. Auntie, watch me, Auntie. Huh? I did it perfect that time. Didn't you see it? I'm sorry, my dear. One of the headlines caught my eye. Great. Now be sure and watch this time. I will. Are you watching? Oh, yes, I'm watching. Don't you think I'm doing it better? Yes, much better. That's fine. Don't you think you ought to rest a little while, my dear? Oh, gosh, I'm not tired. I've been sitting down all day. This relaxes me. Just don't overdo it, Marjorie. Don't worry, Anki. Hi, everybody. Well, hello, Leroy. Oh, for heaven's sake. Hi, Elk. Hi, Marge. Hey, look what I traded from Piggy. A real army rifle. What? Look, look what it says there. U.S. Army. Oh, it's nothing but a wooden gun. Okay, it's wood, but it's official. <laughs> they use them for training. Oh? Yep, U.S. Army. Some gun, hey, Elk? <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't point that thing at me, Leroy. <laughs> Why, George, is pretty good, all right. What did you have to trade Piggy for it? Well, I got it cheap because his cousin sent him two. What did you give Piggy? Just the front tire off my bike. It was shot anyway. <laughs> Leroy, but you can't ride it without a front tire. It'll cost you $3 for a new one. Where are you going to get $3? I'll save up my allowance. Don't worry about it, Uncle. Your allowance. Let me see the gun. Okay. See, it's got everything... Trigger, barrel, all the stuff. They don't work, do they? No, but they look good. Feels good against your shoulder, doesn't it? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I'll get a bead on that light bulb. Squeeze that trigger easy. Bang! Oh, for heaven's sake, you're worse than Leroy. Yeah. <laughs> My dear. <laughs> If you children will excuse me, I think I'll go into my study till supper time. Okay, Uncle. Look, Leroy, don't you think I'm doing better? Better? Oh, yes. 
uh, stuffy in here. A little quieter, though. <laughs> Well, the Tigers finally made it. Wish I'd go to Chicago and see the World Series. Uncle Mort, will you make Leroy go upstairs, please? Oh, why don't you go upstairs yourself? No, no, what is this? Can I leave you children alone a minute without a row? Well, I can't practice my dancing with Leroy in the room. What did I do? I never opened my mouth. He was looking at me. Then he started pointing that gun at me. <laughs> Oh, my dear, you've had quite a little time in the parlor. You can't have it to yourself exclusively. But if you want me to practice my dance... Why don't you take the phonograph upstairs for a little while, huh? Then there won't be anybody to disturb you. But my room is so small. You may take it in my room. I have no objection. Okay, I'll go up there for a while. You want Leroy to help you with the machine? No, he'd probably drop it. Uh, let me see your gun again, will you, Leroy? Sure, play with it all you want. <laughs> You know, it feels just right. Must have some weight inside of it someplace. I guess so. I wonder if I can remember the manual of arms. Let me see. You start with it down here. Huh? That's order arms. And that old tarp sergeant will holler, right shoulder, hop. One, two, three. Yeah, that's pretty good, huh? Can you do any more? Sure. When he wants you to put it down again, he says, order, hop. One, two, three. Hey, neat. Show me how to do it, will you, Unc? Sure. Now, you see, it's all a matter of rhythm. One. <laughs> What's the matter, Unc? I've lost my rhythm. Uh, Leroy, will you tell your sister I've gone out for a little walk? Oh, you can't take it, huh? Nothing of the kind, my boy. I simply feel the need of a little fresh air. <laughs> Judge, that'll be the same as usual, dollar eighty. <laughs> and four cents for the governor. You may charge it, Phoebe. Yes, sir. Judge Hooker's liver powder, one eighty four. You've made a pretty good thing out of my liver, Phoebe. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. Dollar <laughs> eighty a month for ten years? Of course it used to be a dollar fifty. <laughs> well, the cost of liver is going up. <laughs> Very funny. I don't suppose there's any chance this stuff will affect a permanent cure of my condition. Well, I wouldn't want to say. Oh, here's Mr. Gillisley. Well, good evening, gentlemen. Picking up something for your liver, Horace? I came in to purchase some cigars, Gillisley. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to lie about why I'm here, Horace. I don't want to buy a thing, Peavy. Just came out for a little walk, that's all. <laughs> Very athletic, isn't he, Peavy? Yes, I am. So is my whole family. My nephew, Leroy, is at home right now practicing the manual of arms. My niece, Marjorie, is practicing ballet dancing. Wasting their time. Leroy will never have to go to war, and Marjorie will never be a dancer. Oh, you think not? Marjorie's very graceful. Shows real aptitude. She may decide to make a career of the ballet. You don't say. Yes. <laughs> Well, I understand the good ones have to study it for about 25 years, is that right? Well, I That's right, know. Phoebe. By the time Marjorie's equipped to dazzle an audience, she'll be um, 43 years of age. I don't believe it. With old-fashioned methods, maybe so. But these days, she could be a top ballerina in five or six years. Has Marjorie got her heart set on this, Mr. Gildersleeve, or is it your idea? Well, both, Phoebe. She seems to have a real talent for it, and I certainly don't intend to stand in her way. Why? Oh, nothing. No, no, Peavy, I value your opinions. What's on your mind? Well, I just wondered, is is that the kind of life you'd choose for a nice young girl? What's the matter with it? Dancing is fine exercise. Keeps her in tip-top physical condition. Yeah, but what about her moral condition? <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, what about those fellas hanging around the stage door with bouquets and so on? I, I'm speaking only from hearsay, of course. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you don't know anything about it. Well, I know something about it. And if you let Marjorie go on with this nonsense, pretty soon she'll be wanting to live in some place like Chicago or New York. She'll be getting a divorce every other day. You don't really believe that, do you, Judge? I certainly do. Do you, Peavy? 
That's the way of the world, Mr. Gillyfinger. You're just a couple of old women. You're worrying about my niece being led astray by millionaires when she can't even do a two-step. Well, I thought you said she was already quite a dancer. Well, I may have exaggerated a little bit. The girl has talent. She's interested. But good heavens, she's only 16. This may be just a passing fancy. Seems to me you're a little excited, Gildy. I'm as cool as a cucumber, you old goat. <laughs> I'll leave you two to worry about Marjorie. I'm going home to admire her dancing. Goodbye, Mr. Gildersleeve. Goodbye, Gildy. Goodbye, Judge. Don't forget to take your medicine. <laughs> yes, I wonder if there's anything in what those old ninnies said back there. Uncle Mort, is that you? Yes, my dear, it's me. You've got to do something for me. What's that? The phonograph. It's terrible. It sounds so tinny. Couldn't we do something about it? Couldn't we get a new one? Well, now, let's not put any money into this. But I need it to practice with. But, my dear, this whole thing might turn out to be just a passing fancy. Oh, no. I'm serious about this, Uncle Moore. But it might take 20 years. Not me. The teacher told me today I'm already showing improvements. Oh. Well, I'm glad you're improving, Marjorie. But let's not overdo, shall we? But I'm so encouraged. I'm determined to succeed now. I'm going to practice every minute that I can. <laughs> Marjorie, for heaven's sake, industry is all very well, but I think it'd be nice if you'd relax for a few minutes before supper. I will in five minutes, Unky. I just want to practice my leap a few more times. Your what? My leap. It's beautiful. Where do you see it? Yeah, leap. <laughs> Arms no, out. confound it. Haven't you got anything to do with play with guns? Gosh, I didn't do anything. Holy cow, you don't have to jump on me. You're right, my boy. I shouldn't take it out on you. <laughs> How long can this go on? Why don't you tell me to quit? <laughs> well, she's a girl, Leroy. Girls have to be human. Yeah, I suppose. Do you really think she'll ever be any good? Do you? I doubt it. Do you think a plaster will fall down? I suppose so. James, they're too much for me. Yeah. Have a cigar, Leroy. <laughs> We'll hear more from the great Gildersleeve in just a few moments. Does your family like French bread, the kind that comes in long, slender loaves with a crisp, crunchy crust? In our house, we stack the bread plate whenever French bread is served. And my, how quickly it disappears, especially when there's delicious, satisfying parquet margarine to spread on it. Yes, sir. You see, Kraft takes special care in making parquet margarine. Selected wholesome products of American farms are skillfully blended in parquet, and then it's rushed flavor-fresh to your food dealer. That's why millions prefer parquet margarine to any other brand. That's why parquet's flavor is still unmatched. Try it soon for a real flavor treat. Tomorrow, buy delicious, economical parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by the Kraft Foods Company. I didn't really give him the cigar. I smoked it myself. Good night, folks. <laughs> the Great Children's Slave is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meacham. This is John Lang speaking to the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of The Great Children's Slave. Ladies, here's how to make leftovers not seem like leftovers at all. It's easy with Pabstet, the delicious cheddar cheese food. First, make a luscious golden cheese sauce with Pabstet and a little milk. Then pour this appetizing Pabstet cheese sauce on leftovers of meat, fish, vegetables, or rice, and you have a brand new delicious main dish treat. Remember, Pabstet comes in two tempting varieties, golden Pabstet and pimento Pabstet. It's ration-free, so buy delicious, nourishing Pabstet cheese food when you shop tomorrow. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. It's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Let us journey now to Summerfield. Summerfield, the city of homes, nestling like a pearl in the golden setting of the autumn countryside. Trees. Trees are one of the loveliest features of this lovely little town. Shimmering poplars, stately elms, giant maples lining the quiet streets. And as they turn from crimson to gold, the leaves come drifting down. And as the leaves come drifting, in each front yard we find a small boy raking, raking away for dear life. Ah, the simple joys of youth, the rich reward of living close to nature. For as he reaps the golden harvest, raking the leaves into orderly piles, ever and anon comes the playful wind and scatters them. Oh, for corn's sake! How am I going to get anywhere with this? Find where to spend Saturday. If he wants a long rake, why doesn't he come out and do it himself? Well, Leroy, that was quick. Finished already? Are you kidding? Excuse me, Mr. Gilfried. Is it all right if I clear away the dishes? Go right ahead, Bertie. You're finished, aren't you, Marjorie? What? Oh, yes. Just leave the coffee, Bertie. I always like a little coffee with my morning paper. Yes, sir. You sure do. <laughs> <laughs> now, Leroy, what seems to be the trouble? Why aren't you out raking leaves? It's a darn the minute I rake them up, they blow away before I can get them in the basket. Well, uh, I need somebody to help me. Help you? That's ridiculous. All right, how would you do it? Well, there's a will, there's a way, my boy. Yeah. Huh? Uh. <laughs> I'll tell you what. If you finish raking up the yard by this afternoon, I may have a nice surprise for you. What? You're invited to a birthday party. Yeah? Who's? I said you'd be delighted to come, provided you finish up your work first. Yeah, yeah. Whose party? Little Craig Bullard's. I think it was very nice of his mother to ask you. She called up a few minutes ago. That does it. I give up. I quit. I'm not going to any party with any kindergartners. Kit, I told her, Leroy, that you would come. Gosh, I think I might have something to say about it. I think you might have asked me. I don't have to ask you, my boy, because you're going, and that's all there is to it. Gosh, there goes my Saturday. All right, now you're going out and rake those leaves. Okay, but I need somebody to help me. Why can't Marge help me? She's not doing anything. I'm busy. Yeah, reading a book. Go rake the leaves, Leroy. (laughs) I don't see how she gets to read at the table. You'll never let me. She's right, my dear. You know the rule, no reading at the table. What about you? This is different. I'm reading the newspaper. Merely trying to keep abreast of the times. She's still reading, Unc. What's the book, Marjorie? The Art of Ballet Dancing. Tweet, tweet. Leroy, what did I tell you? You go out and rake the leaves. Well, I don't see why I have to be the only one that ever does any work around here. Now, that is a gross misstatement of fact. Well, if anybody ever caught you lifting a finger around here, they'd drop dead. Oh, <laughs> I'll leave it to anybody. I'll leave it to Bertie. How about it, Bertie? What's that, Leroy? Yes, Bertie, how about it? Don't I do twice as much work around here as Unc? Well, Bertie? I pass. <laughs> She's afraid to say so. She's afraid if she tells the truth, you'll fire her. Leroy. Okay, okay. Leroy, you hadn't ought to talk to your uncle like that. Just leave this to me, Bertie. Leroy didn't mean nothing, Miss Gilson. Just leave this to me. Young man. I'm going, on. You will rake the entire yard, front and back. Every inch of it. Every leaf, every twig, every pebble. All of it? He. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, I'm going. Yes, by George. 
there's one thing I demand of a boy, it's respect. Why shouldn't it? Why shouldn't I take a little... Well, take it easy. Yeah, why shouldn't I? I work hard at the office all week, trying to support everybody. And I come home here... Well, Marjorie? If you'll excuse me, I think I'll go upstairs. Marjorie, this is a matter of discipline. This is... If you ask me, a man's entitled to a little rest. After he's worked hard all week. Besides, a boy ought to learn to help around the house. Acquire the proper work habits. That's important. I had to learn to work when I was a boy. Through with your coffee now, Mr. Gilsley? Yes, Bertie. What's on your mind? I didn't say nothing. No, but you're thinking something. <laughs> now, what is it? Well, I was just thinking that's an awful big yard with such a little boy to have to rake. Oh, all right, I'll rake the yard myself. Ye gods! Rake, rake, rake. Where does it get you? Like bailing water with a sieve. Sure, sure, get a little place rake clean and more of them fall down. The more you rake, the more there are. Oh, darn wind. That's right, go on, blow them all over the lot. Well? What you doing, Gilday? What does it look like I'm doing, Hooker? Baking a cake. I never thought I'd live to see the day. The great Gildersleeve actually working. I wish I'd brought my brownie. <laughs> Judge, if you have nothing better to do than scoff at honest toil, I suggest you proceed on your way. Oh, I haven't come to scoff, Gildy. I've come to admire. All I ask is to be allowed to stand here and watch you. This is something I want to tell my grandchildren about. <laughs> you optimist. Look, Judge. <laughs> judge, I have no time to waste on heavy-handed wit. You're going to hang around, grab a basket, and get to work. Don't you wish it. <laughs> oh, goat. What you doing, Trock Martin? Sue. <laughs> You're about the tenth person who's come along here and asked me what I was doing, Leela. Ye gods, can't they see what I'm doing? Well, it's not that they can't see it, Throckmorton. They can't believe it. <laughs> you too? <laughs> what you gonna do with the leaves, Burnham? I suppose so. Oh, good. I love the smell of burning leaves, don't you? Makes me cough. Oh, but it's so, so romantic. Somehow burning leaves always remind me of fall. Don't they use Rock Martin remind you of fall? Naturally, that's the only time you can burn them. <laughs> I declare, I don't believe you have an ounce of romance in your nature, Rock Martin. Oh, I don't know. Didn't you used to play in the leaves when you were a child? Didn't you ever get a great big pile of leaves and just fling yourself into it? Once. Well? I went right through it. <laughs> I was a little heavy in those days. <laughs> Martin, did you ever play Babes in the Woods? Babes in the Woods? How do you do that? <laughs> well, it takes two. I lie down and you cover me up with leaves. And then you pretend you're a big bear and you come crawling around looking for me. <laughs> and uh, what if I find you? Oh, you always find me. You know where you buried me. <laughs> Well, where's the game? What do I do when I find you? What do bears always do, silly? They give you a bear hug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so scary and such fun. Look, I'll show you. All right. Hey, Leela, look out. My leaves. I just finished waking those up. Oh, I beg your pardon. I mean, don't mess them up. That's all. I wouldn't think of 
are disturbing your leaves for the world, Throckmorton. Well, you don't have to get angry, Leela. Angry over a silly little old game like Babes in the Wood? Gracious, I don't know what you're thinking of. Well, that's good. But if you should ever feel like a game of pin the tail on the donkey, let me know. I know just where to pin it. Oh! I'll leave you to your precious leaves. Hmm. <laughs> Well, hello, P.B. Raking leaves, I think. Yeah, you hit it right on the head, P.B. Well, you got a nice day for it. It's not too hot, and on the other hand, it's not too cold. <laughs> no, just about right. That's what I say. When you come right down to it, I believe the fall of the year is just about my favorite season. That's so? Of course, winter is nice if you're prepared for it. So is spring. And then there's summer. Too true. On the other hand, you can run into bad weather. Any time at all. Yes, sir, I've seen some awful winters. Some terrible springs and falls. Uh, tell me, Mr. Gildersleeve, if you don't mind my inquiring. Yes? How do you come to be doing this, this... Raking. Lose a bet? Ye gods, Peter. Is there anything so strange about this? I suppose you've never seen a man rake leaves before. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> but I will say this. I, I've never seen you rake them. What is this? Conspiracy? Who sent you over here, Peavy? Why, nobody. I, I was just... Somebody a... sent you over here to heckle me. Now, admit it. Mr. Gilbert, I, I was just on my way home. Was it Hooker? Well, I own I did run into the judge on the way. Yeah, I knew it. Why, George, I'd like to know what this country's coming to when a man can't put around his own front yard without getting a lot of so-called wit and a lot of free advice from every Tom, Dick, and Harry that comes down the street. Is that democracy, Peavy? Is that what we've been fighting for? Well, is it? I beg your pardon. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. I'll tell you what it is. I'll tell you what I think it is. It's communism. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. Yes, it is. It's communism. Everybody minding everybody else's business. Mr. Gildersleeve, not so right. Well, I'm ready for him. Let him come. I got a shotgun right upstairs in my bedroom closet. Let him come. Mr. Gildersleeve, nobody is coming. What's that? I say nobody is coming. Oh, no. <laughs> of course not. How did we get started on communism? I don't know. I said something about the weather. I believe I remarked that it was a nice day. Nice day for raking leaves. Yes, it is. Fine day. Well, I guess you'll want to be getting on with it. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Gilder. Uh, goodbye, Peavy. Glad you dropped by. Where's that rake? Oh! Who left that upside down? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you, Craig. I'm going to ask you to guess. Where's Leroy? I want him to play with me. Leroy? He's around someplace, I guess. I want him to play with me. Well, come to think of it, I guess he went downtown. No, no. Here he comes now. Hello, Leroy. You want to play with me? Oh, hi, Craig. No, I don't want to play. I'll see you when the party starts. I want to play now. Scram, kid. <laughs> Leroy. <laughs> Leroy, I'm surprised at you. That's no way. If Craig wants to play, well, confound it, play. Oh, for corn's sake. Hey, that's quite a pile of leaves you got there, Unc. Just shows what steady work will do, my boy. What are you going to do, burn them? Yeah, you got a match? What would I be doing with matches? I don't know, but I've always suspected you of carrying them. <laughs> well, I'll just have to go in the house and get one, I guess. I see you're not going to offer to them. Did you get me a present, Leroy? Yeah, I got one. How much did it cost? Buck? Is that all? That's all my uncle would give me, and if you don't like the present, just give it back, that's all. What is it? None of your business. I'll bring it when I come to the party. Okay. My, mom, my mother ordered four hamburgers for every kid that's coming. Four apiece? That's what she said. I heard her. And three kinds of ice cream. Ice cream or sherbet? Ice cream. Gosh. After, summer, ma after supper, a magician is coming to do tricks. A magician? A real one? Sure, a real one. My father's going to pay him. Hey, neat. Boy, this might be a pretty good party after all. Huh? Uh, it sounds like a swell party. 
Do you think the magician will need an assistant? You know, somebody like me that knows his stuff. I don't know. I want to play. Well, sure, Craigie, old boy, let's play. What do you want to play, huh? Oh, wait, here comes Uncle. Boy, now we'll have a bonfire. Hey, boy, stand back. You hear? Get out of the way. I thought I told you and Craig to play. Well, we are. We were just about to start, weren't we, Craigie? We were just deciding what to play. I know what I want to do. Okay, what is it? Let's run through this pile of leaves. <laughs> I don't think that's a very good idea, Craig. I want to run through the leaves. Come on, Leroy. Gosh, I don't know. Now, you boys find something sensible to do, huh? There are plenty of nice games. I want to run through the leaves. You must not run through the leaves, Craig. I've spent all morning raking these leaves together. Come on, Leroy. Let's run through the leaves. No, I don't think we'd better, Craig. Well, I'm going to. Come on, it's fun. Don't do it, Craig. Here I come. Whee! Oh, boy, you little... Come here. Come here, you little... Well, hello, Craig. Hello, Gildersleeve. Oh, hello, Bullard. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> I was just escorting little Craigie across the street. <laughs> <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be back from across the street in just a moment. Say, ladies, did this ever happen in your kitchen? Gosh, Mom, something smells awful good. Oh, boy, fresh baked bread. Right you are, Johnny. I just took some bread and rolls out of the oven. Can I have some now? Please, Mom. Well, they've got to cool off a bit first. Anyway, you like them best spread with parquet margarine. And Dad used the last bit of parquet on his breakfast toast this morning. Oh, gee, Mom. Oh, cheer up, Johnny. I phoned the grocery, and he says that the craft truck delivered some fresh parquet to his store just an hour ago. Then here I go. I'll be right back, Mom, with some parquet. Oh, boy. Fresh rolls and fresh parquet. And that's the kind of enthusiasm you'll find in millions of American homes for the fresh, delicate flavor of parquet margarine, a fine, fresh flavor that's still unmatched. Parquet is mighty nourishing, too, high in food energy and fortified with important vitamin A. And parquet is easy on your food budget, only about half the price of costly spreads. So tomorrow, buy delicious, economical parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet Margarine, made by the Kraft Foods Company. Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. Leroy has raked the leaves together again, and now his uncle thinks it's time to burn them. Hey, Uncle, can I light up the pile? Can I, I rake them up? You might light it, Leroy. The laborer is worthy of his hire. Give me a match. Here, two matches. That's all a Boy Scout is supposed to need. I'll get by with one. Just watch. Uh -huh. There. She's going, Unc. Seems to be. Uh, why don't you light it on the other side, my boy, too, huh? Get her going faster. Good idea. Boy, she'll be roaring in a minute. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Smells good, doesn't it? Super. Hey, the wind acts like a regular bellows. Look, it's red hot. Hold the pile down with a rake, Leroy. We don't want this thing to get away from us. Okay. Boy, is that hot. Yes, sir. Well, I'll bet it... Oop, <clears throat> give me that rake. Darn wind. Hey, you better give me the rake. The pile's starting to blow away. Oh, on your toes, Leroy. Stamp it out over there. Okay, I got it. Oh, my goodness. Look out, Leroy. Get that little patch over there. I'm getting one over here. Oh, ah, it's hot. Yeah, it's blowing across the street, Leroy. Patches, we must let this thing spread. It's burning. Hey, it's an old man's board's head. Oh, they'll put it out. Gosh, his head is burning. Hey, what the devil's going on here? What do you think's going on, Bullard? We're trying to put out a fire. Yeah, in my head. Huh? Gildersleeve, that fire break cost me 50 cents a plant. If I lose Keep it... Keep your I... shirt on. We're getting it under control. Yeah, it's out now, Uncle. Great. Well, get back on those other places. Okay. What's the devil with the idea of trying to burn leaves on a windy day in the first place? It was not windy when I started. You're crazy. It's been windy all day. Not a breath of air. Well, if my head had burned, I'd have called the police. I have a half a mind to call them anyway. I dare you. I'll sue you for false arrest. If you'll come down off your porch, I'll... Come on down, brother. <laughs> I wouldn't bother. Get off my property. Why, you... And another thing. 
Tell that nephew of yours we need to come to Craig's birthday party this evening. Oh, I wouldn't let Leroy come to Craig's birthday party if he wanted to. Um, Why, even if your kid was... The coward. Well, I guess I told him. Now, Leroy, stop moping about Craig's party. It's all your own fault if you miss it. My fault? Told you it was too windy for a fire. You've been more alert. Never gotten into Bullard's hedge. What if it did? You didn't have to offer to punch him in the nose. Gosh, every time I get a chance for some fun, you manage to spoil it. Leroy, I'm sorry. If there's anything I... What are you looking at, Leroy? Just looking out the window. Is it against the rules to look out the window? No, no, of course not. I... There's the truck from the meat market. Oh? They're getting four hamburgers for each kid. <laughs> some kids wouldn't want that many, so there's sure to be some left over. <laughs> I probably could have had six. Well, well, I'm beginning to see what's bothering you, my boy. You're hungry. All that work and then that excitement putting out the fire. Maybe we can have hamburger over here, too. How'd that be, hmm? Doesn't matter what we eat. But gosh, missing all the fun. Fun? I'll probably cook the hamburgers outdoors. Regular picnic. A picnic. The very thing. We'll have one ourselves right here. Where? Right here in our cozy little parlor. We we'll light the fire, and you and Marjorie and I will have a picnic. We'll make popcorn, toast marshmallows, and roast apples. Ever eat a roast apple? No. Nope. Best thing you ever tasted. We'll have more fun than the Bullards ever thought of having, Leroy. Bye, George. Leroy, what are you looking at now? There's the ice cream truck. <laughs> Gosh, a whole freezer. Leroy, let's look on the bright side, huh? After all, this morning, you didn't even want to go to Craig's party. This morning, I didn't know he was going to have all this stuff. Yeah. Uh. Holy cow, this is going to be the best party in years. Now, now. What am I going to do with this lousy present? You may keep it. I don't want it. Well, then throw it away. Take it back to the store and exchange it. I don't care about the present. I want to go to the party. Leroy, cheer up, huh? We're going to have a lot of fun right here. Yeah. You bet. (laughs) Marjorie! Marjorie! What is it? Come on downstairs. We're going to have a picnic. Smell those roasting apples, Leroy. Don't they smell good? I guess so. Have you done in a minute? Time to pop the popcorn. Where is the popcorn, Marjorie? What? I said, where's the popcorn? Oh, there's the box up in the mantel. Gee, we've had that stuff for years. Oh, no matter. It's always good. (laughs) I'd like to see you take a little more interest in our picnic, my dear. We can't have any fun if you're just going to sit there reading a book. We can't have any fun anyway. (laughs) We can't have any if we don't try, my boy. Put your book away, my dear. We're going to make popcorn. Well, we can't all do it. Let Leroy do it. Leroy's going to toast marshmallows. You make the popcorn. Marshmallows. Popcorn. Here, Leroy. Here's a toasting fork. Nice long one. Here are the marshmallows. Now, Marjorie, we'll pour some corn into the popper. There. Now, in no time at all, those little kernels will be big, white, crunchy tidbits. You sound just like a radio announcer. Huh? Here. You have to shake the popper over the fire, my dear. Okay. Leroy, you take the... Leroy, what are you looking at now? The kids are starting to arrive. There's Donald Kelsey and Robert Rosenblatt. Leroy, what do you care who goes to their old party? We're having our own party here. There's Peter Fisher. There's Piggy. Stop looking out of that window, Leroy. I forbid you to look out of that window anymore. Oh, gosh, I want to see the magician. The magician. Leroy, what do you think? The roast apples are done. How about a nice roast apple, huh? I'm not very hungry. You'll be hungry when you taste this. Where's the plate? I'll pull one apple out of the fire just for you. Bertie, bring me a plate, quick. Yes, sir, right away. How's the popcorn coming along, my dear? It isn't. Huh? Well, shake it. Never get any places holding it still. Here's a plate, Mr. Gilsley. Is that all you wanted? That's fine. Thank you, Bertie. Yeah, I'll have to brush the ashes off this. There. Now, Leroy, you just sink your teeth into that and tell me if you've ever tasted anything finer. Okay. Careful. Hot. Yeah. Better blow on it. Okay. (laughs) Now. Why, it tastes just like baked apples. It does? And I hate baked apples. (laughs) 
Oh, for heaven's sake. Well, we'll forget the baked apples. Let's get back to the marshmallow and the popcorn. How's it coming, Marjorie? It's dead, Uncle Mort. I think it's too old to pop. Nonsense, my dear. Here, let me give it a shake. Hmm. Devil's the matter with it. Come on, you little pop. <laughs> I'm not putting the stuff in these poppers anymore. <laughs> Pour in another batch, my dear. But, Uncle Morris... Do as I say. I'm going to the door. Oh, good evening, Mr. Gildersleeve. Who's that? Oh, hello, Mrs. Bullard. I came over to see what's happened to Leroy. Why isn't he at Craig's party? Leroy was canceled by Mr. Bullard. <laughs> my goodness. Now, isn't that ridiculous? I couldn't believe it when Rumson told me. Of course we want Leroy at the party. Why, Craig simply adores him, and so do I. Well, he... Rumson Bullard, don't hang back there like a thief in the night. You come up here and straighten this thing out. I was just coming, my dear. <laughs> oh, uh, hello, Gildersleeve. Hello. <laughs> well... Well, Rumson? Uh, well, uh, I'll tell you, Gildersleeve. I'm afraid I lost my temper this afternoon. No, no, Bullard. I lost mine. Well, you had reason to lose yours. I, uh, it seems to me I threatened to call the police. Mercy. He was right, Mrs. Bullard. He should have called them. No, no, no. Nonsense. <laughs> Little accident. No damage done. I'm tired of that Barbary hedge anyway. I don't like... I mean, it's a beautiful hedge. <laughs> I wouldn't have injured it for the world. Well, anyway, Gildersleeve, I'm sorry. And I do hope Leroy can change his plans and come to Craig's party. Oh, boy, can I? Oh. Just wait till I get Craigie's present. <laughs> well, I guess Leroy can arrange it, all right. Oh, I'm so glad. Here it is. All wrapped up. Box of crayons. I hope he likes it. So long, Uncle. Hey, goodbye, Leroy. Have a good time. Don't worry. Uh, say, wait a sec. Will you, Mrs. Bullard? I want to tell my sister something. Say, Marge... You no, know, I'm going to Bullets after all. I know. Well, the only thing is, I've worked pretty hard trying to fix up all this stale stuff over here. So, pretend you think it's fun, will you? All right. Okay. Goodbye, Marge. Goodbye, Aunt. And now, a word from our sponsor, the Kraft Foods Company. Uh, just a minute, Mr. Lung. Uh, Lang. Uh, <laughs> it just happens that the sponsor has given me this time this evening, so shove over. Well, go ahead. Get off the property. <laughs> Folks, the war is over, but there's still millions of our men in the service who are a long way from home. They aren't going to get home for Thanksgiving or for Christmas or for a long time after that. If we can't bring all the boys home, let's do what we can to bring a little bit of home to them. We can do that through the National War Fund which provides them with movies and entertainment and such other comforts as can be brought into camp life. Of course, the War Fund also provides for the relief of our allies abroad and for many important community needs at home. I don't know any way that you can make a dollar go farther or do more good. So when they come around to ask you to contribute, be generous, will you? Good night, everybody. The Great Gilder Swave is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekin. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Think of it. Here's a cheese food you can serve in a hundred delightful ways. It's Pabstet, the delicious cheddar cheese food that spreads, melts, slices, toasts to perfection. That means you can use Pabstet to pep up meals from soup right through dessert. And it's really delicious in sandwiches and appetizers, too. Pabstet helps supply the nourishing food values of milk. And it comes in two tempting varieties, golden cheddar Pabstet and pimento Pabstet. Be sure to buy Pabstet, the delicious cheddar cheese food, on your very next shopping trip. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. <laughs> it's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by The Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Let us descend now through the magic of atomic power to the little home of the great Gildersleeve in Summerfield. We pass down through the weathered shingles of Gildersleeve's roof through the attic where the dress form stands guard over trunks and boxes of forgotten summer clothes. On down through Gildersleeve's bedroom where his niece Marjorie is posing before the full-length mirror in a ballet skirt. Down, 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 until we come to rest at last in the Gildersleeve kitchen where Bertie moves quietly about her kingdom. Well, Bertie, what's for supper? Hmm, smells good. If I tell you now, you're going to get no surprise when you sit down and eat it. <laughs> well, all right, I'll wait. After all, Bertie, I know it'll be good. Uh, Bertie, I'd like to have something kind of special tomorrow night if we could. Company? Miss Goodwin. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can we have something extra nice, huh? How are the red points? Well, sir, we're running a little ahead of ourselves, as usual, but I'll dream up something. Chicken, maybe? I'll think of something. Duck? <laughs> Mr. Gilsleeve, I don't know exactly what it'll be, but it'll taste like red points, even if it ain't. <laughs> you better stand back now while I add a few little touches for the night. Oh, uh, those little touches. All right, Bertie, I'll leave everything in your hands. Paper and it's airtight. Leroy, is this telephone conversation still going on? Uh, just a sec, Unc. Ah, oh, Piggy, will you listen just once? It's a T formation. The ball is snapped to the quarterback. The fullback rushes over and pretends to get the ball from the quarter. Leroy, terminate the conversation. Unc, we have to settle this. Terminate the conversation. Call you later, Pig. Goodbye. You've been talking to Piggy for a half an hour, Leroy. I can't have my phone perpetually tied up by conversations between you and your little friends. It may have caused me to miss an important call. Well, how would I know you were expecting an important call? I'm not, but there's always a possibility. <laughs> and who messed up the evening paper? I messed it up. I put it all back together. Half of it upside down. If you weren't so careless, stop bouncing that football while I'm talking to you. Okay. You'd pay a little more attention to what you're doing, my boy. While you're doing it, didn't I tell you to get a haircut yesterday? You did? You know I did. You gave me an argument. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Oh, you forgot, eh? Hair down over your ears, you look like a teddy bear. Get it cut the first thing tomorrow morning, you understand? Saturday? I can't, Unc. Our team has to practice tomorrow. We play the Fair Oaks All-Stars next week. Are you going to practice all day? Well, sure. We have skull practice in the morning and field practice in the afternoon. We need it. Well, start your skull practice in the barbershop. <laughs> Is that clear? Well, sure, it's clear, only gosh. I asked you not to bounce that football while I'm talking to you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Uncle. What you've got to realize, Leroy, is that life is not all beer and Skittles. Oh, I never said it was. I never tasted beer in my life. I'm not talking about real beer. Beer and Skittles is just an expression. When I say life is not all beer and Skittles, I mean it's not all play and no work. Oh, that. Yes, that. Work, responsibility, my boy. You're getting older. You've got to realize you can't just play all day. Who's that? Oh, Marjorie. Leroy, why can't you be more like your sister? She's a girl. She... <laughs> How do you like my ballet skirt, Uncle? Isn't it a dream? Well, that's really a very... If you'd stop spinning around for a minute, I could tell how I like it. Oh, I have to spin it. It doesn't stand out. Well, stop it or you'll make yourself dizzy. No, it doesn't. Well, it makes me dizzy. Stop. I want to talk to you. <sighs> why didn't you say so? Young lady, it's time you realize life is not just a bed of roses. Or beer and Skittles, either. Leroy. <laughs> you watch your step, young man. Don't you just love the skirt, Unky? Don't you think it looks professional, Leroy? Yeah, it looks pretty good. It looks fine, my dear. Now go upstairs and take it off. It's time to get ready for supper. Why can't I wear this to supper? Because I don't consider it suitable. But I don't see why. Won't anybody around here do as I say? All I get is arguments. Have you children no conception of obedience? Oh, sure. Oh, Anki, when you're unreasonable. I am never unreasonable. Oh, brother. 
Did you say something, Leroy? I didn't mean to. I hope I won't have to warn you again. I want both of you children to understand that what I want around here is a little obedience. From now on, when I say jump, I want you to jump. Is that clear? Yeah, yes. Very well. I'll go upstairs and change into something more ladylike for supper. Oh, all right. Ladylike. Leroy, you ready for supper? Yeah, I just happened to wash. Look. Amazing. I want you to be careful of your table manners at supper. Miss Goodwin is coming to dinner tomorrow, and I'd like you to make a good impression on her for once. Don't worry. I always get along with her swell. Hey, Leroy! Somebody calling you? Yeah, it's Donald Kelsey. Leroy! Well, answer him. What? Oh! <laughs> Don't shout in my face. Go to the door. I'm going. No, Leroy. It's too near supper time. Just play in here till it's ready. But I... Okay. I can't come out, Donald. Uncle won't let me. You see, Unc? I was obedient. I'm glad you remembered. Even if for only this once. Uh, uh. Well, Marjorie, you look much more suitable for the table. I better go upstairs and get ready myself. Try to stay clean till supper, Leroy. Don't worry about me. Say, Marge, you want to see the trick play I invented? It's practically a sure touchdown. You want to see it? No. Oh, come on. I'll let you be the star. Look, you're the halfback and I'm the quarter. You're way out at the end of the line, see? I'm not playing. I'll be a sport for once. Look, the center snaps the ball to me. I fade back a little like this. The fullback rushes over this way and pretends to grab the ball, and I run around and shoot you a quick pass. Look out! Oh! The bait! She... <laughs> Sake, Marge, of all the passes to mud. Well, Leroy, which vase, may I ask? On the mantelpiece. It was an accident, Dunk, honest. I am delighted to hear that. So it was not vandalism, merely an accident, eh? Do you realize that vase was a piece of genuine California pottery? It was? <laughs> yes, it was. I bought it in Chicago. It cost me two dollars a half. Gosh. How did it happen, Leroy? Well, it was just an accident, Dunk. It wasn't Marge's fault. She just didn't catch the ball, that's all. I've told you not to play football in the parlor, young man. Well, when Donald wanted me to come out just now, you said to play inside. I thought you meant it would be okay. That mistake will cost you your allowance till the base is paid for, young man. What? Every penny. What's more, starting tomorrow, you'll earn your allowance. You'll work in the backyard here every Saturday till your debt is paid. Um... That will do, my boy. We'll get a broom and dustpan and clean up this mess. Okay. I shall be broke the rest of my life. I'm working, too. Where's the br- broom and dustpan, Bertie? In the closet. What happened? That little skinny jaw on the mantel? Yeah. I knew it would go someday. <laughs> he claims it's worth two fifty, and I have to pay for it. Mm, that's a lot of money. You're telling me. Have to work for it, too. That's the hardest way to get money there is. <laughs> yeah, I hate it. Let's see it. Twenty-five cents a week. I have to work every Saturday for ten weeks. That's right. A couple of weeks left in October, four weeks in November, four weeks in December. I gotta work from now till Christmas, and I won't get a cent for it. <laughs> Come on, Leroy. Don't make me drag you in by the coat collar. I'm coming. Good morning, Floyd. Hi, Commissioner. Hi, Leroy. Hello, Floyd. I want you to give this young man a haircut, Floyd. He's considerably overdue. Hey, he is at that. Leroy, you know, it's kids like you that make it tough for barbers to make a living. I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm only kidding. Climb right up in the chair. That's the boy. Well, Commissioner, did you lose any money on the series? I'm not a betting man, Floyd. Although if I had made a bet, it would have been on the Tigers. Perfectly clear they had the better team. Yeah. Well, second guessing is cheap, as a fella says. I knew it all along. Okay, okay. I wish you'd let me in on it. Could have saved myself a bundle. Did he let you in on it, Leroy? Ha! <laughs> Would you mind getting down to business, Floyd? I haven't got all day. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner. I didn't know you were going to referee this thing. 
Why don't you sit down? I might as well. Get going, though, will you? Doesn't have to be a masterpiece, you know. The boy's special, I know. That's right. With no smelly stuff on it. Okay. I'm out of here in no time. Yes, yes. Hey, Floyd, did you hear the Army Wake Forest game last week? Did I? Never missed a play. Army's got a super team this year, haven't they? Best in the country, that's all. Best football team in the country. Glenn Davis. And Doc Blanchard. Yes, sir. Those two fellas play a whole lot of football. Floyd, you haven't cut a single hair. Starting in right now, Commissioner. I guess Navy's about the only team the Army has to worry about, huh, Floyd? Well, Navy's got a good team. Pat Jenkins plays a whole lot of football. And Clyde Scott. Yeah. Clyde Scott of Smack Over, Arkansas. Yep, that's where he comes from. <laughs> Smack Over, Arkansas. <laughs> Floyd. What's the matter, Commissioner? I'm chopping away here all the time. <laughs> Must you talk? If you must talk, does it have to be about nothing but football? What's the matter with football? About as clean a game as you'll find. Of course, there's angles to it. <laughs> I've been trying to interest Leroy in a few things I consider more important than football. Oh, why'd you say so? Read any good books lately, Leroy? Nah. Well, that takes care of that. <laughs> Tracy? Read him every day. Gosh, I thought he was going to catch up with Itchy there yesterday, but now it don't look so good. <laughs> but, uh, of course, he'll get him eventually. It'd be a big surprise if he don't. I notice every time Tracy's really stuck, the crooks start to fight about the money. You ever notice that? No, but that's right. If Breathless Mahoney hadn't fought with B.O. plenty about the money, Tracy never would have... Be God! <laughs> Baseball, football, comic strips. I can't control your conversation, Floyd, but by George, I don't have to listen to it. Here. Here's for the haircut. No smelly stuff, remember. I won't be able to stand him around the house. Okay, but gee, Commissioner... And Leroy, I... you get home as soon as you finish. Remember, you got a man's work to do today. Huh. Your uncle's a nice fellow, Leroy, but he's got peculiar tastes. Yeah, I guess so. What was that about a man's work, he just said? Well, I have to work every Saturday till I get 2 50 for something I busted. Oh. So, uh... Take your time, huh, Floyd? <laughs> yeah, I'll have to. <laughs> you got a lot of hair. <laughs> <laughs> Say, um, how'd it be if we catch a little of that Michigan Army game while I'm working? Oh, boy, super. I figure that'll be the best game of the day, don't you? Yes, sir. Those Ann Arbor boys play a whole lot of football. <laughs> <laughs> You look better. Almost human, in fact. No kidding, Uncle Floyd really knows his stuff about sports. Mm -hmm. And not just the major sports, either. He knows all about lacrosse and bowling and, and water polo. He remembers scores way back to 1930. Let it be a warning to you, my boy. Fill up your brain with football scores, and you may wind up a barber with one chair in your shop. Leroy, Piggy called you. He did? Oh. Uh, say, Unc. Yes? I... Guess Piggy was calling me for practice this afternoon. You don't say. Yeah. Yeah, it's awful important, Dunk. It's practically our last chance before a very important game. My boy, I don't seem to have made myself very clear to you. Yesterday you broke a valuable and artistic vase, did you not? Yeah. I'm trying to teach you something for which you'll be grateful to me all the rest of your life. Oh, I've learned it already, Unc. And boy, am I grateful. <laughs> I'm afraid you haven't learned it, or you wouldn't be asking if you could play football this afternoon. But I have learned it. I know I have to pay for the busted vase. Okay, I'll pay. The responsible man puts first things first, my boy. If you had really learned your lesson, you wouldn't dream of either rest or recreation till that debt was paid. Well, if I work this Saturday, can I have next Saturday off to play in the game? Sorry, my boy. No Saturdays till you've paid the last penny of restitution. It's for your own good. Okay. Okay, I'll go to work. But if I ever have a kid, I won't make him work. And if I ever have a house, I won't have any crummy vases in it from California. The Great Gildersleeve will be back in just a moment. 
Mr. Lang, have you seen the new parquet margarine advertisement that's in the magazines now? Um, I've seen it. Why, you could frame it and hang it on the wall. It is a beautiful picture. Everything looks so colorful and appetizing. A pot of steaming baked beans, two slices of luscious brown bread. And that pat of rich-looking parquet margarine. Well, of course, that's what makes the picture complete. As you probably know, parquet margarine helps to make any meal complete. Served with bread, rolls, pancakes, and waffles, parquet margarine adds the final flavor touch. Well, it's the best I ever tasted. Always so fresh, so sweet, and so that's... delicate. And that's what makes parquet margarine an all-American favorite, because parquet's fresh, delicate flavor is still unmatched. And it's economical, too. Only about half the price of costly spreads. Getting back to that advertisement, Mr. Lang. Oh, yes. You'll find it says that parquet margarine is preferred by millions to any other brand because it tastes so good. So treat your family to a spread that's really delicious. Buy economical parquet... P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet Margarine. Made by the Kraft Foods Company. Now let's return to our story. After the exertion of eating, Gildersleeve usually likes to repair to the parlor, relax for a few moments, and enjoy a cigar while planning his next move. <laughs> Ate too much. As often as not, the next move is one he hadn't planned. He unbuttons his vest, slides down in his chair. Time passes. An arm hangs limp. The noble head falls upon the massive chest. Cigar ashes. <laughs> Cigar ashes fall upon the vest. Gildersleeve is at peace. <laughs> but not for long. Oh, my goodness. Bertie! You know, I'm trying to get a little sleep, so I'll be bright and sparkling when Eve comes. Did you come, Mr. Gilson? Yes. You don't happen to be going upstairs, do you? Well, I didn't exactly have it in mind, but I guess I could arrange it. Will you tell Marjorie I'd like to speak to her, please? Yes, sir. Uh, oh, sounds like she's coming down, Miss Gilson. Then never mind. Something's got to be done, Uncle Mort. Something's just got to be done. That's just what it's I had... It's impossible. It's simply impossible. First it speeds up and then it slows down. What does? The phonograph. We'll just have to get a new one, that's all. This one is impossible. It doesn't seem to occur to you, young lady, that it isn't as easy as all that. Phonographs cost money. Uncle Mort, is my dancing important or not? Well, certainly. I guess so, only... If... Well, then? Confounded, Marjorie, you're as bad as Leroy. You have no idea the value of money. Kindly do not compare me with Leroy. <laughs> well, it's true anyway And I'll say this for Leroy At least he isn't banging around upstairs Making a racket while people are trying to get some much needed rest I was not banging around At least he's outside working That's what you think I know he's outside working because I told him to Well, isn't he? By George, if he isn't Why, that little... Where is he? I distinctly told him Where did he go? If he's over at Piggy's playing football <laughs> Hello, Judge. Care to join the game? No. What are you doing here with those knickerbockers on? The boys needed a referee, and I was happy to oblige. At your age. You haven't seen my nephew, have you? Leroy? No, why? Well, I suspected he might be over here. You're sure? I told you, Gildy, I've not seen the boy. What are those kids hiding over there? They're not hiding anything. They're in a huddle. Huddle, muddle. If I find that kid, I'll fan his little tupper. Any particular reason, Gildy, or are you just feeling ugly? Certainly I have a reason. The boy broke a valuable vase. Well, boys will be boys, Gildy. You understood them a little better. Or... Listen, you old goat, have you ever had a boy of your own? Have you? No, but I've had the use of one. <laughs> then I'd suggest you get to know him better. Get out and play with him the way I'm doing. It'll do you good. Make you feel like a kid again and possibly improve your disposition. What? Listen, you old elderly ragamuffin. When I need any advice about the care and feeding of children... Sorry, Gildy. You're holding up the game. One side, please. <whistles> Tension all. Recess over. Resume scrimmage. Resume scrimmage. Oh, brother. Ball, please, Piggy. 
Amos Alonzo Hooker. <laughs> I wonder if there's any use asking Peavy. Leroy might have sneaked in here for a soda or something. Trouble is, if I go in, Peavy will talk my arm off. I've wasted enough time already. No, I guess I'll just go home and wait. Oh, what's that he's got in his window? Well, I'll be darned. A regular little cannon. Ooh, cute. <laughs> Leroy would love that. I might just drop in and see about it. Not so long till Christmas. Well, oh, Mr. <laughs> Hi, Peavy. Uh, what's the price of that little cannon you've got in your window? That little cannon? Yes. In your window there? Yes. It's not for sale. What do you mean? It's in your window, isn't it? Yes, it is, but it's just a display. Well, what do you have it in your window for if it's not for sale? Just a service to our customers. People come along, they like to look at it. What kind of service is that? You get me all excited. I come in here, I want to buy it, and you tell me it's not for sale. It's not. Then take it out of the window. Well, no, I... Can't. All I can say is, Peavy, I don't know what kind of a drugstore you think you're running. Well, I don't sell cannons. <laughs> well, then don't advertise them. The whole thing is very misleading, Peavy, if not unethical. It's misrepresentation. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> No decent drugstore would display anything in its window that it wasn't willing to sell. Have you seen Beckman's window? Certainly. See the big plaster foot he's got in there with the bunions that light up? Well, yes. Have you tried to buy that? <laughs> well, ye gods, who'd want to buy it? Same thing. All right, keep your camp. I'll give you two dollars for it. Mr. Gilbert's name, right? It's not for myself, Peavy. I want to buy it for Leroy. For a little boy's Christmas, Peavy. The one thing that'd make him happy. The one thing that is... Wait a minute. What is it? I forgot. What? I'm mad at Leroy. <laughs> oh, my goodness, that must be Miss Goodwood. I I'll go. Now, take it easy, Bertie. Let's keep our heads here. Marjorie, remember what I told you. You've told me so many things, I can't possibly remember them. Well, just try to make a good impression, that's all. Good evening, Miss Goodwin. Good evening, Bertie. How are you? Just fine, Miss Goodwin. Take your thing. Thank you. Where is that Leroy? Seven o'clock and he's not home yet. If I lay my hands on him, I'll... Oh, hello, Eve. <laughs> good evening, Throckmorton and Marjorie. Hello, Miss Goodwin. Oh, this is so nice. Turned quite chilly out, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Better come and stand by the fire, Eve, to warm up. Shove over, Marjorie. Excuse me, Mr. Gillsmith. Uh, yes, Bertie? You want to wait any longer for Leroy, or shall I just go ahead and put it on the table? Yes, where is Leroy? <laughs> Nobody knows. We haven't seen him all afternoon. Now, my dear, I imagine Leroy just went down to the public library and got so interested in some good book, he's forgotten what time it is. Are you kidding? <laughs> Now, oh, Marjorie. Well, it doesn't sound very plausible, Throckmorton. Not on a Saturday afternoon. Not if I know boys. Well, to tell you the truth, Eve, I'm afraid that I'm going to face a little disciplinary problem with Leroy when he arrives. Miss Gillsleeve, I don't like to butt in, but... Yes, Bertie? You don't think maybe Leroy ran away, do you? Ran away? What makes you say that, Bertie? Well, I don't know. He was acting kind of strange this morning. Going around talking to himself and slamming doors. She's right, Uncle Mort. Eve, you don't think he'd run away, do you? You know about boys. Do you think he'd run away? Oh, of course not. Boys never run away from home without a reason. What possible reason could Leroy have for wanting to run away? Plenty. Uncle Mort bawled the living daylights out of him. Uh, Marjorie, that's not true. I may have reasoned with your brother a little. Ha! <laughs> After all, he was a little careless. Well, I can't imagine your uncle being harsh with a boy, Marjorie. You should hear him. Marjorie, we have company. <laughs> Well, it's true, isn't it? He's gone, isn't he? And he hasn't been home all afternoon, and you don't know where he is now. Oh, my dear, I don't think it's anything to be worried about. You're not worried, maybe, because he isn't your brother. You don't know him the way I do. He may be a bum, and I could kill him most of the time, but if anything happened to him, I'd never forgive you. Never. That settles it. I'm going to call the police. I'll start a search. Throckmorton. Huh? Throckmorton, just a moment. Aren't we getting awfully excited about very little? No, she's right, Eve. I lost my head. I said terrible things to the boy. I've driven him from his home. I don't blame him for running away. If he'll only come back, I'll never speak harshly to him again. Bertie, my overcoat. Hi, everybody. Leroy! 
Leroy. Leroy, where the devil have you been? Good evening, Leroy. You were very nearly late for dinner, my boy. Where have you been? At the library? Nope, the bowling alley. The bowling... <laughs> Leroy, Eve, I don't want you to think that I allow him to hang around such places. I wasn't hanging around. You know very well that I disapprove of such behavior, young man. All right, you told me I had to pay for the vase I busted, didn't you? Well, that was to teach you the value of money, my boy. And you told me I had to earn it all myself, two bucks and a half. I did that for your own good. I know it seems a little tough, but you've had to give up your Saturdays week after week. Perhaps you'll realize how hard it is to earn two dollars and a half. Sure, I know already. Here, Ron, two bucks and a half. Leroy, where did you get all this money? Earned it. How? Floyd picks me up down at the bowling alley. Pin boy. Nine cents a line and a buck and a quarter in tips. Not bad, huh? Better than you pay. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Green. Hi, Leroy. Well, everybody, what do you say we eat? I'm starved. After you, Marge. After you, Miss Goodwin. Thank you, Leroy. You see, Unc, it's not so hard to make a buck if you use your head. I give up. We'll be hearing more from the great Gildersleeve in just a few moments. Home is just about the coziest place there is on a Sunday evening. And with our family, one of the most delightful meals of the week is Sunday night supper. I'll bet that's true with your family, too. Somebody always says, let's have waffles or French toast. And, of course, you know what I'm going to say next. The one thing that makes those waffles or slices of French toast taste so good is delicious parquet margarine. The test of a good spread, you know, is the delicacy of its flavor and aroma when served with hot foods. And that's why parquet margarine is a favorite of millions, because its flavor is unmatched by any other brand. So here's a friendly suggestion. If you want to make next Sunday's supper of waffles or French toast a real treat of the week, top them off with Flavor Fresh Parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by Kraft. <laughs> Every Saturday, 52 weeks a year. That's over 150 bucks. Boy, I'll be rich. Well, you're your own boss, of course, my boy, but there's something I think you're forgetting. What's that? Well, money isn't everything. For instance, there are family ties. You should be glad to work for your old uncle now and then, even if it pays less than some other things. I'm sorry, Uncle. I can't afford it. You'll do it whether you can afford it or not. I thought you said I was my own boss. Don't you believe it. Now go to bed. Good night, everybody. <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekin. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Now, a wonderful help in menu planning. It's Pabstet, the delicious cheddar cheese food that's so nourishing, so easy to digest, so easy to serve in a hundred appetizing ways. Pabstet spreads, slices, toasts to perfection for sandwiches and snacks. And Pabstet melts into a luscious golden cheese sauce to pour over tasty dishes of macaroni, rice, eggs, and fish. Yes, there are a hundred delightful ways to enjoy Pabstet's rich, mellow cheddar cheese flavor. So buy both varieties of this delicious cheese food, golden cheddar Pabstet, and Pimento Pab Step. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. It's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Now let us see what fate has in store for The Great Gildersleeve. Fate moves in mysterious ways. Here he comes now, in the uniform of the United States Postal Service. Hi, So's Christmas. Yes? Who is it, Bernie? Who is it, Bernie? Who is it, Bernie? Uh, special Bernie? delivery. I got a letter for special it. Special delivery? Special delivery. Special delivery, huh? Oh, I'll be right down. No, 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 no. This is for the party next door. Only she ain't home, so I, I thought if you wouldn't mind giving it to her. What's for, Bernie? Is it for me? No, it's for Miss Ransom. Oh, well, she doesn't live here. She lives next door. Yeah, I know. I was just over there, but she ain't home, well, so... Me by any chance? No, Leroy, it's for Miss Ransom. Oh, well, you got the wrong place, bud. She lives next door. I know. I was just over there. Be right there. You sign for it, Marjorie. Oh, nobody don't need sign for it. Uh, uh, all I need is... Eh? Well, I wonder who could be... Oh, this is for Mrs. Ransom. I'm afraid you've got the wrong address, my friend. Mrs. Ransom lives next door, 269. <laughs> right across the lot there. Hey, look. Give me back the letter. I'll take it back to the office. He was just over there, Mr. Gillsleeve. Miss Ransom ain't home. In that case, why don't you leave the letter here and let us give it to her when she comes home? <laughs> That's all I'm asking. Well, all right. Jeepers. Why doesn't the man make himself clear? The letter on the mantle, Leroy. Dinner in about ten minutes, Miss Gillsleeve. All right, Bertie. Better get ready for dinner, Leroy. I am. Leroy, I said put the letter on the mantle. That's what I'm doing. You were doing nothing of the kind. You were holding the envelope up to the light. I saw you. We don't read other people's mail, my boy. It's not only bad manners, it's a criminal offense. Besides, it isn't done. You understand? Yes, sir. Could you make out anything? <laughs> nope. The paper's too thick. Oh, uh, put it on the mantel, and I'll take it over to Mrs. Ransom after dinner. <laughs> I saw your lights on, so I knew you were home. I just this minute got in. Do come inside. You're letting in the cold. Well, it's pretty late, but if you insist. Just came over to bring you a letter, Leela. Letter? Uh-huh. The postman left it while you were out. Special delivery. Here. Now, who could be writing to me? Spe- Throckmorton! Oh, Throckmorton, I'm going to have to sit down. Oh? What's the matter? It's from Lightfoot. Who's Lightfoot? An Indian? No. <laughs> I told you about him, Lightfoot Dupree, the man who was engaged to my very best friend, Lula Jean Carruthers, down in Savannah. Oh, him. I feared this, Throckmorton. I feared it from the very start. Feared what? You don't even know what's in the letter. I know only too well. It's happened. They've broken off, and Lula Jean will never forgive me. Never. As if anything I could have done would have prevented it. I don't know what this is all about, Leela. You go down south and deliberately fall in love with some Indian who's already he in... He is not an Indian, Throckmorton. <laughs> He's a gentleman and a very charming one. And I didn't say I'd fallen in love with him. You did so. I said we were irresistibly attracted to each other. <laughs> That's different. Different? Yeah, How? Well, anyway, I knew it would never do, him being engaged to my very best friend and all, so we made a pact. We agreed not to see each other or even write to each other for a month. And at the end of that time, if we still felt the way we did, well... Well? Well, the month is up, and here's a letter from Lightfoot. Uh, Throckmorton, would you think it terribly rude of me if I read it? No, go ahead. I won't look. <laughs> I know it isn't good manners, but I'm so excited. You're sure you don't mind? No. Nope. Well, then. My dear Leela. <laughs> Leela, how do you know that this file Just a minute, is... Throckmorton, just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just as I feared. He's coming up, Throckmorton. He's coming to see. 
Summerfield. Oh, I just knew. I mean, I wouldn't have had this happen to Lula Jean for the world, but, uh, well, there's no use crying over spilt milk, is there? You mean this fellow is actually... He says he's arriving tomorrow on a business trip. That's likely. Just happens to be coming to Summerfield on business, all the way from Georgia. Ha! Monkey business. <laughs> Rock Martin, you mustn't talk like that. You'd be crazy about Lightfoot. I'm dying to have you meet him. Uh, why don't you come over tomorrow night when he's here? I have to go bowling. Oh, please, Rock Martin. You could give up your bowling just this once. Please, for Leela. What do I want to meet him for? Because I want you to. You just want to annoy me, that's all. Rock Martin, how can you say that? Say you come. Confounded, Leela. Are you really in love with this fellow? I don't know for sure, Throckmorton. It's it's so hard to be certain. I won't know till I see him again, I guess. But I will say this. He's one of the most charming gentlemen I've ever met. <laughs> and talented, too. What's so talented about him? Oh. Everything. To begin with, he's a divine dancer. Simply divine. You say that about everybody, except me. <laughs> and he carries on the most delightful conversation all the time. Whispers little things in your ear. Man sounds like a gigolo. <laughs> Is he musical? Musical. Does he play the piano? Can he sing? Well, I've never heard him sing. Ah, Leela, that's no kind of a fellow for you. You'd never be happy with him. What makes you say that? Remember all the fun we used to have together, you and I, Leela, when you'd play the piano and I'd sing? I remember very well. But a girl can't live on her memories. How'd, how'd you like it if I'd sing for you now, huh? Oh, Throckmorton, you get me so confused. You know how I am when you sing. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Leela. You play for me, huh? Oh, what's the use, Rockmorton? All that belongs to the past. It's dead. Why drag it up? Oh, come on. Just one song. For all Lang Syne, huh? Should old acquaintance be forgot? Should it, huh? And never brought to mind? Should old acquaintance be forgot? And days of all Lang Syne. I always cry when I hear that song. You do? I know. I know one you like. Here's one that'll cheer you up. Come on, you have to play this one. Play what? You sit right down there. What do you want me to play? Our song. Remember? Speak to me of love And say what I'm longing to hear Tender words of love, repeat them again, I implore you. Speak to me of Leela. Lightfoot. I mean, Trotmore. Oh! The great Gildersleeve will be back in just a moment. In the meantime, I'd like to ask this lady a question. Which do you like best for breakfast, toast or sweet rolls? Why, I prefer toast. And I like sweet rolls. Now, uh, what's your choice for dinner, bread or muffins? Oh, I'll take muffins. And I'd rather have bread. <laughs> we just can't seem to agree, can we? Mm, I think we can. At least we can agree that it takes a good spread to bring out the flavor of all kinds of bread. Yes, I'll agree with you on that. By the way, have you ever tasted parquet margarine? Yes, I have. Do you like it? Oh, I certainly do. And so do I. There, you see, we agree again. And that's something on which millions of people agree. Parquet margarine is preferred by millions to any other brand because it's still unmatched for fresh, sweet, delicate flavor. If you haven't tried parquet... 
Buy some soon and discover how good it tastes on bread, toast, and rolls. And remember, parquet is only about half the price of costly spreads. Be sure to ask your food dealer for parquet, the spread that tastes so good. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by Kraft. Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. Weary from a hard day at the water department, he has trudged home through the autumn twilight, tripped over Leroy's bicycle on the walk in front of his house, and finally reached the sanctuary of his parlor. Excuse me, Miss Gildersleeve, did Judge Hooker catch up with you? Judge Hooker? No, Bertie. Was he looking for me? Yes, he said he might stop by. You didn't invite him to supper, did you, Bertie? No, sir. I saw my chance, but I refrained. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Bertie. Well, I'll handle him if he comes in. But let's not delay the meal now. When it's ready, just blow the whistle. Okay, Miss Gilfrey. It won't be long now. Oh, Leroy. How many times have I asked you not to slam the door? Sorry, Unc. Look, we got company. What? Evening, Gildy. Oh, it's you. Evening, Marjorie. You're looking very pretty. Thank you, Judge. Don't get up, Gildy. I wasn't going to, Judge. <laughs> I hope I'm not disturbing you. I figured you wouldn't be doing anything. This is the hour of the day I like to spend with the children. Uh-huh. Yeah. Now, there's a little matter I'd like to discuss with you, uh, privately. You mean you want me to send the children out of the room? I try to run this family democratically, Horace. The parlor belongs to them as much as to anyone else. Then perhaps we could step into your study. Uh, Leroy, mind you, you go into my study for a few minutes, will you? And make it snappy. Okay, all right. You'll have to make it snappy, too, Judge. We're reading in just a minute. I'll make it snappy. Gildy, uh, doubtless you'll recall we had the pleasure a year or so ago of acting as co-signers on a note of Leela Ransom's. I remember. What about it? As her financial advisor and attorney, naturally, I've tried to arrange her affairs so that she'd be in a position to pay the loan off. Well, how's she doing? She got the money, but now she doesn't want to use it to pay off the note. She wants to invest in television stock. Oh, for goodness sake. Gilda, you don't know what I go through with Leela. She's a lovely creature and all that, but by ginger. Well, I'll speak to her about this. Oh, if you would, Throckmorton, I'd be grateful. The hours I spend explaining things to her... Uh, she isn't in any financial difficulty, is she, Horace? Well, she's not too... Oh, she'd be all right, except she's continually doing something foolish. When can you see her, Gildy? I'm afraid she's going to plunge into television any minute if we don't stop her. Well, I'm seeing her this evening, Judge, as a matter of fact. Although I don't know how easy it'll be to bring this thing up. Why not? Well, she's got this southerner coming to see her. Wants me to meet him for some reason. Southerner? Yeah, some flame of hers passing through town. Is this fellow interested in her? I suppose so. He's come all the way up here. Maybe you'll marry her. I wish the Dickens somebody would marry her and straighten her out instead of me. Well, I don't think it's your job to... I don't think it's your job to find the man. You're not jealous, are you, Gildy? No, you old goat, I'm not jealous. <laughs> but that's no reason to marry her off to every Tom, Dick, and Harry that comes through town. I don't see you marrying her. You're just a dog in the manger, that's what you are. <laughs> I'm no dog, you dog. <laughs> And don't call this house a manger. Oh, you make me sick. Well, go on over there and hang around. It won't do you any good. What do you mean by that? I'll bet Leela wants this fellow, and I'll bet she married. That's what you think. I'll show him a thing or two. By the time he... Excuse me. Huh? Oh, yes, Bertie? Don't to whistle. Oh, well, I didn't hear it, though. <laughs> Sorry, Judge. Supper. I'd ask you to stay, only we're a little short tonight. <laughs> I've dined, thank you. Uh, Good night, Lothario. Good night, you money-grubbing old Cupid. Dupree's here yet. Uh, here she comes. Well, I did... Oh, Throckmorton. <laughs> ah, hello, Leela. You're early, aren't you? I don't know, am I? Well, of course. 
course you are. I said 8 o'clock, and it's only about 20 minutes off. Gracious, I'm hardly dressed. Oh, well, as long as I'm here. No, Throckmorton. I've got to finish dressing. Well, I'll wait downstairs here. No, please. I... Throckmorton, I just thought of something. Why, it's the luckiest thing you came out of here. Yeah, why is it? <laughs> I just remembered I haven't got a drop of nail polish in the house. I wonder if you'd mind running down to the drugstore for me. <laughs> nail polish? That takes hours to put on. Well, it's not for tonight. I'll need it first thing in the morning. Be a lamb now, Throckmorton. Run down and get me a bottle. By the time you get back, I'll be all dressed and everything. Well, uh, what color? Mr. Peavy will know, Throckmorton, but hurry. Oop. I wonder if she's trying to get rid of me. <laughs> Hello, PV. You got any nail polish? I'm in a hurry. Nail polish? I believe we have. What color? I don't know what color. Any color. Is uh, this for yourself or for a friend? (laughs) For a friend. What do you think? Well, I wondered. Uh, Lady, I presume. It's for Mrs. Ransom. Oh. She didn't like the polish she bought yesterday? Did she buy polish yesterday? Certainly. I sold it to her myself. Confound it. I knew she was sending me down here in a wild goose chase. Makes me so darn mad. What makes women behave the way they do, Peavy? I don't know, Mr. Gildersleeve, unless it's men. (laughs) Grab me some nail polish, will you, Peavy, and let me get out of here. Yes, sir. What color did you say? I didn't. What colors have you got? Well, they run the gamut all the way from pink to rose. Here's the chart. Well, pick any color. I can't tell one from another. Well, between you and me, neither can I, but... <laughs> women come in here, and they study over the chart, and they ask my advice. <laughs> and I give it to them. <laughs> Peavy, you're a cynic. Oh, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Just practical. Yes. Yeah, how about this color, Mr. Gildersleeve? That's a nice color. Goes with everything. <laughs> Bright enough for evening, not too bright for daytime. You can wear it. You've already told me, Peavy, that you know nothing about it, so spare me the sales talk. I guess the color won't scare anybody. Wrap it up. Yes, sir. Need any razor blades today? Nope. Tooth powder or mouthwash? No. Have a special on shaving lotion. Peavy, will you hurry it up? All I want is a nail polish, and I don't even need that. Just wrap it up and don't talk. Don't say a word. Well, well, I won't. Well, don't. Well, I won't. Trouble with you is you've always got to have the last word. Well, now I would. There you go. He got. (laughs) Bet you never thought I could make it so fast. Well, I do. Here I am again, Leela. Oh. Rock Martin, did you go to the drugstore? Sure I did. Here's a nail polish. Oh, yes, thank you. Well, do come in. I'm freezing. Great. Where's, uh, what's his name, Dupree? I don't know. I've been expecting him ever since 7.30. Uh, uh, sit down, won't you? You bet. Why don't we sit on the couch? I don't think I'll sit down just yet, Rock Martin. I'll just stand here by the fire. Hmm. You look nice there, too. Firelight gleams in your hair. Puts color in your cheeks. What did you say? I said the firelight gleams in your hair, puts color in your cheeks. Oh, thank you, honey. <laughs> matter with you, Leela? Don't you feel well? Why, yes, Rockmorton. I feel fine. You're acting kind of strange, as if I wasn't here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just absent-minded. Now, tell me all about what you've been doing today. Well, let's see. This morning... Oh, that must be right for it. Huh? Sit right there, Rockmorton. You hear Leela, you sure are a lovely sight to a lonesome stranger. Oh, thank you, Conscious. I salute you with a kiss I brought all the way from Savannah. How do they do it? <laughs> oh, life for too much, and I've got company. Come in, darling, just put your bags here in the hall. There. Now, come in here and meet Mr. Gildersleeve. 
Uh, 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 well? Lightfoot, I want you to meet one of my oldest and best friends in Summerfield, Throckmorton Gildersleeve. This is Lightfoot Dupree, Throckmorton. Uh, glad to know you, Mr. Dupree. Mr. Gildersleeve, it's an honor and a pleasure to make your acquaintance, sir. I just know you two boys are going to like each other a lot. Don't you think so? Oh, sure. <laughs> Oh, the, the only thing we could possibly fight over would be you, Leela. Well, I won't have it. I want you to be good friends. Um, Lightfoot, did I tell you about Mr. Gildersleeve when I was down home? He's our water commissioner here in Summerfield. Water commissioner? Mm-hmm. My land, Leela, I hadn't realized you were moving in such important political circles. I'm just a servant of the people, Mr. Dupree. <laughs> But we've got a nice little water department, if I do say so myself. 10,000 domestic subscribers and between two and 300 business and industrial installations. You don't say. Well, you must be in a position to know pretty well what's going on around here. Well, I... Uh... Right, Foot, you haven't said a word about what's going on down in Savannah. Didn't you bring me any news? Uh, well, now, honey, let me recollect. Uh, I suppose you heard about the storm. Mm, everybody wrote me about that. But in general, the weather's been perfect. And then, of course, since the war has been over, business has been picking up right nicely. Oh, business. Tell me about the party. Uh, what business are you in, Mr. Dupree? Uh, Lightfoot is applying to Throckmorton. Ple- oh, pardon me. Uh... I'm branching out a little, though, Leela. You know, Mr. Gildersleeve, the South is processing a good portion of its cotton these days. You don't say. Yes, sir. <laughs> the South is becoming a great industrial area. You Yankees will have to step, first thing you know. Well, competition is the life of trade. But remember, we've got the know-how up here. Oh, you have indeed, sir. But we're learning. Why the price of a yard of cotton processed... Oh, hush is... up, Lightfoot. I declare you're talking just like a Yankee yourself. Well, Leela, honey... Oh, tell Throckmorton about some of the parties we have down home, Lightfoot. He's never heard of the kind of parties we have. Well, now, wait a minute, Leela. I've been on some pretty good parties. So have you. What about the hayride? Right here in Summerfield. Oh, I know. Some of them have been all right. But up here, there's nothing gay and spontaneous and reckless about a party. Why, down home, you might ask six or eight people for supper and wind up with 20 people staying for two days. Sounds inconvenient to me. (laughs) Oh, you see, Lightfoot, that's the trouble with the people up north. Well, Leela, we used to have a lot of fun, it's true. But if we're going to get anywhere commercially, we can't be gallivanting around to people's houses at all hours of the day and night. I have to be at my office every morning when the cotton exchange opens in New York. Lightfoot, did you have anything to eat on the train? You don't sound like yourself. Now, now, don't you worry about me, honey. I had some right nice lamb chops in the diner. Uh, lamb chops? That's no nourishment. You come out in the kitchen with me for a minute and help me bring in a few little things off there. Well, I... We can just leave Throckmorton here with the evening paper and he'll be perfectly happy. Huh? <laughs> well, honestly, I, I don't really feel the need of a thing, Lee. Uh, Throckmorton. Martin, why don't you go out and get the things while I stay here with Mr. Dupree? Well, um, how would it be if we all went out and helped? Of course, let's all go. Oh, I was only joking, y'all. You boys just sit here and get acquainted, and I'll fix everything. Oh, great. You sure you won't need any help? I'm quite sure. But don't you talk about me while I'm gone, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wonderful girl, that Leela. One of the finest girls I've ever known. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, what do you gentlemen up here think about reconversion? Reconversion? Well, there's a lot of angles to it, son. If the government will give us a free reign on prices and let up on taxes... Yes, yes. business. Just look at all these lovely sandwiches. Wow, and stuffed celery. <laughs> my, my. Leela, you remembered my weakness for anchovies. Oh, Leela, never forget. Uh, just help yourselves, will you? There's salt and pepper napkins on the tray. I feel hungry, and I thought. So do I, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, my goodness, Lightfoot. What's the matter with me? Do you realize I haven't even asked you about Lula Jean? Isn't that terrible, Throckmorton? Mm-hmm. My best friend... How is Lily Jean, Lightfoot? Uh, <clears throat> just uh, fine, Leela. 
Looks like we'll be married in November. Here, try one of these ripe olives, Gildersleeve. Thanks. Ah, uh, November? <laughs> November, you say, Lightfoot? Uh, yes, uh, there's a cotton fabric convention in Chicago in November, so I thought we could take our wedding trip then and kill two birds with one stone. Oh. Terribly sorry you've had so little time between trains, Lightfoot, but I'm glad you stopped over just the same. Leela, honey, I declare I said to myself, I just can't travel another mile in this Yankee country without talking to a pretty Georgia girl. Oh, you. Yeah, we better get going, Leela. All right, run along, Throckmorton, but drive carefully. I don't want anything to happen to Lightfoot. Leela, I'm sure Mr. Gildersleeve is a fine driver. Goodbye now, honey, and take good care of yourself. And if you don't come down for the wedding, Lula Jean will never forgive you. I'll do my best, Lightfoot. Uh, goodbye. Mm. Goodbye. Good night, Leela. Come on, Dupree. I'll drive you through the business section on the way. I'm coming right along. Goodbye. I might have liked the honeymoon in Chicago. Who's I? It's me, Leela. Uh, haven't got much time, Leela. Got to get Lightfoot to his train. Uh, but there's something I wanted to say to you all evening. You sure you want to say it now? I mean, you're sure this is the time? Yes, yes. It's important to both of us. What is it, Throckmorton? Don't put that money in television. Get out of my house! <laughs> We'll hear more from the great Gildersleeve in just a few moments. One cheerful note you so often hear at breakfast tables throughout America is the sound of toast popping out of the toaster. My breakfast is never complete without it. But I know as well as you do, it's the spread that makes hot, crisp toast taste so good. And I expect that's why so many families insist on parquet margarine, a spread with a flavor that's really fresh and sweet and delicate. Millions of families prefer Parquet Margarine to any other brand. And for very good reason, too. Because Parquet's fine, fresh flavor is still unmatched. So buy a package of this delicious, economical spread. P-A-R-K-A-Y, Parquet Margarine, made by Kraft. It's high in food energy value and contains important vitamin A. Try delicious, nourishing Parquet on your breakfast toast tomorrow. <laughs> You know, it's a funny thing, little foot. I mean, light foot. <laughs> uh, when I saw you walk in there tonight, you know, I had the idea that maybe you were interested in Leela Ransom. <laughs> you know something? I had the same idea about you. <laughs> uh, oh. <laughs> Just a neighbor, old man. Well, you know the old saying. Love thy neighbor. <laughs> Very good. I'll kill that kid. <laughs> good night, everybody. <laughs> the Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekin. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. You can just bet the cheese-flavored dishes will make a hit with your family and guests when they're made with delicious Pabstep cheese food. Pabstep melts luscious smooth into an appetizing cheese sauce for eggs, fish, and macaroni. Pabstep also makes a grand sandwich spread, toasts to perfection, slices neatly for serving with pie or fruit desserts. Pabstep is nourishing, easy to digest, a treat on all occasions. So buy both varieties of this delicious cheese food, Golden Cheddar Pabstet and Pimento Pabstet. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> it's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Now let's see what goes on in Summerfield. For a little goes on in Summerfield that sooner or later does not involve the great Gildersleeve. For example, one day last week, Gildersleeve's neighbor, Mrs. Ransom, stepped into Peavy's pharmacy, made a slight purchase, and while waiting for it to be wrapped, Dropped a casual remark. And how is Mrs. Peavy? Oh, she's fine, Mrs. Ransom. She's fine. That is, she's, uh, Well, she's been having a little trouble lately. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. Nothing serious, I hope. Well, to hear her tell it... Well, it's, uh, how long has this been going on? In about 30 years. Oh. <laughs> now, that just goes to show. Here, I've known Mrs. Peavy all this time and never even had an inkling... I declare, some women are just martyrs. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. Well, who, who's your doctor, Mr. Peavy? Have you a good doctor? Well, we usually take from Dr. Pettibone, but I haven't called him in on this after all. Oh, it's I a... know. Doctors are so expensive. And operations, oh, don't even mention them. But it doesn't pay to put them off. Well, I don't think this is as serious as all that, uh... Uh, well, I dare say she'll recover. Oh, well, she will, Mr. Peavy. I'm sure she will. You've just got to believe that. You've got to keep her believing it, too. Doctors say the will to live is half the battle. There's nothing the matter with her will to live. <laughs> oh, well, I think it's so brave of both of you to take it this way, and I'm just so sorry to hear about it. Now, if there's anything I can do for her, anything at all, you let me know now, you hear? <laughs> <laughs> Only kidding, Mrs. Ransom. Come on in. Oh, thank you. Hunt's in the living room. Marge is sewing a button on him. Well, hello, Leela. Oh, he stands still. Hello, Mrs. Branson. Hello, Marjorie. You'll have to excuse me for not having my coat on, Leela. Marjorie's sewing a button on my vest. Uh, Quite the little housewife, isn't she? Stand still. You want me to stick you? Better not, you'll let the air out. <laughs> Leroy, sometimes you're a little too smart for your britches. Go up and get ready for dinner. I am. Have you washed your hands? Yes. Well, go wash them. Okay. And stick in your shirt tail. Is that any way to greet Mrs. Ransom? How did I know Mrs. Ransom was coming? You can safely keep your shirt tail in at all times, my boy. You know the Boy Scout motto, be prepared. <laughs> Sorry, Leela, these little domestic affairs. There you are, Unky. Well, that's fine, my dear. Much obliged. Now, Leela? Well, I probably shouldn't even be speaking to you, Throckmorton, after the last time I saw you. But in time of trouble, I think we should forget our differences. Trouble? What do you mean, Leela? Have you heard about poor dear Mr. Peavy? What about Mr. Peavy? Mrs. Ransom is talking to me, my dear. Well, Marjorie may want to hear about this, too. It's Mrs. Peavy. I'm afraid she's very ill. That's a shame. Now, wait a minute. I was in Peavy's this morning. He didn't say anything to me about it. Well, you know how Mr. Peavy is. He never tells you anything anyway. That's right. Well, I had to practically pry it out of him. But I'm afraid the fact is that Mrs. Peavy needs an operation, and they can't afford it. Oh, that's terrible. Well, I guess that drugstore of his is no gold mine. Not the way he runs it. Beckman's is a lot better. Are you still here? Okay, okay, I'm going. What's better about Beckman's? Batman comics, murder comics, Captain Wonder Man, he's got them all. All Peavy's got is Donald Duck. That's the only one he likes to read. Well, Beckman's going to run him out of business if he doesn't wake up. But Peavy's such a stubborn old coot, you can't tell him anything. I know, but he's such a darling, too. I can't bear to think of him in trouble. Neither can I. 
Isn't there something we could do, Uncle Moore? That's why I came to you, Rock Martin. I knew you'd always been a friend of his. Peavy's all right if he weren't so stubborn. Oh, and Mrs. Peavy, the poor old soul. I can't bear to think of her needing medical attention and not being able to afford it. Well, I'll tell you. Come and get it! <laughs> Just a minute, Bertie. We have company. Good evening, Bertie. How are you? Just fine, Miss Ransom. Thank you. Just fine. Miss Kinsley, what about Miss Ransom? Is she a... Uh, is she what, Bertie? Well, I just wanted to know. I mean, what about it? Is she a... Ain't she? Pardon me a moment, Leela. What is it you want to know, Bertie? <laughs> I just want to know, should I set another place? Oh! <laughs> <clears throat> How about it, Leela? Stay to supper? Oh, I couldn't. Oh, come on, Miss Vance. It won't be no trouble. Yes, please do. Oh, well, I don't know that I should. What are you having for supper, Bertie? Well, if I'd known you was coming, Miss Vance, I might have done better. About all we got to offer is some stew made out of leftovers, but there's plenty of it. I don't think I'd better tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Another time, perhaps. Thank you, just the same. I'll be running along. Oh, Frock Martin, about Mr. Peavy. Yeah, I'll see what I can do, Lee. Oh, I knew you would. Yeah, the Jolly Boys are meeting this evening. I'll be seeing him at the club. Well, now, don't tell him I said anything. You know how sensitive he is. Yeah, I won't, Leela. Don't worry. Good night, y'all. Hey, good night, y'all. All right, everybody, dinner. Marjorie, where are you going? To put these things away. All right, but hurry. <laughs> Leroy, where do you think you're going? Up to wash my hands. Confound it, I told you to do that half an hour ago. All right, go ahead. I don't know why it is. As soon as dinner's announced, it's a signal for this family to scatter. Bertie, where are you going? After the food. Oh, well, bring it on. I've got a meeting. Must leave the just, uh... Hey, what's the matter, fellas? Come on. No, no, Commissioner. It's no good. Ah, uh, don't seem the same without Peavy. You're right, Floyd. Where is the Peavy? I thought you said he was going to be here tonight, Commissioner. Well, I thought he was coming, Floyd, but I suppose it's possible he won't turn up. After all, I hear his wife is sick. Oh, that's too bad. Well, just because a fellow's wife's got the pips, no reason he can't get out and have a little fun, is it? Floyd. Well, I mean, he don't have to become a hermit, does he? After all, Mrs. Peavy is seriously ill, Floyd. Oh, yeah? As bad as that. And Peavy is a devoted husband. One of the few really devoted husbands I know. Yeah, I guess they are pretty thick at that. As husband and wives go. Gee, maybe we should send her some flowers or something. That's more like it, Floyd. Roses are nice. Personally, I would prefer chrysanthemums. We're not sending these to you, Hooker. <laughs> Ah, uh, chrysanthemums stink. They smell up the house. Yeah. They don't smell at all. What about roses? Yeah, but roses smell nice. Well, all I can say... If I may have a word, please, Judge. Help yourself. Now, I'm familiar with the situation. I should like to submit that what Mrs. Peavy needs is not a bunch of roses or chrysanthemums, but an operation. Oh, that's bad. Did I ever tell you about the time that Boy, I... Boy, quiet. Okay. Now, operations cost money, fellas. Plenty of money. And just between you and me, I don't think Peavy can swing it. Of course, he wouldn't admit it, but you know how much trade he gets in that grocery, in that drugstore. A toothbrush here, a necko wafer there. Well, uh, what do you think we ought to do, Gildy? Well, either we're jolly boys or we're not. When you say that, smile. <laughs> if the purpose of this club isn't to help a fellow member when he's down, then what is it? To play a little poker. <laughs> Floyd, the wife of a fellow member, is lying ill at home. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner. Oh, I could bite my tongue off. Well, count me in. What do you want to do, pass the hat? I feel that that would definitely be a mistake. Peavy would never accept charity. Yeah, the judge is right. You know how touchy he is. Yeah, he's funny that way. Well, then maybe we better send him the roses. Yeah, wait a minute. I've got another idea. Maybe if we were to go to Dr. Pettibone, you know, on the QT... And persuade him to go a little easy on Peavy. Hey, now you're talking. He wouldn't have to cut his rate or anything. He could just make a little mistake in his bill and undercharge him. Why shouldn't he do it for nothing? 
Well, now... After I... all, Floyd... You should do it for nothing. That's asking a good deal. All right. If Peavy was to walk into my shop flat broke in need of a haircut, don't you think I'd give him one? You're darn right I would. I might wait on my regular customers first, but I'd give him one. <laughs> well... And I... throw in a shave, too. Well... And not charge him a cent. Well... Or expect a tip, either. These doctors. Well, that's big of you, as I started to say, Floyd. But you see, it's a little different with Dr. Pettibone. He's not a jolly boy, so it's not as if he was treating a fellow member. Or the wife of a fellow member, rather. By golly, Gildy, why don't we make him a member? The doc? That's an idea. Yeah, why not? The doc's a good fellow. When he's not looking down your windpipe. Hey, if we elected him a member, we could make him operate on Phoebe's wife for initiation, like. Operator, you don't get in. <laughs> Well, I don't know that that's the way to put it, Floyd, but it's not a bad idea, not bad at all. Shall we put it to a vote, fellows? Do I hear the name of Dr. Pettibone proposed for membership? I so propose. Is it seconded? Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The doc's a member. Who'll notify him? I propose that Mr. Gildersleeve and myself be appointed a committee of two to call upon the doctor and inform him of his good fortune. And don't forget what we elected him for. Move we adjourn. Seconded. Oh, wait a minute, fellows. What do you say? One more song before we go, eh? A song without Peavy? In honor of Peavy. Yeah, yeah. Peavy'd want it that way. Oh. Uh, sit down there, Floyd. You know, our big special. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, I miss you, dear old pal of mine. Each day I miss you. Could hear this. While sweet dreams rest you, dear old pal of mine. Dear old pal of The great Gildersleeve and his dear old pals will be back in just a moment. What are you going to tell us tonight about parquet margarine, Mr. Lang? Why, I was just thinking about that the other day while my family and I were driving through the country. As we passed by several fine-looking farms, it made me wonder how many people know that parquet margarine is made from choice products of our American farmlands. I'm sure we'd all like to hear about that. Because so many families use parquet margarine as a regular spread. Parquet, you see, is made from rich, highly refined vegetable oils and pasteurized skim milk, cultured for flavor. That sounds wholesome and nourishing. Indeed it does, for parquet is one of the finest energy foods you can serve. And remember, Kraft adds important vitamin A to every single pound, making parquet margarine an even more valuable food. Hmm, well, that's something we too often take for granted. And good nutrition is so important these days. Yes, and flavor is important, too. Helps us enjoy the things that are so good for us. That's why Kraft takes special care in flavor blending the fine, wholesome farm products used in Parquet. So join the millions who prefer delicious, nourishing Parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by Kraft. <laughs> Now let's get back to the great-hearted Gildersleeve. Driven by his concern for his old friend Peavy, we find him with Judge Hooker, a committee of two representing the Jolly Boys, walking into the office of Dr. Pettibone. Huh. Where is he? He must be inside. He's always here at 9 o'clock. Well, pick out a magazine and make yourself comfortable, Judge. Have you seen Hygieia for August 1942? <laughs> I've read it from cover to cover. Didn't help you any. <laughs> Gildy, may I suggest that since I know Pettibone better than you That you allow me to do most of the talking? You can do half of it now Let me start, let me explain the situation Pettibone's kind of touchy on some things, you know Now, what is there to be touchy about? Plenty, in the first place Oh, good morning, Judge Good morning, Miss Finlay 
<laughs> this is my friend, Mr. Gildersleeve, Miss Finley. Oh, how do you do? Uh, just fine, thank you. There's nothing the matter with me, Miss Finley. We're here to see the doctor on a personal matter. Oh, we'll go right in. Thank you. <laughs> see you later. <laughs> oh, hi, Doc. Good morning, gentlemen. <laughs> Pretty nice-looking receptionist you've got there. I'm surprised your wife lets you get away with it. She's my wife's cousin. She's, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, which one, of, which one of you fellows is sick? Neither of us, Doctor. That is, I'm feeling as well as usual. But we didn't come for a professional reason. We didn't? Please, Gildy, if you let me. Oh. No, Doctor, we came to bring you some good news. You know a few of us fellows have a little club. Oh, that. Club? Well, you know, what club? The Jolly Boys Club. It's just a few fellows, I guess you'd call us kindred spirits. And we generally get together on Saturday nights and raise Ned for a few hours. We sing, play cards, tell a few stories. Get on with it, Horace. Well, Doctor, Mr. Gildersleeve and I are a delegation, a committee of two officially chosen by the Jolly Boys Club to call on you. Well, what for? It is my pleasure and high privilege to announce your unanimous election to the Jolly Boys Club as a full participating member with all rights and perquisites pertaining thereto. The dues are 50 cents a month. Ah, I see. <laughs> do, do I know any of the other members? Chief of police? Oh, yes, yes, Chief Gates. He has a slight systolic murmur. You'd never know it to hear him sing. And you know Floyd Munson, the barber. We meet upstairs over his shop. Floyd? I set his leg when he broke it on election night back in 1936. Of course, you know Peavy the drugger. Peavy? Asthma. It's... Good fellow. Good fellow just the same. I think you find the Jolly Boys a pretty congenial group, Doctor. Well, I do enjoy a little card game occasionally. Dr. Pettibone, Mr. Ebert Ball is here. Oh, thank you. Now, if you fellas will excuse There's me... There's something else we have to ask you, Doctor. Let Mr. Ebert Ball wait a minute, will you? Well, he's got an appointment. Oh? Well, then we'd better come back later. No, no, Judge. It'll only take a second. Tell Ebert Ball to wait, Miss Finley. All right, Miss Finley. Yes, sir. <laughs> 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 it's this way, Doc. Now that you're a jolly boy, we can speak freely. Yes, you're one of us now, Doctor. And the motto of the jolly boys is, one for all, all for one. Yeah, what are you getting at? Well, it's about Peavy. Now, we all agree Peavy is a fine fellow. Yeah, yeah. And his wife, Mrs. Peavy, is a fine woman. Well, that may be. Take my word for it, she's a splendid woman. All right, all right. She's Florence Nightingale. What about it? As a jolly boy, Doctor... You wouldn't want anything to happen to Mrs. Peavy, would you? No, why? Is Peavy thinking of, uh, what, doing her in? Yes. I'm sure you're joking, Dr. Pettibone. They're a most devoted couple. Why, Peavy thinks the world of her. He often has... Ye to... gods, Judge, don't beat around the bush all night. I was just... Shut up, it's my turn to talk. <laughs> Pettibone, Mrs. Peavy needs some kind of an operation, and Peavy can't afford it. Will you do it? Gilly, that's not the way... Will you, Pettibone? Why the dickens should I? Pettibone, as a humanitarian and a jolly boy... Peavy hasn't seen fit to call me in on the case. I'm not going to take it away from another doctor. Are you going to let somebody else hold him up for a big fee? If the doctor on the case calls me in, I'll be very happy to consult with him. So Peavy can pay two bills instead of one, eh? Ha! Gildy, I don't think you understand Dr. Pettibone's position. Oh, yes, I do. You doctors are all the same, the way you back each other up. Well, let me tell you, Pettibone... Careful, Gildersleeve. Remember your hypertension. You can't... You can't scare me. Yeah. I'm certainly much obliged to your visit, gentlemen. Elect me to a club that meets over a barber shop, and then ask for a thousand dollars worth of surgery. Now, Pettibone, I don't think that's fair. If you'll excuse me, I have a two dollar cash patient in the waiting room. Huh. Come on, Judge. No, 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 this door, please. What? This way, Judge. Good day. Oh. Shoving us out the back door. We don't even get another look at that nurse. Well, fellas, how'd you make out? Floyd, we've got to call an emergency meeting of the Jolly Boys. Yeah, right away. Can we meet tonight, Floyd? Oh, what's the matter with right now? I got the chief under the towel here. Oh? Well, open them up. We've got to have a quorum. I can hear all right, boys. Go ahead with the meeting. All right, let's come to order. Now, uh, Pettibone didn't he react very favorably to our proposal. He didn't? You hear that, chief? Yep. He's a heel. Yeah, well, that may be, chief, but Peavy's as bad off as ever. Well, he runs that store like a museum. No wonder he don't make money. Modern merchandising methods would help, no doubt about it. Some of the tricks Beckman uses. Peavy's too stubborn to take advice, though. Do you think he'd accept the loan? He might. You got any money to loan him? 
No. Have you, Gildy? No. How about you, Floyd? Nope. We'll have to think of something else. <laughs> I know, fellas. Peavy needs money. Well, nobody's got enough to loan him, but we could spend some money. Suppose we tell all our friends to go into Peavy's and buy six months' drug supply in advance, or whatever they can afford. That's a possibility. Yeah, that sounds good, yeah. Hear that, Chief? Yeah, that's okay. Of course, we'll have to spend all we can, too. Now, why don't we get a six-month supply of hair tonic, Floyd? At retail? Listen, I'm a jolly boy, but I ain't that jolly. <laughs> well, a judge can buy his liver medicine for six months ahead. How do I know I'll live six months to enjoy it? Oh, what's the diff? You can't take it with you. What's Gildersleeve going to buy? Don't worry about me, Horace. I'll do some of my Christmas shopping. Eh, uh, how about the chief? What do you say, chief? Will you buy six months' drug supplies at Peavy's? Sure. What does that amount to, chief? Three cakes of soap. <laughs> You'll have to do more than that, chief. Okay, I'll send in some of the boys. That's the main thing. Send in lots of people. Everybody we know. High and low, rich and poor, young and old. Send them to Peavy's. Just a minute, Mrs. Ransom. I'll wait, Mr. Peavy. Good afternoon, Mrs. Bullock. Oh, Mrs. Ransom. Doing a little shopping? Yes. Isn't it fun and in such a good cause, too? Yes. 85, 170, 37, that's your skin lotion, and a dollar fifty for the candy. That'll be 747, Mrs. Bullard, and let's see, uh, 23 cents for the governor. Will that be all? Yes, thank you. 770 out of 10. 7 $10. I'll tuck the things in my market basket. There. Goodbye, Mr. Peavy. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now, Mrs. Ransom, what can I do for you? Well, I want just lots and lots of things. Mm, don't say. Oh, yes. I'd like three lipsticks and a half a dozen toothbrushes. Yeah, just and... a minute here, my goodness. <laughs> One thing at a time. And I also want a... Uh -huh. a... Hiya, Peavy. Hello, Mrs. Ransom. How's it going? I'm very well, thank you, Mr. Munson. Uh, wrap me up a dozen of those shaving bowls when you get a chance, Peavy. A dozen? Mm -hmm. And I want a dozen boxes of face tissues, please, Mr. Peavy. Well, I just happen to have them. I... Good afternoon. I'd like six bottles of cod liver oil, please. Madam, you'll have to wait your turn. Yes, Leroy, but you'll have to wait till I get to you. Okay, you got plenty of it? Oh, yeah. Hey, guys, he's got barrels of it. Come on in. Oh, oh my goodness gracious. One at a time, please. One at a time. Heavens to Betsy, the world's not coming to an end, you know. crowd. I thought people would be running in and out of this store like rabbits. Well, four o'clock in the afternoon, he can't be. Ah, uh, there he is. Hey, Peavy. I see you, Peavy. Let me in. Go away. Let me in. We're closed. <laughs> let me in anyway. Come on, let me in or I'll bust the door. No, please. Hurry up before somebody sees you. Peavy, what happened to your bell? The fuse blew out about a half hour ago. <laughs> or maybe it just wore out. <laughs> Been pretty busy today, have you, Peavy? Mr. Gildersleeve, I had to close up in self-defense. <laughs> Did you ever visit the stock exchange in Chicago? I saw the one in New York. I guess it's all the same. Fellas standing around yelling at each other. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's what's been going on in my store since about 12 noon today. The whole police force came in about 2 o'clock and bought toothpaste. <laughs> I just can't understand it. Well, the cops want to brush their teeth, that's all. 
And then Leroy came in and bought five dollars worth of chewing gum. Chewing gum? I told that kid to get something the whole family could use and enjoy. Oh, you sent Leroy? Yes, Peavy. Um, <clears throat> wasn't going to tell you this, but this whole thing was cooked up by the Jolly Boys. Mm, I'm afraid I don't understand you. Well, Peavy, we heard about Mrs. Peavy's trouble. Jolly Boys decided if you needed money, the main thing to do was to chase people in here to buy merchandise. Stock up on stuff they'd need later on. So you could have the cash now. You needn't thank us. Well, thank you, but uh, who told you Mrs. Peavy had any trouble, if I may ask? Well, Mrs. Ransom told me she needed an operation. Why? Uh, well, nothing in particular. She does need an operation, doesn't she? She's never mentioned it. <laughs> well, you can't fool me, old pal. Your wife's a sick woman and she needs a doctor's attention. Well, I don't know. She stacked a half a quart of stove wood yesterday. <laughs> Peavy, you're an imposter. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. You are. You deliberately gave Mrs. Ransom the idea you needed money for a doctor. But I never said... You can that... expect Leroy down here tomorrow morning with that chewing gum and see that he gets his money back. The very eye. Uh... <laughs> that man certainly has a temper. Yeah, I'll get back to my counting here. 200, 210, 12, 15. 215 dollars. <laughs> Not bad for the old lady's rheumatism. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve again in just a few moments. Don't you sometimes get a hankering for different kinds of bread, such as Johnny Cake, gingerbread, or muffins? I'm sure all these tasty hot breads will make a hit at your table, served with a delicious spread to make them taste extra good. And the spread I have in mind, of course, is parquet margarine, preferred by millions because of its fresh, sweet, delicate flavor. Melting into hot breads like Johnny Cake and gingerbread, parquet really is delicious. Your first taste will tell you why it's still unmatched for fresh, delicate flavor. Another reason you'll like parquet margarine is the smooth, easy way it spreads. And remember, too, parquet is only about half the price of costly spreads. So be sure to insist on economical, flavor-fresh parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Hey, Unc, can I borrow your... Hey, look where you're going. Pulling your feet. Unc, can I borrow your hatchet for a little while? No, Leroy. What for? Piggy and I need it, just for a few minutes. My hatchet is not a toy, young man. What do you want it for? Uh, just a little Halloween trick we thought of. There'll be no tricks, no, sir. What is the trick? I don't want Marge to hear. What is it? Well, I could whisper. Hey, no fair. That is outrageous, Leroy. Absolutely not. How can you even think of such a thing? Who on earth could you think of doing such a thing to? Well, we were thinking of Judge Hooker. The hatchet's in the garage. <laughs> but remember, I told you not to. <laughs> Go to bed, Leroy. I want to sit up and listen to Jack Benny. <laughs> Good night, everybody. The Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry and is written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekin. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Youngsters get hungry at all hours. And when they do, treat them to Pab Step, the delicious golden cheese food. You can just bet they'll like Pab Step. It's so rich in cheddar cheese flavor, so easy to digest. Children simply love Pab Step spread on crackers or bread. And remember, Pabstad is equally delicious, melted into a luscious cheese sauce, toasted for sandwiches, or served in wedges with fruit or pie for dessert. Don't forget to buy Pabstad. Add delicious, nourishing Pabstad cheese food to your shopping list tomorrow. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> it's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by The Kraft Foods Company makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Now let's join the great Gildersleeve. But first, let's decide which Gildersleeve we want to join. For Gildersleeve is a man of many sides. Shall it be Gildersleeve, the man of action? (laughs) Or Gildersleeve, the guardian and protector of his niece and nephew? Leroy, stick in your shirt tail. Or Gildersleeve, the great lover. (laughs) No, let us drop in on still another Gildersleeve. The Gildersleeve the world knows as Summerfield's water commissioner. The big shot in his private office in the city hall. Gildersleeve, the executive. (laughs) Wonder what time it is. (sighs) Quarter of five? Must be later than that. Oh, Bessie. Bessie. That Bessie, I'm going to have to let her go. Bessie! Did you call me, Mr. Gildersleeve? That I did, Bessie. What time is it by the clock out there? By the clock? Quarter five. Oh, well, all right. Certainly feels later. Have you taken care of these things, Mr. Gildersleeve? I'd like to clear up your desk a little. Yes, it's a mess. How do you expect me to get any work done, Bessie, when you leave papers all over my desk? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gildersleeve. You told me to leave all those folders on annual rainfall so you could use them in your budget report. Oh, rainfall folders. Oh, that's what these are. But what's all this pile here? Oh, those are the monthly financial reports for 1945. You asked for them last week. I wonder what for. (laughs) Yes, sir, I wondered myself. (laughs) Well, take them away till I think of it. Yes, sir. What's all this stuff over here? Oh, that's your immediate file, Mr. Gildersleeve. Immediate? Getting a little behind on that, aren't we? (laughs) Yes, sir. Well, no time like the present, Bessie. Let's just wade through this pile and clean it up. Now? Yes, now. Put that other stuff in the files and then bring your book. Yes, sir. Let's see here. State Association of Water Commissioners. Dear Mr. Gildersleeve, we're making a survey to determine the average power input of municipal pumps in this state. If you could get these figures from your engineer sometime in the next few days and forward them to us promptly, we'll be greatly obliged. Yours truly. Bessie, uh, Bessie. Oh, you're here. Uh, uh, Call Charlie Anderson out at the reservoir, please. Yes, sir. Take this, Bessie, while you're waiting. Uh, State Association of Water Commissioners, dear sirs, in reply to yours of August 10th, (laughs) she... Hello, uh, Mr. Gildersleeve calling. Yeah, thank you, Bessie. Hello, Charlie. How's it going? Well, never mind how it's going. I want you to give me some figures. What's the power input on our pump out there? No, Charlie, that's no attitude. You mean you don't know? Then figure it out and call me back. It's not a waste of time. It's very important. And if you... Hello. Hello. He hung up. Uh, George, if I knew where to find another engineer, but I don't. Uh, What have you got there, Bessie? In reply to yours of August 10th. August 10th. Well, the survey must be over by now. Throw that away, Bessie. We'll tackle something else. (laughs) Yes, sir. Uh, Let's see. What's this one? Oh, yeah. Mrs. Joel Toddbinder. I can't believe I used the amount of water for which you have billed me during the month of September. Kindly explain. Oh, there's four or five letters like that. There are? These people think we do. Make up meter readings out of our heads? Take this. Dear Mrs. Toddbinder... Uh, several of these, you say, Bessie? Yes, sir. And we ought to have a form answer for it. I'll make up a form letter and you can send it to all these people. Yes, sir. But I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> Anything else that's, uh, pressing? Well, the whole file requires immediate answers, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, we made a good start on it, Bessie. I doubt if we could finish it tonight anyway. Suppose we get at it bright and early tomorrow morning. Yes, sir. What time is it now, Bessie? Well, my watch says a quarter to five. And your watch is slow. A quarter to five, ten or fifteen minutes ago. Time to close up, Bessie. If you say so, Mr. Gildersleeve. I do say so. But bright and early tomorrow, Bessie. Bright and early tomorrow. Oh, the trouble I've seen. No 
Nobody knows my son. Hiya, Bertie. You can't have nothing to eat now, Leroy. It's too close to supper. Okay. I told you time and time again, if you want to eat, you come to me right after school and I'll fix you something. You can't come in here just before supper and fill up your stomach. I'm not even hungry. Well, you better be hungry when you sit down at the table. I got us a roast of beef tonight with our brand new November points. Yeah? What's the matter with you, Leroy? Don't you feel good? Yeah, I feel okay. I got another bad report card today. Oh, that's what's preying on your mind. I thought you'd been mighty quiet this afternoon. I'm afraid Uncle hit the roof. Oh, he won't hurt you. He sure was mad last time. I'm scared to show it to him. Make a clean breast of it, Leroy. That's the only way. Just say I done it and I'm sorry. Yeah? Yeah, that's the way I do every time I bust a cup. You do? Yes, sir. Everything open and above board. Handle it that way, nobody ever gets anything on Birdie. Well, I tried hiding it last time. What happened? She. <laughs> I might try your system this time. What could I lose? That's probably your uncle now, Leroy. Yeah. Go on, son. Get it over with. The sooner you show it to him, the sooner it's all over. That's what I'm afraid of. Go on. He won't hurt you. Well, I'll try it. It's not particularly early, Leroy. Oh, well, I'm glad you're home anyway. Isn't it nice that Unc's home, Marge? What? Well, thank you, my dear. <laughs> ah, never mind her. Uh, the reason I'm glad you're home is there's something I want to talk to you about, Unc. All right, Leroy, just as soon as I wash my hands. Okay. Gee, it sure gets dark early these days, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Probably on account of daylight saving, huh? I suppose so. I wish they'd go back to the old way. It's better for people's eyes, don't you think so? Uh, possibly. If they put back daylight saving... Leroy, it will not be necessary for you to supervise my washing. Well, I don't intend to supervise... Stay I... out. <laughs> Did you have a nice wash? Yeah, fine. Thank you. Here's tonight's paper, Unc. Haven't even opened it. Well, a treat. Thank you very much. <sighs> Something you wanted to ask me, was there, my boy? I got my report card today, and it's pretty bad. Oh? Let me see it. I got bad marks and everything. I don't know how to explain it. I work hard. I do all the stuff. I don't know. I must be dumb or something. Come here, Leroy. Let me see the card. Yes, sir. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, Leroy. Isn't it terrible, Unc? I feel pretty bad about it. Huh? I got my report card today, and I did swell and everything. Shut up, will you? There must be some explanation for this, Leroy. It's just my fault, Unc, that's all. I'm not blaming anybody but myself. That's no explanation. I never had any trouble when I was in the B-7. All that stuff is easy. Marjorie, I think you better leave this to me. Yeah. Well, all I know is anybody that tries can learn that stuff in their sleep. In his sleep, and I will handle this, please. Leroy, this is, well, it's very serious. I know it, Unc. I sure hope I can do better next month. Yes, well, I'm sure that you... I just have to work harder than ever, that's all. Are you kidding? Yeah. Now, Marjorie, let's not assume Leroy is insincere. I believe your brother is ready to turn over a new leaf. I think we should help him. That's right. If you buckle down and work hard, my boy, you can show improvement. You're not stupid. I should say not. Only all the stuff is so hard. It's over my head. It's not really, my boy. Not if you understand it. Perhaps I can explain some of it to you. Could you, Unc? Help you every night of the week if you want. Gee, that'd be super. Because I really got a load. Monday night, I have to do English, and Tuesday night is my arithmetic night, and Wednesday is history. Don't tell me anymore, Leroy. You'll talk me out of it. <laughs> this looks like one of my bad weeks. The Great Gildersleeve will be back in just a moment. 
The other day, while I was waiting my turn at the grocery store refrigerator, I saw a lady trying to decide which spread to buy. Naturally, since my job is to sell parquet, I thought I'd give it a little boost. So I said... Have you ever tried parquet margarine? Well, I've heard of it often. Is it really as good as people say? Yes, ma'am. I know lots of people think parquet's fine, fresh flavor is the best they've ever tried. Well, that's what I'm looking for. A spread for bread and toast that really tastes good. And I know that you're also interested in good nutrition. Now, on the package here, you'll notice that parquet is made from rich in energy vegetable oils from the farm and that it's fortified with important vitamin A. And you can plainly see from the price tag that parquet margarine is only about half the price of costly spreads. Now, I'm just repeating to you folks what I told the lady, and I'm happy to say that I helped make a sale. So next time you do your shopping, I hope you decide to buy delicious, economical parquet, the spread preferred by millions because it tastes so good. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Now let's get back to our story and see how Gildersleeve has been getting along with the education of his nephew. To tell the truth, he hasn't really got around to it. Monday night... Well, Monday, something came up. Tuesday night... Tuesday night, I ran into a friend. Wednesday night... Well, Wednesday was something else. Now it's Thursday, and even Leroy is getting uneasy. Look, Uncle, let's face it. I've got to write a composition about the Missouri Compromise, and I've got to have it in tomorrow. Confound it, Leroy. Haven't you done that yet? No, and that's not all. I've got about nine million problems in arithmetic and a map to draw and a whole lot of spelling. Why do you let it pile up this way? Why do you keep putting it off? I was waiting for you to help me like you promised. Excuses? All I get is excuses. You did say you'd help him, Uncle Mort. Thanks, Marge. When I need to be reminded of my promises, my dear, I'll ask for it. Well, holler. I'll be up in my room. Yeah. <laughs> that girl. There's such a thing as being too smart. I wish she'd get a low report card just once. Well, Leroy, come on. Let's see what seems to be the trouble here. What's your most difficult subject? History. What don't you understand about it? I don't get it, that's all. I can't learn it. Never say can't, my boy. Well, I can't. Nonsense. History can be a very interesting subject. If you approach it properly... Well, how do you approach it? By the simple process of learning it. Just learn it, that's all. But I can't. Don't keep saying that. Of course you can learn it. I learned it, you can learn it. Now, for instance, you've got to write a composition about the Louisiana Purchase. Very well. The Missouri Compromise. All right, the Missouri Compromise. It's the same thing. Are you kidding? (laughs) Well, that is, I mean they're related. Everything in history is related, my boy. That's the important thing in history, to learn the relation of things. Now, for example, Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. Remember that, Leroy, that's mighty important. But it was Rogers and Clark who discovered the Northwest Territory. I don't get the relation. Well, you're a little young, I guess. <laughs> yeah, let's get down to this composition of yours now. What was it to be? The Missouri Compromise. Oh, yes, that. What was the Missouri Compromise, Unc? Uh, well, it took place in Missouri, my boy. <laughs> Natch, but what was it? Uh, it took place some years ago, as I remember. I forget the exact date. I know the date, 1820. But well, what was it? The Missouri Compromise? Well, it was a sort of a compromise. <laughs> that is to say, it was, well, just what it says, the Missouri Compromise. Everybody knows what the Missouri Compromise was. Um, will you tell me one thing? What? What good is history, anyway? Well, history is a lot of good. If you learn it now, it'll help you in later life. How? Well, that depends. It depends on what you do in later life. Yes. Have you given any thought to that, my boy? What do you plan to be when you grow up? How should I know? Confounded Leroy. You see, that's what's the matter with you. You have no purpose, no sense of responsibility, no plan in life. You just live from day to day. But, Uncle, I'm just a little kid. If you're old enough to stay up till 9.30 at night, you're old enough to be responsible. You've got to organize yourself, my boy. You've got to start making sense. Doorbell. I'll get it. There you go. Right while I'm trying to talk to you. Hi, Judge. Come in. Thank you, Leroy. Is your uncle planning to go to the meeting, do you know? I don't know, but he's right in here if you want to talk to him. Oh, hello, Horace. Evening, Gildy. 
Going to the school board meeting? I can't. I promised to help Leroy with his homework tonight. Well, I'm sure Leroy won't mind. I he... never break a promise to a child, Judge. That's something I make a point of. Huh. Leroy, go to your room. <laughs> I didn't mean anything, Unc. You can't work down here anyway with people dropping in all the time. Pardon me. Oh, no offense, Judge. <laughs> Stick around. Leroy, you go upstairs and get started on that composition. I'll come up later and see how you're doing. But you still haven't told me about the Missouri Compromise. Why should I? It's all in the encyclopedia. Go look it up. That's what education is for, my boy, to teach you to look things up. And that's what the encyclopedia is for, to look things up in. I still don't see what the Missouri... Don't bother me anymore with the Missouri Compromise. Ye gods, go upstairs and get to work. Oh, uh, that boy. I don't know what I'm going to do about him, Horace. No power of concentration. Puts everything off. Completely disorganized. Oh, I don't know. I was talking to him just now. Absolutely no sense of responsibility. No thought for the future. I asked him what he wanted to be when he grows up. He doesn't know. The boy has no life plan. What's your life plan, Gildy? Huh? <laughs> I say, what's your life plan? What do you mean? Well, what thought have you given to the future? Are you going to be a small-town water commissioner all your life? The office of water commissioner, Horace, is not one to be sneezed at. Hmm. Big frog in a little puddle. <laughs> That's all you are, Gildy. I resent that. I don't know where you get off to talk about Leroy. You're not even a very good water commissioner. Horace! Well, be honest with yourself, Gildy. Are you? You aren't there half the time. You shilly-shally, you put things off. There's no saying, you know, Gildy, procrastination is the thief of time. I know, I know. Well, it's true. You've been in that office three years now. What have you done? And what did you do before that? And what are you going to do in the future? I don't know, Horace. I just don't know. I'm saying this is your friend, Throckmorton. You are my friend, Horace, and I hope I'm yours. I've always so considered you. But what you've got to realize, old friend, I'm only saying this for your own good. I know that. What you've got to realize is... You only got into that office on a political fluke. And you could be bounced out tomorrow. Horace, you haven't heard anything. No. But if they ever got on to you, if anybody ever found out how little you really know about it, why, you don't know anything about the water department. You're just a glad hander. That's all, just a small-town politician. You don't know beans about hydraulics or anything else. And you've never taken the trouble to learn. You've just been so doggone lazy. Horace, don't! Well, it's true. All these things you accuse Leroy of, he's just a chip off the old block. You're right. I've been a bad uncle. I wouldn't go as far as that. I but... have. I've set him a bad example. Oh, it isn't that so much, Gildy. But what provisions have you made for the future? Suppose you were to get the can tied to you. No. <laughs> have you made any plans? Have you saved up any money? I don't even need to ask. I'm no good. I'm not worrying about you. You'd get along somehow. But what about Marjorie and Leroy? Those two sweet children. I'm no good, Horace. I'm just no good. Have nothing to do with me. Now, now, old friend, that's not the way to take it. I'm a failure, a big, fat failure. <laughs> well, be that as it may, and I'm not altogether denying it. <laughs> the thing to do is not to give in to it. What do you mean? Advise me, Horace. Well, you want to be a success in life? You want to be a good water commissioner? Make yourself one. But how? Work, study, improve yourself. Go to bed early, get up early. I will. I'll go to bed at 9 o'clock. Study engineering. Learn hydraulics. Learn... But how? I'm no chicken, you know. Why, any good correspondence school must have a course in hydraulics. Write to them and... I'll do it. I'll write to them this very night, Horace. Oh, Judge, I don't know what to say to you, but... Thanks, old friend. Thanks a million. Say, Unc, I can't find anything in here about the Missouri Compromise. I looked under history and all it said... Don't bother me with your problems now, my boy. I have problems of my own. Well, for cat's sake... Bertie, Marjorie, where's last Sunday's paper? Last Sunday's paper, you say, Mr. Gill, please? Yes. Why is it the Sunday paper always has to be thrown out before I can get a chance to read it? This is Thursday, Uncle Morris. You... I never throw out nothing, Mr. Gillsleeve. I put all the papers in the wood closet there, just as always. First I ever heard of it. Well, never mind, Bertie. I'll... 
Hey, here it is in the wood closet. What's the use of me talking? If you're looking for the funnies by any chance, they might just possibly be up in my room. No, I'm looking for the book section. Here. I saw it in here. I know I saw it in here. Ah, the Alexander Hamilton Institute. Now, clear out, everybody, please. I've got to write a letter. Marjorie, get that junk off the desk, will you? Come along, Leroy. I never heard such a fuss about writing a letter. Who's he writing to, President Truman? No, Alexander Hamilton. Oh, now, who's that? The minute I sit down, i got to get up and answer the... Well, hello, Leela. Come in. Oh, thank you, Throckmorton. I just dropped over to see if there was any gentleman who'd care to invite a lady to the movies. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I'd like to, Leela. But... They're showing romance in the rain. Oh, well, I'd love to go, Leela. The only thing is, in the first place, I've already seen the picture. Oh, did you see it alone? Or... No, I saw it with somebody. Oh. How did you like the picture, Throckmorton? Well, to tell the truth, I thought it was a little shallow, Leela. Oh, you went with Miss Goodwin. Yes. Well, <laughs> well, you wouldn't mind seeing it again, I'm sure. I always think what you get out of a picture depends so much on who you see it with, don't you? You bet. I'd love to go, Leela, but you see, I've got to write this letter, and I promised myself I'd get it off this evening. Oh, an old letter. Well, it's kind of important to me. You see, it's kind of a test, Leela. Of myself, I mean. Mm -hmm. I promised myself that for once I'd do something and stick to it. You know, Throckmorton, I don't think you like me anymore. Oh, but I do, Leela. Really, but you just don't understand. Well, not if I practically throw myself at you and you tell me you have to stay home and write a letter to somebody else. But, Leela, I... Gee, I'd like to, but... Leela, tell me something. Yes? Do you think I'm a failure? Well, certainly not. Do you think I'm nothing but a glad-hander and a small-time politician? Gracious, who could ever think a thing like that? <laughs> well, that's all I want to know. Let's go to the movies. Mr. Gildersleeve, well. Hello, Phoebe. Out for a little constitutional, you two? No, we've just come from the movie. Oh. Mrs. Oh. Ransom thought she'd like a hot chocolate. Mm, it's so cold out. It is a little chilly. I I'll just warm it up a little. It won't take a minute. <laughs> Something for you, Mr. Gildersleeve? No, thanks, Phoebe. Nothing. Well, it's not like you, Throckmorton. You sure? And... Um, Peavy, if you should see Judge Hooker, I'd be grateful if you didn't mention to him that you saw me this evening or that I went to the movies. Just as you say, Mr. Jellison. What's wrong, Morton? What possible difference could it make to Horace? Oh, none. I'd just rather he didn't know, that's all. What's wrong, honey? You don't seem like yourself tonight. Nothing. You haven't seemed like yourself all evening, except when you fell asleep there. <laughs> and that was only for many. Well... I feel I've been a bad boy this evening, that's all. Why ever should you? Because, Leela, there were some things I promised myself I was going to do. I was going to help Leroy, and I didn't. And I was going to write to some people, the Alexander Hamilton Institute. Yeah, there you are, Mrs. Ransom. Oh, thank you, Mr. Peavy. It's hot, watch out. And so you folks went to the movies, eh? How was the picture? Oh, just wonderful. So, so. I don't get to go to many movies myself. Mrs. Peavy likes to go occasionally, but I have to work late here. Peavy, so. you don't know how lucky you are. I don't know. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> yes, you are, Peavy. You're one of the luckiest men I know. You know what you want out of life, and you get it. You're a real success. Yeah, I'm much obliged. But and I'm... another thing where you're lucky. You're married. And I could answer that, too. <laughs> Certainly, you don't have a lot of temptations to keep you from doing what you should be doing. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say that either. Throckmorton, I just don't understand what you're talking about. You wouldn't understand if I told you, Leela. This has to do with life. Oh? Yeah, drink your chocolate. <laughs> Men are so strange sometimes. Uh, what I mean to say, Peavy, is, well, confounded, here you are working till 11 o'clock at night. You stick to things. You get them done. You have willpower. 
Well, Mr. Gildersleeve, I'll tell you a little about that. You might not think it, but it used to be I had a lot of trouble with my willpower. Fact, I was this way and that about things. Just couldn't seem to make up my mind. Then one summer, Mrs. Peavy and I took a little trip. Well, uh, what's that got to do with uh, willpower? Well, I'm coming to that. We took a trip to Chautauqua, you know. They have a sort of a camp meeting there with lectures and so on. There's one fellow, he's quite a talker. Big, tall fellow, I remember, with black hair and a gold tooth. His lecture was about willpower. Well, uh, what do you have to say about it? Well, it was his theory that if you believe you can do a thing, you can do it. That's what he said. If you believe it hard enough, you can do it. Got him there? Hmm, maybe. I'll never forget that fellow. He stood up there and sort of flung his arms around when he talked, and his eyes were black, and they seemed to bore right through you. Yeah? I remember the words he said when he was winding up. He banged on the desk, and he shouted, I am the captain of my faith and my unconquerable soul. Looked at me when he said it. <laughs> and from then on, your willpower was okay? Well, not exactly. I've always suspected that Mrs. Peavy thought the fellow was looking at her. Because if there was ever a woman with an unconquerable soul... <laughs> keeps me on the beam, though. Yeah, but it's Mrs. Peavy's willpower. Do you think I'd be down here working till 11 o'clock at night if I had my way about it? <laughs> Why, you're no better than the rest of us, Peavy. You say what? By George, you're all right. Have a hot chocolate on me. <laughs> you feeling better now, Frogmore? Oh, great. You want to know something, Peavy? That hooker, the sanctimonious old goat, he's the biggest faker in this town. Well, now, I... You may be right. <laughs> Come along, Leela. Good night, Phoebe. <laughs> the great Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few moments. One of the pleasant ways I like to spend an evening at home is to relax in a big easy chair with a good book to read and a big bowl full of popcorn to eat. Now, if anyone in your family likes popcorn as much as I do, here's a simple recipe you'll surely want to try. While the kernels of corn are popping away, melt some flavor-fresh parquet margarine in a saucepan. Pour the popcorn into a big bowl, season with salt, and then drench with melted parquet. Good? Man, there's a way to really enjoy popcorn, thanks to Parquet's fine, fresh flavor. And, of course, I expect you all know that Parquet is a favorite spread for bread, preferred by millions because it tastes so good. So for a flavor that's still unmatched, buy delicious, economical Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, Parquet Margarine, made by Kraft. <laughs> Just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. My little niece, Marjorie, wants to say something. Well, it's about the Junior Red Cross. That's the American Red Cross for students in high school and elementary school. Yes, fine organization. Well, the Junior Red Cross does a lot of important work. During the war, we contributed millions of useful things the soldiers asked for. And now we're working to collect clothes for the orphan children in Greece and school equipment for Yugoslav and Polish children. We really do lots of good things. Don't you think all school children should join it? I do indeed, my dear. I think you presented it very w nicely, too. And I hope all the children listening will join the Junior Red Cross. Good night, everybody. Goodbye. The Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekin. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> it's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by The Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Every man should have a hobby, or so the doctors tell us, and Gildersleeve has his. You'll find him at it morning, noon, and night, his eyes shining, his mouth watering, and his napkin tucked under his chin. This evening, however, appears to be a semi-formal occasion, for the Gildersleeve napkin is at half-mast. He has tucked it daintily into the top of his vest in honor of his old friend, Judge Hooker, whom he is entertaining at a family dinner. Judge, pass your plate and let me give you a little more of the fresh meat. Well, if you insist, but only a very tiny piece, Scott Horton. About like that? Well, not that tiny. <laughs> <laughs> I should like to say at this time, Bertie, that this is one of the most superb dinners I've ever encountered. Oh, shucks, it's just a dinner. I'd call it a masterpiece of the culinary art. Yeah, Bertie's a jewel, all right, Judge. The kind that's hard to find. Didn't say that again. I speak as one who has had three housekeepers in the last three months, all incompetent, and none of them cooks. You hold still, Judge, and I'll go get you some more biscuits. Hey, Leroy, that's my glass. Hey, look, I can play a tune. That'll do, Leroy. <laughs> Leroy's performance calls to mind the old Swiss bell ringers they used to have in vaudeville. Have either of you children hey, ever... Hank. Uh, excuse me, Judge. Hey, Unc, can I go to the Majestic a week from Thursday? We'll see, Leroy. I gotta go. Can I, Unc, please? They're gonna have Famous Jones. I told you, Leroy, we'll see who's Famous Jones. Never heard of Famous Jones? How do you like that, Marsh? He never heard of Famous Jones. That fails to surprise me. But Famous Jones? Holy smoke. You ought to keep in touch more, Unc. I'm in touch with all I can handle right now, Leroy. <laughs> And I repeat, who is this famous Jones? He asks me, who is famous Jones? He's a famous colored drummer, the best in the world. Famous Jones and his band. He's super. You ought to hear him. Stop beating on the chinaware, Leroy. Now fold your hands and sit still till dessert. Okay, but can I go, huh, Uncle, a week from Thursday? We'll see when the time comes. Oh, please. It's far too far off to even discuss. We don't have to discuss it. All I want is an answer, so I'm going to... No. That's your answer. Now, are you satisfied? Gosh. The judge and I are trying to talk, my boy. It's time you realize that other people besides yourself have things to talk about. <laughs> Sorry, Judge. What were we talking about? I don't know. <laughs> you were talking about Swiss bell ringers. Oh, yes. What about the Swiss bell ringers, Judge? Well, they, they ring bells. They ring bells. Uh, here's Bertie with the biscuits. Nice and hot, Judge. Have some. Thank you. You know, Bertie, I was just remarking to Mr. Gildersleeve that he's a very lucky man. He has the finest cook in seven counties. Oh, go on. Have a whole lot of biscuits, Judge. <laughs> it's fact. I'm going to steal you one of these days, Bertie, if Mr. Gildersleeve doesn't watch out. I'll be watching. Don't worry. You sure you're happy here, Bertie? No, Hooker. What does he pay you? Are you getting decent wages? None of your business. You have a nice room, have you? Fresh wallpaper and all that, I suppose. Radio, of course. Listen, you old goat. This is the last time I invite you to dinner. <laughs> Only joking, Gildy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but it's such an old joke, Horace. Do you have to keep repeating it? What were you banging on just now, young man? I was drumming. What were you banging on? On the table here. It sounded pretty good, huh? On the table? Huh. Look, you see those dents? Dents? Yes, dents. You've made dents in a genuine Philippine mahogany table. Those little teeny marks, who'd notice them? Leroy, I'll not have you smashing up the furniture around here. Now find something else to drum on or quit drumming. Bertie said I could have a dishpan. I said quit drumming. <laughs> okay. 
Did I tell you I decided what I want for Christmas? My boy, it's much too soon to discuss Christmas presents. Well, gosh, you might like to know I only want one thing this year. I would like to read the morning paper, Leroy, if I may. Go ahead. Who's stopping you? Yes. <laughs> Why, George, if it isn't one thing, it's another. Pavlova. Marjorie, stop that racket. Marjorie. Marjorie. I can't hear myself think. Yeah, it's terrible. Never mind sticking in your oar. Now, what's the matter? My dear, I don't want to interfere with your career in the ballet, but a man can stand only so much. That infernal racket upstairs. Well, I have to practice. Perhaps you'd like me to go away somewhere and study. Perhaps you'd like to send me to New York. New York? Well, that's where the best teachers are in this country. My dear, you're not thinking of leaving home. Well, I can't study with a small-town gym teacher all my life. That settles it. This has gone far enough. Ballet dancing is all very well for exercise, but it's no life. You've got to get these notions out of your head, my dear. You've got to be learning some of the fundamental things, the normal things. You think dancing is abnormal? Well... It's abnormal to be thinking about nothing else. Normal things for a girl to learn are cooking, sewing, washing, and ironing. That's one of Mother Nature's laws. They bore me. Well, they won't bore your husband when the time comes for you to get married. You think all a husband wants is someone to feed him and, and send his clothes to the laundry? Well, that's not all there is to marriage. <laughs> But those things are important. Believe me, when a man comes to think about a woman seriously, he considers everything. You said it. Leroy, you're... <laughs> you're not old enough to have an opinion on this question. Okay, I sure hope I get a dame that can bake a cake, that's all. <laughs> That'll do. Marjorie, has it occurred to you that you might want to master some of these boring things, like cooking, simply to attract a husband? That happens to be one thing I don't have to worry about. What do you mean? I have an understanding with Marshall Bullard. What? Well, isn't that nice? Am I to take this as a formal announcement? There's nothing formal about it. Marshall and I have this understanding that we both have our careers, and then when we're 35, we'll get married. <laughs> if we both still want to. 35? Ah, she'll be a grandmother by then. <laughs> Leroy, will you please stay out of this? Marjorie, you can't be engaged to Marshall Bullard till you're 35 years old. Well, we won't be engaged, exactly. We expect to have other men and women friends in between. Leroy, leave the room, please. <laughs> Why? Leave the room. Go outdoors. Play with your drumsticks. Anything. Okay. Gosh, what did I do? And don't slap... Don't slam the door. <laughs> Marjorie, marriage is it? Well, it's a very serious thing. Okay, what of it? I just told you it'll be years before we even consider it. That's what I mean, my dear. I don't think you quite understand all the problems involved. Do you? Well, I'm a good deal older than you, my dear. You're not married. No, but I almost was. <laughs> Maybe I should have been. Maybe you should. Mrs. Ransom might have taught you a few things. No, my dear. Well, you're certainly no authority on marriage. If you'll excuse me, I'll get back to my own affairs. <sighs> what am I going to do with her? If it was Leroy, I'd know. But Marjorie, I don't know. Say. <laughs> Hello, Leela? Doc Martin Gildersleeve. Uh, say, Leela, could you do me a big favor? Well, come right over, will you? Quick. Add a girl. I'll do the same for you sometime. <laughs> yeah. Goodbye. Oh, Marjorie. Marjorie. Yes, I mean, no. That is, well, nothing in particular. Sit down. Where's Leela? 
Is that what you called me downstairs for? Nothing in particular? Huh? Oh, no, no, no. I wanted to have a talk with you. You just had a talk with me. Yes, well, I wanted to have another talk with you. Sit down. I'm sitting down. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, so you are. I... <laughs> well, uh, where is she? Uncle Mort, if you have nothing to say to me, I might as well go back upstairs. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have lots to say to you. How did school go today? That's fine. Glad to hear it. <laughs> what I wanted to say, my dear. There she is. Uh, well, now, who could that be? I'll go and see. Leela, well, this is a pleasant surprise. Surprise? I thought you said to come right over. Shh. <laughs> Come in, Leela. Awfully glad you decided to drop over. Yes, indeed. Marjorie and I have just been sitting here having a little heart-to-heart chat. Haven't we, my dear? Hello, Marjorie. Hello, Mrs. Ransom. Uh, Marjorie, I wonder if you'd mind running into my study and closing the window in there. I seem to feel a little draft. Would you mind? Not at all. Leela, hmm. help me out, huh? Hmm. Marjorie's being a little difficult, and I thought if you could say a word to her, it might make more of an impression. Why, certainly, Throckmorton. Uh, what do you want me to say? Well, she seems to think, because I'm her uncle, I don't know anything. Uh, about girls, I mean. Uh-huh. But you're a married woman. I mean, you were. And if you told her... Oh, back already, my dear. <laughs> Did you close the window? The window wasn't open. Well, can you beat that? I could have sworn I felt a draft. (laughs) Well, that just goes to show. I think as long as Mrs. Ransom's here, I'll excuse myself if you don't mind, Uncle Mort. No, no, no. Stick around, my dear. You know, Leela, it's quite a coincidence you're mentioning the thing you were just talking about. What was I talking about? (laughs) About how important it is for a woman to know how to sew and cook and all those things. Oh? Yeah, yeah. You see, Marjorie and I were just having a little discussion about that, weren't we, my dear? Uncle Mort, who are you trying to fool? I don't know what you mean. You got Mrs. Ransom over here to lecture me because you weren't getting anywhere yourself, so Now, you... Marjorie, all your uncle did, he called me up and I... Leela! <laughs> all right, maybe I did. But it wouldn't do you any harm for once to listen to your elders. Oh, now, Throckmorton, that's no way to persuade anybody. Marjorie, honey, pay no attention to your uncle. Leela, that's not what I got you over here for, to tell her to ignore me. Well, what is it you wanted me to talk with a bathrock, Martin? He wants me to get married, and I have no intention of marrying till I'm 35. It's not that, but she's got a lot of fool notions in her head about a career, Leela. I want you to tell her it's important to a woman to learn the old-fashioned virtues first. Oh, it is, Marjorie. It's terribly important. What old-fashioned virtues, Frog <laughs> Well, things like cooking and sewing and sweeping and dusting. Well, of course, I don't know a thing about those things, Frog Martin. I never did. Huh? Well, I always had those things done for me all the time I was married. We always had so many servants. There. Just what I've been saying. Yes, but where are you going to find servants these days? Tell me that. Well... Yeah, I didn't think of that, did you? Maybe you'll be a little more inclined to listen to me hereafter. Of course, Rock Martin, there's always Bertie. Why, of course, Bertie. When we're married, Bertie can come with us. Over my dead body. Oh, well, you won't be needing us, Rock Martin. You'll be so old by then. Oh. <laughs> we'll take Bertie, and you can come and visit us every year. How will that be? Listen, you can take my house, you can take my car, you can take my debts and assets, but nobody takes Bertie, understand? Bertie stays with me. You talking to me, Mr. Gillespie? You're staying with me. Yes, I wasn't going nowhere. All right. <laughs> the great Gildersleeve will be back in just a moment. Mr. Lang, you always speak with such enthusiasm about the fine flavor of parquet margarine. You bet. You just can't beat parquet as a spread for bread, rolls, muffins, pancakes, waffles. And I've heard you say that parquet margarine is so wonderfully nourishing, too. That's right. Parquet margarine is one of the best energy foods you can serve. It's made from vegetable oils from the farm, oils rich in energy, and it's fortified with important vitamin A. Well, what I'm leading up to is this. My family's food bill is not getting any lower. 
And I certainly appreciate the fact that Parquet Margarine provides my family with such fine nourishment at so little cost. Well, that's something all homemakers appreciate. And remember, for only about half the price of costly spreads, your family, too, can enjoy Parquet's fine, fresh flavor. As a matter of fact, millions of American families do prefer Parquet Margarine to any other spread because it tastes so good. Yes, it pays to buy delicious, economical Parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet Margarine. One of the quality foods made by Kraft Foods Company. Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. Having failed in his efforts to interest his niece in the domestic arts with the aid of Mrs. Ransom, he tries characteristically to reason with Marjorie himself. A sample of his reasoning. By George, you'll learn housework whether you want to or not. End of sample. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. We'll join Gildersleeve in just a minute. Let's pop into his kitchen first, where we find Leroy entertaining the priceless birdie. How's that, birdie? Well, it's noisy. Well, I haven't got quite perfect yet, but what can you expect on a dishpan? It's a good riff, though. I stole it off one of Famous Jones' records. Famous Jones. I used to know him. You knew him? To say hello to? We went to school together in Chicago. Gosh. He's coming here next week to the Majestic. Will you go and see him? No. Famous wouldn't remember me. It's been so long ago. I sure never thought Famous was going to be famous in them days. Nobody else did either. (laughs) Didn't he play drums in school? (laughs) He didn't do much of anything except get in trouble. What kind of trouble? Every kind there was. Gosh. Bertie. Oh, Bertie. I wonder what he wants. Yes, Miss Gilsey? Come along, Marjorie. There's no, no use being a baby about this. You're treating me like a baby. Now, now. What are you doing out here, my boy? I've told you not to bother Bertie in her kitchen. I'm not bothering her. We were talking about famous Jones. Bertie knows him. Well, get out of here anyway. Uh, Bertie, uh, Marjorie has decided it's time she learned a few of your famous secrets. Listen to him. <laughs> She's come to realize that there are things every girl should learn about running a house. And who better to learn from than our birdie? What kind of things, Miss Gilsleeve? Oh, cooking, sewing, washing and ironing, sweeping. <laughs> there ain't much to learn about sweeping, Miss Gilsleeve. Anybody can sweep if they want to. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> That's our little difficulty, Bertie. Marjorie has the idea she can manage to get along without housework. She wants a career, she says. I just want independence, that's all. You see, Bertie, she doesn't realize that real happiness lies in making some nice young man happy. Oh, skip it. What do you want me to do? I want you to do it cheerfully, my dear. Marjorie, someday you'll meet a fine, clean-cut young man with a good job and determination to succeed. Why, the first thing you know, you'll be owning your own home, picking flowers in your own little garden. Standing at that little gate every evening when he comes home from the office. Never mind the commercial, Uncle Mort. (laughs) Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. I'm not going to stand by and let you ruin your life, my dear. You may resent this now, but in a few years when you've got children of your own in a car and a radio, you'll thank me. Now, I'll tell you what I want you to do. What? I want you to start right in. I suggest you take over the responsibility for this evening's supper. Oh, is it? And under Bertie's supervision, of course. What do we got for supper tonight, Bertie? Anything complicated? No, sir. Just some lamb I'm going to make lamb stew out of. Just the thing. Just the dish to tempt a husband. I'd never marry a man that liked lamb stew. Well, you cook it anyway. All right, all right. Oh, that's the spirit. Now, the thing to remember about a stew, Marjorie, is to cook it slowly. You simmer it. Am I right, Bertie? Yes, sir. Here, put on this apron, honey, while I get the pan to brown the meat. Okay. On the other hand, the main thing in baking is to get a hot oven and bake fast. How about that, Bertie? That's right, Mr. Gillsleeve. Slice up these carrots, will you, honey? Okay. What kind of biscuits are you figuring on, Bertie? Just regular baking powder biscuits. Well, nice cornmeal muffins might be better for her to learn on, Bertie. Let me tell you about cornmeal muffins, Marjorie. The trick is to grease the pan. You take a Uncle big... Mort, I'm trying to peel these carrots. Peel them? My man, honey, you don't peel carrots, you scrape them. Well, Uncle Mort's telling me so many things about baking and stewing and greasing. I can't possibly keep my mind on what I'm trying to do. You're right, my dear. Too many cooks spoil the broth. I guess you and Bertie can take care of everything. You trust me, Mr. Gillespie. I'll just keep an eye on her, and I bet she'll fix up as nice a supper as you ever sat down to. Yeah, you bet. And the first thing you know, she'll be enjoying herself. 
She'll be loving every minute of it. Oh, beat it, for heaven's sakes. Go away. Huh? Uh, oh. Oh, you're talking to me? Oh, very well. I'll go away. I'll go out and get a little of the nice autumn air, my dear. Good evening to you, Peavy. What can I do for you this fine November evening? Not a thing, not a thing, Peavy. Just stepped out to work up a little appetite before dinner. <laughs> work up an appetite, eh? I didn't know that was ever a problem with you. Yeah. <laughs> well, ordinarily, you might be right. But tonight, I don't know. We're conducting a little experiment at my house. Marjorie is cooking the dinner. Marjorie? Well... I didn't know that Marjorie was domestically inclined. Well, she's not. I'm trying to incline her. No. <laughs> yes, Peavy, I don't know what the younger generation is coming to. Why, would you believe it? I don't believe that girl even knows how to boil an egg. Well, I don't know that that's so serious. A boiled egg is pretty easy to come by. <laughs> it's not really the egg. It's the principle of the thing. A girl's got to be able to cook if she wants to get anywhere with men. Uh, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> If she wants to get married, I mean, Peavy. Now, Marjorie's got some fool notion she wants to be a dancer. Who's going to marry a dancer? You never know. <laughs> I'd say there were two ways of looking at it, Mr. Gildersleeve. Those that marry cooks, well, maybe sometime they wish they'd married dancers. And then again, those that married dancers... You bet, they wish they'd married cooks. Maybe. There's just one thing about it. If you marry a dancer, you can always hire a cook. But if you marry a cook, you see what I mean? Peavy, I don't know why I come in here and talk to you. All you ever do is argue with me. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> it's true. You don't believe half the things you say. You just say them to make me mad. Well, no, I... You don't really believe the things you're saying now. Do you? I don't know. <laughs> when a man gets to my age, Mr. Gildersleeve, he looks back. And he looks back and he begins to wonder. Wonder what? Well, how things might have been if they... Weren't the way they were. Oh? What do you mean? Well, if he hadn't tipped his hat that time and offered to see the girl home afterwards, and if he hadn't taken out that insurance policy when she told him to and kept up the payments all these years. Another thing. He wonders if he hasn't missed something or was playing it safe. But Peavy... <laughs> Peavy, you're a happily married man. What could you have missed? I guess I'm just in a dangerous mood this evening. <laughs> Pay no attention to me. Hmm. <laughs> well, keep plugging, Peavy. It'll all work out for the best. That's what they've been telling me all these years. <laughs> I gotta be getting home to dinner. Good night, Peavy. Good night, Mr. Gildersleeve. Might have been worse, you know, Peavy. You might have married a dancer. So am I. So am I. Tell me, pretty maiden, are there any more at home like you do? Oh, well, he, he's probably right. It was probably all for the best, darn it. <laughs> kind of a supper my little niece will have for me. Well, however it is, I'll pretend I like it. <laughs> the kids are growing up. Just a few years ago, they were toddling around, falling down. Now here's Marjorie serving her first dinner. <laughs> There'll be flour on the tip of her nose, her cheeks all pink from the oven. Bet by now she's as nervous as a bride. that Marjorie? Why isn't she in the kitchen? Stop it! 
Stop that racket, Leroy. Okay. You want to talk about my Christmas present now, Uncle? Certainly not. Is that Marjorie up there in her room? Sure. Well, go up and tell her to cut it out. Okay. Hey, Marge! Turn it off! Turn it off! I said go up and tell her, Leroy. It worked. Yeah. <laughs> That's not the point. The object is to get a little quiet around here. Go upstairs and get ready for supper. Yes, sir. Gosh. Bertie, what's Marjorie doing up in her room? I thought she was going to get supper. Well, Mr. Gillsleeve, I'll tell you how it was. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink unless he's thirsty. It, never mind the proverbs, Bertie. What happened? Mr. Gillsleeve, her heart wasn't in it. Well, maybe not, but I expected her to stick to it once she started. There's no use, that's all. She cut her hand peeling the potatoes and burned herself light in the stove, and she dropped the meat on the floor. I was afraid we wouldn't have no supper if I didn't get her out of here. Well, in that case, you did right, Bertie. <laughs> Uh, I don't understand that girl. She seems normal enough, don't you think so? She's all right, Mr. Gillsleeve, just a little young. Well, I should think any normal young girl would want to learn these things so she can have a happy married life, wouldn't you think so? Absolutely. Miss Marjorie might not agree with you, Mr. Gillsleeve, but you sure convinced me. Bertie, what do you mean? <laughs> I sure like what you said about the nice young man coming home every evening. You haven't anything definite in mind, have you? I ain't saying. Oh. <laughs> I've done it again. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve again in just a few moments. Good meals are always more enjoyable when served in pleasant surroundings. We men folks and the children, too, appreciate those bright little touches... Wives so often dream up to make family meals happier occasions. For example, supper by candlelight or an attractive centerpiece. And how much better the food is, too, when appetizing touches of flavor are added. So I'd like to recommend for your enjoyment Parquet Margarine, the delicious spread for bread that's made by Kraft. Any meal is brighter when you serve fresh bread, muffins, and crusty hot dinner rolls with Parquet Margarine, the spread that tastes so good. One taste will tell you why Parquet is still unmatched for fresh, delicate flavor. So be sure to enjoy delicious, economical Parquet soon. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet Margarine, made by Kraft. Uh, Bertie, before I go out, I've been thinking about your room. Maybe we ought to freshen it up a little, huh? Some new wallpaper? How would that be? That'd be fine, Mr. Gilfrey. And some curtains? Some nice white curtains? That'd be nice. Uh, I'd even get you a radio to listen to. Would you like that? Radio would be nice. Well, we'll see. Uh, Mr. Gilfrey, as long as you're going downtown, would you mind dropping a letter in the box for me? A letter? Glad to, Bertie. Here it is. Much obliged, Mr. Gilfrey. Uh, not at all, Bertie. Not at all. Uh, Mr. Famous Jones, Majestic Theater, Summerfield. Personal. Good night, everybody. The Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekin. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. Now here's a favorite food you can serve in a hundred or more tempting ways. It's Pabstet, the delicious cheese food that spreads, melts, slices, toasts to perfection. Serve it between meals and at parties as a tasty appetizer or sandwich spread. And at mealtime, enjoy Pabstet's mellow cheddar cheese flavor in omelets and soufflés. And in smooth, luscious sauces for macaroni, egg, and chicken dishes. It's extra nourishing, easy to digest. And Pabstet comes in two popular varieties, golden cheddar and pimento. Buy delicious Pabstet cheese food when you shop tomorrow. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. It's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Now let's peep into the world of Summerfield and see what goes on there. It's Thursday night, not Saturday, but a familiar commotion upstairs over Floyd Munson's barber shop leads us to conclude that the Jolly Boys Club is assembled there. Let's get started, huh? Have order, please, gentlemen. Nobody wants order, Judge. We're trying to organize a poker game. We have a request from a member, Gildy, for a brief business session. What member? What business? No, yeah, we never do any business. Floyd Munson has made the request, Chief, and I feel we should honor it. Mr. Munson, you something to bring to the attention of the club? I'll say. Address the chair, and you may have the floor. Address the chair, and you may have. Who made him chairman, anyway? Please, Gildy. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, fellow members... I'll say what I gotta say, and you can take it from there. And I might say before I start, I'm sorry to have to bring this up at this time. Uh, the club rooms here belong to me. Of course, the bank's got a piece of it, but the building's in my name. <laughs> and the wife's. <laughs> all right, all right, what of it? Order, order. Continue, Flo. Well, I've been letting the club use the place. Glad to have you, but something's come up. Day before yesterday, I had a chance to rent it. Rent it? Who'd want to rent this dump? Well, it was a young fellow and a girl. Just married. What do they care where they live? <laughs> Anyhow, they offered me 20 bucks a month. That's a lot of money for this place, Floyd. Inflation, Chief. That's what it is. Well, the OPA said it was okay. I figure I can't afford to turn it down. You gotta turn it down. This is the Jolly Boys headquarters. You can't rent it to any Tom, Dick, and Harry that wants to go on a honeymoon. Well, I was talking it over with the wife last night, and I told her that. I said, Lovey, the fellas won't like it. The club's been a second home to them. What did she say, Floyd? Well, it's no use going into that. <laughs> to her, 20 bucks is 20 bucks, at least. But now if the club was to pay me rent... Why, naturally, I'd be glad to have you fellas stay on. Oh, so that's it. You call yourself a jolly boy, Floyd? You're a hold-up man. That's what you are. If I may step from the chair for a moment, Gildersleeve, you're being ridiculous. Get back in the chair. <laughs> Let's just look at this thing sensibly. We're asking Floyd to give up $20 a month so we can have a club room. Is that the way for jolly boys to treat each other? I know. That's terrible. That's all there is to it. We've got to reimburse Floyd for the use of the club rooms. I now resume the chair. Oh, goat. Do I hear a motion that we reimburse Floyd for the use of the club room? Won't someone make the motion? I'd be willing to make it. That's illegal <laughs> and unconstitutional. Listen, fellas, there's only five members in this club. Do you realize we'd each have to pay $4 a month dues? Many clubs charge even more. Not for a drafty room with a kitchen table and a busted piano. Oh, it ain't a bad piano. The Elks don't have no piano at all. The Elks have two pool tables. Sure, when they pay dues, they get something for it. Well, if we had more members, the dues wouldn't have to be so high. Say, you might have something there, Judge. Don't be childish, Floyd. When you ask people to join a club, they expect to get something for their money. Like a pool table. Couldn't you get hold of a pool table someplace for him? Pool tables cost a lot of money. I know who's got a pool table. Maybe he'd be willing to join the club and let us have it. Then we could put on a real membership drive. Well, who's got it? Your friend and neighbor, Gildy, Rumson Bullard. Has Bullard got a pool table? No fooling? It sure would be nice to have a pool table right in your house. That's my idea of living. Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know whether Bullard's got one or not. Have you seen it, Horace? Oh, I assumed you had. Haven't you ever been in your rich neighbor's house, Gildy? On numerous occasions, but I never saw any pool tables. Well, a pool table's pretty tough to hide. Ain't like a day bed, you know. No. He might have a billiard room in the basement. A playroom, probably. Lots of people have playrooms down in the basement right there with the furnace, I hear. Well, why don't we look into it? You drop over there tomorrow, Gildy, and see if he wants to join. Then, ask him to lend us the pool table. Why me? It's for the Jolly Boys, Commissioner. Sounds like the only way we can hold the Jolly Boys together. Well, if you put it that way, but I'm not very anxious to call on Rumson Bullard. 
He's never been particularly friendly. That's probably because you never got to know him. Down underneath, he's probably a swell fella. It's not easy to get to know rich people, Chief. They're always afraid you're going to get something out of them. Like a pool table. <laughs> well, I'll see what I can do. Now, for heaven's sake, let's get our minds off money and play a little poker. Why don't you go see him tomorrow night, Gildy, and then come down here and report to us? All right, all right. Okay, everybody, Andy and Nickel, deuces and one-eyed jacks are wild, and no cheating till you're down to your last dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Howdy, Bullard. Remember me? Gildersleeve. Oh, yes, yes. Come in, won't you? Well, thank you. Can't stay. I have to get downtown, but I... Well, I thought I might just pay a neighborly call. I'm glad you did. My wife's gone to New York for a few days, so I'm all alone here. Uh, with Craig, that is. Oh, yes, Craig. Remarkably attractive little boy, Craig. Yes. <clears throat> He's going to bed, I'm glad to say. Why don't we just come into the library, Gildersleeve, as long as there's only two of us? Library? Fine. I've never seen it. Hmm. Uh, just down the hall here. Well, well. Books. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I've accumulated a few volumes. Sit down. Have a cigar? Yeah, thanks. But here, try one of mine. Three for a half. No, no, no. I insist. Uh, I have these made up for me in Havana, if you uh, like a mild cigar. Say. Yes. Mm-hmm. Light. Why, George, that's a real cigar. Yep, yeah, it makes a nice smoke. <clears throat> Gold tip. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> well, uh, care to look at some of my first editions? Or uh, perhaps you're more interested in fine printing, bindings, and that sort of thing. Are, uh, are you a bibliophile? Oh, you bet I am. I belong to the Book of the Month for several years. <laughs> Well, I've got a... Uh, yes, I have a few nice items here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, here's something, yes. Milton's Paradise Lost, hand set in London by Alfred Royce. Printed on vellum with red and gold initials and bound in full Morocco. I've read it. Of course. <laughs> but uh, to a lover of fine printing, now... Uh, here, here, here. Just, just look at this page. Oh? Page 24. Beautiful, just as clear. Well, they, they only printed 200 of these. They, uh, they sold originally for $700 a copy. Huh? Yes, yes, but I, I was lucky. I, I picked it up at an auction in London for 560 <laughs> <laughs> I, I robbed them, didn't I? Yes, yeah, like taking pennies from a kid's bank. <laughs> Uh, find a lot of books you got here, all right. Oh, I, I'd forgotten you'd never been in this room. Uh, care to see some of the rest of the house? Uh, well, I got to be getting on. Uh, by the way... Yes? Nothing. <laughs> well, you don't have to go just yet. Let me uh, let me show you around. Well, for a minute. <laughs> Here is my, uh, my gun room. Oh, yes. A uh, gun room? Hmm. Another of my hobbies. Uh, the really old pieces I, I keep in the glass case here. Now, see that, uh, that big fellow there on the end? That's a Spanish blunderbuss from the 18th century. Hand-carved barrel. Will it shoot? Well, I, I hate to try it. Now, uh, the gun on the right is an old flintlock uh, musket. My pistols and rifles are over here. Say, uh, this is a regular arsenal. You're not expecting any... Uh... <laughs> no, 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 no. But I, I dare say I could give a pretty good account of myself if necessary. <laughs> now, uh, this, this is a Derringer, early 19th century. Devilish-looking little thing, isn't it? Yes. Uh, let's go back to the library. Now, uh, we'll go back to the library later. First, I want to show you the billiard room. You've got to see that. Don't tell me you've got a billiard table. Yes, yes, I say billiards is really a gentleman's game. Well, I can't seem to get the hang of it. Ever play any pool? 
No, no, I never cared for pool. Or do you like it? No, billiards is the game for me. Hmm. Well, drop over any evening you care to play. Yeah, I might just do that. Uh, who do you play with generally? Oh, no one in particular. I, I haven't played a great deal of billiards since I lived in London. I uh, belonged to a club in London where I got very fond of it. Oh, is that so? Uh, speaking of clubs, Mister Bullard, I yes, uh, nothing. <laughs> Yes, London's a great place for clubs. Uh, now, this was a place in German Street. Been standing right there in the same spot for over 200 years. Oh, pretty exclusive district around there? A mm, lot of fine clubs. In this club, they had oh, six or eight billiard tables, several card rooms. And many's the afternoon I've seen 5,000 pounds change hands in that card room. See, that's a fortune. Yes, yes, but uh, they're such gentlemen, you could hardly tell who'd won and who'd lost. Of course, one afternoon, a fellow shot himself afterward. Oh? A winner or a loser? A loser, yes. Oh. Brilliant young fellow he was, but uh, uh, wild as the devil. Youngest duke, uh, youngest son of a duke. Oh, a duke, yeah. Must have been a terrible shock to his father. Mm, frightful, frightful. The whole club was in mourning for a week. Ah, but club life is a fine thing, fine thing. Oh, you bet, you the bet. Spirit of good sportsmanship. Yes, sir. The feeling of loyalty and companionship between real gentlemen. Yes, yes. Ah, I miss club life. I don't suppose there are any men's clubs here in Summerfield, are there, Gildersleeve? Um, uh, huh? I say, are there any men's clubs here in uh, Summerfield? Uh, no, Mr. Bullard. There isn't a single one. <laughs> Wait a minute, fellas. Wait a minute. I tried to ask him. I started several times to ask him. And then each time, something would come up that I couldn't. Well, of all the chicken-hearted fellas to send on a simple errand... Watch out what you, who you're calling chicken-hearted, you old goat. Why, what's trouble? Couldn't you get him around to the subject? Well, we got to the subject, all right. We talked about clubs for quite a while. What a cinch. Just say, speaking of clubs, Mr. Bullard, there's a little spot where I and a few of my friends hang out. Like to have you drop around sometime. It wouldn't have worked, Floyd. Well, I'm blessed if I see why. Why didn't you ask him, Commissioner? Because he's too good for this crummy joint, that's why. Well, I'll be darned. What makes him think he's such a much? That's what I want to know. Well, it's not his idea necessarily, Floyd. It's my opinion. You mean you think he's too good for us? If you put it that way, yes. Mr. Gilder. Sleep. Oh, shut up and listen for a minute. Bullard has a house full of first editions, fine bindings. He has a dog that costs $300. He has a gun collection that must be worth thousands. He's a fellow that's used to gracious living. He can't hang around a club like this. It wouldn't be right. Is this Bullard too good to associate with a judge of the probate court? Judge Hook is a pretty high-class fella. Thank you, Floyd. Chief of police, one of the highest jobs in this town, and a useful man to know. Thank you. And what's the matter with Peavy? Runs as nice a drugstore as you'd want to see. And Floyd, he's got the only barber shop in the south end of town. Yeah. I know, fellas. You just don't understand. Bullard's been in high-class clubs in London with dukes and gentlemen. You ask me, Gildy, this fellow's nothing but a big snob. He is not. He's a mighty nice man to know. If you ask me, our water commissioner's getting to be a snob himself. Oh! <laughs> don't call me a snob, Floyd. Uh. You fellas wouldn't know how to treat a high-class fella like Bullard anyway. All right, go treat him then. Yeah, go ahead. We don't need you around here. Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve's a jolly boy. I'm not sure he is, Chief. Not if he considers himself and his friends too good for us. Go on, go play pool with Bullard. All right, I will. Can you imagine that? Just for a pool table. It's not a pool table. It's a billiard table. Billiards is a gentleman's game. You... <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve will be back in just a moment. Do you have a big Thanksgiving dinner at your house, Mr. Lang? Indeed we do. Turkey with all the trimmings. Then when Mrs. Lang planned her menu, I dropped a broad hint for some of those wonderful baking powder biscuits she serves on special occasions. Well, we prefer Parker House rolls or muffins. Well, it's a sure bet that hot breads of all kinds are popular on Thanksgiving menus. And, of course, everyone knows a delicious spread makes hot biscuits, rolls, and muffins taste extra good. 
That's why I always like to suggest that you serve them with parquet margarine. Why, that's our favorite spread, Mr. Lang. We always use parquet margarine. My husband likes parquet better than any spread we've ever tried. And I can well understand that, because parquet margarine's fresh, dairy-like flavor is still unmatched. So this week, when you're shopping for those good foods to serve during the Thanksgiving season, be sure to buy parquet margarine, the spread that tastes so good. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y. Delicious, economical parquet margarine, made by the Kraft Foods Company. I'm sure you'll like it, because millions prefer parquet margarine to any other brand. Now let's get back to our story. It's Saturday night, and Saturday night is the Jolly Boys Night to Howl. But a voice is missing. For the first time in many weeks, Gildersleeve is not to be found with his old associates. Gildersleeve this evening has hurried through dinner, stuffed a pocket with expensive cigars, and set out to take advantage of Bullard's invitation to drop in any time. Scarcely 24 hours have passed, and here he is, dropping in. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Craig. Is your father in? Where's Leroy? Leroy? <laughs> Well, he's at home, I guess. Uh, tell your father, will you, Craig, that Mr. Gildersleeve is here. Craig, get away from that door. Come upstairs. Uh, who's that? My nurse. She stinks. <laughs> Craig? <laughs> You'd better answer her, hadn't you? Why should I? Where's Leroy? I want him to come over. Well, Leroy can't just now, I'm afraid, Craig. Run up and tell your father he has a caller, will you? Craig, shut that door and come up to bed. There's a man here. Yeah, <laughs> Tell her it's Mr. Gillisleeve. Uh, it's Mr. Gillisleeve from across the street. Well, there's nobody home. Oh, well, Mr. Bullard will be back, maybe. I'll just amuse myself in the billiard room while... There's I... nobody home. <laughs> As you said that. <laughs> he said I might use his billiard table any time, so if you don't mind, perhaps... He didn't say anything to me. Guess he didn't. <laughs> Fine way to treat a man. Invite him to use your billiard table, then sick the nurse on him. Oh, well. Now what'll I do? Saturday night. Only 7.30. Can't just go home and go to bed. Besides, it's Saturday night. No, I won't go down there. But what can I do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you Saturday night. <laughs> Here she comes. Boo! Surprise! Oh, it's you. <laughs> well, aren't you surprised to see me, Leela? No. I suppose you'd be around sooner or later. Oh, is that so? <laughs> well, get your things on, Leela. We're going places Saturday night. I'm sorry. I have a previous engagement which I'm just about to make. But, Leela... It's time you learn, Throckmorton. I have better things to do than sit here and wait for you to turn up. And it's time you learn there's more to caught in a lady than just whistling at her. She... Some Saturday night. Now what am I going to do? What is there to do? Nope, I will not go down there. <laughs> Suppose I could stroll down to the drugstore, see what's doing there. No, I'm always hanging around there. I won't go there either. Well, I guess all that leaves is home. <laughs> What a town. Saturday night at home. Anki, you back? I thought you were out. 
out for the evening. Yes, well, I changed my mind, Marjorie. You going somewhere, my dear? Over to Francie's. She has some of the gang coming in. Oh, well, have a good time. Thanks. Oh, um... Yes? You wouldn't care to stay home and play a quiet game of dominoes or something with your old uncle, I suppose. Uncle, I'd love to. I'd just love to. But I promised Francie and the gang, and I wouldn't want to disappoint them. Ask me another time, will you? Yes, yes. Run along. Have a good time. Thanks. Oh, um... Yes? Where's your brother? What's he doing? Leroy? Oh, he's going to the movies, if he hasn't already gone. Oh, here he comes now. Yes. Well, Leroy, you're dressed up for once. Yeah. My boy, how would you like it if your old uncle went to the movies with you? Well, I wasn't going to the movies exactly. Bertie was going to take me to hear Famous Jones and his orchestra at the Majestic. Hey, Bertie, it's ten after. I'm coming. (laughs) Now, wait a minute, my boy. I thought you and I might just stay home together tonight and have a good game of dominoes. You kidding? Then if we stayed home tonight, why, next Saturday I'd take you to that football game you've been wanting so much to go to. How would that be? Well, do you know how you found it? Of course, it's up to you, my boy. You get your choice. The movies with Bertie this evening or the football game with me next Saturday. Makes no difference to me one way or the other. Well, if it makes no difference to you, Unc, I think I'll go with Bertie. All right, go on then. Go on, all of you. Leave me alone here all by myself. I am nobody. I just pay the bills around here, that's all. Hello, Mr. (laughs) Gildersleeve. Peavy. Yeah, that's just about giving you up for this evening. I've just about given myself up. How do you mean? Peavy, have you ever tried spending an evening alone? Worst darn thing in the world. Well, I wouldn't say that. Well, it's terrible. That's why I came down here, to have somebody to talk to. Well, as a matter of fact, I was planning to close up here a little early so that I could stop by the Jolly Boys Club on the way home. Oh, well, in that case... How does it happen you're not over there this evening, Mr. Gildersleeve? You always seem to be pretty faithful. I uh, couldn't make it. Oh. Well, if you'd care to stop by there with me now... Well, I think I'd better not, thanks. Well, shoot yourself, but you said you wanted somebody to talk to. Well, truth of it is, Peavy, I've had a little falling out over there with some of the less desirable element... Talking about Floyd? Well, him and some others. Chief Gate? Him, too. Okay. Uh-huh. That leaves you and me. <laughs> well, these little differences of opinion are bound to occur, I'd say, even among jolly boys. It was more than a difference of opinion, Petey. Floyd called me a big, fat snob. There's no difference of opinion about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there? What did you call Floyd, Mr. Gildersleeve? I didn't call him a thing. Not a thing. You gave him no provocation? None whatever. He just walked in and said, Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve, you big fat snob, huh? <laughs> well, I may have made some trifling reference to his social standing. That's what I say. Now, why not let bygones be bygones? I'm sure if you come over there with me now and everybody apologizes... That's one thing I'll never do. Apologize. All right, don't. Just come over there with me. Let them come over here. I'm closing up here. Well... You just come along and leave everything to me, Mr. Gildersleeve, and I'll see if I can't straighten it all out. Well, all right, Peavy. But remember, I won't apologize. Mr. I'll wait down here. What for? You go up and see how the land lies, Peavy. That's a good fellow. I'll wait down here. Yeah. Yeah. Call me if it's all right. Well, if it ain't Steve. Welcome, stranger. Yeah. Well, I suppose they're hashing me over up there now. I don't know that I like this. What are they taking so darn long about? Can't keep me waiting down here like a lackey. Wonder what a lackey is. 
Got a good mind to walk out and leave them flat. After all, I didn't want to come over here in the first place. This has been about long enough, by George. Gosh, I don't think they'd blackball me. Commissioner, you down there, pal? <laughs> I hear you calling me. Uh, come ahead, the coast is clear. You called me when the moon had veiled her light. Before I went from you into the night, I came. Do you remember? Hi, fellas. Evening, Scott Martin. Lloyd? Hi. Hi. Come in, come in, Commissioner. Join the happy throng. Uh, thank you, Chief. <laughs> now, uh, we've been talking it over here, Commissioner. The pros and the cons. Floyd has got something he wants to say to you. Go ahead, Floyd. Say it. Yes, Floyd. Say it. Well, Commissioner, I'm sorry if I got a little out of line here the other night. The fact is, I didn't say what PV says I said. I only told him what you told me. You said, Floyd, that I was a big, fat snob. I never said you were fat. <laughs> Everybody knows that. Floyd. I didn't come down here, gentlemen, to be re-insulted. Floyd, now apologize nice, like you said you would. Go ahead, Floyd. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Commissioner. I don't know what come over me. I could bite my tongue off. Well, ain't that good enough? I think that's very handsome, Floyd. Commissioner? Well, maybe it was my fault a little too, Floyd, now that I come to think of it. Ah, <laughs> you old swindler. You old horse thief. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's just stuff. Uh, my golly, it does my heart good to hear you talk like that. Let's say we shake hands all around, eh? I'm game. Shake your lips. Shake, shake. There is a tavern in the town, in the town. And there my true love sets him down, sets him down and breaks his wine with laughter free. And never, never thinks of me. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve again in just a few moments. During the Thanksgiving and holiday season, there's usually a little strain on the family food budget. So on your shopping trips now, I imagine most of you ladies have an eye out for the best values in food. And when it comes to spreads for bread, one of the best values I know of is delicious parquet margarine. Parquet is only about half the price of costly spreads, and it provides your family with such rich, wholesome nourishment. Parquet is one of the best energy foods you can serve, and it's fortified with important vitamin A. And as for flavor, Parquet is preferred by millions because it tastes so good on bread, toast, rolls, and waffles. So if you want to make a real saving on a quality food, buy this nourishing spread that tastes so good. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by Kraft. He said I'd be back, and he was right. Good night, everybody. <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meacham. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. Ladies, here's how to be ready at the drop of a hat with sandwiches, snacks, and appetizers. Keep a package of delicious Pabstet cheese food in your refrigerator. Pabstet is ready in a jiffy, can be served a hundred different ways. It spreads, melts, slices, toasts to perfection. Any way you serve it, any time you serve it, your family and guests are sure to like Pabstet's mellow cheddar cheese flavor. Pabstet comes in two popular varieties, golden cheddar and pimento. So head up your shopping list with delicious Pabstep cheese food. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> it's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Thanksgiving weekend. Each year at this season, the good citizens of Summerfield make a pilgrimage of some 30 miles to witness the annual football classic between State University and the Aggies. And in the whole of Summerfield, there is no one more determined to go this year than Gildersleeve's nephew, Leroy. For weeks, he has been hammering away at it. Tonight, can I go home? Can I? How about it? Can I? No. No, Marjorie. Nobody asked you. Uncle Mort, if he goes to that game, I shall just die. Oh, why? Because Marshall's coming home for the weekend, and he's taking me. And all Leroy wants to do is spy on us. Boy, that's a cheap thrill. (laughs) You think I'd be looking at you when I can be watching a football game? Uncle Mort, don't let him go. You can't. You simply can't. Now, my dear, I think that's for me to decide. That's telling her. I don't see why Leroy hasn't just as good a right to go to the game as you. You hear that? After all, I think you might consider his side of it, too. Yeah, how about considering my side of it? You stay out of this. (laughs) But, Uncle Mort, this is my only weekend with Marshall since he went away to school. We want to be alone. Alone? They go to a football game to be alone. (laughs) Now, Leroy... I suppose you'd like everybody else in the stadium to get up and leave. 20,000 people. Leroy. I rest my case. (laughs) Well, what about it, Uncle Mort? I shall think it over. Oh, say yes, please. I'll pay you if you will. I'll give you all the money I've got in my bank. I'm not subject to bribery, my boy. Well, I'll do anything you say. Anything at all. How about it? I told you I shall think it over. Well, for cat's sake, how long do you have to think? There are two sides to this question, my boy, as there are to most questions. Now, from Marjorie's point of view, I can see why she wouldn't want to have you tagging along. Thank goodness. From your point of view, Leroy, I can see that this game means a great deal to you. More than anything in the world, I guess. Except you, Unc. Yes, yes. (laughs) Well, the only thing I can see to do about it... Yeah? I hate to say this, but the only thing I can see to do about it is to take you myself. You mean you? Yes, my boy. Much as I dread it, I'll take you to the football game. Yikes! You hear that, Marge? Hail to the victors, Valiant! Hail to the conquering heroes! Good evening, Mr. Gilsley. Oh, good evening, Bertie. Is that you, Mom? Yes, it's me. No, Leroy, I didn't forget them, but I'm afraid I have bad news for you just the same. They're completely sold out. Oh, that's a big jib. I know, my boy. I know exactly how you feel, but uh, we have to learn to take these little disappointments and make the best of them, don't we? Gosh, if you didn't have to think it over so long, if you'd gone and got on the boat... I did the best I could. After all, I'm just as disappointed as you are. It means that I can't go to the game either. Ha, you didn't want to go in the first place. (laughs) That's not true, Leroy. I wanted to go very much. Yeah. But there's no use crying over spilt milk, is there? There'll be other games some other time, perhaps, eh? (laughs) Leroy. (laughs) I want you to believe that I tried, my boy. Why, I even asked Judge Hooker to use his influence. Not that I'd give two cents for all the influence he's got. (laughs) I should have known. I should have known I'd never get there. This is just a terrible day, that's all. It's been a terrible day right from the start. Friday's always a terrible day. Leroy, honey, what's the matter? Nothing. Oh, now, don't be bad. <laughs> Let's not give up hope, my boy. After all, there's still Judge Hooker. Yeah. Well, you're probably right. <laughs> Every time you say you'll take me to a football game, this is what happens. Leroy, this is the first time I've ever offered to take you to a football game. Well, it happened, didn't it? Yeah. I should have known. Now, Leroy, you're just tired. Why don't you go up and get ready for bed and 
That birdie bring your supper to you up there. I don't want any supper. Well, later maybe you will. You run along and I'll be up. I got turkey croquettes for supper. And mashed potatoes? Mashed potatoes and gravy. Okay. Doorbell, I'll get it. No, I'll get it, Bertie. <laughs> Hooker, come in, Judge. I can't stop, Gildy. I just came by. Leela, I didn't see you standing back there. <laughs> come on in. It's cold. Well, just for a minute. We're on our way to dinner. I'm taking Leela to a movie afterward. Oh, so that's why she was busy tonight. <laughs> you didn't tell me you were going out tonight with the judge, Leela? I don't tell everything I know. I sort of cut you out there, didn't I, Gilday? <laughs> old goat. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> careful, my dear, careful. <laughs> Come in. Hello, Marjorie. Hello, Mrs. Ransom. I hope I didn't hurt you. Oh, good evening, Judge. Marjorie. Oh, don't you look pretty. Thank you. Such pink cheeks. Mm, and natural, too. I, I'll bet you're excited that Marshal Bullard's home. Oh, he's been home for two days. Uh, Anki, is it all right if we go skating after supper? After supper? It's perfectly safe. There's a big moon out. I don't know that that makes it safe. <laughs> oh, skating in the moonlight. How I'd love to be out there with y'all. Well, why don't we? We could all make oh, a... wait a minute now. Leela and I have a date. Oh, yes, that. Well, how about tomorrow, then? But tomorrow's Saturday, Uncle Mort. Marshall and I are going to the game. Oh, oh, oh yeah. I'll tell him it's all right about going skating tonight, then. Well, now, wait a minute. I did... Well, all right. Thanks, Uncle. You're a dear. Yes, yes. Oh, to be 16 again instead of pushing 30. <laughs> football games, skating in the moonlight. I used to love football games. We used to drive up to Atlanta when Georgia played Georgia Tech. It was such fun. The girls looked all so pretty, and the men were all so handsome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There'd be parties at all the fraternity houses after the game, and a dance at the big hotel there in the evening, and driving back by moonlight. <laughs> Come on, Leela. I think it's time we were getting along. Oh, yes, I suppose it is. Oh, that reminds me, Gilday. I almost forgot what I stopped you for. I got you that pair of football tickets you asked for. You got them? Just leave it to old Judge Hooker. There they are. See. Well, that's... Well, that's fine. Are they any good? Are they any good? Why, they're right smack on the goal line. I don't know whether to thank you or not, but thanks anyway. Oh, Strockmountain, don't tell me you got tickets for tomorrow's game. Huh? And never even told me about it. Aren't you wonderful? <laughs> I might point out it was I who got the ticket. Oh, but it's the thought that kind Yes, but Leela, you... Oh, I think surprises are such fun, don't you? Now, here I wasn't looking forward to a thing tomorrow except washing my hair. And now, all of a sudden, everything's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> but, Leela, Imagine I... me carrying on about how I love football games and all the time you knew. Rock Martin, you devil, you. <laughs> Leela, you don't understand. Understand. Don't understand what? Well, I wasn't exactly planning to, I mean... You mean you were planning to take some other girl? No, no, of course not. Gosh, I'd rather take you than anybody. I would have asked you too, Leela, only I didn't think of it until yesterday, and I suppose by this time you'd... Well, the last time I saw you, you bawled me out for always inviting you places at the last minute. Rock, Martin, honey, it's time you learn never to pay a single bit of attention to anything I say, ever. Leela, I don't like to hurry you, but it's time that we were getting downtown. Oh, yes, we must be going. Yeah, but wait. We've got to be going, Gildy. I have a reservation for dinner. You don't need a reservation at Joe's place. <laughs> we're not going to Joe's place. Come on, Leela, for heaven's sake, let's get started. But we haven't settled this. Oh, well, don't worry. I'll call you first thing in the morning about the times and all. Good night, and I think you're alive. <laughs> what am I going to tell her when she calls? Morning, Mr. 
Gilsey. Good morning, Bertie. Leroy? Hi. I trust you slept well last night. You can see that I didn't. You do look a little so-so. Well, you just sit down and I'll bring you a nice phone. I'll get it. Uh, where's your sister, Leroy? She ate her breakfast and scrammed. I'm coming! <laughs> you mean they've started for the football game already? I suppose so. Lucky bums. Mr. Gilsey's residence. Uh, I'm afraid I know what this is. Oh, yes, Miss Ransom, he is. It's Miss Ransom, Mr. Gilsey, about the game. Huh? <laughs> uh, ask her if she could hold the wire a minute, Bertie. Hmm. Could you hold a while, please? You'll be right here. Leroy, I want to have a talk with you, my boy. Okay, shoot. Swallow that toast and listen. My boy, if by any chance I should be able to get tickets for the game today. Mind you, I don't say I can, but if by any chance I should. Yeah? And if it turned out that it wouldn't be convenient for me to take you. What? You promised. I know, and I'd make it up to you, Leroy, some way. I don't like breaking promises, but if you'd let me off just this once... How about it? I don't know. Leroy, please, just this once. I have to think it over. I'll make it up to you, my boy. I'll do anything you say. How about it? How you doing, Miss Ransom? Oh, just fine. You'll be right here. Mr. Gilsey, she's waiting. Leroy, stop eating that toast and answer me. <laughs> I'm sorry, my boy, but I told you I'll do anything if you let me off. It's going to be a pretty good game. I'd sure like to see it. Anything, Leroy, anything at all. Anything? Anything. Okay. You'll never regret this, my boy. You'll never regret it. I only hope I won't. Hello, Piggy. Leroy, the kid himself. Boy, oh boy, Pig, have I got Unc where I want him. What a character. You know what he did? He told me about... The Great Gildersleeve will be back in just a moment. After a friendly game of bridge the other night, we all dropped into the kitchen to kibitz a bit while Mrs. Lang was preparing some sandwiches. And as she was spreading the bread with parquet, one of the guests said to me... So that's the parquet margarine I hear you talking about, John, on the Gildersleeve show. That's the genuine article, the one and only parquet margarine. Well, if it's as good as you say it is, I... Well, the best way to find out is to taste it right now. Ah, here we are. The first sandwiches are ready. Thank you. Now, there's flavor for you. Flavor that's fresh and sweet. Am I right? Hmm, it's delicious. It's the fine, wholesome farm products that make parquet taste so good. And you know, friends, you'll have the same satisfying taste experience the very first time you spread parquet margarine on bread, toast, rolls, pancakes, and waffles. I'm sure you'll agree with the millions who prefer parquet margarine that it's still unmatched for flavor. And it costs so little to enjoy parquet, only about half the price of costly spreads. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y, Parquet Margarine, made by the Kraft Foods Company. Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. With a blonde on one arm, a buffalo robe over the other, and a brand new bucket hat perched on his head, Gildersleeve looks the complete American college boy, 20 years out of college. We join him now as he and Leela Ransom stroll past the State University campus toward the stadium where the big game is soon to begin. Aren't we having fun, Throckmorton? Yeah, you bet. You know something? Walking around a college town like this makes me feel like I'm 18 again. Oh, you look 18, Leela. And I'll tell you something else. I don't feel a day over 22. Let's skip, I dare you. <laughs> oh, Throckmorton, with all these boys and girls going by. What do we care? Come on, let's skip. <laughs> <laughs> it's Marjorie and Marshall Bullard. You. Well. Oh, I saw you 
up ahead there, Unky. Hello, Mrs. Ransom. You remember Marshall, don't you? Indeed I do. It's nice you could come home for the holiday, Marshall. Thanks. How are you, Mrs. Ransom? Mr. Gildersleeve? Just fine, my boy. Unky, where did you get that bucket hat? Uh, this hat? Well, I got it at the Summerfield Men's Toggery. What's the matter with it? Oh, nothing. It just looks kind of collegiate. That's not what the college men are wearing this year, Mr. Gildersleeve. That's immaterial to me, son. <laughs> <laughs> I needed a hat in case of rain. Well, I think he looks very cute in it. Although, if you pulled it a little farther forward... Like this? It was better the other way. It's nuts. <laughs> Marshall, I do believe you've grown just in the few months you've been away. Put on 15 pounds, been playing a little football. Oh, uh, Speaking of football, shouldn't oh, we you be... You seem to be in such a hurry, Throckmorton. Mm -hmm. Why don't we all go somewhere and have a bite to eat? Well, no, Marjorie and I are going over to the Beta New House for lunch. That's my father's fraternity. Uh, uh, well, you kids go on and have lunch. Maybe we'll see you at the game. Look for us, Unky. Marshall got seats right on the 50-yard line. The 50? Well, we're not far from there. <laughs> uh, see you later. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. I wish we didn't have to sit way down by the goal line, Throckmorton. Well, I'll see what I can do. But it's pretty late. I wonder how that Bullard kid got seats on the 50. I suppose he got them through his father. Yeah, I suppose so. Well, bye, George. I'll go to the box office and tell them who I am. Don't worry, Leela. We'll wind up with the best seats in the place. Pardon me, ma'am. I'd like to exchange these seats, please. Uh, they're in the section uh, 32. I'd like something on the 50-yard line. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> yes, very funny. Uh, perhaps you didn't understand me. I want to exchange these tickets for a pair on the 50-yard line. Oh, run along, buddy. Nothing doing. Wait a minute. It just so happens I'm a public official. I'm the water commissioner down in Summerfield. Water? <laughs> I hear it's good to wash in. <laughs> Don't get smart. Are you going to sell me tickets or not? Look, we've been sold out since the 10th of September. Now beat it. Then why are you open? For next year. Oh! <laughs> Wise guy ought to report him. <clears throat> why don't you look where you're going? Say, hey, buddy, uh, you really want two and a 50 like you said? I sure do. Have you got two? Shh. Not so loud. Oh? 50-yard line, 35th row. And, uh, seeing it's so late, huh? Well, I'll let you have them for 20 bucks apiece. Why, that... That's robbery. Twenty bucks a piece? Pardon me, mister. I thought you were a big shot. Oh, I am. Here. Give me the tickets. <laughs> Being a big shot is kind of expensive. Look, honey. The fan down there on the stairs. They're getting ready to spell out something. Say, look at those uniforms. Welcome, Aggies. Pretty clever. Drachma, not we having fun. You bet. Why don't the teams quit practicing? They've been practicing all season. Let's start the game. Oh, let me see the program for a minute, Clark Ma. Mm -hmm. Ma, look at this picture of the state captain. Isn't he a high Tom Lingenfeller. Certainly looks dumb. Oh, but look at those shoulders, Ma. Probably wearing shoulder pads. I'll tell you something else. A lot of these football players aren't as strong as they look. The Army had to reject the whole flock of them. Mm -hmm. I suppose so. But, of course, a girl looks at these things a little differently from the army. Yeah. Uh, oh! <laughs> There's Marshall. Marshall where? Down there, just two rows in front of us. you Hi there! Oh, why, that... He's got his arm around Marjorie. Hey there, what do you think you're doing? Rock Martin. Cut that out, young man. I'm watching you. <laughs> And don't grin at me like that. Oh, for heaven's sake, Throckmorton. What harm is there in the boy putting his arm around in a public place like this? Don't tell me. It feels just the same in public as it does anyplace else. <laughs> does it, um, does it really? You know darn well it does. Mercy, how would I know? <laughs> How's that? Marjorie, turn around and watch the game. Third down. This time it looks like they're going to try a pass. How can you tell, Throckmorton? By the formation. When one fellow stands back like that... Was that a pass? No, it was a punt. Oh. 
They shoot a pass, though. If they keep punting all afternoon, I don't know how they expect to score. Is it still nothing to nothing? Certainly. There they go. Oh, and in right. Yeah, stopped him dead in his tracks. That fellow couldn't run around a mailbox. <laughs> that whistle call, Strathmore? Just stalling for time. Come on, quit stalling down there and play football. Strathmore, people are looking at you. Let them look. They're not stalling, mister. Al Sample broke his leg on that last play. Oh. Oh, isn't that awful? Look, they're carrying him off. The poor boy. Mm. Stample must have been in bad condition. I told you these football players weren't so husky. <laughs> You cold, Leela? I'm perfectly comfortable, thank you. Oh, that's funny. I'm cold. Well, to tell you the truth, every time you start to hold my hand, Marshal Bullard turns around and laughs at me. Oh, he does, eh? That young, smart yeah, Alex. That's right, Martin. He's just a child. Although I must say he seems much better looking than when he went away. Don't you think he is? I'm watching the game, Leela. Oh. Second and ten. Maybe they'll try a pass this time. <laughs> Through the line. Can you tell, Throckmorton? I couldn't see a thing on that play. When everybody falls down, it's a line play. <laughs> he gained about a foot. Well, he tried anyhow, and that's what came. Never make a touchdown that way, Leela. Now I suppose they'll kick again. <laughs> there, there they go. Kick the ball back and forth. After you, my dear Alphonse. After you, my dear Gaston. Why, George, we don't get some action pretty soon, we log it on and complain at the box office. All afternoon they've been playing, and nobody's even tried. And once again, the ball changed hands in this nip and tuck battle between State University and the Aggies. Oh, boy. Believe you me, folks, both these teams are playing heads-up football out here this afternoon. What a game. They're lining up again now. State's ball on their own 40-yard line, T-formation. Come on, State, let's get a touchdown this time. The ball is snapped to Captain Tom Lingenfelder. He gets the ball and... Come on! Lingenfelder! Lingenfelder fades back, takes a line to the left, runs for the hope Gene might guard my tackle. He's through! He's away! No! No! A beautiful tackle came right through and stopped him cold! I tell you folks, you've never seen football like we're seeing today in Park Hardman's Field. Did you hear that, Bertie? Lingenfelder almost got away, but they stopped him cold. Is that a fact? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you want to listen a while, Bertie? No, thank you, Leroy. You hear your uncle saying anything? Not yet. <laughs> Now it's fourth and six for State, falling back into punt formation. Crowds in the stands are tense as Tom Lingenfelder opens his hands for the ball. He's got it. He kicks. Back and forth, back and forth. Nothing happens. Well, I think it's very exciting, Frog Martin, for a football game. What do you expect? A pass once in a while. You gods have only tried about three and none completed. Hey, Lingenfeller, why don't you try an aerial attack? Why don't you drop dead? Oh? <laughs> Who said that? I said it. Oh, oh, you. Yes, me. These boys are playing swell football and they don't need any advice from you. <laughs> Just a suggestion. Tourist. <laughs> I paid for my seat, didn't I? I should think that would entitle me to make it. Now what? Nothing. You know, Lena, looks like it might rain. I don't think so, Throckmorton. How can you think such a thing when we're having so much fun? I don't really think it'll rain. I don't think anything at all is going to happen here this afternoon. Oh, Throckmorton, honey, I dropped one of my gloves just now. Do you see it anywhere? Glove? No. Must be down under the seat. Well, would you mind looking down there for it? My hands are cold. Well, if your hands are cold. Uh, later, darling. But find the glove now for me like a sweet boy, won't you? Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Old peanut shells down here. <laughs> Chewing gum. See? <laughs> Neil, what happened? Come on, Come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, my God. Oh, jumping up and down on my fingers. Oh, are you still down there? See? Here's your glove. What was all that racket? Somebody threw a pass and Lincoln fell to call it and made a touchdown. A touchdown? Why didn't you tell me? Well, I was too excited, Throckmorton, and it all happened so quickly. The only play of the afternoon. Oh, Augie, wasn't that a beautiful pass? Oh, yeah, scrumptious. <laughs> Throckmorton. What's the matter? I fell 
spoiled a drop of rain this night. Rain, you couldn't have. It's... <laughs> so did I. It's a cloudburst. What'll we do, Leela? Maybe it'll stop in a minute. I'll stay if you will, Frog Mom. Well, I... I had a slight cold yesterday, and I... Uh, why don't we give up and go home? I must say, I thought you were more of a sport. Well, I'm not a sport. Come on, let's get out of here. Pardon me. That's Pardon me. What's the matter, mister? No school spirit? Uh, oh, 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 yourself. Soaking wet. Bucket hat. Bucket is right. Isn't it, Mr. Gilsey? Did you have a nice time at the game? Yeah, don't speak of it, Bertie. Don't speak of it. Well, it's too bad it had to rain. Maybe a little supper will make you feel better. I even feel like eating. I had a couple of sandwiches half an hour ago. Well, I'll dish it up anyway. Bucket, not you! What's the game super on? Super? What game are you talking about, young man? The state Aggies game. The one you saw. I heard it on the radio. It sure was super. The re- How do they do it? Say, I'm... I've decided what I want for a reward for missing it. Oh, all right, my boy. What is it? Take me to the state game next Saturday. Oh, Leroy, anything but that. The Great Gildersleeve will be dropping in at Peavy's Drug Store in just a few moments. How are you getting along with your food budget these days? Are your meals pretty expensive? Well, maybe I can give you a little help. There's a very important food you serve at every meal that certainly shouldn't be expensive. And that's the spread you serve with bread, toast, and rolls. Of course, the spread I have in mind is delicious parquet margarine, preferred by millions of families throughout America because it tastes so good. And as for economy, well, it's plain as the price tag in your dealer's store that parquet is only about half the price of costly spreads. And parquet margarine is so nourishing, too. It's one of the finest of all energy foods, and it's fortified with important vitamin A. So for a real value in a quality food that's still unmatched for flavor, buy parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine, made by Kraft. P.B., are you fond of football? Uh, football, Mr. Gillespie? <laughs> yes. Do you like the game? You mean do I like to play it? No, no. Do you like to watch it? Are you a fan? Well, Mr. Gillespie, I'll tell you how it is about me and football. When I was a young fellow, I lived in Worcester, Massachusetts one year. That fall, I took it into my head to go to the Harvard Yale game down at Cambridge. Is all this necessary? Well, you asked me a question. <laughs> I didn't realize you'd have to answer it by the way of Worcester, Massachusetts. Well, if you don't want me to tell you. No, go ahead, Peavy. You never give a straight answer to a question anyway. Well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> go ahead. Well, I've lost the thread now. Why did you want to know if I like football in the first place? Well, I thought if you did, you might enjoy taking Leroy to the state game next Saturday, if I could get the tickets. Yeah, so that's it. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, I am fond of football, but I'm not that fond of it. Yeah. <laughs> I might have known you'd be of no use to me. Good night, Peavy. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Another fine Kraft food product you'll want to add to your shopping list is Kraft Salad Mustard. This creamy golden Kraft Salad Mustard puts an extra tempting tang into relishes and sandwich spreads, hefts up the flavor of deviled eggs, Adds extra zest to cheese and meat dishes. And if you like an extra tingle of sharpness, there's another delicious variety in the Kraft line. It's the Kraft mustard with nippy horseradish added. Buy both kinds and please the whole family. Ask for Kraft mustards when you shop tomorrow. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> it's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Is that a message? Okay. I sure don't understand it. Mr. Gilsey is a man who'd rather eat than sleep any day. Got any more toast, Bertie? Who was that? Some lady for your uncle. Dames. Who was it, Bertie? I don't know, except it wasn't Miss Ransom or Miss Goodwin. Well, someone knew. He didn't get in until pretty late last night. Here he comes now. Hi, Al. Huh? Well, good morning, Leroy. You aren't thinking of going anywhere in that sweater, I trust. Sure, why not? Because it's filthy. Change it. Good morning, Marjorie. Good morning, Bertie. Good morning, Mr. Gilsleeve. Good afternoon, Anki. No, my dear. <laughs> Your lady friends have already been phoning you. Lady phone? Who? I don't know, Mr. Gilsleeve. Except it wasn't one of the regulars. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you mean by that expression, Bertie. She means it wasn't Mrs. Ransom or Miss Goodwin. Oh, did you tell her I was out, Bertie? No, so I told her you was asleep. Yeah. <laughs> that might give people a bad impression, Bertie. If it was my secretary down at the office, for instance, she might... Well, it wouldn't be good for her morale. No, sir. <laughs> you want some breakfast, Miss Gilson? Yes, Bertie, I'm good and hungry. And don't forget some more toast, Bertie. I ain't forgotten, Leroy. Marjorie, I'd like to see the morning paper if you're through with it. Almost, Unky. Why, it was pretty late when you came in last night, Unc. How did you happen to be awake? I wasn't. Not till you tripped over something in the hall. <laughs> yes, I tripped over your football, my boy. I've told you not to leave that thing lying around where people can fall over it. Oh, sorry, Unc. Where'd you put it? I need it this morning. I put it where no one will ever trip over it again for some time. Put it on. I've warned you often enough, my boy. Oh, gosh. Whenever he stays up late, this is the way. Here's the paper, Uncle. Look, I want to show you something. On the society page. I'm not interested in the society page. You will be. Listen to this. Hmm? Music lovers in Summerfield will have a rare treat next Saturday when the Wings of Song Opera Company makes a special benefit appearance here. Oh, let me see that. The event is being sponsored by the exclusive Summerfield Women's Club in conjunction with the Sponsors Committee of Other Socially Prominent Citizens. Box parties are already being planned, and the whole affair promises to be one of the top events of the season for the Summerfield elite. What does elite mean, Unc? means a bunch of stuffed shirts, my boy. <laughs> well, they can have their opera. But, Uncle, you don't want to miss it. I'm evidently not socially prominent enough to be on the committee. That's no reason you shouldn't go and enjoy the music. I wouldn't enjoy it if I went. Opera in Summerfield can't possibly be any good. I don't see why not. It's a regular opera company. There are good opera companies and bad opera companies, my dear. Distinguish between them requires rare musical judgment. Now, who has selected this opera company? Mrs. Pettibone, the president of the Women's Club. She never heard an opera in her life. Now, if they'd seen fit to consult with me, but no! Oh, no! Mr. Gildersleeve isn't quite la -di da enough to be on any opera committee. Oh, mercy, no! <laughs> What's he all excited about? I'm perfectly calm, my boy. I'm a little disappointed, I'll admit, that there are people in Summerfield who think more of so-called ancestry than they do of real work, that's all. I happen to believe that opera should be enjoyed by everybody, not simply by the favored few. I still don't see why you can't just buy a ticket. Because I'm not the kind of a person who likes to horn in where he isn't wanted. You mean just because you're not on the committee, you won't go to the opera? Oh, that has nothing whatever to do with it. The opera won't be any good, I'll tell you that. Some small-time company I never heard of. Any opera company that would come to Summerfield must have something to hide. <laughs> I got it, Mr. Gilsey. Mr. Gilsey, you said this. Yes, ma'am, he's been up, oh, about five or ten minutes. Oh, pretty. <laughs> yes, ma'am, I'll call him. Mr. Gilsey, I think it's the same lady. Yeah, Bertie, you don't have to tell people I'm asleep, and you don't have to tell them how long I've been up. 
Hello. Oh. Oh, yes, Mrs. Pettibone. Yes, I read about it in this morning's paper. Me? A sponsor? I'm pretty busy, Mrs. Pettibone. But of course, where opera is concerned, I'll be glad to help. <laughs> you bet. Any time at all. Not at all, Mrs. Pettibone. Thank you. Oh, solo mio. <laughs> da, 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 da. What a character. <laughs> you children have to hurry and get out of here now. Mrs. Pettibone and Mrs. Bullard are coming over to consult me about the opera. I'll get right out, Unc. Uh, I could play outdoors if I knew where my football was. Uh, it's in the laundry hamper upstairs. Gee, thanks, Unc. I'll do the same for you sometime. Yes, yes. Oh, solo mio. Da, 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 da. Just sit down any place, ladies. Sofa, Mrs. Pettibone? This chair is very comfortable, thank you. Then I'll try the sofa. Fine, Mrs. Bullard. Shove over a little. <laughs> I can't tell you ladies how enthusiastic I am about this opera thing. I knew you would be. I said to Mrs. Bullard, I said, Mr. Gildersleeve is one man I know we can count on, I said. Didn't I say that, Mrs. Bullard? She certainly did, Mr. Gildersleeve. She sang your praises. She said, you're a man that knows and appreciates music. Well, I happen to have, uh, I've had a little musical training. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve sings, Mrs. Bullard. Did I tell you Mr. Gildersleeve sings? Oh, I've heard him from across the street. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid sometimes I forget myself. That is, I forget what a big voice I have. You need a big voice in opera, of course. Mr. Gildersleeve, don't tell me you've sung opera. Well, I appeared in one or two productions at college. Uh, what opera is the company going to present? Well, that's up to the committee to decide. We'll want your advice on that, of course, as one of the sponsors. Oh, it's your service, ladies. Uh, which opera do you prefer, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, they're all good. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, think we can decide that later, Mrs. Bullard. There's another problem that we have to consult Mr. Gildersleeve about. Yes. Yeah. Since this is for charity, we've uh, got to make it a success. Oh, it will be. If it is, it'll be due to the efforts of a handful of men like yourself, Mr. Gildersleeve. We're not asking many sponsors. Is that so? Oh, very few, Mr. Gildersleeve. But uh, your name is so well known. Well, everybody sees it on their water bill once a month. <laughs> <laughs> Say, how would it be if I sent out a little notice about the opera along with my December statements? I don't think that would be quite appropriate. Why not? Good way to sell tickets. Oh, we won't have any trouble selling tickets. People are going to be fighting for tickets. After all, Summerfield has never had an opera. I see. Um, how much are the tickets? Five dollars a piece. Five uh, dollars a piece? <laughs> yes, you see our problem, Mr. Gildersleeve. The tickets are so ridiculously cheap that everybody will want to come. <laughs> Isn't it silly? <laughs> it certainly is. <laughs> But we've thought of a way around it. All our sponsors are taking 15 tickets apiece. That's uh, $75 worth. But I only have a niece and nephew. I doubt if my nephew cares much for opera. Oh, no, no. You sell the tickets to your friends, Mr. Gildersleeve. Just your best friends. You see, that way we can keep the tickets in the hands of the desirable element. Oh, well, I'll be glad to call up a few people and... Uh... Of course. Mm. But uh, the sponsors take the tickets in advance. That'll be $75, Mr. Gildersleeve, even if you'll just write us out a check. Check? You mean now? Well, if it wouldn't be too much trouble. Oh, no trouble. Only, uh... Yes? Nothing. <laughs> Let's see. Checkbook. 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 Where is it? Uh, make it out to Earl Lewis, Wings of Song, Opera Company, Mr. Gildersleeve. I see, Earl Lewis, Wings of Song, Opera Company. Where am I going to get rid of 15 tickets, I wonder? 75 and, uh-oh, hundreds. Uh-oh. 15 tickets. Do I know 15 people that like opera? Do I know 15 people with $5? <laughs> <laughs> Rock Martin P. Well, hello, Mr. 
Kathleen. <laughs> well, howdy, PB. How's things down at the waterworks? <laughs> Gosh, I haven't even thought about the waterworks. I've been so busy with the opera. Just dropped in to check up on these tickets I left with you. Oh, don't worry about those, Mr. Joe Steve. I got them right here. <laughs> I put them in the cash drawer for safekeeping. But, but uh, have you sold any? No, Mr. Gildersleeve, I haven't. <laughs> to tell you the truth, there doesn't seem to be much demand for them. Well, it's like anything else, Phoebe. You have to create the demand. You have to sell them. I know, but just the same, I, I wonder if you haven't picked the wrong outlet here. Why? Well, in all the years I've been in the pharmacy business, I can't recall that anyone has ever come in here and asked for opera tickets. <laughs> People come in and ask for a lot of things. I had a woman come in and ask for a dozen and a half skate keys once. Never told me what she wanted them for. Skate keys at a drugstore? Why, that's ridiculous. Yes, it is. It was just by the merest chance that I happened to have them. (laughs) But as I say, I never had anybody ask for opera tickets. Of course, there hasn't been any opera. Yes. Well, you can't wait for people to ask you for them, Peavy. You've got to ask them. Oh, I do. Yeah. The reason you haven't sold any tickets is you haven't tried. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. (laughs) If you ask me, the reason I haven't sold any is... Well, I don't like to say this, but I wonder if you haven't set the price a little high, five dollars. I didn't set the price, Peavy. That's what they cost. I'm not making anything on this, you know. I know, but five dollars. That's ten dollars if you take the wife. And what man would go to an opera if it wasn't for his wife? (laughs) That's not the attitude, Peavy. You're not supposed to enjoy this. It's for charity. That's what I say. Uh, What charity? What's that? I say, what charity is it being given for? Oh. But, oh, yes. Well, I don't know that that's been settled yet. But it'll be a, bur- a worthy one, yes. Yeah, pardon me, just a moment, customer. Customer? Uh, don't forget about the tickets. Good morning, Mrs. Hornberry. Good morning, Mr. Peavy. Fine day. Yes, it is. Oh, is, the, is this gentleman ahead of me? Oh, no, no. Go right ahead. I'm just waiting. <laughs> don't forget, Peavy. What can I do for you, Mrs. Hornberry? I'd like some aspirin, please. Aspirin? Any particular brand? Well, which is best? Well, they're all monoacetic acid ester or salicylic acid. They're all what? They're all aspirin. <laughs> PB, the tickets. Keep your shirt on. You mean uh, there's no difference between any of them? Well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> well, I think I'll just take this one. A very wise choice. That'll be ten cents and one cent for the governor. Uh, will there be anything else, Mrs. Hornbeck? PV. No, I, I think that's all, thank you. Any razor blade? <laughs> uh, shaving lotion? Uh, cod liver oil? Uh, no, thank you. PV. Uh, vitamin tablet? <laughs> we have a special on bath salts. Well, um, no, I, uh... You wouldn't want any tickets to the opera, would you? No, I think that's... Did you say opera tickets? Uh, just a suggestion. I didn't really think you would. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> There's your package, Mrs. Hornbeck. Thank you very much, and call again. There, you see, Mr. Gillespie? Peavy, you take the case. By George, you couldn't sell mittens at 60 below zero. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. Give me back my tickets. I'll sell them myself. And we'll find out how the great Gildersleeve sells the tickets in just a moment. Mr. Lang, before you say anything about parquet margarine... Do you generally have a big breakfast at your house? Well, we usually have a substantial breakfast. Most of my friends say breakfast at their house is such a hectic affair. Everybody sort of eats and runs. Yes, I expect that's true with a lot of people. But I think you'll find that a great many of our go-getting Americans have learned that they need the nourishment a hearty, hot breakfast provides. Well, I wish I could get that idea across in my home. Well, then I'd suggest that you make each breakfast as tempting as possible by serving hot breads or pancakes or, of course, the old standby toast. 
And to make any kind of bread you serve taste extra good, I'd recommend parquet margarine as the spread. Parquet is preferred by millions as a spread for bread because of its unmatched flavor. And it's one of the most nourishing foods you can serve. It's rich in food energy value, and it's fortified with important vitamin A. So get your family off to a right start at breakfast by serving delicious, nourishing parquet. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by Kraft. Mrs. Finley? Uh, this is Mr. Gildersleeve, Clark Martin P. Gildersleeve. You probably don't know me, Mrs. Finley, but I'm calling with regard to the forthcoming opera benefit of which you have undoubtedly heard, and of which I have the uh, honor to be one of the sponsors. Your name has been given to me, Mrs. Finley, as one of the... Oh, you're a sponsor yourself. <laughs> uh, how's it going? Me too. <laughs> well, good luck. <laughs> Uncle Mort, what are the chances of somebody else getting at that phone? Not now, my dear. Give me another name from the book, Leroy. We haven't had much luck with the F's. You want to try the G's? I'll try anything. But, Uncle Mort, you've been on the phone for hours. The way it's going, I'll be on it for days. But I've got to do my homework. Well, go do it. Pick a name, Leroy. But I've got to call Francie. It's algebra. You're not going to do your algebra on my telephone. Well, how can I do it if I can't call Francie? Do it in your head. How does anybody else do it? Next name, Leroy. Flack, E.J. Summerfield 0859. Flack. Summerfield, 0859. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't stand there making faces at me, Marjorie. Go do your... Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hello, Mrs. Uh, uh, hold the wire a minute, please. Leroy, what was that name? Flack. Huh? I think it was Flack. Maybe it was Flake. Or Fluke. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> hello, Mrs. Flack. Uh, this is Mr. Gildersleeve. Frock Martin Gildersleeve. You probably don't know me, Mrs. Flack, but I'm calling with regard to the forthcoming opera benefit, of which you've undoubtedly heard, and of which I have the uh, honor to be one of the sponsors. Your name has been given to me, Mrs. Fluke, is one... <laughs> oh, you too, huh? <laughs> Sorry to have bothered you. How can anybody sell opera tickets if everybody's going to be a sponsor? Doorbell, it's Judge Hooker. Oh, what does he want? Just when I'm... Wait a minute. Let the dear judge in, my dear. Let him come right in. Hello, Judge. Good afternoon, Marjorie. Horace, my old friend. Welcome to our humble abode. Take the judge's coat there, my dear. Horace, I'm certainly glad to see you. Well. Leroy, get out of that chair. Sit down, old fellow. Sit down. Well, if it's all the same to you, I'll stand up, Gilly. Well, thank you, Marjorie. I won't take off my coat. Sit down. Stand up. Take off your coat. Roast to death. Suit yourself. <laughs> This is Liberty Hall here. We want to please you. Marjorie, how long has he been like this? Since birth, I guess. <laughs> Horace, my friend, how much money have you got on you? None of your business. Why? Horace, my friend, much as I esteem you, I've always felt that there's one facet of your education that's been woefully neglected, and that is music. What bush are you beating around now? And if there's one field of music in which you're particularly ignorant, it's opera. Now, I am so fortunate as to have in my possession here a few little tickets. If those are opera tickets. They are. And if you were thinking of selling me any. It was in the back of my mind. Well, I happen to be the chairman of the opera's committee on arrangements. (laughs) Horace, have you sold any of those tickets they stuck you with? To tell you the truth, Gildy, I've been so busy with all the committee work I haven't even tried. But I anticipate no particular difficulty. <laughs> I just dropped in to tell you that owing to the many demands upon my time, I may be a little late to the Jolly Boys meeting tonight. Oh, I'd forgotten there was one. You're going, aren't you? Mm, I don't know. Well, if you do, ask him not to hold up the proceedings for me. Oh, uh, and since you mention it, uh, you might just take these opera tickets of mine and pass them around down there in case any of the members are cared to purchase You go them. sell them yourself, Horace. I've got my own tickets to get rid of. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I may see you later, then, if you decide to go. Don't worry. I'll be going. You're not going to get down there ahead of me, the old goat. <laughs> Hello, boy, you're the most boys. Boy. Let's be jolly boys, shall we? I'm just trying to make myself heard, that's all, Chief. Well, we heard you. 
I say we've got to get behind the opera, fellas. I say we should support it. Why? It's for charity, Floyd. Yeah, yeah, I know about charity. Give me another reason. Well, it's going to be an important function socially. Uh, I think if the Jolly Boys were to attend, it would give them a little class. A little class could ruin this club. <laughs> He's got a point there. Yeah. Well, there's another thing, too. This isn't just a club here. In a way, we're a musical organization. No, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> well, you wouldn't, maybe. But Floyd, you're a singer. Well, I, I can hold my own, I guess. You're as sound a tenor as I know. Gee, thanks, Commissioner. And the chief here. I don't know where you'd find a better bass. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Of course, the judge ain't here, so we don't have to lie about him. <laughs> yeah, very good, Floyd. <laughs> so what I say, fellows, as music lovers and the only singing group in Summerfield that's worth a hoot, the Jolly Boys should not only go to the opera, they should attend in a body. How about it? He's got a point there. Yeah. Yeah, let's all go. That's the stuff, fellas. Now, I've been able to obtain a few choice tickets, which I happen to have here with me. Coincidence. Let's see... Each of us will want to take a wife or friend, I presume. Just a minute, Commish. How much are these tickets? Uh, how much are they? Yeah, how much? Uh, five dollars. Five dollars? Five dollars? Five dollars to take the wife to a lousy opera? <laughs> Ten dollars, Floyd. The tickets are five dollars apiece. You keep out of this, PB. Now, hold on. I'm for charity and all that, but fun is fun. Yeah. When I pay out ten bucks, I like to get a little something for my money. Lousy opera. Have you ever been to the opera, Floyd? No, and it don't look like I'm going. Have you, Chief? No, I can't say that I have. PV? I told you, Mary Widow. Yeah. <laughs> Why, gentlemen, you've missed some of the greatest entertainment in the world. That ain't what I heard. Why, it's exciting. It's spectacular. People go miles to see it. Why, in the opera, Carmen alone, you know what you get? What? Bullfights, duels, parades. Love scenes, beautiful senoritas. Yeah? Yeah. And through it all, gorgeous melodies. Toreador, oh, Toreador, Toreador, Toreador. <laughs> what's the opera about, Commissioner? Uh, Carmen, what's it about? Yeah. Uh, oh, well, <clears throat> it's about this girl named Carmen, this beautiful senorita. She's Spanish, see, and she's very ooh-la-la. That's French. Well. <laughs> she's the French type, only she's Spanish. Oh. <laughs> so in comes this fellow who's in love with her. His name is Don somebody, and he's about six feet six. He comes marching in. Toreadoro, Toreadoro. You sang that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he no sooner arrives and start make loving. <laughs> well, who wrote this? <laughs> he no sooner arrives and starts making love to Carmen, who, believe me, fellas, is a dish, really. <laughs> and in comes another fella, Don somebody else. Right away, they're jealous. And they whip out their swords and go at it, hammer and tongs. Toreador, eh, Toreador. Is that the only song in the opera? <laughs> Let him tell the story, Floyd. Lloyd, don't betray your ignorance. Surely you heard. Vesti la juba, yo ho ho paliati. Da, 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 da. Yeah, that's it, Chief. Why, I've heard that. Sure, and then there's. Celeste Aida. Who's Aida? Friend of Carmen's. Oh. Celeste Aida. Da, 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 Carmen. Is that opera? No kidding? Certainly. Oh, and don't forget Martha. She another friend? I guess so. <laughs> Martha, Martha, I implore you, leave me not to pine inside. Hey, Chief, you know that, Why, I've got a record of that. Hey, say, hey, this sounds like a great show. Oh, it's even better when you see it. Bullfights, fellas, beautiful senoritas, a band of 50 pieces. Uh, Mr. Gillespie, are there any elephants? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised, Peavy. It's got everything else. Now, I always like to see the elephants. Oh, well. Now, who wants tickets, fellas? How many? Chief? Uh, I'll bite, Commissioner. Give me two. That's the stuff. Two for the chief. Peavy, how about you? Uh, give me one for now. I'll let you know about the other one later. Oh, great. One it is. Floyd, how about it? 
I still say ten bucks is too steep. Oh, come on, Frog. Yes, Floyd, let's all go. Well, don't urge him if you don't want to. I just hate to think about what he's missing, that's all. All those gorgeous melodies. Some think the world was made for fun and frolic. And so do I. And so do I. Some like to fret and be all melancholic. To pine and sigh. To pine and sigh. Wait. Come on, how about it, Floyd? Nope. But I, I like to spend my time in singing some joyful song. Some joyful song. <laughs> to set the world with laughter bravely ringing is far from wrong. Is far from wrong. Harkin, harkin, music fills the air. Harkin, harkin, joy is everywhere. Finicule, 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 finicule. Joy is every... Floyd, I forgot to tell you about the biggest scene in the opera. What's that? That's where Carmen and her friend, these two beautiful senoritas, uh-huh. they get into a fight over this fellow. You know, Don, somebody? Yeah. And I tell you, it's really something to see. They bite, they scratch, they even start to tear each other's clothes off. Tear each other's... Yeah? Right before your very eyes. But there's no telling how it might end. <laughs> Only the dancing girls come in and pull them apart. Dancing girls? You didn't tell me they had dancing girls. Oh, hundreds of them. I'll take two tickets. <laughs> Joy is everywhere. Peniculi, peniculi. The great Gildersleeve will be back in just a few moments. A little while ago, I had a few words to say about parquet margarine's fresh, delicate flavor, how it makes all kinds of bread taste so good. And I also pointed out how parquet margarine helps provide your family with fine, wholesome nourishment because it's so rich in food energy and fortified with important vitamin A. Now, another reason why parquet margarine is preferred by millions to any other spread is that it's so economical. Parquet's nourishing goodness and unmatched flavor can be enjoyed by your family for only about half the price of costly spreads. So why pay more? Just try Parquet Margarine once and see if you don't prefer it to any other brand. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet Margarine. Made by the Kraft Foods Company. Ladies and gentlemen, there's just one week left in the Victory Bond Drive. The war is over, but the government needs money to bring our men home from overseas, to provide hospital care for the wounded, to support the wives and children of those who will never return. If the war was worth buying bonds for, surely these vital peacetime needs deserve our help, too. And remember, inflation is still a danger, and the bonds are the best defense against it. So if you haven't bought your victory bond yet, do it tomorrow. Will you? Good night, everybody. Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekin. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. You good cooks know it's the seasoning that adds extra zest to foods. That's why there's been such a big swing to Kraft Salad Mustard for pepping up meals. You'll be delighted with the extra flavor tang Kraft Salad Mustard adds to meat, hot vegetable and cheese dishes, and to gravies, pickle relishes, and barbecue sauce. There's another variety, too, just a bit sharper and oh so tasty on frankfurters and in sauce for fish. It's the Kraft Mustard with nippy horseradish added. Buy both delicious Kraft prepared mustards when you shop tomorrow. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Now let's see what goes on in Summerfield. Well, you'd hardly know the place. Summerfield, which usually can boast no more than a second-run movie, is suddenly all a flutter over the prospect of an evening of grand opera. And how did this come to be? Well, it seems that Mrs. Robson Bullard, while on a recent trip to New York, bought herself a very expensive evening gown. Do you like it, Robson? Yes, yes, it's very becoming. But where on earth are you going to wear it in this town? I know. That's the only thing. Never fear. Where such things are at stake, woman will find a way. And so it is that a touring opera company is scheduled for a single performance at the dusty old Summerfield Opera House, underwritten by such prominent citizens as Brock Morton P. Gildersleeve and Judge <laughs> Horace Hooker. In fact, the two of them are up early and in Mr. Gildersleeve's study right now discussing the matter. What seems to be your problem, Judge? Women. Yeah. <laughs> How'd you come to get mixed up with women at your age? You know, it's this darned opera. They made me chairman of the Committee on Arrangements. I don't know why I ever said I'd do it. Nothing but a lot of jealous women in my hair all day long. (laughs) (laughs) You never could handle women, you know, Judge. Well, you may be right. Say, Gildy, maybe you... Oh, no, no thanks. I've done enough. I've sold my $75 worth of tickets for the opera, and that's plenty. But, Gildy, you're the man they should have appointed to head this committee in the first place. That may well be. But it so happens they didn't. Now, let them try to get along without me. Gildy, that's not the spirit. If they want to appoint some tactless old goat who doesn't know the first thing about handling women, who puts his foot in his big mouth every time he opens it, and probably insults him when he thinks he's paying him a compliment... You're right, Gildy. I am tactless. I realize that. Handling women is an art, Horace. It's an instinct. You're either born with it or you aren't. That's so true. And you do it so well. <laughs> I envy you, Gildy. I truly do. Well, I could probably give you a few tips, but uh, why should I? Why should you get the credit while I... Exactly. Huh? (laughs) Now, why don't we fool them, Gildy? Why don't we just take matters into our own hands and handle it the way it should have been handled in the first place? Oh, how's that? Well, we won't consult anybody about it. I'll just resign in your favor. Oh, now, wait a minute. Well, you said yourself you're the obvious man for the job. Well, I don't know that I said it. Well, there's hardly any work involved, Gildy. It's all done, practically. All it calls for now is someone to act as referee, as it were, between the various women. Someone with your deft touch, Gildy. Uh huh. Someone who has a way with the ladies. You devil, you. <laughs> <laughs> then you'll do it, huh? Now, well, wait a minute. I'll get it, Bertie. <laughs> now what? I got to be getting down to the office. Well, I'll drive you down, Gildy. Oh, Leela, hello. Get your hat and coat, Frock Martin. You're coming with me. Coming where? To the dressmaker. What? I'm having a new gown made for the opera, and I'm having a fitting at 9.30. I want you to come and see it. Oh, but I can't. But I want you to pass on it, Frock Martin. I want to know if you approve. Some people might think it was a little extreme. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to, but I can't, Leela. I got a million things to do. Oh, now run and get your coat. You hear? I won't take no for an answer. Besides, how am I going to get there if you don't drive me? Well, gosh, all right. Wait there. I'll go get the car out. Hello, Leela. Horace, I didn't know you over here. Did you hear the news, Leela? Gildy's taking over the chairmanship of the committee on arrangements for the opera. It's a tremendous honor. Horace, you didn't stick Frock Martin with that. Well, he claims he has a way with the women. (laughs) Uh, Is this 
miss the place, Leela? Wonder she wouldn't fix her gate. Mm, you wouldn't say that if you knew her. Why? Poor Miss Tate. She's as poor as a church mouse. But she's a wonderful dressmaker. Everyone in town goes to her. Well, if everyone goes to her, why is she so poor? Mm, I guess she's just been too busy ever to stop and figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the bell? Oh. Gosh, I haven't seen one of these since I called on the Peavies. Oh, come in. Come in, Mrs. Ransom. Oh, thank you, Miss Tate. This is Mr. Gildersleeve. How do you do? It, aren't you afraid you'll swallow those pins? Oh, uh, I'm so used to keeping pins in my mouth, I often forget they're there. <laughs> it looks dangerous. <laughs> I, I know you hate me for being late, Miss Tate, but I had to wait for Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> He just insisted on coming along to see my new gown. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, it doesn't matter. Everybody's late. They've all arrived at once. Dear, dear, let me see. Now, where can I put you? The gown's ready. I finished it last night. Oh, you're going to love it, Throckmorton. I can't put you in the bedroom. Mrs. Pettibone's in there. Oh, and Mrs. Bullard's in the sewing room. Mrs. Bullard? I thought she bought her gown in New York. She did, but it had to be let out a little. <laughs> Oh, that terrible. Anyway, here's yours. Now, if we can do uh, Don't look, Frock Martin. Close your eyes, you hear? Close my eyes? Why? Because I don't want you to see it till I'm in it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, Leela, they're closed. <laughs> oh, dear. If everybody didn't arrive just at the same time. Oh, I know. I'll change in the bathroom. Oh, would you mind? Oh, thank you. I won't be in a minute, Throckmorton. Well, I won't hold my breath. <laughs> Things are so upset here, I feel I should apologize. It's just been... Well, it's more than I can handle, I'm afraid. <laughs> you seem pretty busy, all right. Busy? Well, I've never seen anything like it. Hmm? Uh, it's all right if you open your eyes now, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, oh, thanks. Miss <laughs> Tate, uh, I need help here, I'm afraid. Uh, right away, Mrs. Bullard. Excuse me. Oh, certainly. Miss yes. Tate. Uh, just a moment, Mrs. Pettibone. Why did I come here? By getting caught in a hen roost. <laughs> I suppose she wonders what I'm doing tagging around with Leela. So do I. <laughs> Please, I've been so rushed. Uh, Miss Tate, mm, mm, those pins. Uh, don't worry. I always carry them in my mouth. <laughs> Though goodness knows I'm so distracted these days, it's a wonder I don't go to bed with them. You ought to check. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, I haven't been to bed for two nights. Oh. <laughs> Miss Tate. Uh, tell me. My head is just in a spin today. Now, let's see. That was Mrs. Pettibone. That sounded like her. You better sit down for a minute. Oh, dear. Someone else. Uh, just a minute, Mrs. Pettibone. Ooh, the poor woman is, woman is running a madhouse. <laughs> yeah. It's beginning to get me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd sure like to get out of here. Oh, come in. Come in, Miss Goodwin. Miss Goodwin. He. I hope I haven't come at a bad time, but I have an appointment in half an hour with... Rockmorton. <laughs> Hello, Eve. Well, what in the world are you doing here? Me? Well, I, uh, I just happened to, uh... I didn't know you were interested in dressmaking. Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> well, I don't understand. Why, You're... here I am, Rockmorton. Oh, I see. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Eve, you know Leela. Leela, you know Eve. Yes, indeed. Uh, how are you, Mrs. Ransom? Uh, yes, I guess everybody knows everybody. <laughs> oh, Miss Tate. Oh, of course. Sure, you know him. Sure. Well, aren't you going to say anything about the gown, Frostmore? Yes, very nicely. Let's see. <laughs> it's a lovely gown, Mrs. Ransom. It won't fall off, will it? <laughs> oh, don't you worry about that. But I see one thing wrong with it. I'll just put a pin in here, so. I declare, I just don't know how the opera would ever get on without Miss Tate. Do you, Miss Goodwin? That's quite true. Miss Tate is really the keystone. And another pin in here. Ouch! Oh, I stuck you. Oh, do forgive me. I'm so terribly sorry, Mrs. Ransom. Why, well, watch it. I don't know how it happened. My hand shook, I guess. I'm so nervous today anyway. Now, let me try once more. I'll be very careful. 
Oh, dear. Where did I put those pins? Pins? Uh, in, oh, in your mouth. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now, one more. Miss Hayes, how long do I have to wait? I've been here half an hour. Oh, dear. I might remind you, Mrs. Pettibone, that I arrived here before you did. My appointment was for 9.30, and that's when I got here. Oh, dear. Well, I don't want to step out of turn, Miss Tate, but unless I can have my fitting within the next 15 minutes... Just a minute, I everybody. Won't... I might remind you that I'm having my fitting now. Continue, Miss Tate. Well, I like that. Uh, comes in here after everybody I else. I was the first it? one here. Well, I told Miss Tate when I arrived, I have an appointment. I'm getting and if I can't get my fitting now... Right here, Mr. Meister. <laughs> 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 Miss Tate! Oh, oh catch her, Throckmorton! Oh, gracious! Oh, she's fainted. Fainted nothing. What happened? I know what happened. She swallowed those pins. Here, take her, somebody. Let a man handle this. Let me at that telephone. Well, there goes my fitting. Your fitting? There goes the opera! <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve will be back in just a minute. Mr. Lang, I'm very grateful to you. Well, that's nice to hear. What have I done? It was you who put me wise to parquet margarine. You see, I fix three lunch boxes every day, and it takes a lot of spread for the sandwiches. And you find that parquet margarine spreads quickly and easily, don't you? Even when you first take it out of the refrigerator. Yes, that's one reason I like to use it. Because I have to work fast, preparing six to eight sandwiches while my children and husband are having breakfast. Oh, six to eight sandwiches do take a lot of spread, don't they? And that's another reason I'm glad you told me about parquet margarine. It's so economical. Well, that's what a lot of women are finding out. Parquet is only about half the price of costly spreads. And the important thing to remember is that it's one of the best energy foods you can buy. Rich in nourishment and fortified with important vitamin A. I want to say, too, that my family likes Parquet's fresh, sweet flavor. Well, now you've made me grateful to you. Because I think you've convinced a lot of other people that they ought to try Parquet. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by Kraft. <laughs> Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. Several days have passed, and now we find him at home, wrestling with some of the operatic problems left unsolved by Judge Horace Hooker. Simultaneously, and with more or less assistance from the rest of the household, he's trying to get the checks in the mail for his November bills. All right, Leroy, what's next? Summerfield Meat Market, $32.25. $32 worth of meat? There isn't that much meat in the whole world. You want the items? November 1st, pork chops. November 2nd... Never mind. Bertie's checked it. Summerfield Meat Market. Telephone! 32 and 25 hundreds. Mr. Gillespie's back then. Oh, yes, Miss Bullard. He's right here. Miss Bullard, across the street, Miss Gillespie. Oh, thanks. wonder what she wants. Keep working, Leroy. Hello? Oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'm sorry to bother you, but a question has come up. That's what I'm here for, Mrs. Bullard. What is it? Well, it seems that there hasn't been any official decision on who is to be head patroness for the opera. Oh? But naturally, since the whole thing was my idea in the first place, why, naturally, I assumed that I... Well, yes, I suppose that's right if you thought the whole thing up. I was sure you'd agree with me, Mr. Gildersleeve. Absolutely. But I just wanted to make it official. Thanks ever so much. You're welcome, Mrs. Bullard. Goodbye. Bye. All right, she's head patroness, whatever that means. <laughs> How are the envelopes coming, Leroy? Pretty good. Do I have to finish them now? Well, I'd like to establish my credit, so maybe I can do a little Christmas shopping. Let's get going. I made a blot on one envelope. Does it matter? This one. Well, you can still read it. Acme cleaners. If they don't like it, they can clean it. <laughs> What's next? Summerfield Light and Power, 260. Yeah, the thieves. <laughs> Summerfield L and P, two and sixty hundreds. 
Next. Summerfield Water Department, 502. Outrageous. That's for two months. You didn't pay last month. <laughs> I'll have to, have to write myself a letter. <laughs> Doorbell. I'll get it, Leroy. It's Miss Goodwin. I saw her coming up the walk. Oh, yes, Miss Goodwin. Something about the programs, I guess. Hello, Miss Goodwin. Hello, Marjorie. I know your uncle's off is busy, but I'd like to see him just for a minute. Sure, come on in. Hello, Eve. Glad to see you. Hello, George Morton. Leroy. Hi, Miss Goodwin. How's the opera coming along? Oh, I think we'll get it on all right. Doc Martin, if you've got a minute. Sure, Eve. Sit down. Take off your coat. Take Miss Goodwin's coat, Leroy. Go out and play. But the bills. Go out and play. <laughs> Marjorie, you too. Go out and play? I'm not a child, Uncle Mort. If you want me to leave the room, say so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any of this is necessary, Throckmorton. But we're going to have a, an opera a week from today, you know. Oh, yes. The important thing is we ought to decide which one it's going to be. Oh, yes. Well, what operas has this company got? Well, they offer a choice of three for this kind of engagement. Carmen, Rigoletto, or Tannhauser. Let's make it Tannhauser. Tannhauser. All right, but why? Never mind why. You asked me which opera, and I told you. Bing, bing, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm glad you settled it. I must say men are awfully efficient. Well, of course, I'm an executive. <laughs> but I think you're efficient, too, Eve. Oh, thank you. Yes, sir. You've got your mind on the opera, not on what you can get out of it. <laughs> well, I've got to go and see Hogan Brothers about their ad. They're taking the back cover. That a girl. You know, Eve, you ought to get a percentage of the profits. I just hope there are some. Well, drop in any time, Eve. Anytime you need a quick decision, bing, bing, you know where to come. It's a great comfort. Uh, goodbye, Eve. Goodbye, Throckmorton. Oh, by the way, the program should include the name of the head patroness. I sort of wondered... Oh, you want to be head patroness, is that it? Well, then I... Then head patroness you shall be. <laughs> yes, sir, let's not beat around the bush. Well, do you really think I deserve it? I don't know who deserves it more. Consider it settled. Bing, bing. <laughs> oh, thank you. Goodbye, Throckmorton. Ta-ta, Eve. Come around next week. I'll have mistletoe. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Mort, I heard you tell Mrs. Bullard she could be head patroness. What's the difference? Tell one, tell all. <laughs> An executive can't bother with details, my dear. Oh, so that's it. Mr. Gilfried, you're going downtown today, you're going to be here for lunch. I'll be here, Bertie, working. But I don't want anything elaborate, just a tray at my desk. Yes, sir. About a three-course tray? Yeah. <laughs> Fine, Bertie. Okay, I'll get working on it. <laughs> uh, now what? Hello? Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. This is Mrs. Pettibone. Oh, yes, Mrs. Pettibone. How's everything going? Just splendidly. The women's club has sold every single one of its tickets. We're over the top. Uh, great work, Mrs. Pettibone. Great work. Well, I guess you can relax a little now. <laughs> I think I should. But uh, there's something I want to ask you. Since the Women's Club is sponsoring the opera, and since I'm the president of the club, I suppose I am to be the head patroness, am I not? <laughs> I didn't catch that, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, oh, yes. You say you want to be head patroness, Mrs. Pettibone? I say I should be. Well, all right. After all, it's only... It's only fair. Thank you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, not at all, Mrs. Pettibone. In fact, don't mention it. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Just a title. What difference does it make? Uh, but these women... Come in. Yoo-hoo, Throckmorton. All right, you can be head patroness of the opera. Oh, Throckmorton, you darling. Well, that was what you wanted, wasn't it? No, but I think it's just lovely. <laughs> All right, now let me get back to work or there won't be any opera. Skat. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> How goes the opera? The opera, coming along, Peavy, coming along. I'm running the whole shebang, you know. Well, yeah, congratulations. How'd you ever get stuck with that job? Well, I just took it over to help Judge Hooker out. After all, I know how to handle women, and he doesn't. Oh. <laughs> well, I do. I don't have any trouble with women. Even a whole committee of women. And you know why, Peavy? I don't ask them. 
I tell them. Treat them rough. That's the way, is it? And you're darn right. <laughs> Women just want to be told, that's all, Peavy. And they want a man to tell them. No, I wouldn't say that. Wouldn't <laughs> I wouldn't expect you to agree with me, Peavy. You never agree with me about anything. I agree with you when I think you're right, Mr. Gilmerstein. Well, that's practically never. That's what it's saying. <laughs> and you're wrong about this. Women like to be treated rough. They want to be bossed around. That's female psychology. Do you uh, know this for a fact, Mr. Gildersleeve, or have you just been reading some magazine? I know it for a fact. <laughs> did you ever try it? No, can't say I ever did. You better not, Peavy. I doubt if you're the type. You have to be the caveman type to get away with it. Now, here I am with all these women on this opera committee, and when I say jump, they jump. You just tell them jump, just like that. Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. Jump, Mrs. Pettibone. Jump, Mrs. Bullard. Jump, ladies. Jump. And they jump. I'd certainly like to see that. Uh, did you come in here for anything particular, Mr. Gildersleeve? No, just out for a breath of air, Peavy. Better get back and start cracking the whip, though. They'll be getting out of their cages. Take it easy, Peavy. If any women try to shove you around, shove them right back. Oh, my. My, my, my. <laughs> Now, Leroy, we'll check the list of box holders. Gosh, Uncle, I'm tired of checking stuff. Why can't Marge check anything? Your sister's going to see about her costume. Costume? Is she going to be in the opera? No, she's going to sell programs. Now, box A downstairs. Does that mean she gets to see the show? I suppose so. Jeepers, what about me? I didn't think you'd enjoy it, my boy. I enjoy anything at night. (laughs) Well, we'll see. Now, box A... Oh, nuts. Whoever it is, tell him I'm not at home. Okay. Oh, hi, Miss Goodwin. Hi, Mrs. Ransom. Hello, Leroy. Is your uncle home? Of course he is. We saw him through the window. (laughs) Well, that takes care of that. Come on in. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Well, well, Leela and Eve. Come on in. Come on in. Leroy, you go in the study and check this list, will you, my boy? Put on. Christmas is coming, Leroy. Okay. Boy, it better be good. <laughs> now, sit down, ladies. Make yourself comfy. How's everything going? Everything's going all right, Throckmorton. Only there's something you'll have to straighten out. Well, you know me. Bing, bing, I give my decision. Throckmorton, you told me this morning I was to be head patroness. And now I find Miss Goodwin somehow has the impression she was to be. Oh, oh, that... Do you remember how I got the impression I was to be head patron of Throckmorton? Well, now, let's see. Been so busy, so many details to be taken care of. You told me. That's how. I did? You couldn't have Throckmorton because you distinctly told me I could have it. I didn't even ask, remember? Well, I remember something about it. Do you remember your conversation with me? I guess so, only... Um... Only what? Oh, I don't know. Is it possible, Throckmorton, that you've promised both of us we can be head patroness? Yes, it's possible. Ye gods, what difference does it make? It's just a title. Who cares who's head patroness anyway? Well, I certainly care. It's very important, Throckmorton. I don't see why. Well, the head patroness appears on the stage between the acts in a spotlight, and the star of the opera kisses her hand. Well, even so. You saw my dress, Throckmorton, and if anyone in town has a more impressive one... I don't consider it important. But it just so happens that I have the same dressmaker. Well! Uh, Well, uh, I didn't think you'd care about a thing like this. Well, I do. But perhaps not for the same reasons as Mrs. Ransom. She seems to have forgotten that the head patroness has to make a speech. I hope you'll want the committee effectively represented. Oh, yes, that's very important. Well, I hope you don't think I'm tongue-tied, Throckmorton. Oh, no. I once gave a talk before a thousand people down home. The time the Sunday school burned down and they raffled off a Buick to buy a new one. You made a speech? I certainly did. Yes. The lucky ticket is number 93. (laughs) Keith Goodwin, I made a regular speech. I may not be a school teacher, but I'm just as... Now, Leela. But I won't stand here and be insulted. And if you cared all about the appearance of the head patroness, you'll choose me. Not necessarily. Of course, if he wants the matronly type. Eve. 
Matronly? I'm not considered matronly. But even if I was, I'd rather be matronly than scrawny. Mrs. Ransom, you be careful. I won't. Throckmorton, make up your mind. Is it me or her? Yes, Throckmorton. Is it she or I? <laughs> School teacher? Widow? Oh, ladies, ladies. For heaven's sake, let's be reasonable. All right, give us a decision. You're the chairman. Well, now, let's see. Uh, by the way, whatever happened to Miss Tate? Don't try to change the subject. Oh, but I, I'm terribly concerned about her, Leela. After all, swallowing a pin. She coughed it up. She's perfectly all right. Now, who's going to be head patron? Poor Miss Tate. Must have been very painful. Never heard her at all. Now, stop shilly-shallying, Throckmorton. Well, now, ladies, I have to think. Oh, uh, doorbell. Excuse me, ladies. <laughs> well, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, hello, Mrs. Pettibone and Mrs. Bullard. Gee. Uh, excuse me. I think I heard the telephone. I didn't hear anything. They're after me, Leroy. They're after me. Oh. Women, women, women trapped in a hen roost. Now I know how that poor dressmaker felt. Leroy, quick, get me a pin and a glass of water. We'll be hearing from the great Gildersleeve again in just a moment. You'll remember a few minutes ago, I had a conversation with a lady about what a swell spread parquet margarine is for lunchbox sandwiches, because you can spread it so easily and quickly, and that you can't beat parquet for economy, because it's only about half the price of costly spreads. But perhaps the thing that makes parquet margarine a favorite of millions is its fresh, dairy-like flavor. For sandwiches, hot breads, pancakes, and waffles, parquet margarine is still unmatched for flavor. Made from selected farm products, vegetable oils rich in energy and pasteurized skim milk, and with important vitamin A added, parquet margarine is one of the most nourishing foods you can buy today. So be sure to try this nourishing spread that tastes so good. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by Kraft. Uh, folks, you know how kids are always pestering you to tell them a story over and over? Well, I thought, why not just have a phonograph record you could play, make the kids happy, and save yourself the trouble? And that's just what I did. I made three records. Puss in Boots, Jack and the Beanstalk, and Rumpelstiltskin. All good stories with pretty music, too. You can get the album at any music store right now. Make a mighty nice Christmas present. <laughs> Just thought I'd mention it. Good night. <laughs> the Great Gilder's Day is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekin. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. For tempting variety at mealtime, treat your family to food zestfully flavored with Kraft prepared mustards. Remember, there are two popular varieties. A tangy golden craft salad mustard that's mild and delicately spiced, and a sharper craft mustard with nippy horseradish added. They're both grand flavor treats in sandwiches and on frankfurters and cold cuts, and mighty appetizing blended into cooked foods, too. Buy both kinds. Ask for craft salad mustard and craft horseradish mustard when you shop tomorrow. <laughs> This is the National Broadcasting Company.
The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> It's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Now let's join The Great Gildersleeve. There seems to be a good deal of activity going on in his house. Leroy, ask Bertie if she's finished ironing my shirt. Okay. Marjorie, what'd you do with my tuxedo? The tuxedo? I haven't been wearing it. Did Kate... It came back from the cleaners this morning. Someone must have put it someplace. Leroy, are you going to ask Bertie about my shirt, or aren't you? Sure. Gosh, what's the hurry? There's an opera on, young man. I'll get moving. Ask her about my tuxedo at the same time. And answer the phone. I'll answer the phone. It's probably for me. Well, somebody answer it. Mr. Gilsey, it's afternoon. Oh, yes, Mr. Goodwin, he's sitting right here. No, he ain't the sick little dude. I'll call him. Mr. Gilsey, Mr. Goodwin on the phone. Yeah, all right, Bertie, thank you, but I am busy. Do you know what happened to my tuxedo? It's hanging in your closet, Mr. Gilsey. Oh, well, what about my shirt? It's in your dresser drawer. Already? Wonderful. But <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a minute, Bertie, don't go away now. Hello, Eve? How are things shaping up? Great. <laughs> uh, look, how would it be if I pick you up around 8 o'clock? Okay, my chariot will drop to your door at the stroke of eight. Shall I blow the horn? I was only kidding, Eve. I'll ring the doorbell. <laughs> am I dressing? You darn right I am. After all, an opera doesn't come to Summerfield every day. Okay, Eve. Ta-ta. Let me see now. If I... Whoop, forgot you were standing there, Bertie. <laughs> Something you want, Mr. Gilson? Uh, yes, Bertie. Very important. I wonder if you could press my black tie and give it a little backbone. I can try, Mr. Gilson. Fine. Leroy, run upstairs and get my black tie. It's lying with my collar and studs on the bed. Gosh, all this work to go to the opera. Does everybody have to go through this? Men always dress to go to the opera, my boy. It's a tradition. Yeah? Who started it? Women, go get the tie. <laughs> okay. See a shirt, collar, tie, socks. Socks. Bertie, have I got any black silk socks? You got three pair, Mr. Gilfrey. One pair never even been mended. Well, one pair ought to be enough. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. What else? Oh, yes, my opera hat. Have you seen it? No, sir, not in some little time. I've worn it since the day I sat on the platform with the governor. Marjorie, have you seen my opera hat? Not since Leroy had it. Leroy? What was he doing with it? Don't you remember? He used it for his magic. Oh, my goodness. Where is my opera hat, Leroy? I thought you wanted the tie. Never mind the tie. Where is my opera hat? Upstairs, I guess. Don't guess me any guesses. Go get the hat. Okay, gosh, more trouble. And give me the necktie. Oh, forgot. Here, cat. Oh. Here, Bertie. <laughs> you think you can do anything about it? Well, sir, I might be able to make it set up for a few hours. <laughs> That's all I ask, Bertie. Just so it'll carry me till midnight. <laughs> Then I'll come home like Cinderella. Yes, sir. A little starch ought to do it. <laughs> Marjorie, what kind of tricks was Leroy doing with my opera hat? Oh, you know. He used to pull things out of it. What kind of things? Eggs and stuff like that. <laughs> that darn kid. By George, if he's... Leroy. Were you thinking of wearing this hat on? I was. Tonight? Tonight. Let me see it. She. She, Leroy, you ruined. Well, this hat cost me seven dollars and a half in 1922, and I've only worn it three times. The first chance I've had to wear it to an opera. And look at it. Oh, it isn't so bad, huh? It's just one teeny little hole in the top. I bet it wouldn't leak even. An opera hat is not worn to keep off the rain, my boy. Oh, well, I suppose the music will sound just as good if I wear a derby. (laughs) 
Well, here we are, folks, in the lobby of the Summerfield Opera House, where tonight, Summerfield is to have its first opera since the year 1922. Now, I'm going to try to bring to our microphone a few of the leading citizens as they arrive to take their seats. So, if you'll just be patient, we expect to present some of these leading citizens very shortly. Pardon me, buddy, could you I'm do... sorry we're on the air. Oh, oh, pardon me, I thought you were an usher. <laughs> Look, lovey, this guy's broadcasting the opera. You see the microphone? Yeah, I've seen lots of them in pictures. While we're waiting, folks, I might give you a little background information on tonight's opera entitled Tannhauser. It was written <laughs> by Richard Wagner, a German, and was first presented in the year 1845 in the city of Dresden, He's Germany. He's reading all that off the paper. <laughs> yeah, I saw him. Oh, I think I see a gentleman coming now. I'd like to present to you over our microphone. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, this gentleman is the chairman of the Committee on Arrangements for tonight's opera. Did you hear that, honey? Mr. Gildersleeve's going to speak over the air. Why? <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, will you step over there? Yes, uh, pardon me. Pardon me, madam. And here is our first celebrity, ladies and gentlemen, just as we promised, Mr. Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, our popular water commissioner. Oh, thank you. Should I talk or sing? Just talk. Oh, oh yeah. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here this evening. And as chairman of the Committee on Arrangements, I want to say it's been quite a job getting this opera on. What I mean, ladies and gentlemen, is that I personally have sacrificed my personal time and energy. So I Thank want to... Thank you, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. <laughs> now, folks... Just a minute. I haven't finished. I didn't say anything about how good the opera is. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Gildersleeve. Everything is timed to a split second. Oh. <laughs> now, I'll move our portable microphone around a little, friends, and bring you some of the other celebrities. At the time, Tannhauser was... Hi, Commissioner. Nice little speech you gave there. Thanks, Floyd. Had some more I wanted to say if you hadn't been in such a hurry. Oh, well... Hi, Commissioner. What's the matter? You can't say hello now that you're a big radio star? <laughs> well, uh... Oh, Mrs. Munson. Hello. Say, is that darn announcer introducing somebody else? Huh? Who is it over there? Well, I think it's, uh... Yeah, it is. Chief Gates. Chief Gates? Uh -huh. Who wants to hear a speech from him? Now, if he'd let me develop my thought a little oh, bit. Oh, let's go over and listen to the chief. Maybe we can make him laugh in the middle. <laughs> now, lovey, is that a nice thought? <laughs> well, come on, let's go listen to him anyway. And so I take great pleasure in presenting Summerfield's popular chief of police, Don Gates. Uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, there was more crime in Summerfield during 1945 <laughs> than in any previous year of our history. The music chief say something about the music. Arrests for every type of offense increased during the past year. Of particular importance was the rise in juvenile delinquency. The guy makes a speech for it. It's about juvenile delinquency. And in yeah. my opinion, juvenile delinquency can only be curbed by occasions such as this one. Giving our young people wholesome amusement that will keep them off the streets. I thank you. Thank you, Chief Gates. The story of the opera Tannhauser is a tragic one. Dealing with a love of medieval... Well, good evening, folks. Mrs. Munson, nice to see you again. Hi, big boy. Hi, Floyd. Hi, Commissioner. Nice little speech, Chief. You talk into that thing like you was Gabriel Heater himself. <laughs> For heaven's sakes, Chief, why didn't you say something about how much Summerfield has needed the opera? What a great thing this is for the music lovers in this town. Well, I gave my angle of it, Commissioner. Now you made it sound like a punishment for criminals. <laughs> well, you like it, Floyd. You like it. Well, I'll give it a listen. Come on, shouldn't we be finding our seats? Yes, why, George, we should. Now, just follow me, folks. Okay. Hey, here we are. Where are we follow me, here. folks. Mm -hmm. Dark, isn't it? Our box is the next one. We have a private entrance. Oh, so here we are. Oh. See, there's Peavy. Been sitting right here all the time. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Peavy. Hiya, Peavy, old boy. Uh, uh, don't get up, Peavy. I think if Mrs. Munson and Floyd will sit here and Peavy over there. Uh, Mr. Jones, babe, I, I'd rather not sit so close to the edge, if you don't mind. <laughs> oh, Peavy, nobody ever fell out of a box. Well, maybe not, but I've always had a nervous feeling about high places. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, look at all the people way down there. Shh, catch me, lovey. I think I'm going to jump. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Floyd's a clown, isn't he? <laughs> uh, yeah, very funny. For heaven's sake, Floyd, people are staring at us. Let them. I bought my ticket. Yeah. <laughs> it's a funny thing being nervous about high places. 
Psychology, I suppose. Yes, yes. Hey, look, look. I could drop my program and bean the president of Hogan Brothers. <laughs> Little psychological quirks. For example, I never can eat eggplant after tomato soup. Yes, yes. Where the dickens is Judge Hooker? The show ought to be starting any minute. Some people don't like to be locked up in a small room, I understand. I tried it once and I enjoyed it. <laughs> I guess it takes all kinds. Yes, yes. Quiet, everybody. Now, here comes the orchestra. Twenty pieces. Uh, I tell you, this is going to be a real show. Hey, wait a minute. That little guy with the piccolo. Don't he help so baggage down at the depot? Jimmy Pittenger. Sure, that's him. Hey, what kind of orchestra are you palming off on us here, Mr. Gildersleeve? For five bucks a throw, I don't want to hear no freight handler. <laughs> well, Floyd, let's give him a chance. Okay. If he's good, okay. If he's lousy, I hope he drops a trunk on his toe tomorrow. Hey, who's the guy just came in down there with a bald head? Yeah, that's the conductor. Now they'll start. Yeah, he's tapping. See, shh. Yeah, that's it. That's the overture to Tannhauser. Beautiful. Beautiful. Pardon me, folks. Is this box seven? Oh, for heaven's sake. This is it, Judge. Come on in. Oh, that's you, Floyd? Yep, that's me. Well, where shall I... Quiet, you. Sit down before I choke you. All right, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, WSUM, the voice of Summerfield, regrets that time does not permit us to bring you the opera Tannhauser in its entirety. We urge you, however, to stay tuned to this station. My, it certainly feels good to sit down and relax for a while. Don't tell me Christmas shopping has got you down. <laughs> yes, it has. I've never seen such crowds in the stores, Mr. Lang. I'm glad my shopping's just about done. All I have to do now is pick up a few things on my holiday food list. Well, don't forget your grocer also is a very busy man these days. And with quality foods in such big demand for special occasions, I think it might be wise to get in a reminder right now about homemakers shopping early for parquet margarine. There's always a big demand, you know, for this popular spread made by the Kraft Foods Company. It's a favorite of millions. I'm glad you reminded me of that, Mr. Lang. We're going to be serving all kinds of hot bags over the holidays. And I know I can always count on parquet margarine to make them taste extra good. You certainly can. Parquet margarine makes all kinds of bread taste extra good because it's still unmatched for flavor. That's why millions of American families prefer this delicious economical spread to any other brand. So be sure to get parquet from your food dealer tomorrow. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. One of the quality foods made by the Kraft Foods Company. Back in the Summerfield Opera House, the last aria has died away. The last tribute has been delivered. The last bows have been taken. The asbestos curtain has fallen and the musicians have scrambled out of the pit. Ushers prowl now through the rows of empty seats, picking up lost gloves, discarded programs, and gum wrappers. On the sidewalk out in front, Summerfield's opera lovers are still milling about in their post-war finery, looking for their cars. Yeah, I asked you first. <laughs> <laughs> I get you, me too. Goodness, Ralph Morton. I hope not everyone felt that way about it. Uh, don't worry, Eve. Stick close to me now. Taxi! Hey, taxi! Uh, got away. I'll shut off his water. <laughs> Wish I'd brought my own car. Now. <laughs> parking would be so Hey, Commissioner! Oh, there's that Mr. What's his name? He's calling you. Where? Sounded like Floyd Munson. Uh, in that car that just pulled up. Hey, come in! Oh, yeah, Floyd. Hello. Hey, nudge the ball and chain there, will you? If you don't see me. Where? Standing right behind you there with a mouth open. <laughs> hey, Dreamy. Oh, yeah. Uh... Oh! Hi. 
Jane. <laughs> now, Mrs. Munson. Oh, with you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, I thought it was somebody getting familiar. Oh, no. <laughs> on the contrary, Mrs. Munson, there's your husband waiting for you. Come on, come on. Well, it's a wonder you wouldn't blow your horn. I practically blew the insides out of it. You wasn't standing there gaping all around you. Hey, Commissioner, you got a ride? Can I drop you somewhere? What do you think, Eve? Well, your room. Glad to take your friend there, too. It's a ride, Eve. Would you mind? The taxi situation don't look too good. Well, I think it's very nice of them to offer. How about it? Uh, thanks, Floyd. We won't be taking you out of your way. Ah, climb in. Uh, go ahead, Eve. Uh, Mrs. Munson, you met Miss Goodwin. How do you do? Likewise. <laughs> Pile in there, Mr. Gildersleeve. You think there's room for me in the back here? Oh, plenty. I'll just... Oh. <laughs> yeah, a little tight, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> All set? All set, Floyd. Where to? Home, Jay. There's other people in the car besides you, lovey. Oh. Oh, where are you headed for, Miss Goodwin? Yeah, I'm seeing her home. Uh, she lives over on Laurel Avenue, Floyd. Yeah, I know the place. We drove by there one time. Ah, oh, keep your shirt on. You think you're on the street? <laughs> Suppose we get going. Oh, wait. Watch it. You asked for it. There's other people in the car besides me, lovey. So just watch it, that's all. A little less help from the back seat, or a certain party's going to get out and walk. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How did everybody like the opera? Oh, yes, I'm very oh, anxious to know. Oh, opera's okay for them to like it, I guess. But give me a good musical show any time. Yeah, or a good bill of vaudeville. Yeah. Remember when we used to go to the Orpheum every Saturday night, Floydie? Ah, uh, those were the days. That was entertainment. Well, I don't care what anybody says. I enjoyed the opera. Did you, Throckmorton? Ah, oh, come on now, Commissioner. I caught you dozing off there a couple of times. <laughs> I closed my eyes, Floyd, in order to enjoy the music more. Yeah. Well, I don't blame you. Personally, I would have enjoyed it more if I'd slept through the whole thing. <laughs> Floyd, just stick to your driving. Who asked for any advice from you? You heard the man say he enjoyed the opera, didn't you? All right, leave him enjoy it. You got a cousin, you know, that likes rutabagas. <laughs> Listen, you want to get out and walk? <laughs> Let's not discuss the opera anymore, folks, shall we? Do come inside for a minute, Rock Morton. Well, just to say good night. <laughs> At least it's warm in here. Feels good. Whew. Let's sit down. Tired. A little. Aren't you going to take off your coat? In a minute, I'd just like to sit first. Guess I'll do the same. All these weeks of preparation, and now suddenly it's over. Well, I think it was a great success. Don't you? I suppose they'll say so. What do you mean? Oh, Mrs. Bullard's gown was much admired, and Mrs. Pettibone's, and all the best photographers attended. Well, I thought yours was prettier than either of them. I just wonder if anyone heard the opera. Some of the remarks I overheard were so discouraging. Who made remarks? Just tell me who made any remarks, Oh, and it wouldn't do any good to threaten them, Throckmorton. That's not the point. It's just that it didn't speak very well for the level of musical appreciation in Summerfield. Well, there's always bound to be a few gripers. I was very proud of you, by the way. Yeah? When? <laughs> <laughs> On the way home when you defended the opera, when you said that you'd really enjoyed it. Oh, I did. I think it was the finest performance of opera I've ever heard. Well, I don't know that I'd quite agree with you about that. Actually, the performance, I thought, was a little better than mediocre. Oh, there are <laughs> things about it that I'd criticize if you want to split hairs. Exactly. After all, it isn't the performance, it's the opera. When you compare it to what we usually have here in Summerfield... Just what I was going to say. It took the very words right out of my mouth. It isn't the performance. It's the opera. By George, that's so true. <laughs> you know, Throckmorton, perhaps I shouldn't say this, but I'd almost given you up for lost there for a while. And now I think again, perhaps there's hope. What do you mean, lost? Well, 
I had a feeling that you were simply running with the crowd, that you cared more for the plaudits of the multitude than you did... Eve, my whole life has been an attempt to get away from that. You know, you're, you're very puzzling at times, Rockmorton. You're really quite an enigma. Oh, you think so? <laughs> I mean, sometimes I think I see a spark in you. And then for long periods, it disappears. I just get too busy. And then suddenly the spark is there again. I can see it. And I have the feeling that if it were just fanned a little... Fanity. <laughs> Don't misunderstand. <laughs> I'm referring at the moment to your feeling for music. It's one of the nicest things about you. You know, Eve, when I was listening to the opera there tonight, I suddenly realized. You know, 20 years ago, it was a toss-up whether I'd take up music professionally or go into business. My talent for business won out. But I still wonder sometimes if it wasn't a mistake. Perhaps it's not too late. You mean, you think I could... Oh, not professionally, perhaps, but you still have a lovely voice. Well... Music has always been one of my great loves. Uh, me, me, me. Uh, how does that area go? Oh, evening star. Da, da, oh, if you study, Doc Martin, if you really work. I will. I really will, Eve. I'll work and I'll study every spare minute I get. Oh, do. I'll let nothing stand in my way. I'll work till I've made up for all the years I've wasted. And then one day, I'll cast aside the waterworks and surprise everybody. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes. Oh, evening star, how bright you are. Da, 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 dee, da, da. I'd only met you 20 years ago. Good night, Eve. Good night, Throckmorton. Eve. Yes? No, no, I won't. <laughs> Won't what? I won't ask to kiss you. Not till I've made good. Good night. Good night, Doc Morton. And remember, work and study. Day and night. <laughs> understands me. Eve has faith in me. Well, I'll show her, too. Work and study. Work and study. Yes, by George, the first thing tomorrow. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
what you for? It's a quarter of nine. It is, huh? Well, close the window, so it's a quarter of nine? Yeah, Bertie said to tell you. Quarter of nine, eh? Well, well, what was I going to do today? It was something I was going to do. I don't know what you're going to do, but i got to get going. Uh, wait a minute, my boy. Where are you going in such a hurry? To school. Where do you think? Oh, school. I told you it's a quarter of nine. It's all right for you maybe to lie in bed till noon, but I'm only a kid, so I have to work and study all day. Work and study. I remember now. Eve. Well, so long. Uh, Leroy, wait a minute. Come back here. Now, what is it? Uh, Leroy. Don't neglect your music, my boy. Who's neglecting it? Practice your piano every day. I always do. Work and study. Those should be your watchwords, my boy. Devote every moment you can to it, because there's no greater satisfaction in life to a man than music. Yes, sir. Well, I got... I want you to study and work hard, my boy, so that so that Miss Goodwin will be proud of you. Yeah, well, In I... fact, beginning the first of the year, I think I'd like you to take two music lessons a week instead of one. What? Two lessons? You'll thank me for it, Leroy. When you're an older man, you'll thank me for it. One of the greatest regrets of my life was the fact that I didn't keep on with my musical studies when I was a young man. I'd even take them up again now, if I had the time for it. <clears throat> Close the door when you go out, my boy. I think I'll catch you a few more weeks before I get up. <laughs> up a little late last night. What a character. <laughs> <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be back again in just a moment. One of the pleasant things we all look forward to in our house during holiday time is the tempting aroma of hot breads baking in the kitchen. No doubt you'll be having a variety of baking treats in your home, too, during the coming weeks. And it goes without saying that you'll want a delicious spread to serve with them. So I'd like to suggest for your family's enjoyment a spread that's a favorite of millions, parquet margarine made by Kraft. Parquet margarine is still unmatched for fresh, dairy-like flavor. That's why it tastes so good on fresh-baked muffins, sugared buns, and crusty rolls. And parquet is easy on your food budget, too. It's only about half the price of costly spreads. So tomorrow, be sure to buy delicious, economical parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by Kraft. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one thought before we say goodnight. In the hustle and bustle of Christmas shopping, it's very easy to forget to buy the little Christmas seals that are helping our country to control mankind's most dangerous disease, tuberculosis. The tragic thing about tuberculosis is that its spread is preventable. We know how to control it, but it costs money. Most of us have known someone who's been a victim of tuberculosis. I do myself. So I make this plea very sincerely. Don't forget to buy some Christmas seals tomorrow. Good night. It was played by Harry Perry. It was written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekin. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. We'll soon be into the holiday season, and that's time for bright, tempting dishes. So add a lively touch of flavor to your foods with tangy, golden Kraft salad mustard. You can serve Kraft salad mustard in all sorts of delightful ways. This delicious salad mustard adds extra flavor zest to cooked egg and cheese dishes, adds lip-smacking flavor to gravies, relishes, and sandwich spreads. And for the special zippy flavor some folks prefer, there's a sharper Kraft mustard, too, with horseradish added. So be sure to head up your holiday shopping list with Kraft quality mustards. <laughs> This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Kraft Foods Company presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's 
The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Well, it's almost here. Only one more day. And there isn't a kid in the whole country who looks forward to it with more eagerness than Gildersleeve. Here comes the great man now, plodding up the front walk to his home. He's a little weary, a little out of breath. But his eyes, ah, how they twinkle. His dimples, how merry. And what a load of parcels he's got, right up to his chin. He can't even get hold of the doorknob. Bertie! Bertie, quick, help me here, Bertie. Mr. Gillsleeve, all them packages. Yeah, and grab some of them, will you, Bertie? Grab the top ones. I got them. Let go with your chin. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where can we hide these, Bertie, where the kids won't find them? Gosh, I don't believe there's a spot in the whole house that Leroy ain't into and out of all day long. Well, how about the cedar chest up in the sewing room? Him and Piggy were playing lifeboat in that yesterday. Lifeboat? Yeah, they want me to fly over them and drop them rations. But I told him... <laughs> I just told him I was too busy to do any flying. I got other things to do. Plenty, besides flying. Oh, yeah. Well, now, uh, let me see. Um, oh, I know, in the wood closet. Oh, that's no good, Bertie. Leroy's supposed to check that every day and make sure it's filled. That's one of his regular duties. Mr. Gilsey, I could put a seven-layer cake in that closet, and it would be safe for a year with chocolate frosting. <laughs> any wood gets in there, I put it in there. Yeah, well, you know him better than I do, Bertie. Let's hide him in the wood closet, then. Oh, quick, Mr. Gilsey. I think I hear Leroy coming in the back way. Oh, here, you hide him, Bertie. I'll go and hit him off. Yes. Well, well, my boy. Home from school already? I didn't go to school today. We didn't have any school. You know that. Oh, that's so. I'd forgotten. <laughs> well, how does it feel not to have any school then, huh? Pretty fine? Um, we went through all this at breakfast. What's up? What do you mean, what's up? What are you acting so funny about? Who's acting funny? I'm merely trying to have a little conversation with you, that's all. Gosh, most of the time you won't even listen to me. <laughs> well, let me just go... Uh, 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 uh. I wouldn't go in there just now if I were you, Leroy. Why not? It's Christmas, my boy. Doesn't pay to ask too many questions. Is it something for me? Doesn't pay to ask too many questions. <laughs> Gosh, I know what I hope it is. That's good. There's just one thing I want for Christmas, that's all. Just one thing. I believe I've heard you mention that before. I wouldn't care if I didn't get another single thing if I just got that. Just that one thing. If I just got that, that would make Christmas perfect. I say it's one thing. There are several parts to it, actually. There's the bass drum and the snare drum and the cowbells and the wood block and the cymbal. Yes, yes. <laughs> all right, Mr. Gilbert, all clear. Uh, we can go in the front of the house now, anyway. Now, don't run. What was Bertie doing, hiding it? She uh, asked me to step out while she was cleaning up in there. Uh-huh. All right, first to come in now, Bertie? Oh, yes, sir. I put them logs away like you told me, Mr. Gilsley. <laughs> uh, Leroy, don't you go near that wood closet or you won't get a single thing that's in there, you hear? Oh, I wasn't thinking of going near it. <laughs> Why would I want to go near the wood closet? Well, not to put any wood in it, I'll bet. Well, don't, that's all. I was telling Uncle Mort, Bertie, there's only one thing I want for Christmas this year. Leroy, it strikes me that all you ever think about is getting you should give more thought to giving. That's the spirit of Christmas, my boy. Oh, don't worry. I got that all taken care of. I know just what I'm going to give everybody. Except Marge. Well, you better get busy on her present, too, then. Practically Christmas Eve. What are you waiting for? I'm waiting till I find out how much she spends on my present. Confound it, <laughs> found at Leroy. That's no way to do. Christmas is not a time for horse trading. It's a time for generosity and uh, being nice. Uh, Marjorie? Where have you been? At the Bullard. Not that it's any of your business. Who said you could stay to lunch? Nobody. Do I have to ask your permission? Oh, stop it, both of you. Why can't you children be nice to each other on Christmas Eve, at least? Well, I'm being nice. He's the one who's so... Ah. Quiet. <laughs> oh, Anki, I meant to ask you, is it all right if I go out for a while this evening with Marshall? Go out? My dear, this is Christmas Eve. Well, I know, but all the games... Christmas are... Eve, we always spend at home. You know that. Well, that's just the point. What do you mean? Well, she says Christmas Eve is corny. I didn't say it was corny. I said it was dull. My dear, what kind of talk is this? 
Well, it's true. Everybody has to stay at home. What? I said everybody has to stay at home, and everybody has to do the same old thing year after year and pretend to enjoy it. Marjorie, where do you get these ideas? From Marshall. Oh, go away. Uncle Mort, you know as well as I do, Christmas is nothing but a commercialized racket. Indeed. Just a way of making money. Is that so? So why go on being mushy and old-fashioned and sentimental about it? You can't expect us to go on believing all that nonsense forever. After all, we're not children. I am. <laughs> you both are, if you only knew it. And that Marshall, if I get my hands on him. I believe if you want something badly enough and you ask Santa Claus for it, and you keep wishing you had it, and you try to be a good boy, even if you're not too good. <laughs> if you just try like I have all year, why, well, you can't tell. You might get it. Yes, yes. <laughs> because if you didn't, that would be disappointing a little boy and Santa Claus at night. Oh, have... come off of it, Leroy. <laughs> Now, Marjorie, about this evening. Oh, well, all we're doing, Uncle Mort, a bunch of us are going over to Francie's and play her new phonograph and dance and things. Marshall's bringing his collection of hot records. Hot records? On Christmas Eve? Yeah, and that's not all. Tell them what you call it, Marge. They call it the anti Santa Club. <laughs> Why don't you keep out of this? Well, all I can say, I don't know what's happened to Christmas. But I think the whole thing is the most disgusting idea I ever heard of. Uncle Mort, you don't want Marshall to think I'm a baby who isn't even allowed to go out after dark. It strikes me, young lady, that you care more about what Marshall thinks than what I think. All right, go on, ruin Christmas. You've already ruined it anyway, you two. <laughs> Decorate it yourself. Do I still have to do it all alone? Well, don't if you don't want to. I don't care if we even have a tree. Boy, here's that little angel with the parachute. Remember him? Where do you think he'd look best, Unc? Up top? I don't care where you put him. Gosh. Can I have a candy cane? Before dinner? Just one, Unc? Have two. Maybe they'll make you sick. <laughs> That kid comes near me, I'll... Hey, Leroy, it's the boyfriend! Leroy! <laughs> it's Marshall, Unc. Good evening, sir. Hello? I wanted Marge to hear a record I found today. Are you interested in good records, Mr. Gildersleeve? In good ones, yes. Well, this is a real find. An oldie, of course, but a real collector's item. Harry James' record of the mole. The what? <laughs> the mole! I thought that's what you said. You like to hear it? Uh, not particularly. I understand, young man, that you've plans for this evening, you and Marjorie. Now, I may be old-fashioned, Marshal, but I was brought up to believe that oh, Christmas... Oh, hello, Marshal. Uh, let's go into the study, shall we, so we won't disturb Uncle Moore? No, just a minute. Doorbell. I've got it. Oh, hi, Craig. What do you want? My brother here? Hey, Marshal, come on home. Why? To hang up your... Because Pop says to, that's why. What for? To hang up your stockings. <clears throat> Excuse me, Marge. Listen, Squirt, what's the idea coming over here Pop like says he doesn't care what you told Mom. He says you come home and hang up your stocking or I'll break your neck. Okay, okay. And he says you needn't think you're going out of the house tonight either. Craig, have a candy cane. <laughs> fine boy, fine boy. Well, if you'll excuse me, about tonight, Marge, I, I don't know. It doesn't look too good. That's perfectly all right, Marshall. Marjorie understands perfectly, don't you, my dear? Yes, indeed. You just run along. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Marjorie, I, I don't want you to be too disappointed. Well, to tell you the truth, Unky, I'm kind of glad. Well, it looks as if we might have a white Christmas after all. The Great Gildersleeve will be back in just a moment. Some friends dropped in the other night to help us trim our Christmas tree. 
And after we had the tree all decked out, Mrs. Lang served a buffet lunch. And while one of our guests was fixing a sandwich, she said to me... I suppose, John, that this spread is the parquet margarine we've heard you raving about on the Gildersleeve show. That's it, the one and only parquet margarine. Well, here's that chance I've been waiting for. You've been saying that parquet margarine is still unmatched for flavor. Yes, I have. And the best way to prove it is to taste that sandwich you just spread with parquet. All right. One, two, three, tasting. Now, there's real flavor for you. Fresh, sweet, and delicate. Am I right? Yes, you are. It's really delicious. Thank you. And friends, I'm sure you'll have the same gratifying taste experience... The very first time you spread parquet margarine on bread, hot toast, and rolls. I'm sure you'll agree with the millions who prefer parquet margarine, that it's still unmatched for flavor. Try it soon and let your own taste decide. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine, made by the Kraft Foods Company. Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. It's getting on toward four o'clock in the afternoon, and here and there in Summerfield, lights have been turned on. Here a Christmas tree, there a neon sign. The Gildersleeve house is not yet lit up, though Gildersleeve is there wrapping parcels and putting artistic bows on them. At the moment, he is alone in the parlor. Darn fancy paper. They never make it big enough. Must think people give each other thimbles for Christmas. Hi, Alf, what you doing? Don't sneak up on me like that, Leroy. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. You didn't scare me, you merely surprised me. You were hoping you'd see something, weren't you? No, I just happened to come downstairs quietly. I've been wrapping up Marge's presents. Oh, finally got one, did you? Yeah. Swell, so it cost a buck and a half. Well, what is it? Perfume. The bottle is shaped like a little house. I hope it smells good. <laughs> you mean you didn't smell it before you bought it? Nah, but for a buck and a half, how could it be lousy? <laughs> well, I hope you're right, my boy. Well, if your presents are ready, maybe you could help me wrap up some of these things. Okay, sure, Unc. Here, see if you can do a nice job on this box of cigars. Who's it for, the old ghost? Yeah, no. <laughs> Leroy, these cigars are for my very good friend, Judge Horace Hooker. Okay. Oh, huh? you, that is my boy. Maybe it's a present. Marge, Lee, look at all the packages. Oh, I took around some presents and everywhere I went, they gave me something. Well, that's Christmas, my dear. Gosh, is all that stuff for you, Marge? Oh, not all of it. Some of it's for the whole family. Uh, I know those family presents. Doilies. <laughs> I'll be pessimistic. Put the things under the tree, my dear, and then you can help me and Leroy wrap up this other stuff. Okay. I hope what Fancy gave me is what I think. What do you think? What I gave her. I was going to get one for myself, too, but then I figured, maybe. Uh, Christmas is a bad time to buy things for yourself, my dear. Here's the judge's cigars, Unc. Neat, hey? A little shaggy, but I'll pass it. <laughs> Where's that card I made out for it? Oh, here. Just shove this under the string. Okay. Why doesn't Leroy take it over to him? Well, maybe he can later. The judge doesn't stop by. He generally looks in on Christmas Eve. You know what we ought to do. Francie's mother does it every year. We ought to get an extra package ready in case somebody drops in with a present we don't expect. Well, good idea. Very clever. I don't get it. Well, you remember how embarrassing it was when Mrs. Pettibone came by last year? Embarrassing? All she brought was a glass of jelly. That's not the spirit, Leroy. Mrs. Pettibone was thoughtful enough to bring us a Christmas remembrance. It was beautifully wrapped, too. So you couldn't tell it was jelly. What did you say, Leroy? Nothing. Well, just be careful. Remember that Santa Claus can hear you even if I can't. Okay. Do you think he's heard me say anything about a set of drums? He certainly has. <laughs> I venture to say he's sick of hearing about them. Okay. Auntie, I know just the thing for the extra present. Those bookends that Hattie sent you last year. The two cupids leaning against each other? Mm, I don't know, my dear. Well, you never cared for them particularly, but someone else might be crazy about them. Can't imagine who, but go ahead and wrap them up. They'll do for a real emergency. I'll go upstairs and get them. Doorbell, I'll get them. I'll get them. Well, 
Oh, Merry Christmas, children. Merry Christmas, John. Is your uncle home? Oh, here he is. Compliments of the season, Throckmorton. Well, same to you, Horace. Same to you. Take off your coat and mittens and make yourself at home. No, I can't. Thank you just the same. I just stopped by to leave some little Christmas remembrance. Oh, you shouldn't have done it, Horace. Leroy, where's that package we had for Judge Hooker? It's coming up. Here. Take this with you, Horace, and all of our best wishes for a very Merry Christmas. Stop, Martin. You shouldn't have done it. Nonsense, old man. <laughs> Christmas comes but once a year. So it does. And in spite of all the inconvenience and the crowded stores and the whatnot, it's a grand old day. Yeah, nothing like it. It's a day when a man really feels close to his friends and his family. Exactly. Well, I've got to be running along. I hope you children won't be disappointed when you open your stockings tomorrow. I'm sure everything will be lovely, Judge. I hope it's as lovely as you're looking right this minute, my dear. Why, thank you, kind sir. She's growing up to be a pretty child, Doc Morton. Don't tell her, Judge. You'll give her ideas. <laughs> Oh, okay. Got your package, Judge? Yes, thank you. Well, goodbye, all. So long, Judge. Thanks a lot. Oh, yes, thank you, Judge. Don't mention it. Merry Christmas, Horace. Merry Christmas to all, and to all, a good night. Ah, uh, good old Horace. Original, too, yeah. <laughs> a little difficult at times, a little set in his ways, maybe, but true blue, just the same. He's sweet. You said it. Can we look at the stuff he brought, on? I think we'd better wait till tomorrow. Oh, just one little peek. Well, just one, then. And no shaking, mind you. Okay. Best wishes for a happy Christmas to Marjorie from her friend Judge Hooker. My, it's big. Merry Christmas to Leroy and be careful with this. Say, might be a knife. Yes, yes. Well, what does mine say? Yours? He only left two. What? That's right, Uncle Morris. Why, that two-faced old goat. And I gave him 25 cigars, three for 29. No, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Don't tell me I know it, but by George, I'll show him next year. <laughs> The place is beginning to look Christmassy. Tree never really looks like anything that looks dark outside. Let's turn on all the lights, then it'll look super. No, not now. I'm reading. Christmas cards look nice up on the mantel there. I think we got more cards than usual this year. That's because the war's over. Well, maybe. Say, I think it would be nice to spend a few minutes looking at our cards, make a little good wish for each of the people who sent them. What do you say, children? It'd be more fun to open a present. Yeah, Leroy. <laughs> After all, a Christmas card is a real thought. A lot of trouble, too. Well, sure, only... Never mind. Marjorie, what about you? I'm reading. What a family. Well, I think it's a good idea, and I'm going through with it. Let's see. Here's a pretty card. Three wise men walking through the snow to Bethlehem. There wasn't any snow in Bethlehem. There was, too. You can see it right here in the picture. <laughs> Noel, Noel. That's all it says. Very nice. Yeah, who sent this? Oh, Summerfield Hardware Company. <laughs> Hoping to fill your tool needs in 1946. <laughs> By George, that's enough to turn a man's doorbell. I got it. Leroy seems awfully willing today. Hello, Mr. Peavy. Merry Christmas. Oh, Peavy, I completely forgot him. I haven't got a present for him. Ed had his book in. Gee. Here with Steve, I want to take this opportunity <laughs> to wish a very Merry Christmas to you and to your family. Why, thank you, Mr. Peavy. Yes, thanks, Peavy, and the same to you and to Mrs. Peavy. Tell her, Peavy, that I... Peavy! What's the matter? Is that lipstick on your cheek or do my eyes deceive me? Lipstick? Yes. On my cheek? Yes. Well, I'm darn mistletoe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame the mistletoe, Peavy. Mistletoe isn't what leads a man astray. I didn't go astray. I just went to deliver a Christmas present to Mr. 
Uh, to take a present to this certain party. Who is it, Phoebe? I might go take a, this party a little certain present myself. <laughs> Come on now. Who was it? Mr. Gildersleeve, the gentleman never betrays a lady. <laughs> Just the same, I better get this stuff off my face before I go home. Mrs. Peavy doesn't take much stock in mistletoe. Well, here, don't use your handkerchief, Peavy. Leroy, take Mr. Peavy up to the bathroom. Okay. Oh, I can't believe that's necessary. It's the only way. Isn't it, Marjorie? It's the best way, Mr. Peavy. I mean, the way of the transgressor is hard. Well, show me where it is, Leroy. Okay. Gosh, all this fuss about a little lipstick. Poor Mr. Peavy. Marjorie, he's left a five-pound box of chocolates here. Look, oh. Mr. Gildersleeve and family from the Peavy's. What shall I do? But the bookends. Oh, isn't it lucky we thought of it? I suppose so. No, by George, it's not. I wouldn't give those bookends to a nice fellow like Peavy. I don't know who I would give them to now that I come to think of it. Well, what can you do? We haven't got another thing. Um, yes, we have. I have, that is. I bought myself a little present today little silver lighter I couldn't resist. Why, Uncle Moore. All right, I know I shouldn't have done it. Well, I'll give it to Peavy. We'd better hurry and wrap it. It's all wrapped. Right here under the tree. Thought I'd surprise myself Christmas morning. <laughs> <laughs> what about a card? Oh, yes, a card. Here. Uh, Merry Christmas to good old Peavy from Rockmorton P. Gildersleeve uh, and family. <laughs> What's so funny? Reading the card you had on it before. Give me that card. To Frock Martin from his loving brother. <laughs> well, my brother Wendell would probably give me a lighter if he thought of it, if he had any money. Oh, uh, there you are, Peavy, as good as new. No, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Rubbed half my face away getting the darn stuff off. Yeah, he really worked on it. I'm much obliged for the use of your facilities, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, I think nothing of it, Peavy. Come on, sit down and relax for a while. No, I really can't. Mrs. Peavy and I like our tree at six o'clock sharp, and I, I gotta be there. Oh, well, in that case, of course. No, I just came over to bring a couple of small gifts to you and Mrs. Ransom. And your, uh, oh, uh, Mrs. Ransom. That's where you ran into the mistletoe. Mr. Gildersleeve, I'm a cad. <laughs> Don't you worry about it, Peavy. If I know her, she was more to blame than you. No, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I gave her as good as I got. Well. Okay. I'd really better be going, Mr. Gildersleeve, but I'll just leave this little thought for you and my dream, Leroy, if I may. Little thought? It's a five-pound box of chocolates. My best grade. You shouldn't have done it, Peavy. But here, take this along, and I hope you and Mrs. Peavy have a merry, merry Christmas. Well, thank you. Good night, Marjorie. Good night, Leroy. Good night, Mr. Peavy. Good night, Mr. Gildersleeve. Good night, Peavy. Go straight home now. Unky, have you got a present for Mrs. Ransom? Yes, I have, my dear. Why do you ask? Because I see her coming up the front wall. I'll go. You will kindly stay right where you are, my boy. You too, my dear. Don't worry. I will handle this. Leela, Merry Christmas. Shame to you, Throckmorton. <laughs> my, my. Hey, what are all those packages? Oh, uh, take some of them, will you please? Yeah, just put them down here for a second. There. Throckmorton, what on earth? Heavy, heavy hangs over your head, Leela. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, I got a cold. What do I care? Mm. <laughs> 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 Merry Christmas. Oh, my goodness. You absolutely took my breath away. Did I? Well, Happy New Year. <laughs> Come on in, Leela. Take off your coat and stay a while. Well, just for a minute. Can you bring my packages like a sweet line? Oh, sure thing. Say, a lot of them, too. Well, I want to explain about that. Uh, oh, good evening, Marjorie. Hello, Leroy. Hi, Mrs. Ransom. What do you know? Good evening, Mrs. Ransom. Well, I, I do hope you children are going to like the presents I brought you, but I never know. Don't worry. Whatever it is, I'll be crazy about it. Well, this package is for you, Leroy. Gee, thanks a million. And this is for Marjorie. The Bonton Special 
jewelry shop, my dream. Mm -hmm. and, and this is for Bertie. Oh, put it with Bertie's things under the tree, my boy. Got it. And this is for you, Throck Martin. Lily, you shouldn't have done it. <laughs> oh, that's silly. What's this other package, Mrs. Ransom? Oh, that's the strangest thing. Judge Hooker came by with a gift for me, the old darling. The old goat. Oh, but, but wait, Throckmorton. He accidentally left a package for you at the same time. What? Look, to Throckmorton, best wishes for a Merry Christmas from the old goat. Well, I'll be darned. Good old hooker. He was true blue after all. What's in the package, John? Looks like a box of cigars. Fifty Corona Coronas. Gee. Well, I'll make it up to him next year. <laughs> Oh, the tree looks simply lovely, Marjorie. Did you decorate it? No, Leroy did it all. Well, Leroy, you should be real proud. I don't think I ever saw a prettier tree. Thanks a lot. Well, our side of the family always had a flair for that sort of thing. Good taste was just born in Leroy. <laughs> oh, Auntie, now that Mrs. Ramson's here, why don't we sing a few Christmas carols? Oh, an excellent suggestion. Will you play for us, Leroy? I'd love to. I don't think Christmas is Christmas without singing a few carols. Well, come on, then. Come on, Leroy. You can sing alto if you're careful. Don't worry about me. You're the one that gets off. Yeah. <laughs> now, my boy. Uh, excuse me, Miss Gill, please. Is it all right if I go now? Well, good evening, Bertie. Merry Christmas. Good evening, Miss Ransom. I didn't see you over there. I thought you'd left long ago, Bertie. Sure you can go. All right, then. I guess I will. Bertie's going to sing a solo tonight in church. Now, Leroy. Is that a fact, Bertie? A solo? Well, won't be nobody singing but me. <laughs> Not on this one particular carol. It's just a little Christmas carol, that's all. Well, why don't you sing it here, Bertie, before you leave? Oh, no, I don't want to do that. Oh, come on, Bertie. Yes, Bertie, do you good. Sing it now, and you'll do it better in church. Mm, I'd be too scared, Mr. Gilsey. Uh, there's nothing to be scared of, Bertie. Is that your music you got there? Yes, it's just a little book of carols. Come on. Lily, you can play this, can't you? Well, I don't believe I know it, but I guess I can play it. All right, Bertie, sing it. The lay little tiny child by thy lovely lolly. So did I. You'll do fine in church, Bertie. Now, before you go, let's sing something we can all sing, huh? The joy to the world. Oh, yeah. Come on, everybody in on this. Let her go, Leela. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let us receive our King. Let every heart prepare him rose and heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. Yes, sir, Christmas. The night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring except the great Gildersleeve. Gildersleeve is still downstairs, fussing with something or other next to the Christmas tree. <laughs> yeah, guess I'll go to bed. Oh, <laughs> gee. Well, I may live to regret this. But what do I care? <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> Kraft Foods Company and the entire cast of the Great Gildersleeve join in wishing every one of you the merriest Christmas and the happiest holiday season you've ever had. Good night. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. It's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Christmas week, Christmas to New Year's. These are the times that try men's souls. All the things you rushed out and bought the day before Christmas come back to plague you the day after. I don't know how it's been at your house. You probably weren't foolish enough to buy the little darling a set of drums. But at our house, all week long, it's been nothing but... (laughs) Now, Leroy. Now, my boy. Leroy. Leroy. I'm trying to do some figuring here. Could you possibly pursue your musical studies at some other time, my boy? Well, gosh, what's the use of having drums? Why did you give them to me? If you don't were... ask me why I gave them to you. I don't know. I must have been out of my head. I'm sorry, Leroy, if I seem a little impatient. But this is very difficult work I'm doing here. I'm trying to add up my accounts. So if you could find something else to do... Will you play me a game of electric football? There's your sister. Why don't you play something with her? Play with her? If I ask you something, will you say yes, please? Will you please say yes? Well, now, wait a minute. I was nice about Christmas. I stayed home when you told me to. But this is different. New Year's Eve isn't like Christmas to you, so please say I can do it. Please say yes. My dear, if you'd calm down and explain what it is you want me to say yes to. Oh, oh well, it's really a very nice place. Everybody says it's very nice. It's not run by gangsters or anything. And it'd be a chance to wear my new lap and jacket and my silver slippers. They'd be just perfect. So can I, please? Leroy, do you know what your sister's talking about? Does anybody? (laughs) Now, Uncle, don't be a tease. Say I can go. I'll just die if you don't. They have a band and favors and everything. And it's the grand opening, New Year's Eve. And I've never been anywhere New Year's Eve. So can I? I take it, my dear, that you're asking my permission to go out this evening. Oh, that's right. To the Blue Cockatoo. You know, it's out on Route 28. That the place that used to be Julius's Hofbrau? <laughs> the place they closed down last year? Oh, but it's, it's under all new management. It's lovely now. Everybody says so. They're opening tonight. And Marshall's got reservations. His father got them for him, so can I go? My dear, you know what I think of Marshall Bullard. Well, you don't have to go with him. <laughs> Please, Anki. It's Marshall's last evening at home. He has to go back to school tomorrow. Thank heaven for that, my dear. I wish they'd keep him there. Well, can I go or not? All right, go ahead. Pay no attention to what I think. I'm nobody. I just pay the bills around here. That's all. Oh, Anki, you're a darling. Yes, yes. Leroy, did you hear that? said I could go. Oh, I could change. Get out of the house. Let's make her quit. What's the matter? She kissed me. What did I do? <laughs> Still figuring, Leroy. Gosh, haven't you got the answer yet? Almost, not quite. Certainly takes you long enough. This covers a whole year, my boy. Now let me alone or I'll never get it done. When you're finished, will you play me a game of electric football? We'll see. That's what you always say. Yes or no? No, by George, I won't. (laughs) I played electric football with you all day Christmas and every night this week. I'm sick of it. Now stop bothering me. Aunt. Yes? What can I do? Leroy, how can you ask that? Here you got all this stuff for Christmas. Go out and play with it. All I really want to play is electric football. Well, find somebody else then, but get out of here and stop bothering me. If I'm quiet, can I stay? If you're quiet. Oh, where was I? Oh, 51 and 3 is 54. And 2 56. Aunt. And 7 is 63. <laughs> Eight is 71, and two is 73. Unc! Just a second, Leroy. Oh, Uncle Mark, do you mind if I... Quiet! Can't you see Unc is busy? I'm sorry. 
<sighs> well, there it is. As of the close of business, December the 31st, 1945, flat broke. <laughs> how do I do it? No matter how much I earn or how much I spend, it's always the same. Oh, well, at least I'm holding my own. <laughs> We're in trouble? Oh, no more than any other year. Are we poor, Ralph? Just comfortably poor, I'd say, later on. Mr. Gilfrey, excuse me. Uh, yes, Bertie? About this evening. You'll be going out, I suppose, New Year's Eve. Well, I don't know. To tell the truth, I haven't really got around to making any plans, Bertie. I've been so busy, I sort of let it slide. You'll be staying in, then? Well, I haven't really made up my mind yet. I'll let you know. Well, Uncle Lord, if you're thinking of going out anywhere this evening, you'd better get busy. You may be right. Why, the blue cockatoo was sold out for New Year's Eve a week ago. If you think Christmas was bad... Oh, don't go anywhere, Unc. You and I can have a swell time right here. Doing what? Playing electric football. <laughs> we can have a... That settles it. I'm not going to spend New Year's Eve playing electric football. Hello. Leela? Rocky? What you doing tonight, Leela? New Year's Eve, you know. We ought to... Oh... Oh, you are, huh? That's too bad. Well, Happy New Year, anyway. Hello, Eve? Rockmorton Gildersleeve. I was wondering if you had any plans for this evening. I thought we might just... Oh. That's too bad. Wish I'd called you sooner. Well, Happy New Year, Eve. <laughs> Miss Proudfoot? I don't know if you remember me, Miss Proudfoot, but this is Throckmorton Gildersleeve. I met you one time at Floyd Munson's. In the kitchen. I was wondering how you'd like to go out this evening and... Oh, you have. Uh, nuts. I mean, Happy New Year. Judge? Guilty. Say, how would be if you and I got a couple of girls went out and painted the town a little? We could... Oh, you have, eh? Who is she? <laughs> Yourself. <laughs> Phew. Now what am I going to do? Spend their New Year's Eve alone? Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah, here, Bertie. Grab some of these things. My goodness, where all have you been? Drugstore, delicatessen, every place. I'm going to have to ask you to help me here, Bertie. We've got to work fast. Uh, Marjorie left yet? No, sir. She's just getting ready upstairs. Yeah, that's good. Now, I'll tell you what I want you to do. You set the table nice and pretty, Bertie. Let's see. Uh, Marjorie, Marshall, Leroy, and me. Yeah, better set it for four. But I thought Miss Marjorie and her friend was going out to dinner. Now, don't ask questions, Bertie. Just do as I tell you, and quickly. Yes, sir. Got a lot of favors here. Paper hats and snappers and so on. You can decorate it with ease. Oop, that must be Marshall. Well, you get the idea, Bertie. You fix everything nice and pretty, huh? Yes, sir. I'll just close these double doors so they can't see into the dining room. We want it to be a surprise. Yeah, the young brat. Can't he keep his shirt on? Oh, Uncle Mort, is that Marshall? Don't you worry, my dear. I'll entertain him. You get down. I'll be right there. And now, do be nice to uh, Just leave it to your Uncle Throckmorton. Yeah, the young twerp. Well, well, Marshall, come right in. Yes, indeed. Marjorie will be ready in a jiffy. Good evening, sir. Here, let me take your overcoat. Oh, don't bother. I'll just... That is an overcoat, isn't it? <laughs> let me hang it up for you. Oh, we'll be going right out. Oh, here's Marjorie now. Hello, Marshall. Hey, you look wonderful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, very pretty, my dear. Very pretty. Uh, so you uh, young people were going out this evening, eh? Why, Uncle Mark, you know we were. Well, it's pretty cold out. Pretty nasty. I just came in myself. You couldn't drag me out again. No, sir. Oh, we don't care how cold it gets, do we, Marshall? No, we'll keep warm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You were planning on going to some nightclub, were you? Uh, yes, sir, we have... Well, I a... told you, Uncle Mort. Marshall has reservations for the blue cockatoo. The blue... Oh, yes, yeah, so you did, so you did. Ever been to a nightclub on New Year's Eve before, either of you? Oh, no, sir. This is the first time... That horrible. I... Just horrible. 
crowded, noisy, services bad, people falling all over each other. Oh, we don't care, do we, Marshal? No, sir, I don't know a worse place in the world than a nightclub on New Year's Eve. Now, I was just wondering if we couldn't all have more fun if we stayed right here at home. Uncle Moore! Now, wait a minute, I've got a surprise for you. You haven't seen the way I've got the dining room fixed up. All right, Bertie, you can open the doors if you're ready. There. How do you like that? You see? Paper hats, confetti, noisemakers, everything. Look. <laughs> Some fun, eh? What do you say, Marshal? Well, it looks swell, Mr. Gildersleeve, but... What do you think, Marjorie? I think it's a dirty trick. Marjorie? You told me we could go out, and now you pull this on us. My dear, it's entirely up to you. Far be it for me to put any pressure on you. Nothing could be further from my mind. If you want to go out, go ahead. You want to leave us here, Leroy and me, on New Year's Eve alone? With all these little tokens that we tried so hard to please you with? Go ahead. Go ahead. We'll try to understand. What do you think, Marge? Oh, Anki, I wish you could come with us and be in on the fun. Yeah, it's too bad the reservation is only for two. No, my dear, run along and have your fun. Don't mind me. All I ask is at midnight when the band plays All Lang Syne, give a thought to your old uncle, because he'll be thinking of you. Oh, Anki, happy new year. Happy new year, my dear. Uh, happy New Year, Marge. <laughs> happy New Year, sir. Well, shall we go, Marge? Bye, Anki. Bye. Well, Bertie, they're gone Yes, sir, guess it didn't work What's that? Oh, <laughs> yes No, I guess not Uh, Mr. Gilsey, you don't mind if I go out later after I finish the dishes? No, go ahead, Bertie Everybody else is going, you might as well go too But, Mr. Gilsey, how about you? How are you going to see the new year in? I shall probably play a game of electric football, Bertie For all Lang Syne <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve will be back in just a moment. Have you folks on the Gildersleeve show made your New Year's resolutions, Mr. Lang? Oh, we certainly have. The whole cast, the writers and producers have resolved to give our radio listeners even finer entertainment in 1946. And uh, I personally have resolved to win more friends for Parquet Margarine. Well, that shouldn't be so hard to do, Mr. Lang. I'm a regular user of Parquet Margarine. And any spread that tastes so good and can be bought so economically is sure to keep winning a lot of new friends. That's right. Why, did you know that Parquet Margarine was one of the fastest-growing brands in America before the war? No, I didn't. But I do know that Parquet is very popular today because it's often so hard to get at my neighborhood food store. Yes, Parquet Margarine is more popular than ever. It's winning friends right along because it tastes so good on bread, hot toast, waffles, and pancakes. And with Parquet's flavor still unmatched, I expect that resolution of mine to win more friends for Parquet Margarine is going to be easy to keep. Be sure to try delicious, economical Parquet soon. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y, Parquet Margarine, made by the Kraft Foods Company. Now let's get back to the Great Gildersleeve as he drags himself through the dying hours of the old year. It's after supper now, but the situation appears unchanged. Come to me, my early bird. Leroy! <laughs> I need to learn the lyrics. My boy, for the rest of 1945, please, no drunk. Then go to bed. It's almost time anyway. On New Year's Eve? I thought I could stay up till 12. Well, we've got to think of your health, you know. I'm healthy. What if I should just happen to wake up at 12 o'clock? Well, then you may celebrate a little. Oh, boy, what can I do? You can say Happy New Year and then go back to bed. <laughs> is that all? That is all. Now go to bed. Oh, what is it, Bertie? I'm going out now, if you don't mind. Not at all. Have a good time. Happy New Year. Thank you, Miss Gilsey. Same to you. The house is all locked up front and back, so you don't have to do anything. Well, that's good. Well, good night, Miss Gilsey. Good night, Bertie. Um, wait a minute. Where are you going? To a party. Kind of a combination dance and frolic. Well, 
Sounds like a good combination. <laughs> sure is. Combined so good last New Year's, one man didn't come home for three days. <laughs> well, you don't say. Yes, sir. Well, good night, Miss Gipsy. Young people, old people, every kind of people there, I suppose? Yes, sir. Cradle to the grave. Young folks are jitterbug, I expect, and you middle-aged folks. Well, guess they're jitterbug, too. The old folks get a waltz every two hours. <laughs> Bye, George. I better keep going. I don't want to miss anything. No, I guess not. Well, good night. <laughs> good night, Miss Gilsley. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Bertie. <laughs> Bertie has more fun than I do. Yes, sir, a lot more fun. I'd like to be going to a dance tonight myself. Say, I wonder what my secretary is doing tonight. I like the idea of going out with her, but just this once might not do any harm. I could call up and say, Bessie... Oh, no, I remember now. Out of town for Wednesday. Oh, well. Oh, doorbell. Well. wonder who this could be. Leela, maybe. Eve. Peavy. Hello, Mr. Gillespie. <laughs> Happy New Year. Well, the same to you, old man, and many of them. Come on in and have a Coke. Oh, I can't stay, I'm afraid. I... I just dropped by to bring you this little 1946 calendar with compliments to the pharmacy. A calendar? Well, just what I needed, too. Well, at least come in for a second while I look at it. Well, if you insist. Say, what a beautiful calendar. The alchemist. Yeah, those are the fellows that used to try to make gold out of lead. Never got anywhere with it, not that I ever heard. No, but they were the scientists of their day. Look at them. Standing there with his test tubes and his crucibles. Fine picture. Yeah, I think it makes up into a nice little calendar. Uh, for the family trade, that is. Oh, perfect. The calendar man tried to sell me a picture of a girl with black silk stockings. Oh, well, that wouldn't do for your customers, Pete. That's what I say. Too bad, though. <laughs> TV, you're an old rascal. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. Picture never hurt anybody. You, uh... All alone this evening? Yes, Peavy. I decided I didn't feel like whooping and hollering this New Year's Eve. Decided to spend a quiet evening at home for a change. Is that a fact? Yes, sir. Stay at home with a good book. That's the way to spend New Year's Eve. Well, that's one way. <laughs> or with a friend, of course. Now, why don't you sit down here with me and take it easy? Fact is, I've got to be getting home to Mrs. Peavy. Well, sure, but there's no hurry, is there? <laughs> Nobody but a bachelor could say that. I'm sorry, but I got to be running along. Wait, Peavy. What are you doing to celebrate New Year's, you and Mrs. Peavy? Well, she's like you. She likes to spend the evening quietly. Perfect. Bring her over here and we'll all celebrate it together. Well, I don't think... Nonsense, Peavy. I've got some paper hats and some nice new horns. We can all drink a few Cokes or something. Huh? How about it? Sounds noisy. All right, forget the horns then. We'll be as quiet as mice. We'll celebrate the quietest New Year's Eve in history. Mr. Gildersleeve, I hesitate to say this, but you're talking like a darn fool. What do you mean? Well, if I were you, I wouldn't sit here with a coke and a paper hat. I'd go out somewhere and make whoopee. Well, why don't you? Well, Mrs. Peavy is against it. But you're a free agent. Go get yourself a girl, man. Go out and see the town. <laughs> don't think I haven't tried, Peavy. Tried every girl I know. Well, in that case, you might as well go to bed right now. <laughs> Good night, Mr. Gillespie, and Happy New Year. <laughs> well, looks like I'm stuck. New Year's Eve and not a friend that'll have a cup of kindness with me. Not a friend in the whole world. That's how I'm winding up 1945. Alone. I could be dying and who'd know it. It'll probably be just the same when I am dying. Nobody around to say a kind word. Nobody to soothe my fevered brow. Gildersleeve, let him die. Sure, let him die like a dog. I should wonder if I've got a temperature right now. Ah, uh, mustn't get ideas like that. Can't just sit here moping, though. Try the radio, maybe, and hear a little news. Can't believe it. 
Always thought I was popular. Been living in a fool's paradise, I guess. People just can't stand my personality. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're just about ready with the first of our series of transcontinental New Year's Eve celebrations. Here we are in Times Square, New York City. And when I say that Times Square is teeming with humanity, I don't want you to think I'm merely coining a phrase. Mm. Must be almost midnight back there. I asked one of the traffic cops how big the crowd was, and his guess was 200,000. Oh, looks more like a million to me. What a dope. A million people couldn't get in Times Square. Anyway, it's just a few seconds before midnight, and all these thousands of faces are looking up towards a big clock. They're waiting for the end of 1945. And here it is! What a way to celebrate. Childish. Yes, sir, 1945 is all over in Manhattan. And New York is giving 1946 a big hello. Now, I'll try to get a typical citizen here to tell you how he feels about it. I beg your pardon, sir. But how do you like 1946 so far? Lousy. Are you talking to me, boss? Yes, sir. Would you like to tell our listeners how you like 1946 so far? Best little old year I ever had so far, I see. And the young lady with you. Oh, boy, I wish you could see her, folks. How does she feel about it? How do you feel, honey? Well, when I'm with you, honey. How can they put that kind of drivel on the air? <laughs> well. Happy New Year, Trot Martin. Oh, it's you, is it, Judge? It, what happened to your date? Well, I'd rather not speak of it, if you don't mind. But if you're busy... Not I... particularly. Come on in. Thank you. Throw your hat and coat any place. Come on in and have a Coke. Very kind of you, old man. What about your girl? Didn't she show up? Oh, certainly she showed up. I took her to the gold room at the Hotel Summerfield. Well, it's still pretty early. I'd rather not discuss it, Gilly. Well, suit yourself. <laughs> I'll hear all about it tomorrow from whoever was at the gold room. Dag nabbit, I'm afraid you will. I suppose I might as well tell you what happened so you get the straight of it. Sure, go ahead, Judge. Well, I had a table at this place, and the young woman and myself were having a pleasant time, chatting and so on. Till a sailor appeared. <laughs> she uh, seemed to be acquainted with him. Yes. Yeah. The sailor asked her to dance. So, not wishing to quarrel with the armed forces, I made no protest. Yes, I see. However, after the fifth dance, I felt that I'd done my duty. I remarked to the young woman, I thought it was my turn. And? She slapped my face and walked out with the sailor. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I might expect a little sympathy. Oh, I'm sympathetic, Judge. Believe me, I am only... <laughs> Fine friend, I must say. I'm sorry, Horace. Honestly, I'm sorry, but that's women for you. Come on, sit down and forget it. I certainly like to, but I'm afraid I'll hear plenty about it tomorrow. Anybody mentions it to me, Judge, I'll punch him right in the nose. Here, have a drink. Thanks, Gilda. Uh, certainly glad you came by, old man. I've been sitting here feeling sorry for myself. Sitting here alone all evening. i begun to think maybe there was something the matter with me. Something wrong with my personality. By George, I don't know why you should think there's anything wrong with your personality, old man. You've got plenty of it. Oh, you really think so? I do, sincerely. Good old Horace. Here's to you, old man. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yes, sir. And Leela Ransom, a girl I've been engaged to, mind you, when she thinks so little of me, she won't even save me New Year's Eve. Well, makes a fellow wonder, that's all. Oh, don't be silly. Why, Leela thinks more of you in two minutes than she does about any other man in ten years. You're a he-man. Strong, masculine personality. <laughs> and yet you know how to handle women. Yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> Guess Leela was just standing me up tonight to make me jealous. Yeah. May I fill up your glass? No, not yet. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Throckmorton, having that girl walk out on me tonight was a bit of a blow to my ego. Quite a blow. I had the feeling that she found me attractive. She laughed at the little things that I said about the menu. She laughed when I showed her that stunt, you know, with the spoon and the salt salad. <laughs> I thought that we were getting on splendidly. Do you suppose I seemed old to her? Oh, no, Horace. <laughs> Believe me, any woman would guess you weren't a day over 55. 
Well, I'm only 62. You certainly don't show it. I mean, you look lots younger, Horace. Yes, sir. The way you carry yourself. The spring in your step. The sparkle in your eye. I've seen women look at you when they walk down the street, Judge. You have? You look? Recently? Plenty of times. <laughs> <laughs> women. They need us more than we need them. Have another Coke, Judge. I'm certainly glad you dropped in, Horace. Yes, sir. Hey, the old tack factory. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot the paper hat. <laughs> what could you say? A regular party. Here, Judge. You take the red hat. I look better in green. Don't kill me. You certainly look funny. You ought to see yourself, Horace. Look like a tomato. <laughs> Here, blow a horn. Blow two if you've got the wind. Acquaintance be forgot and, and never, never brought, brought to mind. Hey, yo, happy New Year! Leroy, get back in bed. Happy New Year! Happy New Year! We'll take a cup of kindness yet for all lang syne. What a pair of characters! <laughs> We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve again in just a few moments. A short while ago, I was speaking to a lady who said she can't always get parquet margarine these days at her favorite food store. And the simple explanation is this. Quality spreads for bread are in big demand everywhere. That's especially true, I know, of parquet margarine, the quality spread made by the Kraft Foods Company. Millions prefer parquet margarine to any other brand because it's still unmatched for flavor. And Kraft wants to assure you that everything possible is being done to keep dealers supplied, to distribute all available parquet both fairly and equitably. So if you can't buy parquet the first time, please try again, won't you? Chances are your dealers soon will have a new supply on hand. Insist on P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine, made by Kraft. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the United States Treasury has asked us to announce that the sale of savings bonds will be continued now that the war is over. This means that those of us who have been participating in payroll savings plans can go right on laying up a nest egg for the future, at the same time helping to control runaway prices. You can still get F and G bonds as well as the E bonds, which most people bought during the war. The return is still at the same high rate, $4 at maturity, for every three that you invest. Might be a good New Year's resolution to buy U.S. Treasury savings bonds regularly. Good night and a happy New Year. The Great Gilder Slave is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Mason. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. If you're planning a gay New Year's party, liven the foods on your buffet with a taste-tingling flavor of Kraft salad mustard. Your guests are sure to like this tangy, golden Kraft salad mustard blended into tasty appetizers, relishes, and sandwich spreads, or in a delicious filling for deviled eggs. For those who like a sharper tang, there's Kraft mustard with nippy horseradish added. So be sure to buy both kinds. Ask for Kraft horseradish mustard and Kraft salad mustard when you shop tomorrow. <laughs> This is the National Broadcasting Company.
The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> It's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Now let's join The Great Gildersleeve. He has battled his way through Christmas and New Year's. He has forced himself back into the routine of work at the office. He has savored the bliss of the children's return to school. And now comes Saturday. A nice, bright, wintry Saturday. Oh, hello, Auntie. I didn't know you were here. Uh, yes, my dear. I live here. Yeah. Has the mail come yet? I couldn't say. I haven't heard anything. Well, I might just look anyway. Hmm. It has come. Well. Well, where is it? Where's what? The mail. Oh, there wasn't anything for me, so I just left it in the box. <laughs> My dear, you've got to learn to be more thoughtful of others. You've got... Is it just a bunch of bills? That's all. Then let them lay. <laughs> okay. Wish I could leave them out till February. <laughs> I'm as restless as a willow in a windstorm. Well, yes and no, Bertie. I was trying to read the morning paper. Yes, sir. Well, as long as you ain't doing anything, I wonder, could you fix my electric iron? Iron? What's the matter with it? Look here. Oh, cord burned out. Well, I don't like to fool with electrical things, Bertie. Dangerous. But I'll take it down to the man and let him do it. Yes, sir. Those fellows don't seem to mind electrical shocks. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, when was you thinking of going downtown, Miss Gilsey? Oh, later, Bertie. May not go to the office today, but if you'll just leave the iron here, I'll be sure and take it when I go out. Yes, sir. I'll leave it back here on the hall table. I'm as busy as a spider spinning daydreams. I'm as giddy as a baby on a swing. What the devil is that song, Marjorie? It might as well be spring. Might as well be anything. <laughs> If you're going to play it, my dear, learn it. That's what I'm trying to do. Hi, Elk. Take it easy today, huh? Well, I may go down to the office later, my boy. Stick in your shirt tail. On Saturday? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> but I feel so gay in a melancholy way that it might as well be spring. Oh, for corn's sake. It might be. My dear, if you wish to resume your piano lessons... Oh, no, I just want to learn this one piece. You know why she's so crazy about that song, Unc? I can't imagine. It's her and Marshall's song. Leroy, you're a little sneak. She and Marshall Bullard sang it to each other all the time. We did not. It just happens to be a very beautiful song, and I'm going to learn it, whether anybody likes it or not. Marjorie, Well, you I... can't learn it right now, sister dear. I have to practice. Leroy, the only time you ever want to practice is when I want the piano. I practice every day, faithfully. Listen, don't you want to hear my new piece? All I want is a chance to read the morning paper. <laughs> oh, you like it, Unc. I play it pretty good now. Miss Roots admitted last week I played it pretty good. That sounds horrible. Oh, where's that electric iron? I'm getting out of here. Guess what? All right, what? You'd never guess in a thousand years, so I'll tell you as soon as I get my coat off. Yeah, getting pretty nippy out. Now, 
Uh, cold, all right. Uh, have you guessed? No, I give up. All right, Ben is back. I said Ben is back. Ben Waterford. He's been in town three days. Well, what of it? Marjorie, you used to see Ben quite a bit before he went into the Navy. I was a child then. So was he. But you're old friends. I thought you'd be pleased to hear he's back home, safe and sound. Uncle Mort, Ben doesn't mean a thing to me. Perhaps you've forgotten he got engaged to a girl back east. It was practically the first thing he did in the Navy. <laughs> Well, he didn't get married. Ben's a good, sensible boy. I imagine he'll be coming around to see you. What am I supposed to do? Jump up and down and say, goody, goody? My dear. You say he's been in town three days? He hasn't even called me up. Well, he was always a little bashful. Maybe he still is. After two years in the Navy? <laughs> Marjorie, I'm not trying to start an argument. I just thought you might be glad to hear he's at home. Not particularly. I believe I've mentioned to you that Marshall Bullard and I have an understanding. Marshall Bullard. <laughs> Is that who you were expecting a letter from this morning? Of course. He's written me every day since he went back to school. I'll not have you corresponding with young men behind my back. Well, what do you want to do, look over my shoulder? <laughs> you know how I feel about that Marshall Bullard. Yes, but why? Well, I... it's hard to say exactly. You've never liked any boy I've liked, that's why. That's not true, my dear. Now, take Ben. Oh, Ben, you don't like Marshall and you hated Keith and... Keith wasn't so bad. You said he was. There must have been something wrong with him. <laughs> I have an instinct about these things, Marjorie, and my instinct tells me not to trust Marshall Bullard. Now, Ben... You still haven't given one reason why you don't like Marshall. Well, because I don't trust his father, for one thing. I don't trust anybody with that much money. Oh, Uncle. And even if I haven't got a reason, the fact is I can't stand that kid. The way he hangs around here. Well, every time I look at him, he's grinning at me. He's always polite. Yeah, too doggone polite. I can't stand a kid that's politer than I am. <laughs> but now, Ben, did I tell you I ran into Ben? I ran into him right in the street, State Street. No, you didn't tell me. That's a fact. Ran into him. He's looking fine, too. Is he still in uniform? Uh, I didn't notice particularly. <laughs> yeah, but he looked fine, just fine. And he asked how you were. Asked quite uh, enthusiastically. You don't say. I do say. Seemed very much interested in your welfare. So, uh, naturally, I, I invited him to Sunday dinner tomorrow. You didn't? Yes, I did. Now, isn't that a nice surprise? No, it isn't. You're inviting Ben around because you don't like Marshall, that's all. That's not true, Marjorie. I asked him because he's a fine fellow. Ben is a man who has served his country in his hour of need. He's returned from two years of danger, of hardship. He's a hero. How do you know? Because I was in the last war, that's how. <laughs> of course he's a hero. Who are you talking about, huh? Ben Waterford. I've asked him to dinner tomorrow. Ben? Yippee, maybe he'll bring me some souvenirs. Boy, could I use a couple of bayonets and a carbine? No, Leroy. Okay, just a carbine. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, it'll be great to see Ben again, huh, Marge? Apparently, it'll be great for you and Uncle Mort. I think maybe the best plan would be if you two entertained him. Now, see here, young lady. Ben Waterford has come back from two years in our Navy. It's your patriotic duty to be nice to him. But I'm practically engaged to another boy. You are not. And Ben was engaged to another girl. Forget it. But, Uncle. You give Ben a nice time tomorrow if I have to sit here and watch every minute of it. Can I watch too, Uncle? No. <laughs> now, come on, both of you. Let's eat supper. The great Gildersleeve will be back in a few moments. I have with me tonight a lady who has volunteered to answer a few questions about parquet margarine. I'll be glad to, Mr. Lang. I know that many of our listeners will be interested in your answers because parquet margarine is a spread for bread that's preferred by millions. Well, I'm one of those millions, Mr. Lang. And that brings me to my first question. Why do you prefer parquet? Well, because, like the rest of my family, I like parquet's flavor the best. Then you've discovered that parquet's fresh, delicate flavor is still unmatched. That's a good way to put it, Mr. Lang. Do you realize what an important food parquet is in supplying your family with needed nourishment? Mm, I've heard you say many times that it's fortified with vitamin A. That's right. And it's also one of the best energy foods you can serve. Now, my last question is, have you compared the price of parquet with other spreads? I know it's economical. 
I pay just about half as much for parquet as I'd have to pay for costly spreads. Well, in answering all those questions, you've explained why parquet margarine is a favorite of millions. And to those who haven't tried parquet yet, I'd like to suggest that you do so soon. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, made by the Kraft Foods Company. Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve, who has prepared a rousing welcome for the Navy. Judging by the fuss, you'd think the guest he was expecting for the Sunday dinner was at least Admiral Halsey. All morning long, he's been bustling around the house, issuing orders, countermanding them, supervising Leroy, supervising Bertie, supervising everybody. Leroy, pick up these shoes. I didn't put them there. Well, they're yours. Pick them up. Put them where they belong. Gosh, I got blame for everything around here. Marjorie, aren't you going to get dressed? I am dressed. Pants and sweater? That's no way to come to Sunday dinner. Well, what's wrong with it? You never objected before. Well, it's no way to greet a guest. He's your guest. You greet him. You... My dear, you're being very silly about Ben, and I won't have it. You go upstairs and put on something nice. I want you to make yourself attractive, understand? Well, I still don't see what's on Men it. don't like girls in pants. Marshall does. Well, I don't like Marshall. <laughs> well, are you going to do as I say? If you insist. Hey, here he comes. Here comes Ben. You see, my dear, you're too late. I'll get it, I'll go. Leroy, Leroy, come back here, you hear me? But it's Ben. I saw him coming up the wall. Let your sister open the door. Marjorie? Marjorie, where are you going? Up to change my clothes. I wouldn't think of coming to dinner like this. <laughs> Confound that girl. Well, somebody let him in. Here, I'll go. Let me. We'll both go. Well, Ben. Hi, Mr. Gillespie. Hi, Ben. How's the kid? Say, did you get in any battles? I got a model of a P-40 for Christmas. Yeah. You want to help me put it together? Now, Leroy. You know what? I learned the whole Morse code. Piggy and I can send each other messages. You go send it's one. It's neat. I got drums, too. Huh? I got drums. Last year, I got a dog, but he ran away. I can stand on my hands. You want to see me? Oh, I sure do. <laughs> Not just now, Leroy. Hello, Ben. Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> Come on in, my boy. Come right in. Thanks. Well, well, well. So you're home from the wars, eh? Yep, I'm home, all right. Hey, where's your uniform? Well, I took it off. You mean you're not in the Navy anymore? Nope. Civilian now. Gosh. Well, you're looking fine, Ben. What are we standing here for? Come on in the living room. Hey, Leroy, run in the kitchen and tell Bertie Ben's arrived, will you? Sit down, Ben, sit down. Thank you, sir. Well, well, well. So you're back, eh? Yes, sir, I'm back. <laughs> well, that's fine. Well, you'll find everything pretty much the same around here, Ben. Things haven't changed much. Well, things look pretty much the same. Yeah, it's pretty much the same. Not much change. Uh, smoke a cigar? Uh, no, thanks. Pretty close to dinner. I guess I won't start one either. <laughs> <laughs> so you're back. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> well, we've missed you, Ben. All of us. Uh, by the way, where is Marjorie? Marjorie? Uh, she'll be right down. She's been dying to see you, Ben. But the minute she heard you were coming, she ran upstairs to uh, powder her nose. Oh. Yeah, you know how girls are. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yes, indeed. She's dying to see you, Ben. Oh, is uh, that you, my dear? Hurry down. Speaking to me, Uncle Moore. Oh. Oh, Marjorie. Well, Ben, you here? Welcome home and all that. Say, Uncle... Yes, sir, dying to see you, Ben. <laughs> well, let's go into dinner, eh? Shall we? I could eat a horse. Marjorie. <laughs> Ben. Let me give you another piece of pie. Oh, no, thanks. Nonsense. You've only had two pieces. Pass up his plate there, Marjorie. He says he doesn't care for any. Well, it isn't that. I just... Well, I, I thought they fed you in the Navy. But gosh. <laughs> well, in that case, what do you say we adjourn, eh? Yeah, come on up to my room, Ben. I'll show you my drums. Now, oh. my boy, Ben didn't come over here to see your drums, you know. He came to see your sister. Oh, Uncle Morris. Uh, some other time, eh, Leroy? That's right, some other time. 
Right now, there's a nice fire in the living room, and I know that you and Marjorie have a lot to talk over, Beth. Oh, really, Uncle Moore? So you, Leroy, are going to go upstairs and take a nap. Take a nap in the daytime? <laughs> Nothing like it after a big Sunday dinner. I haven't taken a nap since I was three. <laughs> Absent-minded. <laughs> <laughs> now, my boy, uh, Marjorie, you take Ben into the living room and make yourself comfortable there in front of the fire while I have a word in private with Leroy. <laughs> Well, I guess we're being driven into the living room, Ben. I hope you don't mind. Not me. Now, Leroy, you listen to me. Do I have to take a nap, Uncle? I'm not going to have you pestering Ben and Marjorie. Uh, would you rather go to the movies? Than take a nap? Are you kidding? Yeah. All right, you can go to the movies. Well, uh... Oh, oh yes, money. Here, bring back the change. Gee, thanks, Uncle. And this time, bring it back. Okay. <laughs> Well, go ahead. What are you going to do? I don't know. I may take a nap. Run along. What are you standing there listening for? Go to the movies and mind your own business, Leroy. I'm not listening. I, uh, stopped to tie my shoe. Ha! Do you want to go to the movies? Okay, I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> listening. The very idea. I wouldn't think of listening. Just want to see how they're getting along, that's all. <laughs> Awfully quiet in there. How you been, Marge? Oh, fine. How you been? Oh, fine. <laughs> fine and dandy. You're looking well. Oh, I'm fine. You look well, too. Oh, I am. I'm fine. Fine. That cleans that up. <laughs> Nice fire, isn't it? Yes, it is. I like fire, don't you? Yes, I do. Me too. <laughs> Forget the fire, will you? You're getting off the track. Your uh, uncle's looking well. Yes, yes. I say your uncle's looking well. Oh, he is. He's fine. Will somebody say something? Oh, Leroy seems to be the same old Leroy. Yes, I guess he always will be. And Bertie, she looks just the same as ever. Yes, Bertie's just the same. Oh, brother, i got to do something about this. <laughs> well, you two have been chatting your heads off, I suppose. I don't blame you. Two years is a long time. Ben, my boy, how does it feel to be back? Oh, it's... Well, I can tell you it's good to have you back, isn't it, my dear? Yes, indeed. <laughs> You know, Marjorie's been complaining there weren't any boyfriends around here who appealed to her. But I guess that's fixed now, eh, my dear? Uncle Moore. Yes, indeed. I really worried about her, Ben. <laughs> Couldn't get her to go out with anybody all the time you were away. She just sat here knitting and sewing and... Uh, Uncle, you know that's not true. Well, she may have gone out once or twice, maybe, with a boy across the street. But the point is, Ben, that down underneath... Well, it's been pretty obvious to everybody, except Marjorie herself here, maybe, that as far as she was concerned, you were the only... Telephone, Uncle Mort. Uh, Bertie will answer it. You better go. It might be for you. Bertie will answer it. But it might be something important. Mr. Gillespie, telephone. See? Who is it, Bertie? That Lucas? The old goat. What does he want? All right, Bertie, I'll be there. You mustn't mind Uncle Mort, Ben. Oh, I don't. I, I think he's swell. Well, I don't know what's got into him. There's not a word of truth in anything he said. There's not? Not a word. Oh. Do you mind if I say something? Not at all. What is it you wish to say? Well, you seem different. Oh? How? Well, when I went away, when I joined the Navy, you were just a kid then. I mean, when you were just a kid. But now, gosh, you're practically grown up. A lot can happen to a girl in two years. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> you know, you seem different, too, somehow. You're not as shy as you used to be. Yeah, I got over all that. For near. <laughs> Tell me, about that girl you wrote me you were engaged to. Oh, you never answered my letter. No. Why? I was mad. Oh, I wondered. How could you wonder? Well, I was a dope, I guess. I mean, well, you were just a kid when I went away, and I never really thought of you that way, I guess, but 
Gosh, I... Look out. Here comes Uncle Mort. Oh. <clears throat> well, how you been, Marge? Oh, well, fine. <laughs> Just fine. How have you been? Oh, fine. <laughs> Don't tell me you haven't gotten any farther than that. <laughs> What do you mean? You know perfectly well what I mean. All right, go ahead. Be stubborn. I give up. I wash my hands of the whole thing. Well, uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, did I do something? No, you didn't do a confounded thing. That's what I'm complaining about. Hello, PB. What can I do for you this afternoon? I want to complain about my niece. Marjorie? What's the matter with her? She's stubborn. That's what's the matter with her. Stubborn as a mule. Well, I've always thought of Marjorie as one of the most obedient and well-behaved young ladies I know. Well, she is. But confounded, she insists on running around with that Marshal Bullard. Oh. The no good, lazy, supercilious young upstart. I can't stand him. I don't like the way he calls you sir all the time. I don't like the way he parts his hair. Anyway, he's no good. Did I say that? Words did I think. Oh. Well, I mean it. Now, you take Ben Waterford. Ben's as nice a boy as you'd want to know. Yes, he is. I like Ben. Everybody likes Ben. The trouble with him is he's spineless. There he is, just out of the Navy. A nice, attractive fellow. So I invite him to dinner, and what happens? What? Peavy? I never knew how hard it was to get a sailor and a girl together. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I know you hear all those stories, but so help me, Peavy. They're sitting there right now, the two of them, talking about the weather and getting no place. Doesn't sound like our Navy. (laughs) I tell you, Peavy, I heard them. Well, Mr. Gillespie, there's an old saying. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Yeah, I know, I know. Mm, Pretty sound. Another old saying. Rome was not built in one day. Mm -hmm. I know, I've heard that one, too. And then what is it the fellow says? He who fights and runs away will live to fight another day. What's that got to do with Marjorie and Ben? Nothing. It's just an old saying. (laughs) Peavy, I don't know why I come in here. I honestly don't. Well, I don't either. But you, you seem to want to make conversation, so I try to oblige. You're a friendly druggist. That's me. Man wants conversation. It's advice I want, PV. Advice, not conversation. (laughs) Sorry, Mr. Gillespie. We're fresh out of advice. I'm expecting some in Monday. (laughs) Spare me your heavy handed wit, PV, if you please. You really want to know what I think, Mr. Gillespie? Certainly. Well, there's an old saying comes to mind spare the rod and spoil the child. Marjorie is too old to spank, PV. Just the same, you better put your foot down. I found out years ago, once you let a woman get the upper hand, well, there's an old saying they used to use. Yeah, I know. There's no fool like an old fool. Well, now, I wouldn't say that. Goodbye, <laughs> baby. You know, maybe PV isn't such an old fool at that. No, by George. I've taken all the nonsense I'm going to. I'm going back there, and I'm going to tell Marjorie what's what. You back? How long have I been gone? Oh, I just stayed for the main feature. I already saw the mummy's revenge. Yeah, oh, I see. Where's Marjorie? Where's Ben? Ben? Oh, he left. Marjorie's around somewhere. <laughs> All my work for nothing. Yeah. That again. Now, see here, my dear. Yes, Uncle. Stop fooling around with that piano and listen to me. I'm listening. What's wrong? I want you to stop all this mooning around. Mooning around? What you're doing right now. I was just playing a tune on the piano. Can't a girl just... Yes, and I'm sick of it. You sit here all day long daydreaming. Get him off your mind, you hear? Forget him. Tell him to stop writing you those letters. And what's more, tell him in the future to stay off the property. Tell who to... Marshall. Oh, him. What do you mean, oh, him? I wasn't even thinking of Marshall. You weren't? You mean when you were sitting here just now... 
Not bad. Well, I'll be darned. When did he... I mean, how did he... <laughs> well, I'll be darned. <laughs> you know, that's really a very pretty song, my dear. How does it go again? I'm as busy as a spider spinning daydreams. I'm as giddy as a baby on a swing. I haven't huh? seen a crocus or a rosebud uh, or a robin on the wing. But I feel so gay in a melancholy way that, that it might as well. By George, I owe an apology to the United States Navy. <laughs> we'll hear from the great Gildersleeve again in just a moment. Nutrition experts say that one of the best sources of energy for your wintertime diet is the spread for your daily bread. So I'd like to remind you once again that delicious, economical parquet margarine is one of the finest energy foods you can possibly serve. It's made of selected, highly refined vegetable oils from the farmlands of America, wholesome oils that are so rich in food energy. Parquet margarine also has important vitamin A added to every single pound. And since it's only about half the price of costly spreads, you can afford to spread parquet generously on bread, toast, pancakes, and waffles. So make your wintertime meals taste extra good and make them extra nourishing, too, by serving Parquet as your regular spread. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y, Parquet Margarine, made by Kraft. <laughs> Pretty hot. Well, maybe I can stand it. Oop. <laughs> uh, ah. Well, well. Little Marjorie and Ben. Good day's work. When you come to the end of a perfect day. And you... Pam, you in there? Yeah. Taking a bath, getting myself clean. Something you ought to do oftener. I don't hear you washing. Don't worry about me, my boy. Go to bed. Good night. You too, folks. Don't wait up for me. I may be here quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> the Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekin. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. Do you know about this easy way to pep up wintertime meals? Good cooks do it every day simply by adding the flavor tang of Kraft salad mustard to a variety of cooked dishes. Creamy smooth for blending and delicately spiced, this Golden Craft Salad Mustard has just what it takes to liven up egg and cheese dishes. Puts an extra tempting flavor tang into meats, gravies, and barbecue sauces. And for sharper tastes, there's also Craft Mustard with nippy horseradish added. Buy both of these delicious Craft Mustards when you shop tomorrow. <laughs> This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> It's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry. Brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Now let's join The Great Gildersleeve. Yesterday there arrived in his mail greetings from the collector of internal revenue, together with his 1945 income tax blanks. Instead of tossing them in a drawer, there to ripen till March 15th, as anyone normally would, he sat right down and figured them out. Maybe that's why Gildersleeve slept like a baby last night, and why he's the first man downstairs this morning. Well, where is everybody? All out up there. yoo Everybody up. Come on, all hands on deck. <laughs> I just happened to be feeling good this morning, Bertie. Did my whole income tax last night. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're feeling good. Yes, sir. And when I feel good, Bertie, I tend to get hungry. What's for breakfast? Mr. Gilsey, that's a fair question. What do you mean? Well, sir, the milkman didn't leave no eggs this morning. He didn't hardly leave no milk. He didn't hardly leave nothing. Gee. I told him, I said, I don't know why you bother to come around here at all. What did he say? <laughs> He said, because I'm so beautiful. <laughs> I told him if his egg was half as fresh as his talk, he wouldn't get so many complaints, and that's a fact. <laughs> well, do the best you can, Bertie, because I've got big things to do today. Big things to do, and it's going to take plenty of fuel. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Gildersleeve. Gee, you're early. Early? Not at all. I've been up for hours. Oh, well, let me hang up your coat for you. Oh, thanks. You know what I did last night, Bessie? I made out my income tax. I sat up till 1 o'clock doing it. Got the whole thing done and out of the way. Two months ahead of time. Why, that's wonderful. I've never heard of anybody... Wonderful nothing. It's only common sense, Bessie. That's the way everything should be handled. That's the way this department should be handled. That's the way it's going to be handled. In 1946... Yes, sir. Put nothing off. Do it now. Bing, bing. Make decisions. Take action. Clear the desk. That'll be our watchword for 1946, Bessie. Clear the desk for action. Well, if you really mean it, Mr. Gildersleeve... Of course I mean it. That's the official New Year's resolution of the Summerfield Water Department. And I want you to hold me to it, Bessie. See that I do it. I want you to be tough with me. Make me toe the line. Bing, bing. Yes, sir. Well... That's what secretaries are for. To relieve executives of such details as... <laughs> tending to business. <laughs> well, if you don't mind me bringing it up again, Mr. Gildersleeve, there's quite a lot of things in your desk that have been there, well, some of them since summer. That's just what I'm talking about, Bessie. People come in here. What kind of impression are they going to get? Why, anybody would think this department was being run by a nincompoop. Yes, sir. You... <laughs> you don't have to agree with me, Bessie. I like a girl who has opinions of her own. One who isn't afraid to disagree with me. Uh, I'll try, Mr. Gildersleeve. Now... What's the next move here? What's to be done? You're the secretary, Bessie. Give me my orders. Well, as I keep saying, there's all those papers on your desk. And really, if we don't do something about them... Papers on my desk, you say? Well, let's get at them. That's the way we do things around here, Bessie. Bing, bing. Let's go into my office. Yes, sir. Gee, I just got to get a bigger desk, that's all. <laughs> well, let's pitch in here. Uh -huh. Uh, what's first on the list? What have we here, Bessie? I'm afraid it's another calendar. Oh? Hmm. Indestructible Life Insurance Company. I'm already up to my ears in life insurance. Up to my ears in calendars, too. I don't know why it is. We go for a whole year and nobody sends us a calendar. And then all of a sudden, everybody sends us calendars. Every, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> say, Indestructible Life Insurance Company... Hobie R. Wasson, General Agent Summerfield. So that's what became a Hobie. Last I heard, he had the Plymouth Agency. I could use the Plymouth, but I certainly don't need any life insurance. Well, let's get going. Why don't you drop something, Mr. Yeah, Gildersleeve? Drop something? What's that? It just fell out of the calendar. Oh, just a booklet. Hmm. Are you the man we're looking for? <laughs> Would you like a job offering the following advantages? 
Start at the top. Rapid advancement. <laughs> Unlimited opportunity. Fascinating work. Valuable contacts. No office hours. Be your own boss. Retirement at 50. Hmm, who wouldn't? <laughs> if you're a young man with these qualifications, apply to indestructible life insurance. Spooey. Let's get down to work here, Bessie. What's first? Well, here's a letter from a man who claims... Well, maybe you better read it. Oh? Huh? Citizens Committee for Better Water Service. Never heard of it, but I'm against it already. <laughs> Crockmorton P. Gildersleeve, Esquire, Department of Public Water, Summerfield. Sir. <laughs> Don't like that, sir. <laughs> On behalf of the Citizens Committee for Better Water Service, representing over 250 taxpayers in Summerfield, we... <laughs> It's a lie. <laughs> oh, Bessie, take a letter. Take 250 letters. I haven't kept dinner waiting. No, sir. I'm just getting the table set. Ah, uh, that's good. Busy day today. Yeah, yeah. What's that? <whistles> what is that, buddy? <laughs> Leroy tells me it's jungle noises. Jungle noises? What's the jungle? Right, come on, Ben. Come home. Here, here. Oh, Watch it. Watch it, Leroy. Did I surprise you, Uncle? Leroy, not in the house. Put down that gun. Would. Ben, where were you? You heard the signal. Why didn't you charge? Well, maybe we'd better uh, charge some other time, huh? Maybe we'd better charge some other time. You'll never win a battle that way. Well, Ben, I didn't know you were here, my boy. Well, I'm here. <laughs> well, good evening. What are you doing with the mop? Oh, <laughs> bayonet. <laughs> well, well, boys will be boys. <laughs> Leroy, I mean. You're staying to supper, I hope. Well, I... Of course he's staying to supper. Oh, fine. Uh, well, seems to me I've been staying to supper a lot lately. Uh, glad to have you, Ben. Glad to have you. Yes, sir. Can I sit next to Ben at supper? Uh, we'll see, my boy. I think someone else might have something to say about that. Eh, hey, Marjorie? Leroy's been simply monopolizing Ben all afternoon. I have not. Ben and me were playing Carlson's Raiders, weren't we, Ben? Yeah, we were playing Raiders. <laughs> What? I only showed him the first two. Uh, you want me to show you, Unc? Uh, not at this time, Leroy. I need this arm to hang up my coat. <laughs> okay. Come on, Ben. Let's start all over. I'll be the underwater demolition team this time. I'm swimming down the hall. You just lie low and tread water there in the dining room. With your rifle in your teeth, see? Then when I give the signal, we spring out and jump the sentry, okay? Unc can be the sentry. Uh, huh? <laughs> oh, no. Uncle Mort, for heaven's sake, make Leroy lay off, Ben. He's been after him like this all afternoon. No, Leroy. Ben likes this. Don't you like it, Ben? It's fun. All Marge ever wants to do is sit around and hold hands. I do not. Ben just came back from a war. He isn't interested in all that lovey-dovey stuff, are you, Ben? <laughs> I think the mission had better be postponed for tonight, Colonel Carlson. Suppose you go up and wash your hands for dinner. Ah, oh, but uh... Don't argue with your superiors. Your present mission is to go upstairs and wash your hands. You have your orders? Pour it. Art! Vinegar Joe. <laughs> Boy, is he corny. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, let's go in and sit down, shall we, till dinner's ready? <sighs> Sit down, Ben. Sit down. Thank you, sir. Have a hard day at the office, Unky? Well, busy day. Got a lot done, though. Cleaned up all my back correspondence. Told off a lot of people and cleared my desk right down to the blotter. Yes, sir, it's been bing, bing all day long. And last night, I stayed up at 1 o'clock finishing my income tax. Did I tell you that? Over and over. Unky's been a regular fireball the last couple of days, Ben. I don't know what's come over him. It's because I gave up vegetables. <laughs> 
Uh, it's a good feeling. Feeling that you've accomplished something. Doesn't come very often. What have you two been doing? Oh, we've just been fooling around. Haven't we, Ben? Yeah. <laughs> just fooling around. <laughs> Well, that's all right if you got time for it. <laughs> uh, ben, my boy, what are you planning to do now that you're out of the Navy? Do? Uh, yes, for a living. Oh, I don't know, Mr. Gildersleeve. I oh, guess I don't know. <laughs> well, surely you must have given some thought to your future after all those years you were in the Navy. You must have had some plan. What was it? I guess it was just a... Get out of the Navy. <laughs> but uh, what were you going to do after that? Well, I guess I thought I'd take it easy a few weeks and then look around, sort of. Uh, I don't know. That's no way to do it, Ben, if you'll pardon my saying so. It doesn't pay to drift, my boy. You want to get right in there, take the bull by the horn, strike while the iron is hot. No, Uncle Mort, don't rush Ben. He's earned a rest, and I think he should take it. I'm sorry, my dear, but I'm telling Ben this for his own good. Business is business, you know. It's dog eat dog. Dog eat dog? Competition, my boy. Reconversion just around the corner. Flat irons, refrigerators. This isn't war anymore. This is business. Men are coming back every day. You've got to get right in there and start punching if you don't want to get left. Well, gosh, I... But Ben doesn't know what he wants to do yet. Can't wait for that. The important thing is to get started. <laughs> a man has obligations, my dear. Now, Ben, if everything goes well, you'll have a wife one of these days. And children to support. Loved ones to provide for. <laughs> Let's talk about something else, shall we? <laughs> And speaking of loved ones, Ben, did you ever think of going into insurance? Oh, no, oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, I guess I never did. What in the world would Ben do in insurance? Sell it. What does anybody do with insurance? Gosh, Mr. Gildersleeve, I'm afraid I wouldn't be good at selling things. That's nonsense. Just a question of getting your foot in the door. What size shoe do you wear? <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Mort, really? Insurance? I'm serious, my dear. I happen to know they're looking for young men like Ben. I'll tell you what you do, Ben. You go down to Hobie Washington in the Struck of the Life and tell him I sent you. But, Mr. Gildersleeve, Or better I... still, I'll write you a note. Well, that's awful nice of you, but I... Don't honestly... thank me. Glad to do it, my boy. Always happy to give a serviceman a lift. Oh. Mr. Gildersleeve, excuse me. Yes, Bertie? We got a duck for supper. You want a car, but you want me to wrap it with it in the kitchen. <laughs> uh, bring it on, Bertie. The duck doesn't live that I can't lick. <laughs> well, anybody else got any problems? I have Mr. Anthony tonight. Bing, bing. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be back in a few moments. Do you mind if I barge in a few seconds, Mr. Lang? No, go right ahead. Well, the other day, my wife asked me to pick up the groceries. And as I went out the door, the last thing she said was, don't forget to pick up a pound of parquet. Well, that doesn't surprise me, because parquet margarine is a spread that's preferred by millions. Well, it happens that our food dealer was out of parquet, so I had to bring back something else. My wife didn't like it. Well, sometimes there isn't enough parquet to go around. But that's usually a temporary condition because Kraft is doing everything possible to keep dealers supplied with flavor-fresh parquet. Anyway, it was an interesting experience for me because it taught me that wives are pretty fussy about the spreads they serve to their families. Yes, that's right. Women all over the country have found that a sure way to satisfy family appetites is to serve parquet margarine, the spread that tastes so good on bread, toast, pancakes, and waffles. They know, too, that they can buy parquet margarine at just about half the price of costly spreads. So be sure to keep asking for delicious, economical parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by Kraft. Now let's rejoin the great Gildersleeve, who has continued busy for several days. Thanks to his friendly efforts, Ben Waterford has been duly sworn as an agent of the Indestructible Life Insurance Company and has commenced to learn the art of selling policies. But while Ben studies the theory from a handbook, Gildersleeve is scurrying around town finding live prospects. We pick him up now, for instance, at Mr. Peavy's pharmacy. Well, Mr. Gildersleeve, what can I do for you this afternoon? 
Not a blessed thing, Peavy. Not a thing. Just stopped in to pass the time of day. Hmm, maybe you'd be interested in a sale we're having. Uh, it's a special on men's perfume. No, thank you. Lots of nice odors. Pleasant and at the same time quite masculine. Chief of police took a bottle of this the other day. Makes him smell like new moon hay. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, the chief can douse himself with essence of hay if he wants to. I will stick to soap and water. Need any soap? Uh, not at the moment. <laughs> Peavy, do you realize there's going to be a lot of ex-servicemen around here pretty soon? A lot of them here already. What about it? There'll be more. But here's the point. If you... uh, Excuse me, Mr. Gilbert. They've telephoned. Uh... Peavy's Pharmacy. Oh, yes, Mrs. Eversole. How have you been? Oh, I've been well, thank you. She's been well. Well, as usual, that is. Peavy, I'm with... What's that, Mrs. Eversole? Oil? Baby oil? My goodness, I didn't even know you... I mean, I... Uh, uh, well, we don't recommend it for salad. <laughs> Anything else? No, I see. Well, say hello to Mr. Eversold for me. P.V. I'll tell her, Mrs. Eversold. Thank you. Goodbye. P.V., you waste enough time every day to make a fortune. And just common courtesy, Mr. Gildersleeve. What I was saying about the servicemen coming back. Yeah? Well, the point is, do you understand your responsibility toward these men? I think so. Just what is it you're after, Mr. Gildersleeve? I'm not after anything. Not for myself. But now you take Ben Waterford, for instance. He's a fine boy. You bet your life he is. Are we going to let a young fellow like Ben save our country and then come back here and not be able to make a living? No, sir, I hope not. But the fact is, Mr. Gildersleeve, I don't need anybody to help me here in the store. I couldn't afford it. No, no, Peavy, I'm not asking you to give him a job. I've already got him one. Well, then, what's your... Just listen a minute and I'll explain. The point is... Oh, Bert. Well, well, things are really rushing today. Uh, Peavy's pharmacy. Make it snappy this time, will you, Peavy? Alarm clocks? I'm sorry, madam. Have you tried a hardware store? Have you tried a department store? A jewelry store, maybe. Tell her to try a hawk shop. Have you tried a hawk... Uh, a clock shop? <laughs> uh, well, I'm sorry, madam. I can't think of anything else except Beckman's drugstore. They have everything over there. Thank you for calling. Good day. PV, you don't know the first thing about running a business. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I thought you just came in here to waste time, anyway. Well, I didn't. What I came in here for was to tell you that Ben Waterford is selling life insurance. Oh. Don't interrupt. He's selling life insurance, and it's your duty as a citizen to give him a hearing. But, Mr. Gildersleeve, I... gave I... him your name, Peavy. When he comes in, be patriotic. Because in times like... Don't you answer that. Let it ring. When Ben comes in, Peavy... Peavy's pharmacy. Oh, I give up. Goodbye, you money grubber. <laughs> Sister, dear. Answer it, will you, Leroy? Why should I? You never let him play with me. Please, Leroy, I have to go upstairs and get ready. How do you like that? Go on, Leroy, answer the door. Gosh, Danes. Hi, Ben, come on in. Marge has gone upstairs to get dressed up for you. Oh, she has? I'm doing my homework. You want to help me with a couple of problems? Sure, I guess so. I... Oh, well, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, <laughs> hello, Ben. Leroy, take your homework in the study, please. Okay. See you later, Ben. Oh, well, Ben, sit down. How's the insurance going, my boy? Well, I've been working pretty hard. That's the stuff. Did you see Mr. Peavy? Yes, sir. Saw him this afternoon. Was he uh, pleasant? Oh, yes, sir. He was very nice. I thought so. I went in there this morning and soft-soaped him. Of course, I'm a pretty important customer to Peavy. I get all my cigars there. <laughs> I see. How big a policy did he buy? He didn't buy a policy. He didn't? Well, why not, for heaven's sake? Well, he said he didn't want any. What'd you say? Nothing. I couldn't think of an answer to that. <laughs> ben, that's no way. You've got to force the sale. Uh, I'm afraid I'll never get the hang of it, Mr. Gildersleeve. Now, now, my boy, we mustn't be discouraged. When a man says he doesn't want any insurance, that's only the beginning. You don't just give up. You stick around, make conversation. Look for an opening. Well, I hung around for a while and made a little conversation. Oh, what happened? He sold me a bottle of perfume. 
That means you haven't sold anything yet in three days? No, sir. Not yet. That settles it. We're going to make a sale this evening. Right this evening. Yeah, but Marge and I were Marge, going... we will forgive you if you attend to business for an hour or so. She'll respect you for it. But you can't sell insurance in the middle of the night. Nonsense. It's only 7.30. We'll go over and see Judge Hooker, sell him a policy, and you'll be back here by half past eight. But I don't think I know how to sell don't it. Don't you worry, my boy. On this deal, I'm going to help you. <laughs> Unexpected pleasure, gentlemen, an unexpected pleasure. Step right into the library and make yourselves comfortable. Thank you, Judge. Yeah, thanks. Care for a glass of Kalak water, either of you? Uh, I don't believe so. Ben? Oh, no, sir, I don't even drink beer. <laughs> That's right. You know, Ben here is just out of the Navy. Yes, I understand he made a fine record. Excellent record. See any combat, Ben? No, sir. That's too bad. Well, I thought I was lucky. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Well, how did you gentlemen happen to drop in on a lonesome old jurist this evening, if I may ask? Just find yourselves in the neighborhood? No, Mr. Gildersleeve thought I ought to... Uh, the fact is that Ben has a... Well, he has something he'd like to discuss with you. Well, only too glad to do anything I can for a returning serviceman. Something legal, is it? Oh, it's perfectly legal. Yeah. <laughs> ben misunderstood you, Horace. You see, although he's only been back in town a few days, he already has a job. Well, that's fine. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. Mr. Gildersleeve helped me get it. Good old Gildy. People call him a blowhard, but his heart's in the right place, just the same. <laughs> Good citizen, too. Thank you, Horace. What is it you're doing, Ben? Well, I'm supposed to sell life insurance. Oh, so that's it. <laughs> uh, Horace, I don't want you to think that... Uh, uh, uh... That what? Well, I wouldn't want you to get a wrong impression about our little visit. Well, how could I possibly get a wrong impression? I assume that Ben here is here because he would like to sell me some life insurance. I sure would, Judge. Gildy, you could learn a lesson in frankness from our young friend here. If you didn't make such a habit of beating around the bush... I wasn't trying to cover up anything, Judge. I just didn't want Ben to start selling you a policy the minute we stepped in the door. That's no way. Well, suppose we let Ben sell it his way. Young man, do your worst. Thanks, Judge. Believe me, I'm the guy that can do it. <laughs> Should I uh, show him the folder now, Mr. Gildersleeve? Folder? Certainly. Okay. I got it here somewhere. Or at least I did have it. Maybe you left it in your other suit. Nope. Haven't got one. <laughs> For heaven's sake, Ben, never mind the folder. Just tell the judge the gist of the thing. Oh, okay. Well, let's see. Uh... On the front of it, there's a picture of this lady and this little boy. And, uh, she, she looks kind of sad. It, it's a nice picture. Now, don't try to describe the folder, Ben. Forget the folder. Just give the arguments why every man needs insurance. Oh, okay. Never mind Mr. Gildersleeve, Ben. He's never sold any insurance. You just go ahead and do it your own way. Okay. Well, the, the idea is that everybody ought to have insurance. Very good. Why? Well, for the, for the protection of his loved ones. Yes, yes. One never knows from which direction the sad blow may fall. Uh, a traffic accident, a uh, sudden illness, an unexpected shock. Uh, any of these might carry off the loving provider who has always seemed so strong and <coughs> healthy. Are you in... Are you insured, Ben? No, what would I want it for? Ben, that's not the answer. Hildy, leave the boy alone. Now, see here, Judge. We're not playing parlor games. I'm interested in seeing Ben get a start in life. I want him to learn to do this thing right. Ben, they give you three main points, don't they? Yeah. Three main objectives. Now, what are they? Uh, get inside the door. No, never mind that. <laughs> We're already in the door. Oh, well, then there's only two. Uh, prove to this prospect he needs insurance and... Then prove he needs the kind you're selling. And get his deposit. He got Oh, yeah, that. That, yes. All right. Now, have you proved to the prospect he needs insurance? Oh, I guess so. I told him about the accidents and all. Now, let us consider that the need for insurance has been demonstrated. Continue. Well, the indestructible puts out several policies. There's the ordinary life policy, and there's a 20-payment combination annuity and endowment, and there's the... Convertible retroactive policy with double indemnity. Just sell them ordinary life or we'll be here all night. Well, the 
Ordinary life policy is just ordinary policy. It provides maximum protection at minimum expense. The rates are low. <laughs> now, let's see. Starting at age... Uh, how old are you, Judge? Fifty-five. Oh, well, I got it right here on the table. Let's see. On a thousand-dollar policy, age 55... <laughs> Who in the dickens told you you could sell life insurance? Well, you did. Well, I ought to have my fat head examined. <laughs> Anybody ought to be able to sell insurance. Insurance is a real need. Now, Judge, with a small down payment, you can buy your family the protection they deserve. I dare say. The only thing is, I haven't any family. You must have some. Well, I've got three distant cousins, all older than myself, and all as rich as Croesus. But now, Mr. Gildersleeve, then, he's a family man. Of course. A niece and a nephew, the apples of his eye. Yep. You wouldn't want to have Leroy and Marjorie left without protection, would you, Gildy? I don't think you should, Mr. Gildersleeve. You stay out of this. <laughs> you said yourself, Gildy, that you... Well, there's no reason to do it now. I'm perfectly healthy. We never know from which direction the sad blow may fall. Uh -huh. Got an application blank there, Ben? Sure, here. No, thank you. And don't forget, Ben, get his deposit. <laughs> you old goat. Why don't I learn to mind my own business? We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve again in just a moment. Your menu for breakfast may change from day to day because all of us like variety and foods. But whether you have toast, sweet rolls, pancakes, or waffles, it's the spread that makes them taste extra good. I expect that's why millions of American families prefer parquet margarine. Because on any breakfast menu or meal where hot bread breads are served, parquet's fresh, dairy-like flavor is still unmatched. It's the expert way that Kraft blends selected refined vegetable oils and fresh pasteurized milk from the farmlands of America that makes parquet margarine taste so good. And, of course, it adds important nourishment to your family's daily diet because it helps provide food energy and essential vitamin A. So for a quality spread, serve your family parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Hey, Al, can I have a quarter to go to the movies? Leroy, my boy, come here and sit down a minute. I want to show you something your old uncle has done for you. Yeah? You see this? What is it? That, my boy, is a life insurance policy. It's worth $10,000. $5,000 to you, see, here's your name, and $5,000 to Marjorie. Now, what do you think of that? $5,000? Yes, sir, $5,000. Gee, that's swell, Unc. When do I get it? Let us hope it won't be for a long, long time. Oh. Well, can I have a quarter now? No. Now get out of here. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekin. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Ladies, why let meals get dull when it's so easy to liven up the flavor of foods with tangy, golden Kraft salad mustard? You can blend this creamy, smooth salad mustard right into cooked foods. Spread it on sandwich meats for lip-smacking flavor. Or use Kraft salad mustard in gravies, relishes, and barbecue sauce for extra flavor zest. Also, be sure to try the sharper Kraft mustard with nippy horseradish added for frankfurters and sauces for fish. Get both kinds, Kraft Salad Mustard and Kraft Horseradish Mustard, on your next shopping trip. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> it's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by The Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. We take you now to Summerfield, home of that prominent figure and humble servant of the people, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, who is to be found this morning, as every morning, seated at the breakfast table, fortifying himself for the day's work ahead. Leroy, if I might trouble you again for the marmalade. Marmalade coming through. Heads up, Marge. Uncle Mort, it's loaded with sugar. I know that. I shouldn't really be eating any, but just a smidgen to finish off my toast. I suppose now you want another piece of toast. Well, one piece, perhaps, to go with my marmalade. <laughs> there goes another New Year's resolution. Oh, I can get into fighting trim very quickly, my dear, once I put my mind to it. Uh, yes, Bertie? Shall I pour you a second cup, or you want to give me an argument first? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know I shouldn't, but just a small one, Bertie. You know, just to... Uh... I know, just to wash down the toast and marmalade. <laughs> <laughs> Say when. You know, when it comes to breakfast, Bertie, I'm afraid you spoil me. Don't take no help from me. Oh, that's enough. My gracious, you poured me a full cup there, Bertie. I said say when. Well, as long as you poured it, wouldn't do to waste any, would it? <laughs> but beginning tomorrow, Bertie, one cup only. One cup. Every blessed morning we go through this. No, my dear, I don't think that's quite fair. It's true, isn't it? Well, I get hungry. Hey, you... Where? Where is it? The toast is burning, Mark. Oh, oh my goodness. Why didn't you say so instead of screaming like a maniac? My mouth was full. Yes. Well, don't frighten us to death. <coughs> Better open the window there, Bertie. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's enough. Close. <laughs> open the window. Close the window. Is this too well done for you, Unky? Well done. It's burnt to a crisp. Okay, I'll make you another piece. Don't trouble yourself, my dear. Seems I can't eat even a piece of thin, dry toast without general disapproval around here. Seems I'm to be denied even a crust of bread. <laughs> Don't bother to make me another piece, my dear. I couldn't eat it. It would turn to ashes in my mouth, if not before. <laughs> now stop carrying on. It's already in the toaster. Yeah, but you haven't turned it on. Oh, there. I could starve for all anybody seems to care. But don't mind me. I'm nobody. You just pay the bills around here. You darn right. <laughs> uh, doorbell, Bertie. Hi. Wonder who that is. Hooker? Oh, 20 to 9. Have to gulp my coffee and get down to the office. You better get a move on, too, kids. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Ransom. Hey, Mr. Gildersleeve left that Bertie out this box to see him for a minute. No, he ain't took off yet. Just go by him. Leela, that you? Hello, Throckmorton. <laughs> well. Oh, don't get up, please. On your feet, Leroy. Hi, oh, Mrs. Ransom. Hello, Leroy. Marjorie, honey. Oh, look out. Look out, Marjorie. Oh, the toast. Fire. Oh, my goodness, again. Look at that. Will somebody please take the responsibility of watching the toast? I'm sorry, Unky. I guess my mind was somewhere else. Your mind is always somewhere else. If you could just find out where it is and move there. <laughs> oh, now, don't be a cross, Pat Throckmorton. Well, I'm sorry about this, Leela, but the way things have been going here this morning, I've hardly been able to get a bite to eat. Ah! Leroy, <laughs> you're already late for school. Holy cats, he's right. Come on, Mark. Goodbye, Mrs. Ransom. And by the way, I love the color of your nail polish. Yes, yes. Oh, thank you, Marjorie. Ruth did me this time. I couldn't get Vera. Yes, yes. Come on, don't be okay. You've been avoiding me lately, Throckmorton, haven't you? Uh, avoiding you? Yes, you have. Now, fesh up. I haven't seen you in days. Well, I've been busy at the office. I tried to call you last night, and you weren't in then either. Well, last night I was uh, doing something else. <laughs> You see, uh... Oh, it doesn't matter in the least. I just wanted to tell you that you'd better start being a little bit nice to me now because I'm coming into money. 
Money? I might my way downtown right this minute to try on a Persian lamb coat. Oh, Throckmorton, I'm so excited. I wasn't going to tell anybody till it happened, but I just can't help it. Well, wait a minute. Where's this money coming from? Well, that's the thing. I was thinking about that. It could be Andy Pooh. She isn't so terribly old, but she married real well. I just hate to have a go, of course, but we all have to go sometime, don't we? And, uh... I always was her favorite niece. Leela, I don't understand this. Where did you get the idea that you were coming in the money? Oh, gracious. I didn't tell you about Mr. Sartorius. Star was this? What? Who? Sartorius. Sartorius? Mm-hmm. Who's he? Oh, well, he's just wonderful. Everybody who's been to him says so. Uh, Grace Pettibone, she went to him, and the things he told her, well, she said it was simply uncanny. What does the man do? He tells you things that are going to happen. You mean he's a mind reader, a fortune teller? Oh, gracious, no, nothing like that. Well, I wondered. This man reads your palm. Oh, brother. <laughs> oh, but he, he's really wonderful. Well, how do you know? Because he told me I was coming into money, definitely. Within three months, you will come into a sum of money. That's what he said. And that in itself is uncanny because I was just wishing I had some money. <laughs> but Leela. Oh, and that's not all. He told Grace Pettibone her son was going to be discharged from the army, and he was last week. (laughs) Of course he was. The war's over. They're all going to be discharged sooner or later. It doesn't take a mind reader to guess that. I knew what you'd say, Throckmorton. You're so conservative. That's why you've never gotten any wire. Oh. Oh, but you see. When I'm wearing my new Persian lime and driving around town in my new blue convertible, you wish you'd listen. Convertible? Leela, you didn't put any money down. I'm having a demonstration this afternoon. Look, Leela, do me a favor. You don't have to listen to anything I say. But before you get in any deeper, talk this over with Judge Hooker. Horace? <laughs> Gracious, he's worse than you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll hold the phone. If we don't put a stop to this judge, we'll wind up having to bail Leela out. Quiet. How can I telephone? You know how she gets around you. She spends money, and it's us who'll pay. Oh, thank you, Sergeant. No, no, never mind. Well? Well, what do you say? The chief isn't there. He's down at the barbershop. Yeah, the chief is never there. If this town had any kind of a police department, Horace, a man like this palm reader couldn't even open up shop. They'd run him right out of town. Oh, it's not quite as simple as that, my friend. Under the law, a man is presumed to be innocent until proven guilty. But the man is a faker. Possibly so. But can we prove it? Is there any evidence to that effect? I just told you. I know. The man is a faker. That is an assertion. It is not evidence. It's a fact. That's what it is. But how do we know? I just told you twice. (laughs) Guilty, I say again, that is an assertion. And merely repeating it does not lend it weight. Look, Judge, the man is a faker. You know it and I know it. Well, don't we? To the best of our knowledge and belief. Stop hedging. He's a faker. All right, let's get him out of town. Gildy, these things can't be done overnight. The law has its delays, and wisely so. Oh, you lawyers make me sick. A palm reader and he's got you buffaloed. Why, before you and the chief get moving, well, it wouldn't surprise me to see the city hall taken over by gypsies. Hello, Floyd. Where's the chief? Is that... I'm here, right under the towel. Well, unveil him. I want to talk to him. That you, Commissioner? Well, hello there. Come on, sit up. I got something I want to say to you. Anything you can't say to me laying down? Yes, you've been laying down on the job altogether too much lately. Now, Commissioner, is that nice? Hoist me, Floyd. There you are. Uh, what's the beef, Commissioner? Gates, this town is full of racketeers. Well, that's news to me. You bet it's news to you. You don't know half of what's going on around here. Now, Commissioner, do I tell you how to run the water department? Somebody better. Only joking, Commissioner. (laughs) You stay out of this, Floyd. If you ask me, Commissioner, the department has a pretty good record this past year. A pretty good record. That's telling them, Chief. Yeah. We made more arrests than any previous year except two. I know. Illegal parking. There isn't a legal place to park in the whole city. (laughs) 
telling him, Commish? Listen, Ed, what is it that you're after anyway? There's a fellow I want run out of town. Well, we'll certainly tend to that, Commissioner. Yes, sir, right away. Is there any particular reason, or do you just not like the guy? The man's a crook, a faker. He calls himself a palm reader. But if you ask me, he's running some kind of a confidence game. And if you were on the job instead of lying here getting your fat face massaged... <laughs> Commissioner, let's not be calling names, shall we? That can only lead to nothing but hard feeling. Well, confound it, why aren't you doing something about it? Now, don't you worry. We have our eye on all these fellas. We're watching them. Yeah, and while you watch them, they're swindling innocent women. On State Street, in broad daylight. Anybody we know? Mrs. Ransom, for one. Oh. Say, how's she been lately? I haven't seen you and her, uh... She's fine. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, this fellow's on State Street, you say, this palm reader? I thought you had your eye on him. He's next to the candy store there. Next to the candy store, eh? Oh, it's very interesting. I don't know what's so interesting about it. Well, we put these things together. We have our methods. If you think he's going to tunnel into the candy store and break into the jujubees, you're crazy. <laughs> that isn't his racket. Well, what is his racket? I don't know. Why don't you put a cop on him and find out? Well, I'm kind of shorthanded at the moment. There's only one man I could put on the case, and I've got him guarding an excavation. Who's going to steal an excavation? <laughs> Mayor's orders. He's afraid somebody will fall in and sue the city. Well, of all the crooks and hoodlums all over the place, and the only able-bodied cop in town is standing in a mud hole. <laughs> you run your department like a flatfoot. What, you... Commissioner, that's a word I take exception to. Well, that's all you are, a typical flatfoot. If I couldn't run the department better than all that... All right, if you know so much, why don't you go out and get the evidence on this guy? Why, George, I could. All better... right, all right, go ahead. You bring us the evidence, and we'll put that guy in the jug so fast his head'll spin. Yeah, Commissioner, why don't you? Well, suppose he suspected I was up to something. Oh, you got nothing to worry about. He'd never take you for anything but a politician. Come to shake him down, maybe. Oh, thank you, Floyd Munson. I don't know that I'm crazy about going there alone, though. Suppose the fellow was armed. Floyd will go with you. Oh, well, hold on now. I don't know. I got the shop here. Well, make your deputies, both of you. Then you'll have the law behind you. Deputies? Well, can you do that? Can I? Huh. Raise your right hand. Yeah. You too, Floyd. Okay. You do solemnly swear to uphold the laws of Chartered City, Summerfield, to help you? It's done. <laughs> <laughs> what is that, Latin? You mean we're deputies? You're deputies. Well, what do you know? Where's the badge? Where's... Well, here. Here, I'll lend you mine. But don't lose it. I'll pin it on my chest. <sighs> there. <laughs> How do I look? Well, I'll be darned. Now you look exactly like a flatfoot. Oh! <laughs> the great Gilded Sleeve will be back in a few moments. You know, on work days, most of us don't find time to thoroughly enjoy breakfast. In our house, for example, there always seems to be a mad scramble. At our house, too, Mr. Lang. But I try to see that my family gets a proper start for the day by selecting foods which provide plenty of nourishment. And, as most women know, the spread you serve with bread and hot toast is one of the most nourishing foods on your breakfast menu. Millions of women have found that parquet margarine has both the nourishment and flavor that satisfies early morning appetites. Well, parquet's flavor is certainly delicious when it's melting into piping hot toast. Yes, on toast, pancakes, or waffles, parquet is still unmatched for flavor. And parquet margarine is one of the best energy foods you can buy. It's made from wholesome, highly refined vegetable oils. And to help produce that sweet, dairy-like flavor for which parquet is famous... Kraft blends in freshly pasteurized, cultured skim milk. So, even if you do have to hurry through breakfast, make it a good nourishing one by including delicious, economical parquet margarine. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by Kraft. <laughs> Summerfield from the depredations of Sartorius the palm reader, he has organized a private safari to smoke him out. The expedition consists of Gildersleeve and Floyd Munson, whom we pick up now as they approach the Swami's place of business. Well, 
What do we do now, Commissioner? We go in. What do you think? Sure. Okay. Sure, let's go in. I will admit, I, I don't like them black curtains in the window. Anything could go on behind a curtain like that. That silly black curtain is part of the show. This fellow's in business, Floyd. He's got to treat us like any other suckers. Well, take that badge off your vest. It's sticking out. Oh, I thought it might scare him a little. If he thinks you're a cop, he'll shoot you. Stick it in your back pocket. Okay. <laughs> now, come on. All right. I guess we can handle them between us. There won't be anything to handle. Don't worry. Gee, he's got one of those bells when you open the door. It's like Peavy. Yeah, but where is everybody? Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. <laughs> you wish a reading from Sartoria? Uh, yes, we do. Well, if you will kindly be seated, I will ask the master to see you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. I know what you're thinking, Floyd, but don't say it. I bet you were thinking the same thing, wasn't you, Commissioner? Maybe I was, maybe I wasn't. Kindly remember what we're here for. Oh, I know. She's just part of the act. Well, I'll let a dame like that read my tea leaves any day. <laughs> Shh, shut up. Here comes somebody. Gentlemen, Sartorius greets you. Sartorius welcomes you. Sartorius awaits your pleasure. Well, uh, we just want a reading, if that's what you call it, my friend and I. You both wish reading? Yeah, both of us. Two bucks apiece, is that right? Sartorius's fee is two dollars for a complete reading of the palm past, present, and future. Uh, paid in advance? And that is Sartorius's policy. Eh? It's... Well, here's five dollars for both of us. You got change? Sartorius never carries money. Oh. Kalinga! Kalinga! Yes, master? The gentleman offers money. Yeah. Can you change a five, miss? I want to pay for both of us. Thank you. Here's a dollar. Uh, thank you. Well, go ahead, Floyd. Okay. Can you work on me right here, Doc? I don't care if my friend hears whatever you say. Very well. Kalinga, the light, please. Yes, master? And the music. Yes, master. And now, sir, your hand. Shoot. Oh, no, 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 no. The right hand. Oh. The left hand is the hand of birth, the unwritten scroll. The right is the hand of development. The right hand shows what we have made of ourselves, how we have used our opportunities. Gee, I never knew that. Did you ever know that, Mr. Gibbs? It's quiet, Floyd. Let's get on with it. Hmm. A very interesting hand, sir. You must do some kind of highly skilled work. A dentist? A doctor? No, but you're close. Sartorius will now examine the lifeline. Long and full. Long and full. Uh, you were seriously ill when you were about 15? Well, not so very serious. Chicken pox. <laughs> it may have been more serious than you think. Still, you will live a long time. Oh, gee, that's good. Will I make any money? You will prosper steadily. You will continue in your present profession. Uh, you are married, are you not? Yep. Married 12 years. Mm. Uh, does the name Tootsie mean anything to you? Nope. Curious. There's something about your hand that suggests the name Tootsie. Hey, wait a minute. When I and the wife started going together, I called her Tootsie. Well, what do you know? Then your wife will be the only woman in your life. Yeah? Oh, well... <laughs> That is all, sir. Sartorius has spoken. That's all? Boy, that's a fast two dollars. Sartorius has spoken. Now, the other gentleman, please. Uh, get up, Floyd. Get up. Move over. It's my turn. Okay. Okay. Uh, right hand? Yes. The right hand is the hand of development. The right hand shows what we have made of ourselves. Yes, I heard all that. Go on with the reading. Sartorius will read the past, the present, and the future. Sartorius will... No, no. Stop the music. <laughs> What's the matter? Sartorius will be unable to read the gentleman's palm. Unable? Why? There are some things man must not know. <laughs> but, but, 
What is it you don't want to tell me? If Kalingo. You... Yes, master? Return the gentleman's fee, please. Now, wait a minute. Are you trying to scare me? Sartorius has spoken. Your two dollars, sir. Yeah, but I... Good day, gentlemen. The door, Kalinga. Good day, gentlemen. So long. Wait a minute. I've got a right... Oh! Ain't no use, Commissioner. They locked us out. Come on, let's get out of here. All right, but by George, now I'm convinced he's a swindler. Well, I ain't so sure now. He's crooked. Why didn't he take your two dollars? Too smart. He knew I was someone important, and he didn't dare. No, no, he was going to read your hand, but then he looked at it, and it stopped him cold. But why? I don't know. I heard of cases where they won't read your hand because you're going to... Well, because something's going to happen to you. Something's going to happen? Yeah, like I kn- what? I knew a fellow they wouldn't read his hand. Next day, he fell out of an eight-story window, broke both legs and his neck. Kill him? You said it. I don't care. This fellow Sartorius is nothing but a faker. Yeah? He knew I had chicken pox. No, he didn't. You told him. Well, what about Tootsie? Can't get around that. He could have heard about that. Not a chance. I ain't thought of the name in ten years. <laughs> don't exactly fit her anymore, you know. <laughs> well, it's still no miracle. Tootsie's one of the commonest nicknames there is. Everybody that ever lived had a, well, he knew a girl named Tootsie. Have you? No. All right, then. Let's give credit where credit is due. The guy's a pretty fair fortune teller. I should have known better than to take you on a scientific investigation like this. You're stupid, ignorant, and superstitious. Superstitious? Commissioner, I think that's going a little far. All right, think it. From now on, I'll handle this thing myself. Whenever it's too early to call you up for supper, may your days be merry and bright, and may all your Christmas... Well, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. What can I do you for this evening? Joke me no jokes, Peavy. I'm not in the mood. How about a nice cherry phosphate? Great pepper up there, they tell me. Take more than a cherry phosphate to help me. I've been trying to save the community, Peavy, and the community doesn't want to be saved. Well, that's the way of the world, Mr. Gildersleeve. What particular reform have you been working on? Been trying to run a swindler out of town, that's all. And I get no cooperation from the courts, no cooperation from the police department, no help from anybody. Who's the swindler? Anybody I know? Well, you may have heard of him. This fellow calls himself Sartorius. Claims to be a palm reader. Oh, Mrs. Peavy spoke of him just yesterday. Well, I hope she hasn't gone to consult him. Don't let her go near him, Peavy. Why? The man's a common swindler. Nobody can predict the future you know darn well. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Peavy, there's no such thing as being, well, too open-minded. Now, I know you believe there are two sides to every question. That's me. But on some questions, intelligent people ought to agree. Now, surely you're not superstitious. No, no, no. I mean supernatural stuff. Palm reading, telling fortunes with cards, crystal ball gazers, and so on. You don't believe in that kind of stuff, do you? Well, I wouldn't say I believe in it, no. On the other hand... On the other hand, she had warts. <laughs> I tell you, Peavy, there are no two sides to this question. Are there? Well, if you don't want to hear what I was going to say... Well, not I... if it's some supernatural theory. No theory, Mr. Gildersleeve, just fact. Now, my cousin married a woman that claimed she had the gift of second sight. She claimed she had it. So what? What if I claim I can fly? Nobody'd believe it. <laughs> but if you don't want to hear what my cousin's wife did one time, just say so. I'm not one of these fellows that likes to talk just to hear himself talk, you know. I'm sorry, Petey. Go ahead. Tell me about your cousin's wife. Well, one day she went on a little trip. And coming home, all of a sudden, she had this vision. She saw her husband drowning. My cousin. What do you mean? She saw him drowning? Just like a picture, she said. There he was in the water going down for the third time. So she rushed home, and when she got there, what do you think she found? He was washing his hands. He was washing the car. (laughs) Well, he was. (laughs) Forget it, Peavy. You know, when I came in here, I was a little worried. I'll admit that. I went to see this fellow Sartorius, thinking to get some evidence against him, and he refused to read my palm. You don't say. Yeah. (laughs) Even refunded my money. But it's all part of the act, don't you see? Well, no, I wouldn't say that. Huh? If that fella gave up two dollars, he must know something. He knows there's one born every minute, that's all. Good night, Peavy. And thanks for cheering me up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, bushwalk. All right, Leroy, you've been stalling around long enough. Now go to bed. I'm not stalling, Uncle. I was just putting my books together neatly so I can find them in the morning. Very laudable, but these inspirations have got to strike you earlier, my boy. Now beat it. Okay. And that doesn't mean reading in bed for an hour, either. Lights out. Gosh, why did you have to think of that? Huh? Okay, Uncle. Good night. See you in the morning. Yes, uh... Doorbell, I'll go on. Leroy, I'm perfectly capable of answering Hello, my... Leroy. What's happened, Leela? The money. I got a wire. Some old stock that Beauregard left me. It's suddenly worth goodness knows how much. What? You see, everything's worked out just like Mr. Sartori is saying. Isn't it thrilling? Drop, Martin. Aren't you going to say anything? <laughs> <laughs> Leela, I don't feel very good. Leroy, don't leave me. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve again in just a moment. A little while ago, I was talking about the hurry-up breakfast many of us have on work days. Now, I think it's equally true that we try to enjoy a leisurely breakfast on Sunday. Most of us want something a little different for Sunday breakfast, such as pancakes, waffles, French toast, or hot bread. And to make these good foods really hit the spot, I'd like to recommend that you try spreading them with parquet margarine. Here's a spread that millions prefer for its fresh, sweet flavor. And on hot foods, parquet margarine really proves why it's still unmatched for flavor. Another wonderful thing about parquet is that you can enjoy this fine-flavored margarine for only about half the price of costly spreads. Try it soon. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. The quality spread for bread made by the Kraft Foods Company. Well, of course, it's probably just a coincidence. But anyway, Leela, what the heck? We all got to go sometime. Here today and gone tomorrow. What I say is, if you've only got a short time to live, you might as well make the most of it. I think you're right, Rockmore. Yes, sir. Loaf of bread, a jug of wine, and thou. Eat, drink, and be merry. Hey, hey. Hey, Leela? That's right. Leela, would you go to church with me tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekin. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. Now a parting reminder. Don't forget to buy those delicious prepared mustards and Kraft's famous line of quality foods. First, there's a tangy golden Kraft salad mustard, the one that adds such flavor zest to salad dressings, gravies, barbecue sauce, and cooked egg and cheese dishes. Second, there's a sharper variety, Kraft mustard with nippy horseradish added for zipping up the flavor of frankfurters and for blending into tasty sauces for fish. Buy both kinds and please the whole family. Ask for Kraft horseradish mustard and Kraft salad mustard. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> it's
It's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Come on in. Oh, hello, Judge. What brings you here so early in the morning? It isn't particularly early for most people. Leela and I have a little business to discuss with you. Well, sit down then. Here, Leela, you take the sofa. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's this all about? Well, I brought Leela here this morning, Frog Morton, to ask your help in hammering a little sense into her. What? <laughs> you couldn't have made a worse beginning, Horace. What is it he wants you to be sensible about, Leela? Money. You know that money I got from that old stock of Beauregard? Doesn't amount to as much as I'd hoped, of course, but then I didn't think it would. Be that as it may, Leela, the sum is substantial enough to be invested, rather than frittered away on knickknacks and finery. Finery? Throckmorton, I've hardly got a stitch of clothes I'm not ashamed to be seen in. Oh, now, Leela, I was just going to say, I think that's a very neat little outfit you're wearing. <laughs> Do you really like it, Throckmorton? I really do. Cute blouse. <laughs> oh, you should see the dinner dress I bought. It has bows all down the front. See, I'd like to see that. <laughs> I hesitate to interrupt this touching exchange, but I'm a busy man. I can only devote a certain amount of time to this discussion. Now, the fact is that if Leela will invest this windfall in annuities, it can be a great comfort to her later on. Well, how much will it bring in, Judge? Well, roughly around $17 a month. Yes. Isn't that simply ridiculous, Rock Martin? What on earth could I do with $17 a month? She can't live on that, Judge. Of course not. But added to her other income, it may someday prevent her becoming a burden on her family. I have no intention of becoming a burden on anyone, especially on my own family. Uh, yeah. <laughs> The trouble with annuities, though, Judge, is that you have to wait so long for them. That all depends. I was figuring this one to start paying Leela at uh, age 60. Now, that wouldn't be... Horace, I will ask you to remember that I am only 32. Oh, now, dear. <laughs> Old age is something we've got to face. Why not make up your mind to it? I'll face it when it arrives, but not before. I'm certainly not going to rush ahead of myself looking for it. That's reasonable, Horace. It's nothing of the kind. The trouble with you two is, just because old age seems disagreeable, you haven't got the courage to face it. But I'm realistic. I'm facing it squarely. You're looking it right in the eye, brother. <laughs> and it's looking right back at you. <laughs> I'm only 55. Well, if a man of 55 doesn't start thinking about old age, it's because he's too old to think at all. <laughs> now, Leela and I are something else again. Uh, you're a couple of idiots if you ask me. What? Listen, Judge, just because you're beginning to run down is no reason to expect everybody else to do the same. You want everybody else to act like a tired old goat just because you do. I beg your pardon? I think it'll do Leela good to get out and spend a little money, buy a few things, and maybe invest the balance. Now, that sounds really sensible, if there's any left over. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you decide to make your investments, Leela, you may consult Mr. Gildersleeve with respect thereto. I came to advise, and I've been insulted. Good day. Oh, now, Horace, don't get sore. I'm not sore. I'm merely disgusted. No, no, don't bother to show me out. Good day, Leela. You aren't mad, are you, Horace? Ah. Oh. oh, well, we needed a new door anyway. <laughs> Leela, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Right. You're looking so darn cute, I'm going to insist on your coming to dinner this evening. For having roast pork. Oh, Throck Martin, you're a darling. Must I wear my new dinner dress with the bows all down the front? Absolutely. <laughs> More coffee, Leela? I still have some, thank you. How about another piece of Bertie's delicious lemon pie? Oh, I couldn't. It's awfully good, Bertie. It turned out pretty good at that. I can go for another slice, Aunt. <laughs> I bet you could. Uh, Marjorie? No, thanks. You might just put it in the icebox, Bertie. I may look in on it later. Yes, sir. Hey, Aunt, can I go to the movie 
please with Marge and Ben. What? You may not, Leroy. I wouldn't have to sit with them. Leroy, it shouldn't be necessary to have this argument with you every time your sister goes to a movie. You know your bedtime. But it always stays the same. Gosh, even a kid can grow up, you know. I'm watching you carefully for signs of it. <laughs> what, uh, what picture are you going to, Margaret? Dink Stevens. Have you seen it? No. Who's in it? Who's in it? Dink Stevens. He's it. The title of it is Kiss Me Hello, I think, but it doesn't matter. Haven't you seen Dink Stevens? I don't believe so. Have you, Ralph Marge? Never heard of him. What happened to Vanny or Bunny or whoever it was? I thought he was all the rage. <laughs> you mean Van Johnson? Or do you mean Sonny Tuck? How should I know who I mean? Well, I used to like them. They're all right. But Dinky, he's like Bob Walker, only he has freckles. And his nose is cuter. Mm, I like Gregory Peck. Sure, he's all right. Has this uh, new fellow got any particular talent, may I ask? Does he sing, dance, juggle? Why should he? Everyone is simply crazy about him. Oh, but why? What can he do? What's his big secret? He wears his hat on the side of his head and chews grass. <laughs> oh, well, that doesn't sound so wonderful. You have to see him. Well, there's Ben. I'll let him in, huh? Yeah, bring him into the dining room, my boy. Perhaps he'd like a cup of coffee. Okay. I don't think I have time for a cup of coffee. Marge and I are going to catch the early show. Come on in, Ben. Oh, everybody in there? Good evening, Mr. Gillespie. Uh, hello, Miss Ransom. Hi, Marge. Oh, <laughs> Good evening, Ben. Uh, pull up a chair, why don't you? Well, I don't know. Marge and I were going to the movies. Going to see somebody named Dink Stevens, I understand. Shoes is cud, Marjorie tells me. <laughs> huh? Leroy told Unky about that picture where Dink was chewing on a blade of grass all the time, remember? Oh, yeah. Didn't even take it out when he kissed her. <laughs> he's quite a guy. I can't say I'd be particularly crazy about that. Oh, well, he's not... It's not the kind of a picture that would appeal to old folks. Old folks? Well, my mom didn't like it either. Hey, you better get your hat and coat, huh, Marge? Yes, I guess I'd better. Will you excuse us, Unky, Mrs. Ransom? Certainly. Hey, wait a minute, Ben. I want to show you something before you go. Oh, we can't, Leroy. We have to rush. Come on, Ben, and we'll miss the cartoon. Good night, Mrs. Ransom. Good night. Good night, folks. Good night. Have a good time. We will. You have a good time, too. We'll have a good time, all right. Don't worry about us, eh, Leela? <laughs> Leela, what's the matter? Nothing. Well, that's good. I thought maybe... Leela, what is it? Oh, Throckmorton, Horace was right. Hooker was right? About what? About me getting old. I am. I'm not 32, Throckmorton. I'm... I'm 36. Hmm. Well, what of it? Who said 36 was old? Well, you heard Ben just now. He thinks of us as old folks. Now, Leela, Ben didn't mean to hurt your feelings. He's just thoughtless. My gosh, 36. <laughs> I'm 37. <laughs> Even 37. Look, I'm 42. But you know something? I always think of you as much younger than I am. I'm five years younger. I think of you as much younger than that. Well, I think of you as being, well, too young for me. Oh, do you, Throckmorton? You bet. Why, well, sometimes when I take you out, I'm afraid people will say, look at that fellow robbing the cradle. <laughs> That's really a fact, Leela. Tell you what, mm -hmm. if you're not ashamed to be seen in public with a fella twice your age... Oh, silly. Why don't we run down to the Majestic and see this picture with Dink Stevens, huh? Maybe we can figure out what causes the craze. Well, if you want to... Sure, if the kids enjoy him, he must have something. If he's got anything, we can enjoy it, too. After all, there's a little bit of kid in everybody, isn't there? Let's go and see. <laughs> The great Gilded Sleeve will be back in a few moments. Mr. Lang, there seems to be quite a difference in spreads for bread. Indeed there is, especially in flavor. I do my best to point that out every time I talk about parquet margarine. Well, until I changed to parquet margarine some time ago, I noticed that my family wasn't too enthusiastic about some of the spreads I'd been serving. But now you're steady users of parquet margarine, I take it. <laughs> yes, we are. I serve it at every meal. Because on hot toast for breakfast... 
Or on bread and rolls for lunch and dinner, it, it always tastes just right. Well, that's what millions of families have discovered. Parquet's unmatched flavor has made it one of America's favorite spreads for bread. And it's surprising how economical Parquet is. Yes, it's only about half the price of costly spreads. And along with Parquet's fresh, satisfying flavor, you can always be sure of getting an abundant supply of nourishment. Parquet is one of the finest energy foods you can serve. And it's also fortified with important vitamin A. So if you haven't changed to Parquet margarine yet, now is a good time to do it. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, made by the Kraft Foods Company. Now let's get back to Gildersleeve and his old friend and neighbor, Leela Ransom, whose search for their youth has led them to the loges at the Majestic Theater. There they sit, surrounded by all the young things of Summerfield. Leela primly with her coat thrown over the back of her seat. Gildersleeve hunkered down with his coat piled on his lap and his head sagging on his chest. Rock mm. On the screen, Dink Stevens, clad in bathing trunks, has just flopped down on the sand, nose to nose with Linda somebody. They look into each other's eyes. Happy. Skinny little guy, isn't he? Oh, I don't know. His ears stick out. Look, seagulls. Yeah. Pretty. It's a wonder she wouldn't wear some clothes. Oh, I don't know. Why? You know something? What? You're pretty. <laughs> This is the dullest picture I ever saw. Right, Martin. But nothing happens. Tell me something. What? Where'd you get those big blue eyes? Oh, brother. <laughs> and that cute little turned up nose. The great lover. <laughs> you know what you need? What? A good big kid. You can't touch me. So help me if he chases her, I'm walking right out of here. <laughs> there he goes. She isn't even mine. Oh. 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 Look at that, Leela, hugging and kissing. Leela, are you enjoying this? Are you? I asked you first. Do you suppose it would be terrible if we laughed? <laughs> oh, shush yourself. Come on, Leela. wrong with us. What's wrong? What do you mean? Well, it, it seems like I don't enjoy movies much anymore somehow. Well, no, anybody could enjoy that movie. If you ask me, the whole picture was childish and idiotic. Well, people all around us seem to be enjoying it. Children and idiots. <laughs> I'm afraid we're getting older, Throckmorton. That's all. Maybe the movies are just getting worse. You ever think of that, Leela? Come on, let's get a soda or something. I may even have a banana split. Peavy, my lads, you've got customers here for a couple of banana splits. Set them up. Mr. Gildersleeve, didn't you hear about bananas? Go to bottom. There aren't any. <laughs> oh, nuts. Now that you mention it, I'm out of nuts, too. 
What have you got? Well, that's the question. I have the plain vanilla ice cream. Is that all you got? I guess that's about the gist of it. <laughs> Leela, what do you have? Well, I believe what I'd like is hot chocolate. That is, if you have... Now, hot chocolate, I've got. I keep it ready on the burner here at all times. It's a good cold weather drink. I even like to take a little nip now and then myself. <laughs> That's when nobody's looking. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, how about you? Oh, give me the same. I had my heart set on a banana split, though. You would sleep better on a hot chocolate. <laughs> Seems to be quite a seasonal item, hot chocolate. Now, in winter, for instance, I, I sell quite a bit of it. In the spring, I don't sell too much. And in summer, I sell even less. <laughs> I'll go farther than that. I'll say I don't sell any. Yes, yes. Then in the fall again, the sales begin to pick up a little. And in the winter... You sell more. Uh, that's right. <laughs> there you are. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Careful. It's hot. <laughs> you folks been to the movies, have you? We've just come from my Kiss Me Hello. Mrs. Peavy and I saw it Sunday night. Good picture. We thought it was a terrible picture. Well, it wasn't so much when you come right down to it. <laughs> wasn't so much. It was no good at all. You're right. It was no good at all. <laughs> and why do you tell us it was good? Well, every man's entitled to his opinion. <laughs> all right. It but... wasn't my opinion, but I... Thought it might be yours. <laughs> I don't pretend to know anything about pictures anyway. Mrs. Peavy and I very seldom go. What do you do, uh, you and Mrs. Peavy? Do? Yes. Tell us something, Peavy. You're getting pretty well along in the years. Tell us. What's it like? What's what like? <laughs> to be, well, you know, to be getting along. Uh, to be. To be old? Yes. It's a darn nuisance. <laughs> But there's one thing about it. Oh, what's that? It could be worse. Oh, how do you mean? Well, if I weren't married. Uh, happily married, that is. Well, if you've got someone to grow old with, it, it isn't so bad. Maybe you're right. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, say, Phoebe. Yes? Uh, <laughs> forgot what I was going to ask you. Go ahead, go ahead. I remember as a young fellow, I, I used to dread growing old when I thought about it at all. But now that I'm there, well, it's kind of pleasant. Mrs. Peavy and I, we have our evenings at home together. That's when I'm not down here at the shop. Sometimes we play Chinese checkers or we may read aloud to each other from some book. Uh, you know, people ought to do more of that kind of thing. That's what I say. After all, what does a man want? To go around Ned raising Ned forever? <laughs> Peavy, by George, you're the only man in this whole town who knows what it's all about. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Come along, Leela, getting on towards bedtime. Good night, Peavy. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Ransom. Good night, Mr. Peavy, and thank you for having changed my whole life. Well, did I do that? <laughs> Leroy, I want you to pick up this junk and get it out of here. Mrs. Ransom. Again? She was over last night. I know that. Doorbell, birdie. Let me take your things. I'll take them. Here, Uncle, you sit here. Make yourself comfortable. I'll sit over by the fire. Yes, now, Leroy, I'm afraid it's your bedtime, my boy. Oh, I'm going to have to. Can't I just watch the fire a little? Oh, yes, Rockmorton. Do let him stay down a while. But, Leela, I thought we were going to, you know, spend the family evening. Read aloud to each other. Well, why not read something Leroy would enjoy, too? Yeah. Well, that's an idea. <laughs> it would make it more of a family evening having children around. Well, why don't we read? I've got a super comic book, Murder Comics. <laughs> I just started it. There'll be none of that. 
What about one of those nice books you got for Christmas? They were fairly grown up, some of them. Which one? Anyone. What was the book your Aunt Hattie sent you? I never heard of it. The name of it is Pickwick Papers. Pickwick Papers. My boy, that's a classic. Yeah? Dickens. Dickens' famous and beloved story. Why, Pickwick Papers is one of the funniest books ever written. I've always been intending to read Pickwick Papers. Ideal book to read aloud. Where's the book, Leroy? I don't know. It was around here somewhere. Only four weeks since Christmas and you've lost it already? Bet you haven't even written to thank your aunt for it. Leroy, if you'd I only learn... it. Yeah, here it is, Uncle. Um. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, handsomely bound volume with illustrations. Look, here's Sam Weller. Who's he? One of the characters. Great character. One of Dickens' greatest creations. What did he do? Well, you'll find out as we get into the story. <laughs> you see, Leroy. Go ahead, Throckmorton. Let's see now. Where does it begin? Uh, here we are. Chapter one. The Pickwickians. You comfortable? You bet. Leela? Mm-hmm. I'll just curl up here like a kitten. This is such fun. Go ahead. All right. Hi, George. I'm glad I thought of this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, first ray of light which illumines the gloom and converts into a dazzling brilliancy that obscurity in which the earlier history of the public career of the immortal Pickwick would appear to be involved is derived from the perusal of the following entry (laughs) in the transactions of the Pickwick Club, which the editors of these papers feel the highest pleasure in laying before his readers as a proof of the careful attention, indefatigable assiduity, and nice discrimination with which his search among the multifarious documents confided to him, has been conducted. Yep, it's classic, all right. (laughs) Well, I guess I'll go to bed. Why, Leroy, I've only read one sentence. Yeah, and it was a (laughs) piff. I thought you said it was funny. It is funny. You should listen to Abbott and Costello a few times. They're really funny. Who's on second base? No, no, who's on first? Leroy, go to bed. Now, let me catch you listening to that radio again. You read every word of this book. Myself? To yourself. Now, go to bed and go to sleep. Say good night to Mrs. Ransom. Good night, Leroy. Good night, Mrs. Ransom. I'll be seeing you. I'm sorry you can't stay down and enjoy the book with us, but... Well, uh, you know how it is. Have to get started early in the morning. School and everything, so better say good night. Good night. Night, Uncle. Um. Good night, Leroy. Darn kid, radio, comic books, Abbott and Costello. What kind of a world do they live in? Well, start over here again. <laughs> the first ray of light which illumines the gloom and converts into a dazzling brilliancy that obscurity in which... Throckmorton. Yes, Leela? Uh, let's not read any more tonight, Throckmorton. Uh, your eyes must be tired. Let's just sit here and talk, shall we? Well, sure, if you'd rather. What will we talk about? Let's talk about life. Okay. You know, I've been thinking ever since we had that talk with Mr. Peavy last night. I've been thinking a lot. And I've decided there are certain things in life you just have to face. And once you face them, you feel a lot better. I've felt better all day. What kind of things, Leela? You mean growing old? Well, not just that, but... Well, every girl believes that someday a Prince Charming will come into her life. A, a perfect knight who will sweep off her feet and carry away with him to a life of eternal bliss. Yeah, well... But sooner or later, there comes a day when she has to face the fact that Prince Charming isn't coming, ever. And that she'd do much better just to, to settle down with some nice person who's kind and, and thoughtful and sort of comfortable to have around. Someone like you, Throckmorton. I see. Well, you may be right. Of course you're right. We're not chickens anymore, either one of us. Why don't we act our age? That's right. Like Peavy said, growing old isn't so bad if you have somebody to grow old with. Someone to spend your evening with. And we have a lot of things in common, Throckmorton. Our love of good books, for instance. Pickwick papers. That ought to hold us for a couple of years. And, and music. You sing and I can play. Why, well, we could spend whole evenings at the piano. Play something now, Leela. Uh, what would you like me to play? I don't know. Something restful. But what? Oh, anything. Just let me sit here with the fire and close my eyes and you play for me. I don't see much fun in that. I'll tell you. I'll play for you if you sing. Oh, but I'm tired, Leela. I've had a hard day at the office, and I'm not as young as I was once. Oh, now, it won't do you any harm to come over here and sing. It will do you good. All right. Well, what do you want me to sing? Huh? 
What would you like to sing? What do you want me to sing? We could spend a couple of years this way, too. <laughs> Rock, Martin. One of the important things in growing old gracefully is to learn to give in gracefully to the wishes of the other person. Now sing something pretty for Lena. Darling, I am growing old. Oh, not, not that, Rock Martin, please. Why not? It's a fact, isn't it? We agreed we were going to act our age. Well, let's face it. Come on. That's it. La, la, la. Hey, I'd forgotten that one. We used to sing that when we were younger. Remember? Just a little love, a little kiss. Just an hour that holds a world of bliss. As I hold you fast and bend above you. Leela. Age. A man's as old as he feels, Lily. And right now, I feel great. Yoo-hoo! Oh, Rockmart! <laughs> Maybe we're not as old as we think we are, Leela. <laughs> We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve again in just a moment. I'd like to suggest again that no matter what spread for bread you've been serving in the past, one taste of parquet margarine should prove to your family why millions prefer it to any other brand. Parquet's fresh, delicate flavor makes breads of all kinds taste extra good. You'll discover there's a difference both in smooth spreading texture and in flavor. And that's because Kraft takes such special care in blending the fine, wholesome farm products that are used in producing parquet. So be sure to compare parquet's fresh, dairy-like flavor with any spread for bread you may have used in the past. See for yourself how delighted your family will be with this spread that tastes so good. Ask your dealer for delicious, economical parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by Kraft. Good night, Rock Martin. I've had a lovely time. So have I, Leela. Well, good night. Good night. <laughs> good night, everybody. <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekham. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. Looking for something special in mustard? Be sure to try Kraft Salad Mustard. This tangy, golden salad mustard is prepared to Kraft's own special recipe. It's made of choice mustard seed, mild vinegar, and fragrant spices. Has just the right touch of flavor you need for pepping up cooked dishes, gravies, sandwich spreads, cheese fondues, Welsh rabbits, and fish. So for extra flavor in so many appetizing ways, buy Kraft salad mustard. And pick up a jar of Kraft horseradish mustard, too, on your next shopping trip. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Taft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah.
It's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Now let's join The Great Gildersleeve. Uh, continued cold westerly winds, possible snow. <sighs> Wish winter was over. Russ British Row in UNO meet. Row, row, row. Why can't those fellows learn to get along? By George, if I was there. Bevan hollering at Vashinsky, Vashinsky hollering at Bevan. Call themselves diplomats. Hello, is Piggy there? Hi, Mrs. Banks. Wonder what good it does for two fellows to holler at each other in different languages. Hi, Pig. Hey, come on over and let's build a snow fort. Uh -huh. Listen, we can build a super fort. I've got it started already with a great big snowball. Uh -huh. Corn's sake, who wants to go skiing? Skiing for sissy. Besides, it's no fun. Well, you never want to do anything I want to do. You always want to do something else. All right, when you want me to do something, you dirty guy. Leroy. How are you? Goodbye. Hey, Uncle, you want to help me build a snow fort? No, thank you, Leroy. Well, then there's nothing for me to do. Gosh, I might as well not be Saturday. Isn't there somebody you can play with besides Piggy? No. What about Ralph? Got the flu. What about Everett? His mother's making him work. Not a bad idea. <laughs> what about uh, Sylvester? He wanted to build a fort at his house. Then why not go over and help him? Build a whole fort for him? Wouldn't hardly get any use out of it myself. <laughs> Leroy, that's no way to approach this thing. Sit down here for a minute. Where? Uh, anywhere. <laughs> I want to talk to you. Now. Did you read the morning paper? Sure. Good. Then no doubt you read about the difficulties the United Nations seem to be having over in London? Oh, I, I sort of skimmed over the front page. Yes. <laughs> to the funnies, I suppose. Oh, no, I read the sports, too. Sports and comics. We're living in an atomic age, my boy. The problems of the atomic age will not be solved by Dick Tracy. I'd like to know who have a better chance. <laughs> Seems to me you're old enough to be taking an active interest in the world, my boy. You ought to know what's going on. Going on where? In the world. There's trouble going on over in Greece. And the British think one way about it, and the Russians think another way. There's a devil to pay over the whole business. So what? So they'll never get along if they don't stop hollering. Like you and your little friends. How? Because you won't listen to reason. You want to settle everything your own way. Shouting at Piggy just now. That's disgraceful. I've spoken to that before. You have? Repeatedly. You talk to your friends so rudely, it's a wonder you have any. You ought to hear the way they talk to me. You... Well, that's no excuse. And I think if you try to practice a little graciousness, you might find yourself more popular. I am popular. I was voted the tenth most popular kid in 7B. <laughs> well, we needn't go into that. But if you try to remember, my... Excuse me, Mr. Gilsley, you got a minute? Of course, Bertie. Try to remember, Leroy. Okay. Well, what is it, Bertie? I'm trying to lay out my schedule for tomorrow, Mr. Gilsey. You want Sunday dinner at noon or in the evening? Doesn't really matter, Bertie. Have it either time, and I'll guarantee to do it justice. <laughs> then I'll have it in the evening. All right. Say, uh, Bertie, I was just thinking. It's been quite a while since we had one of your remarkable lemon pies. You know what I think of your remarkable lemon pies, Bertie. I ought to, Mr. Gilsey. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, mere words can't express the way I feel about your lemon pie, Bertie. Uh, do you think possibly... Uh, I'll make one for tomorrow night if you like. Is that soon enough? I shall possess my soul in patience, Bertie. Your pie will make a beautiful end to a beautiful day. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful pie, beautiful pie. Lemon meringue or lemon chiffon. Oh, well, I guess they're both the same. Uh, doorbell. I heard it. I want Leroy to play with you. Leroy, he's around here somewhere. Come in, Craig. I think maybe Leroy's upstairs. Yes, he did go upstairs. Hello, Craig. I want Leroy to play with me. Well, he should... If the house isn't falling down, here he comes. You ask him. Leroy, do you remember what I told you? What? Oh, yeah. 
Well, I suppose he's better than nothing. <laughs> How'd you like to build a snow fort, Craig? Okay. Atta boy. Come on, I've got it started already. If we really work, we can get it all done and put a roof on it. Okay. Hey, Uncle, where's my sweater? I had it just a minute ago. Sweater? On the sofa, Leroy, right where you threw it. Oh, yeah. Then when we get it finished, we can have all kinds of fun. I'll be the colonel and you can be the sergeant, okay? Is a sergeant higher than a colonel? Well, they're about the same. <laughs> Only the colonel gives the orders. Where did I leave my gloves, Unc? They're probably under the sofa. Well, what do you know? After we build a fort, can we have a snowball fight? Sure, Craig, anything you want. We'll take turns defending it. I bag first. Okay, I bag second. Well, I'll go, Unc. Peggy, I thought you were going skiing. Oh, I decided not to. I decided I'd rather build a snow fort. And besides, the snow is no good for skiing. It's perfect for building a fort. Hiya, Mr. Gildersleeve. Hiya, Piggy. Hi, Craig. Hi. Come on, let's build a fort. Yeah, let's go. Oh, uh, say, Craig, you better go home. We won't need you. Well, I'll be... Why not? You're too little. Come on, Piggy, let's get going. Leroy, come here to me. <laughs> Craig, you and Piggy go outside and start building the snow fort. Both of you, understand? Okay. But isn't Leroy... I want to have a word with Leroy. You go outside and start the fort, Piggy, or else go home. Is that clear? With Craig. Okay. Gosh, what did I do? Come on, Craig. Okay. Now, Leroy, you listen to me. A few minutes ago, you had no one to play with. Craig came over. You decided he was better than nobody. Okay, okay, I'll let him play. Let me finish. Your rudeness, your ingratitude, trying to shoo Craig away as soon as Piggy walks in the door. That's disgusting. By five minutes ago, you thought Piggy was terrible. What's the matter with you? I don't know. I know. The trouble with you is you're selfish. You think only of your fun, the dickens with everybody else. Now, if you try to think how to give Craig a pleasant morning, you might wind up having a nicer time yourself. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I guess so. Yes. Then see if you can go out and have a pleasant time. Just three boys playing happily together. Now, will you try? Yeah, I'll try. Where's my hat? Behind the chair over there. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Uncle. Come out and see the fort after a while. I will, my boy. <laughs> Tell me I don't know how to handle kids. Yes, sir. And if I was in London... <laughs> should I be feeling hungry? wonder if I eat more than I used to. Well, if I do, it's because I need it. Especially in the winter. <laughs> Leroy, I've asked you not to slam that door. It's not Leroy, Auntie, it's me. Marjorie, I'm surprised, my dear. I slammed it because I was running. Leroy and Piggy were throwing snowballs at me. Isn't Craig with them? Oh, yes, they're having some terrific battle or something. Hostilities ceased so they could all take a shot at me. <laughs> Just give those kids a couple of more years and they'll know better. <laughs> oh, I'm not so sure about Leroy. Whether he'll ever grow up, I mean. Don't worry, my dear. In the meantime, boys will be boys. That's their way of having fun. <laughs> For goodness sake, now what's the matter? Leroy hit me in the eye with a snowball. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> let, let me see it, Craig. Let me see it. Call Leroy in here, will you please, Marjorie? Okay. Craig, if you'll take your hand off your eye so I can look. It hurts. It's right in the eye. Leroy, come in here right away. Ah! Now, Craig, Marjorie, get me a pan of hot water, will you please? It's cold water. It's probably contusion. All right, contusion. Cold water, then. Leroy, come here. I didn't do anything. I'm just having a smoke. Craig says you hit him in the eye with a snowball. Is that true? I may have, accidentally. I have to duck, you know. He put a rock in his snowball. <laughs> That's a dirty lie. Leroy, I'll settle your hash later, young man. <laughs> now, Craig, let's be brave, my boy, shall we? Let's have a look at the eye. Well, now, that doesn't look so bad. Here, blow your little nose. I don't want it. Oh, for corn. <laughs> Water on you. Good. Now, Craig, if you just let me soak a little cold water on your eyes. I want to go. Yes. Well, this will help it, Craig. I want to go home. Maybe you're better at that. <laughs> Take him across the street, my dear, will you? I don't want anybody 
Mrs. Daisy, I'm going home. But Craig, watch him, my dear. Make sure he gets there. Okay, come on, Craig. Leave me alone! <laughs> now, Leroy. Well, no, we didn't want him in the game in the first place. He's too little. Never mind that. What's this about a rock and a snowball? I never put any rock in any snowball, honest. Craig couldn't have been doing all that yelling just from a nice, soft handful of snow. Who said they were soft? <laughs> I'll admit we were packing them, but God. I sent you out there to play happily with Craig and Piggy. I should think you could manage to play for an hour or so without making somebody cry. It was an accident, Unc. I swear it was an accident. Was the rock an accident? There wasn't any rock. Leroy, the weight of the evidence is against you. Craig is obviously suffering real pain. Oh! I regret, young man, that I'm going to have to punish you. In a way, you're not going to enjoy. But a rock and a snowball is a serious matter. It might be dangerous... Hey, Unky! Craig at home, all right? Yes, but now Mr. Bullard's tearing over here. He didn't even wait to put on a hat. Oh, well, show him in. You stay right here, Leroy. I want to see your uncle immediately. He's right in here, Mr. Bullard. Yeah, right in here, Bullard. Tell the slave I want to... Oh, there's the young scoundrel. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? <laughs> I'm just talking it over with Leroy, Mr. Bullard. Oh, you were? Well, let me tell you, Gildersleeve, this is no time for talk. What this boy needs is a punishment he'll remember. Now, just a minute. Don't interrupt. Putting a rock in a snowball is a criminal offense. And a boy who'll do a thing like that will soon be doing worse if you don't nip it in the bud. Now, are you going to give him a good sound thrashing? No, I'm not. <sighs> And why not, may I ask? Bullard, it's none of your business. I can raise my nephew without your advice. Well, when your nephew runs around like a young criminal, endangering the lives of smaller children, somebody ought to do something. And if you're unable to handle it... I can handle him very well. But in the future, you keep that little crybaby of yours at home where he belongs. Don't call my son a crybaby. Your nephew is a big bully. Oh, he is not. He's a fine boy. (laughs) Now get out of here, you. Get off the property. Don't worry. And keep your family off the property. All right, and you keep yours off mine. Oh, Marjorie, Leroy, from now on, there'll be no communication whatsoever with the Bullard family. Yes, Uncle. And I mean it! (laughs) Now, while the feud simmers and Gildersleeve boils, here's something else that will interest you. Mr. Lang, I happened to be in the store the other day when my grocer got in a supply of parquet margarine. I never saw anything grabbed up so fast. Well, by the time my friends got there, all the parquet had been sold. Well, we're sorry that supplies are so short, but you see, even though the Kraft Foods Company is making all the parquet margarine it possibly can with limited supplies, there still isn't enough to meet the big demand. Well, I certainly hope there'll be more parquet soon, because it's my family's favorite spread. <laughs> it's the favorite spread of millions. And that's why Kraft is doing its best to distribute parquet so that everyone gets a fair share. Well, that's just what my dealer said. And uh, did you by any chance notice something different on that package of parquet you bought? Different? Oh, it said they're adding more vitamin A to parquet margarine. That's right. Every pound of parquet margarine now being made contains 15,000 units of important vitamin A, making this delicious spread an even more valuable food in your family's daily diet. So be sure to look for Parquet Margarine. And if you can't always find it, please be patient. The Kraft Foods Company and your dealer appreciate your cooperation during the period of temporary shortage. Now back to the Great Gildersleeve. Sunday noon finds him with his niece and nephew just coming out of church. Fine sermon, Dr. Needham. Fine sermon. Uh, by George, it's a glorious day out. Brisk but sunny. Uh, good morning, Mrs. Carrington. My goodness, you're looking younger every day. Leroy, use your handkerchief. <laughs> yes, indeed, a fine sermon. Hello, Tom. Leela. <laughs> Hi. Uh, mind if I walk home with y'all? The shoe is on the other foot, Leela. Do you mind if we walk home with you? Rock, Martin, I declare, I believe you sweet talk every woman you see. <laughs> That's not so, Leela. Oh, I 
sit you there with old Mrs. Carrington telling her she was getting younger? Well, she couldn't get any older. <laughs> I'll never again believe a single nice thing you say to me. Yeah. Uh, you children walk on ahead, will you? Leela. Leroy, no more snowballs. I wasn't going to throw it up. I just wanted to... Oh, for goodness sake, there's Mr. Bullet and little Craig. Yeah. Huh? Oh, walking along there, right across the street. Leroy dropped that snowball. <laughs> Where do you suppose Mrs. Bullet is? Out of town again? If she is, I don't blame her married to that guy. Oh, I do hope she isn't sick. A call to him, Strockmont. You Leela, don't. He didn't hear me. You called. Don't him. speak to him, Leela. Why not, for goodness sake? Because I'm mad at him. Well, that's the silliest thing I ever heard. I'm certainly not going to let that stop me. You who, Mr. Bullard? It's him or me, Leela. If you talk to him... Oh, he sees us now. Excuse me, Frog Maud, and I'll just run over and inquire about his wife. All right, go ahead. That's women for you. Come on, Marjorie. Come on, Leroy. Hey, wait! <laughs> Tell me this is our dessert, Bertie. Well, this is only luck, Mr. Gillespie. You've got a whole big dinner coming tonight with lemon pie, remember? I know, but proof. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Gillespie, but that's the way you said you wanted it. Lunch in the middle of the day and dinner at night. Very well, Bertie. We'll eat our fruit. Oh, do I have to? Eat them, Leroy. They're delicious. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, Bertie. Yes, sir? Why the overcoat? Is the house so cold you have to wait on table in your mittens? <laughs> no, sir. I'm just going to run across the street for a minute. Across what street? Where? Over to the Bullard to borrow some lemons from Lily Bee. I got my pie crust already, and I found it didn't have no lemon. Bertie, under no circumstances, at any time whatsoever, are you to go to the Bullard for anything. Whatsoever. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. But Lily B ain't the Bullard. She's associated with him in a business way. Well, if you're going to make lemon pie, you've got to have lemons, at least the way I make it. I don't see what harm it would do if I just sneak around to the back Bertie, door. I would rather crawl on my hands and knees from here to Nome, Alaska for lemons and accept one as a favor from Rumpf and Bullard. Go downtown and buy some lemons, myself, on foot, right now. I won't even finish my dessert. Ha! <laughs> because it's prune. You will finish them, my boy. Ha! <laughs> Gentlemen, gentlemen. I'll be right with you. I'm just waiting on the judge here. Go right ahead, PV. No hurry. I'm just here on a matter of life and death. That's all. Well, thank you. Now, judge, what can I... Well, do? I'd like three bottles of Kalak water, my friend. Three uh, bottles of Kalak water it is. And I'm returning these three empty. Don't forget the deposit. Hmm. There we are. Three bottles of Kalak water. The deposit, Peavy. Don't forget about the deposit. Uh, the judge is worried about his deposit, Peavy. He's got a big investment there, 15 cents. Well, if it's agreeable to you, Judge, we can apply the deposit due you on the old bottles against the deposit I'd have to ask you for on the new one. Well, that arrangement would be perfectly satisfactory to me. Of course, I, I could pay you the money that's coming to you on these bottles. That's three bottles at five cents a piece, that's 15 cents. But then I'd have to turn right around and ask you to pay a deposit on these bottles, which would not also be 15 cents, you see? Fellows, I'm waiting. I understand. I understand, Peavy. I think the other arrangement would be simpler. Well, I just didn't want you to think I was putting anything over on you. <laughs> I quite understand. Just take it out of that, will you? Five mm, dollars. Yeah, there you are. Thank you very much, and call again. Now, Peavy, have you got any... Oh, God. Yes? I'm sorry to say one of these bottles you returned doesn't appear to be a Kalak bottle. Why, Judgey, pulling a fast one? Certainly not. Judging by the smell, I'd say it was a turpentine bottle. Well, it may have had turpentine in it, but it was originally a root beer bottle, party size. Horace, aren't you ashamed? 
The deposit on it was five cents, exactly the same as the Kalak water. I know, but I don't handle root beer, John. Well, I thought as an old customer, you might at least do me the simple service of returning the bottle for me, thereby saving me the trouble of going all the way to the A1 market, which isn't open today anyway. Yeah, it's open tomorrow. I'm sure if you were to go there tomorrow... This is could... my day for returning bottles. Fellows, I'm waiting here while you argue over a nickel. All right, keep the bottles, sell it, smash it. Do anything with it. Now, don't misunderstand, Judge. I'd like I'd to... rather take the loss. Oh, don't be an old sore head, Horace. You're asking Peavy to do something that's not his business. Peavy's a druggist. You want to cash in on your precious bottle? Take it to a junk man. When I want any advice from you, my friend, I shall call on you. Well, don't call before 9 o'clock. <laughs> Peavy, if I can get a word in here edgewise... Yes, Mr. Gillespie. What can I do for you? Have you got any lemons? Lemons? No, Mr. Gillespie, I haven't. No lemons? Well, I've got to have lemons. What am I going to do? I'm sorry, Mr. Gillespie, but I don't carry produce of any kind. You don't have to tell me that, but it's Sunday. I thought as a good customer and an old friend, if you had any lemons around... Peavy is a druggist, Gildy. If you want lemons, go to the greengrocer. <laughs> well, I'm back, Bertie. Where have I been? Where do you think I've been? I've been all over town looking for those confounded lemons. Of course, I had to stop and talk to a few people on the way. <laughs> Lucky thing I didn't wait for you to bring them. The pies are already out of the oven and cooling on the shelf. Well, you got some lemons? Yes, I bought them from Mrs. Ransom. A fine thing. I went all the way downtown after those Mom, lemons. did you get the ink for me? The what? The ink. Ink? No, did you ask me to get ink? Oh, my goodness. Now, how can I finish my letter? Letter? Just a minute. Who are you writing to all of a sudden? I don't see what difference that makes. Mm-hmm. I thought so. It's that Marshall Bullard kid. I didn't say who it was. You don't have to. I can put two and two together. Marjorie, I absolutely forbid you to write to Marshall Bullard or have anything to do with it. You understand? Him or any member of his family. I don't see why. Leroy's been playing with his brother all afternoon. Craig? They're up in Leroy's room right now. Up in... Leroy! Tonight, after dinner. What? With movies. Craig brought over his projector. Admission's only five cents. We're going to... Just one minute. What? Stay right up there a minute, Craig. Leroy, what did I tell you about playing with Craig? Answer the door, will you, Bertie? Yes, sir. Well, young man, what about it? Gosh, Uncle, I forgot. You forgot a likely story. Well, he started it. Is Craig here? Well, projector. I know Don well is here. Tell him his father wants him to come home this minute. He has no business over here. Oh, uh, Mr. Bullard, can't Craig stay? Let him stay, please. Please, Pop, let me stay. Will you please? We're going to give a show. Yeah, show. Sure. With movies, Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. And everybody will pay a nickel. A nickel? It'll be swell. Swell? Super. Super. Will you, huh, please? Please, Pop, please. Nothing doing. Come along, Craig. Come, Leroy. We won't fight, will we, Craig? No. Honest, Mr. Bullard, I didn't put a rock in that snowball. Did I, Craig? Tell him. Tell him the truth. Well? You want to have a show, don't you, Craigie? Tell him. Let's get to the bottom of this. You mind if I come in for a minute, Gildersleeve? No, please do. <laughs> now, what are the facts about this snowball, young man? Was there or was there not a rock in it? There wasn't a thing in it, was there, Craig? No prompting, Leroy. Well, Craig? Why do your eyebrows grow so long, Daddy? Answer my question. Was there a rock in it? No, there wasn't. There was no rock in the snowball? Then why did you tell me there was? Well, you shouldn't be too tough on it, Mr. Bullard. Little kids get that way. Yes. It just comes over them. I remember when I was a little kid, I used to tell the worst lies. Why, what? Leroy, you keep out of it. Now, hold on now. I think that's pretty nice of Leroy, trying to protect Craig like that. Well, that's what I do all the time, protect him. Don't I, Craigie? Yep. Oh, brother. <laughs> you know, Gildersleeve, I have the feeling some apologies are in order here. I guess I've been something of a fool. Nonsense, I've been the fool. I didn't even believe my own nephew. I don't know that I even believe him now. That's how kind of a fool I am. 
<laughs> but if you're willing to let bygones be bygones. Well, absolutely. And I want to apologize for Craig, too. Well, you don't need to apologize for Craig. He's a fine young boy, aren't you, Craig? Yes, sir. Put up your dukes there, young fella. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> He'll be a man one of these days. Fine lad, fine lad. Oh, yes, Bertie? Excuse me, but it's on the table and it's getting cold. What? Oh, oh, say, Bullard, I understand Mrs. Bullard's out of town. Why don't you and Craig stay and have dinner with us? Well, that's mighty nice of you, but... Plenty uh... for everybody if you're willing to take potluck. We're having lemon pie for dessert. Well, I... Sure you will. <laughs> Bertie, two more places for dinner. Oh, boy, then we can have a movie show after, hey, Craig? Oh, boy. Go wash your hands for dinner now, Leroy. You too, Craig. Leroy, show Craig up to the bathroom. I put up the rotten egg! <laughs> yes. Boys will be boys. Call your sister, Leroy. Yes, Bullard, these little squabbles, they're all ridiculous. Just as I was saying the other day, if neighbors like you and I can't get along together, what chance is there for Great Britain and Russia? By thunder, Gildersleeve, you talk sense. <laughs> well, Mr. Bevan, shall we go into dinner? After you, Mr. Vyshinsky. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, I'm Vyshinsky. Let's go in ski. <laughs> <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be back in just a few moments. And now here's a special message from Kraft to the millions of American families who are regular users of parquet margarine. Many of you women have written to tell us that it's often hard to get parquet. And dealers from coast to coast say that suppliers have been moving out of their stores so fast they've had to disappoint many customers. Now, we assure you that Kraft is producing as much parquet margarine as available supplies permit. Right now, every Kraft food dealer is getting a fair share of all the parquet margarine that's being made. He's trying to serve you as best he can. Both the Kraft Foods Company and your dealer appreciate your patience during this period of temporary shortage. Buy parquet when you can, and as soon as conditions permit, Kraft will again be making enough parquet margarine for everyone. Just a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any old clothes you can possibly spare, give them to the Victory Clothing Drive. Just take them to any police station, firehouse, or post office, and they'll be sent to people in Europe and Asia who need them desperately. Good night, everybody. The Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekin. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. And now here's a bright spot in the food picture. There's plenty of tangy golden Kraft salad mustard in your favorite food store. So pep up those sausage meats and those egg and cheese dishes you often serve these days with a taste-tingling tang of Kraft salad mustard. And to please sharper taste, you'll also want a jar of Kraft mustard with horseradish added. Both of these delicious mustards are made to Kraft's own special recipe. They're just what you need for pepping up meals. So be sure to buy both kinds, Kraft salad mustard and Kraft horseradish mustard. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> It's the 
The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Now let's see how things are going with the Great Gildersleeve. Not so well, apparently. Confound it. Nuts. That's the third time this week. <clears throat> darn car. Makes me so darn mad I'd like to give it a good kick in the old oh, chassis. <laughs> Darn car won't start. Is that you, Mr. Gillespie? I'm sure glad I caught you before you got away. Well, you caught me, Bertie, but that doesn't exactly make you Frank Buck. The car wouldn't start. <laughs> Is that a fact? Well, I just wanted to remind you, we need some meat for lunch, Mr. Gillespie. But if the car won't start, I can warm up the lamb stew again. Lamb stew? I'll start it if I have to blast it, Bertie. <laughs> Doorbell! It's probably Ben. Ben? Well, just what we need. Natural-born mechanic. Uncle Mort, Ben and I have plans of our own. Oh, Bertie. Anybody home? Yes, sir. She's right here in the parlor. Oh. Hi, folks. Hello, Marge. Hi. Hi, Ben. Hello, Ben. Am I glad to see you. Oh, thanks. Say, is that Mr. Bullard's car over there across the street, that new one? It's a 46, isn't it? Yeah, it's a sip, huh? He was the first man in Summerfield to get delivery. I should think he got the Congressional Medal. He's got so stuck up over it. Look at it. Parked there in front of his house so everybody will see it. That's a beaut, though. He must have pull or something to get it. He's not so much. I'm thinking of getting a new car myself. Unky, really? No kidding? Very possible. Where are you going to find a new car these days? Don't worry, Ben. I've got my eye on a car that'll make Bullards look sick. Where? Bullard isn't the only man in this town that has connections. In the meantime, of course, we're dependent on the old bus. Say, Ben, if you're not planning to do anything... Uncle Mort, you cut that out. My dear, what do you mean? You're trying to get Ben to fix your car. I simply want to ask him a question. Ben is an expert. I value his opinion. What seems to be the trouble, Mr. Gildersleeve? Car won't start. Oh, well, it's probably cold if you tried priming it. Priming it? Yeah. Just how do you do that, Ben? <laughs> well, uh, it's very simple. You just... Well, well it would be easier to show you. Ben. Uh, what's the matter? The last time Unky got you to fix his car, it took two hours. And when you finished, you were so dirty you had to go home, remember? Well, this wouldn't be anything like that, honest. Oh, you make me sick. Marjorie. And it's all your fault. Gosh. What's she so sore about? I'm afraid Marjorie sometimes forgets that the whole world was not constructed for her pleasure. She'll get over it. Uh, right out in the garage, Ben. Go out oh. the back way, if you like. Thanks, Al. Guess I'll go out the back way. If you need any help, Ben, holler. Are you really going to buy a new car, Unc? I haven't made up my mind yet, my boy. I'm simply considering it. Gee, Mr. Bullard's car looks super. Wish we had it. I don't like to see signs of envy in you, my boy. Especially envy of other people's material possessions. Mr. Bullard has a new car. We have an old car, that's all. We have a broken down old car. We've spent a lot of pleasant hours in it. We should be thankful we have any car at all. Okay, I'm thankful. Just the same, it'd be nice to be rich like the Bullards. We're not poor, Leroy. I could buy a new car tomorrow if I wanted to. But I happen to think there are things more important than owning a flashy car. Yeah? Your education, for instance. I believe you're old enough to know that the war bonds I've been laying aside are intended to send you to college. Maybe I don't want to go. Oh, yes, you will. <laughs> I'd rather put the money in a car. You're taking the short view, my boy. College is very important. Where do you think I'd be today if I hadn't had a college education? You mean things might be even tougher? <laughs> Things are not tough. I'm a prosperous man, relatively speaking, and I intend to send you to college. But if you don't show some signs of ambition pretty soon, I'll, I'll blow the money on your sister. Unk! Well, watch it, that's all. What a character. Leroy? Yeah? 
How's Ben coming out there? Well, he's got a reasonable part now. Oh, for heaven's sake. I told you he'd be all day. Now, don't be impatient, my dear. Doorbell, I'll go. Tell Ben to keep plugging out there, Leroy. Hey, Bernie, can I have an old rag and an apple? What for, Leroy? The old rag is for Ben, the apple's for me. Leela, well. Come in. I'm afraid I've come to ask another favor of you, Throckmorton. <laughs> Well, come in anyway. <laughs> Seems like every time I come over here to ask you for something, aren't I terrible? As long as you keep coming, Leela, I don't mind. <laughs> oh, you. <laughs> oh, Marjorie, child, I didn't see you standing there. Oh, yes, Marjorie. <laughs> I'm just waiting for a friend. Yes, yes. Uh, Throckmorton, what I dropped in for, I don't suppose you happen to be driving downtown this morning by any possible time. Well, I'll tell you how it is, Leah. I wouldn't want you to make a special trip, understand. Oh, I wouldn't have you do that for the world, but my hairdress is expensive. I'd be glad to take you, Leela, but I've been having a little trouble with the car. Trouble? It won't go. Oh, well, maybe I can ride down with Mr. Bullard. I see his car's out in front of the house. Maybe he's Now, wait a minute. My car will be fixed in just a minute, Leela. Ben's out there working on it right now. Isn't he, Marjorie? I'll say. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, as long as I'm not so late that Vera won't take me. Uh, have you seen Mr. Bullard's new car, Throckmorton? Yep. Isn't it just simply gorgeous? Stock model, there'll be millions of them. Oh, I think it's just stunning. I'd love to ride in it, wouldn't you? What for? The only thing that's different about it is the bumper. Under the hood, it's the same old car. Oh, but it's so new and so handsome. I don't know. Maybe it's just a weakness of mine. But I simply love high-powered motor cars. I like to get out on a country road with the top down and feel the wind racing through my hair. Don't you? I know something better than that. <laughs> what? Uh... Would you like me to go away? No, no, my dear. But haven't you something to do? something to do till you drove Ben out to the garage. Now, now, he'll be in any minute. Uh, I was telling Marjorie, Leela, that I've been thinking some of buying a new car myself. Have you really? Well, I suppose it takes months, unless you're someone important, like Mr. Bullard. Well, I could get this one tomorrow if I made up my mind to buy it. Really? What kind of a car is it, Throckmorton? As white sidewall tires. I, I, I mean, what make? What make? Uh, it's a cord. A A cord? Are they good? Are they good? They're so good they stopped making them. <laughs> Before the war, even. But why in the world did they... They were too good for the average man. Oh. You really should see this baby, Leela. It's like... It's like new. 5,000 miles, then the owner was drafted. Long and low, with a top you can let down. Mm. Boy, if you like wind in your hair, you could have a picnic in this one. <laughs> oh, Sirach Martin, what... On picnics. Oh, we could go for long drives together in the country, just you and me. And I'd fix a little basket lunch. With fried chicken. With my famous fried chicken. And we'd stop in some nice, quiet place where there was a little brook, maybe. And I'd carry you across the brook, just like in the movies. <laughs> Marjorie. Don't worry, I'm leaving. Yes, yes. Goodness, I keep forgetting. Tell Ben if he should ever have the decency to come in, then he'll find me upstairs. Marjorie sounds a little upset. Yeah, they get that way, so you forget it. Uh, where were we? Uh, you were carrying me across the brook, if I remember correctly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what would we do after that, Leela? Hmm? Well, we, we'd wander through the meadow picking cowslips, maybe. Violets. I'd rather pick violets. They smell nicer. Ah, no. Let's pick wild strawberries. Okay, wild strawberries. And, and after a while, when we were tired of picking strawberries, you know what we do? We'd eat them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Silly. Hmm? No. 
No, we'd lie down side by side on the nice mossy ground and just look up at the sky and watch the pretty clouds drift by overhead. <laughs> Big, soft, white clouds. So pretty. And then what would we do? We'd jump in your car and dash back to town. Oh. <laughs> oh, Throckmorton, I'm glad you're giving up the old car. Well, now, wait a minute, Leela. I didn't say I've I'm... never said anything about it, but I guess it's all right to now. I've always felt kind of funny driving around with you in that old car. But, Leela... I mean, it's more of a family type of car with all those things in the back seat, skates and all. I've been after Leroy to get those out of there. But about the new car, Leela, I was only thinking about that. Gosh, I don't know if I can even afford it. Oh, I see. Leroy? Yeah? How's Ben coming? With oh, the car- there's Mr. Bullock coming out of his house. He must be going downtown. Uh, uh, Leroy, honey, run across the street and stop Mr. Bullock before he drives off, will you? Ask him if I might ride down with him. Well, now, wait, Leroy. Run, Leroy. Okay. Leroy, how's Ben coming with the car? He's through. The car's okay. Well, wait a minute, Ben. Don't... My car is fixed, Leela. Ben's got it fixed. You don't have to go with Bullard. You can ride down with me. Oh, I wouldn't want to put you to any trouble. No trouble, Leela. I have to do some shopping for Bertie. Well, I'd crash her. You have the car all full of groceries. Plenty of room in the front seat. I have to go anyway, Leela, please. Oh, well, you're sweet to ask me, Throckmorton, some other time, huh? At 10, I'll be right there, Leroy. I'll be right there. She... <laughs> She's ashamed. She's ashamed of me and my car. I don't care what anybody says. I'm going down there right now and have a demonstration. And we'll find out what happens in just a few moments. Mr. Lang, I was listening last week when you explained why parquet margarine is sometimes so hard to get in the food stores these days. Yes, even though Kraft is making all the parquet margarine it possibly can with limited supplies, there still isn't enough to meet the big demand. Mm, You're right about that big demand. Why, in my own family, there's a husband and two children who demand parquet at every meal. I've tried other brands of margarine. But only Parquet's flavor seems to satisfy them. That's what millions of families have discovered. Parquet's unmatched flavor has made it one of America's favorite spreads for bread. Believe me, I'm keeping a sharp lookout for every new supply of Parquet my dealer gets. That's a good idea, because Parquet is now an even more valuable food. Every pound is being fortified with 15,000 units of vitamin A. And every Kraft food dealer is getting a fair share of all the parquet margarine that's available. So please be patient when supplies are temporarily short. And remember to keep asking for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. And we find whizzing along in the family car with his nephew, Leroy. I'll bet when we get there, the barber shop will be full. Then you'll just wait your turn. There'll be a long line. Then you get on the end of it. Gosh. Hey, where are you going? The barber shop is on State Street. Never mind where I'm going. <laughs> I'm stopping here for a minute. Oh, boy, is that the car off that one in the window? Are you going to buy it, huh? No, I'm merely going to see how much he wants for it. And if it's cheap enough, maybe? We'll see, Leroy, we'll see. Boy, that's some car. Now, remember, Leroy, I'm not here to buy it. Okay. Yes, sir, uh... Can I do something for you? Well, my name's Gildersleeve. I'm the water commissioner here in the city. I'd like to look over this car in the window, please. Commissioner Gildersleeve. Yes, sir. Uh, Larry Gans is the name. Uh, this is my nephew, Leroy. Mr. Gans. I see. Interested in automobiles, are you, young fella? Yeah. Well, you're going to look at a real automobile now. How do you open the doors? Look, huh? No handle. Uh, just press the button, Sonny. You see? Well, I'll be darned. Hey, neat. Leroy, don't climb all over the upholstery. He can't hurt it, Mr. Gildersleeve. Real leather. And I mean leather. Just feel that. Feels like leather, all right. (laughs) What about the motor? You know, it's a special body job, Commissioner. 
The original body on the cord was good enough for most people, but this particular owner wanted something even better. Look at those lines. Low, isn't it? Yeah, she's low. Sure she doesn't drag a little. <laughs> no, sir, no, sir. It's all a matter of design. Leroy, don't do that. The boy can't hurt it. Horn cost the owner $150 in cold cash, believe it or not. Personally, I wouldn't want to tie up that much money in a horn, but that's the way he wanted it, so that's the way he had it. Yeah, yeah. What's under the hood, Mr. Gams? Uh, Commissioner, did I call your attention to this windshield heater? It's a mighty useful thing to have. Hey, Unc, look, a searchlight with a pistol handle. Bang, bang! Don't point that thing at anybody, Leroy. And don't monkey with everything. Oh, that's all right, Sonny. Pistol grip searchlight, they're fine when you're traveling. Well, I'm not planning any particular tours. I just want a car I can drive around here. Something dependable. Oh, this car's dependable, all right. Uh, uh, suppose you let your uncle slide in under the wheel there for a minute, Sonny. I, I want him to get the feel of the car a little. Well, now... Now, I don't care if you buy it or not. I just want you to get behind that wheel a minute. Oh, well... Did you ever see such a big steering wheel, Unc? No. What's the idea of such a big wheel, Mr. Gans? Uh, it's a racing-type wheel. Better control at high speeds, that's all. When you get around 95, 110, it's nice to have. Won't she do 110 miles an hour? Just look at that speedometer, Sonny. Goes up to 120, doesn't it? Well, I generally stay around 35. <laughs> But of course, with all this power... You won't know you're over 30. It's that smooth. You don't say. And I'll tell you another thing. Women are crazy about this car. Does something to them. It does? Get out a minute, Leroy. Mr. Gans and I are talking business. You mean you're going to buy it, Uncle? We'll see, Leroy. We'll see. Hear that door? That's none of your cheap construction. Uh, you a bachelor, Mr. Gillisman? Uh, yes, I am. You could have a lot of fun with a car like this. <laughs> you think so, eh? I know. I tried it. <laughs> you sit behind that wheel there and you slide along nice and slow. And you see a friend, maybe, walking along. And you just go... <laughs> And when your friend looks around and gets a peek at this automobile, that's all, brother. Well, uh, yes. At the same time, I don't know. A man in my official position needs a car that's pretty conservative. You couldn't want a more conservative car than this. Black body, tan top. Of course, the white sidewall tires are a nice conservative type. Oh, of course, yes. Uh, about how much would you want for this car, Mr. Gans, if I was uh, thinking of buying it? Commissioner, I'll tell you frankly, it would be worth something to have you as a customer. To you, fourteen ninety-five. Mm, fourteen hundred and ninety-five dollars? Yes, sir. Fourteen ninety-five takes it away. Gee. Oh, less, of course, whatever we can allow you on your present car. Oh, of course, the allowance. I never thought of that. Quite a substantial allowance on the late model cars, the forties and forty ones. Well, mine's a little older. All right, bring it in. I'll give you a figure. You can look at it right now. It's parked right out in front. Oh, that's the stuff. Uh, just press the button to open the door. That's it. You uh, say your car's right out in front. Yeah, there she is. Uh -huh. uh, there's two of them. Uh, you mean the one behind the jalopy? No. Well, I'm afraid it'll have to be largely a cash deal, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, well, I'll let you know in a day or so, Mr. Gans. Anytime. Anytime you're ready. Uh, maybe around the first of the week. Uh, Leroy, come along, my boy. Okay. Get your hands off that horn, you little weasel. Leroy, now for heaven's sake, get your hair cut. Okay, will you come back and pick me up? In half an hour. Well, there's Judge Hooker coming out. Hi, Judge. Hello, Leroy. Good morning, Stockmorton. Well, good morning, Judge. About time you got your hair cut. Leroy is getting his hair cut. Get out, Leroy. Has Leroy an appointment? An appointment? A new custom Floyd's inaugurated for Saturdays. He's booked up salad till 3 o'clock. Well, for who does he think he is? Charles of the Ritz? I don't know, but he's getting away with it. You should have got here earlier. Well, I had a little trouble with my car. Been having a lot of trouble lately. So 
I stopped by Larry Gann's place and look at that car he has in the window. You seen that, Judge? You mean that flashy convertible? It's not so flashy. He wants a lot of money for it, though. I'm thinking it over. Gildersleeve, I don't understand you. You know perfectly well you can't afford to buy an automobile like that. Who can't? Stay out of this, Leroy. Who can't? You can't. I believe I know more about my own financial situation than you do, Horace. Gildersleeve, you can't afford the car you're sitting in. Oh, oh can't I? Leroy, climb back in here. <laughs> So loud, Leroy. Remember, you're in a bank. Well, what are we doing here? Never mind. Follow me. What would happen if we tried to hold up the place? Would alarms go off? Please, Leroy, not so loud, and don't ask him any questions. But where are we going? I've never been here before. The safe deposit vault. What for? Uh, uh, want to look over some of my bonds. You mean you're going to buy the car, are you? No. Now shut up. Uh, beg pardon. Oh. <laughs> Uh, good morning. Good morning, sir. If you'll just sign the slip, please. Hello there, Sonny. Hi. Who's he, a cop? No. He's a bank guard. Has he got a gun? I suppose so. Would he shoot? <laughs> Boy's never seen a safety deposit vault before. By the way, you're new here, aren't you? Yes, I just joined the, the organization this week. You know, by George, you look a lot like Don Gates, our chief of police here in Summerfield. Any relation? Oh, we're brothers. Well... Yes, Don went into public service, and I went into banking. Right this way, please, sir. Go ahead, Leroy. Follow the banker. Boy, look at that door. That must weigh a ton. Ten tons, to be exact. Gosh, it'd sure take a lot of dynamite to blast through that. You weren't thinking of blasting it, were you, Sonny? Oh, no, no, not me. <laughs> Gosh, the fellow reads your mind. <laughs> Your key, please, sir? Oh, yes, my key. There you are. Yes, sir. 863. Here we are. What does he use two keys for? So his right hand won't know what his left hand is doing. <laughs> I have to be careful in these places, Leroy. There you are, sir. If you'd care to step into one of our little rooms, just make yourself at home, sir. Uh, thank you. Close the door, Leroy. Why? I don't know. You're supposed to. Now, just see what I've got here. Hmm. What's that? It appears to be an old laundry list. Certainly don't know what that's doing here. Ah. What's that? My membership in the National Geographic Society. <laughs> Let's see now. Fire insurance policy, life insurance. Ah, here we are. Now what? These, my boy, are United States Treasury bonds. Been saving those for four years. What are you going to do with them? Never mind. I'm going to see how many I have first. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. By George, they mount up, my boy. That's the beauty of regular saving. By before you know it, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Yes, sir. Fourteen hundred and ninety-five takes it away. <laughs> What's the matter, Unc? Uh, nothing, my boy. I was just thinking. Gosh, I've got a nothing more right here. Black body, tan top, and, of course, the white sidewall tires. <laughs> <laughs> Women are crazy about that car. It does something to them. What are you thinking, Unc? Well, I was thinking, I was thinking, Leroy, that I've got a new automobile right there. Right there in that envelope. You mean you're going to buy it? Go ahead, Unc. Buy it. Well... Fourteen ninety-five takes it away. And put those other things back in the box, Leroy, and let's get out of here quick. Yippee! Quiet. Do you want to rouse the guard? Here, close that box. Here. Let me. Wait a minute. What's this rolled up here? What? Let me see. Pull it out. It's got a rubber band around it. Here, give it to me. By George. I forgot I'd put it in here. I haven't seen that in 20 years. But what is it? My old college diploma. Nos Rector Universitatis Literarum. Promotor Rite Constitutus. In Virum Clarissimum. Troc Mortinum P. Gildersleeve. What's that? 
That's Latin, my boy. Latin. Yeah? Yeah. I remember the day I received that diploma from the hands of old Prexy himself. I remember some of the things he said to us in his commitments address. As I look out into this sea of faces, he said, and see you young men about to go out into the world, I venture the hope that that world will be a better place for your having been there. Just as State University is a better place because you were here. <laughs> Old Prexy. He's gone now. By George, it brings back memories. Put back the bonds. You mean you're not going to buy the car? Put back the bonds, my boy. You're going to college. Put back the diploma, too. Ah, tell me one thing. What's that, my boy? What does it mean? What does what mean? What you were reading there. What it says on the diploma. My boy, you'll find that out when you go to college. The great Gildersleeve will be back again shortly. With quality spreads for bread in such big demand, it's only natural that more families should want to buy parquet margarine. Parquet is preferred by millions for its fresh, sweet flavor. There are other reasons, too, of course. First, it's such a fine energy food. Second, every pound of parquet is now fortified with 15,000 units of important vitamin A. And third, parquet is always made to crafts high standards of quality. So it's no wonder more and more families are demanding parquet margarine. Unfortunately, supplies are limited, and crafts simply cannot make enough to satisfy everyone. So if your dealer is sometimes temporarily out of parquet, please be patient. Chances are that right soon you'll have a new supply. So keep asking for delicious, economical parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Ladies and gentlemen, I've only got a few seconds, but I want to say something about America's number one problem today, the housing shortage. The government estimates that more than two million veterans and their families will be looking for a place to live during 1946. Men who have fought our war come home and have to beg, not for food, but for a roof to shelter themselves, their wives, and their children. If you can rent a room to a veteran or part of your home to a veteran and his family, call the Veterans Service Center in your community. The need is terrific, believe me. Good night. Do you like your mustard mild, or do you like it with just a tingle of sharpness? Well, here's the good news I have for you lovers of good mustard. There's a craft quality mustard to please both tastes. The mustard with a mild, delicate spicing is golden craft salad mustard. And the one that's just a bit sharper is craft mustard with snappy horseradish added. They're both delicious in cooked foods, on frankfurters, and in tasty sauces. So be sure to ask for craft salad mustard and craft horseradish mustard. When you shop tomorrow. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.